My name's Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan, the Lion's Eye, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of the guy from Gower Gulch. It's a gray building, about the color of moldy bread. It's an apartment house in the middle of Hollywood, and it figures that the guy who built it quit voting when they named the street it sits on, Taft Avenue. My place is furnished with war surplus from the Spanish-American War. Well, it's got a hat rack, and that's where I live, number 308. In back, where you get a view and some fresh air from the alley. One's about as bad as the other. But I got it fixed up kind of nice. Pot plate, coffee pot, an autographed picture of Sally Rand that somebody left there. Only mistake I made was putting in a telephone. It spoils a lot of things. Regan, it's the lion. Wake up. We got a job. Why don't you sleep at night? Lucky for you, I got insomnia. We go broke. Try Ovaltine. What kind of a job? How should I know? Get your clothes on. What are you doing, reading the want ads? I got a note from a client. You mean you got money? hundred bucks is all. Says he'll match it if we run him an errand. Where to? Santa Ana Canyon? He'll tell you. You know, you got morals like a cash register. Can he write his name? Davy Crockett. He's 50 uh, years old. Well, he's a little old for cowboys and Indians, isn't he? That's his name, Davy Crockett. Well, when's the wagon train pull out? Regan, I don't know how I stand for you. Get over there. Get where? Listen, a guy works pretty hard building up a business like I have. Takes a lot out of him. Well, you got plenty on tap. I just want you to understand, that's all. Money doesn't grow on trees. Now, sometimes you gotta play your hunches. Like George Gallup. This time I got a feeling the guy's okay. He writes like a gentleman, Regan. I want you to treat him like one. But where do I find him? He's in a location can give us a lot of business. Where? The city jail. Yeah, that's the lion. Born under the sign of the dollar. Well, it happened on Monday night, and I found the Lincoln Heights jail looking real tired after a rough weekend. They were putting fresh creosote on the walls in front of the drunk tank, and the guy at the desk looked like he'd burst his radiator if anybody phoned for another reservation. It was about 1 a.m., but after a couple of jokes I know about alligators, Sergeant Gonzalez hauled out a drawer with some cards in it. Under C, he found it. Full name, David Crockett. Cell 273, solitary. Gonzalez walked me through a couple of corridors, and then he opened his cell and let me inside. Davy Crockett was there, awake and standing up. He was about four feet high, skinny, with a head like a sunburned turnip. He had blue veins roaming all over his nose and a handlebar mustache to hold him up. He looked at me like I was holding the fifth ace. Howdy, stranger. My name's Regan, International Detective Bureau. How do I know? Start anything and I'll set up a racket. No, I work for the lion. You called him. Maybe yes, maybe no. You got credentials? Where do you want him? Easy, son. Not talking to an amateur. Flyweight champion, Buenos Aires, 29. Grab yourself a squat, partner. Right. What are you so nervous about? Nothing. Precautious, that's all. All right, look, let's start at the beginning, shall we? What are you locked up for? Fire plug. Got him in the dangerous places in this bird. What'd you do? Steal it for your dog? No. Parked my landlady's car alongside it while I ran in there. And... You don't get jugged for traffic tickets. There were two cops. Looked like a posse. I don't like injustice. All right, resisting arrest, is that all? What more do you want? Told you I'm not a man to be trampled with. Taught judo in Tokyo, 34. <clears throat> the Japs still lost the war. Sit still, Regan. You're working. On what? Well, it's... Just another errand. It's not much. Well, come on. Let's pick up the temple, will you? My bicycle's double parked. Say, you ever get saddle sores on a bicycle? I did once. Eight-day race. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, what about this errand? Little package wrapped up in a sweater. In the alley by the ash can. Go on. I calculate I dropped it about three and a half feet to the left of the big ash can. By accident? Man can't fight with his hands full. I wrote down the address for you here. All right. What's in that sweater you didn't want the cops to see? A pole cat. It fits the rest of your story, yeah. Son, there's nothing in the life of Davy Crockett won't stand inspection. 
When you get the package, check it in at the Union Station. And then what? Save me the stub. You get a hundred. Save it for bail. You could do this job yourself. Thought I told you, Sonny. I'd like to be lonesome. So you had him lock you up on purpose? No, I just like it here. You want a reference? Check any of the boys in Gower Gulch. Movie cowboy, huh? Laddie, you're looking at the greatest jockey since Paul Revere. Eddie Sand to Eddie Arcaro. I beat them all. Kentucky Downs, 39. Yeah, sure. Well, a job's a job, Davy, but I got a hot tip where I fit in. Where's that? Trailing the field. Well, I left the little man running his fingers through an old copy of Variety, and I went out into the street. It was about 3 o'clock, and a truck was throwing some water out and giving the gutter a shampoo. I picked up my car and started out to play retriever. That's when I spotted the blonde tailing me. She was using a 37 Packard, and the top was down. I could see her in the mirror. I could tell she had yellow hair like a rag doll. It took a few fast turns to get rid of her, but then I was solo when I pulled to a stop by the alley off Gower. It was in back of some old movie studios. About then, a drunk came pouring down the street, did a loop around a fire plug at the head of the alley, and sat down. He was the talented kind, and I figured he thought I was Arthur Godfrey. Well, I scrambled over some broken beer bottles looking for the sweater. It finally showed, lying beside a pack of newspaper and some dame's torn petticoat. That's when the drunk lost his tilt and began looking at me. I picked up an old shoe, I wrapped it in a newspaper, and I started out of the alley. The drunk went back to his audition, moving toward me. Hiya, friend. Have a drink. That's not my brand. Don't be a mug. A little drink between friends is real nice. Well, we haven't been introduced. My name's Maxwell. What's yours? Slipped my mind. Ah, that's the trouble with the whole world. No fellowship. Except for my girl, Marie. You know Marie? No, I don't. Sort of short and plump with a little sinus trouble. That's too bad. Thought you might have met her. Lots of fellowship in that girl. Every time you look, another fella. All right, move it, buddy. Now, you don't want to get by me, friends. You want to stand right there and have a little drink. You got the subject we're going to talk about? Yeah, sure, sure. What's in the package? Dirty laundry. Ain't that funny, though. I just got me a new Bendix. Why don't you go into business? That's what I'm going to do. You're my first customer. No, I lux my dainties. Yeah, don't go away, friend. I ain't through with my sales talk. Well, hire a skywriter. Hold up, I said. Get your hands off of me. All right, Regan, the round's over. Yeah, what makes you the referee? This does. Friend here wants to play rough, Red. Reconsider, Regan. It'll make you happy. All right, what do you want? The package. You heard what he said, smart guy. Why don't you work for it? Heavy, Max. Don't leave, Regan. We're not finished. I got the package, Red. Give him a tip for picking it up. Mm, Sure. Oh. Uh. Guess I overpaid him. Well, it was easy to see. It was their play. I had about as much chance as a midget in a basketball game. The muscles ambled off with the package that they took from me, and I crawled back for that sweater. It was still there, wrapped around something hard and round. When I ripped it off, a shine caught my eyes. It was a metal can of movie film, and the word Peru was marked on it. Not much for all the hush-hush, but it must have had a story. Well, I looked up a friend of mine who owned a camera shop, and I made a commotion with a five-dollar bill. That shook the sand out of him, and he rented me a projector with sound. The lion's house was the next stop. We threw up a sheet on the wall and turned on the film. That completed the night. We had a trip to a good neighbor without a passport. Wonders turned out to be a Joan Fitzpatrick giving with some kind of a travelogue. One of the most colorful in the world. A temple of worship. Home of Peru, 2,000 years old. Yes, yes, in the perfect Well, stop screaming, will you? It's free. Time. You know I can't stand movies. I got sore eyes. All right, shut up and listen to this. Peru, the marketplace. A street vendor dressed in gay native costume. Selling delicacies to Peruvian children. Beads and jewels of exquisite beauty wrought by the hands of master Peruvian artisans. Horse racing and innovation from the modern world. And native dance. I'm going to bed. You won't sleep. I stole your eye shade. Oh, Regan, I got to get up early. I got lots to do. It'll keep. A veritable symphony of motion. And so, it's with heavy heart we say adieu to lovely Peru. Land of the Peruvians. Land of charm and enchantment. And with the setting sun, we take our leave. 
Well, what'd you get out of it? A headache. Yeah, we'll talk about it in the morning. No, I can't wait. Uh, what you doing now? I'm phoning the city jail. Looking for a room? Looking for information. Davey will supply it. You've been drinking. Now listen, big shot. Somebody's after this film for some reason. I'm going to find it. City jail, Sergeant Gonzalez speaking. Danny's Regan. Oh, hi, you, Regan. I'm glad you called. I just got the joke about the alligators. <laughs> yeah, well, do me a favor, will you? Sure, pal, sure. Say, I told it to the lieutenant. He's still laughing. You know, it may earn me a promotion, pal. Let me talk to Davy Crockett. Oh, I can't do that, Regan. How well, you can say I'm his lawyer. Well, it's not that, pal. He's not here anymore. What do you mean? Some guy bailed him out 20 minutes ago. When I was telling the lieutenant the joke, this guy in the briefcase comes in, slaps down the bail. Out walks your friend. Well, he said he liked it there. And yeah, Davey must have changed his mind. Where'd he go? Not very far. Just over to the morgue. Well, the cowboy from Gower Gulch had spun his last yarn. Gonzalez told me that somebody had shot Crockett as soon as he hit the street. Oh, none of this made sense. The phony job, the blonde who tailed me, the fight in the alley, the corny movie. Well, the lion shoved the film in a desk, and I went out the door. I cut across his yard, but I stopped on the opposite sidewalk. My car wasn't alone. It was a 40-foot nash sniffing at its rear fender. Hey, Regan. Well, Maxwell. That's me. You look different. Did you take the cure? Shut up. Somebody wants to see you. If it's Marie, tell her my book's full. Thought you might like a lift. No, I got a friend who runs a streetcar. Now go on, beat it. Regan, don't be that way. Oh, Grim, a pen tell her, Maxwell. Who's this, your father-in-law? You smoke, Regan? No, it might explode. Yes. Uh, so long. Hold this, plastic <laughs> Get in. Oh, Max. Max, I told you before, you're on probation. Oh, that's all right. Don't pick on him, teacher. He didn't hurt me. Get in front, Max. Sure. Where's your other boy, Red? We could play some bridge. I thought he'd do better in the shoe business. The one I gave him didn't fit, huh? I'm a much misunderstood man, Mr. Regan. I'm sure you'll put your best foot forward. I'd love to. My card, Horace Grundy. Mm -hmm. Sometime earlier, a little man called me, Mr. Regan. Uh, Custer or Boone or... uh... Davy Crockett? Of course. I want you to understand I get many such calls. Party line. It's a private number, but the salesmen bother me anyway. It's tough to be popular. Davy tell you what he was selling? No. Well, he didn't tell me either. Have it your own way. When I told him I'd meet him, he said he'd arranged to get out of jail. He said all he wanted was a job. And he got one. Yes, only there's no future to it. I wouldn't want anything like that happening to you, Mr. Regan. I'll renew my insurance. No, you'll come with me. It's more friendly. Suppose I don't like to talk. You won't have to, if everything goes all right. Well, it's your taxi. And you're paying the fare. All right, Maxwell. Clover Field. I never knew a guy could say the name of an airport and make it sound like Forest Lawn. Grundy sat in the corner checking the manicure on his fingernails, and Maxwell drove out Olympic. By the time we skidded into Clover, I'd figured absolutely nothing. It was still only 4 a.m., but there was a string of cars parked in the lot. I spotted a 37-packard roadster, but I was too busy getting rushed up onto the field to look for the blonde. Besides, the faster we ran, the more excited Grundy got. And then uh, we rounded a hangar, and the reporters hit us. Say, Louis B's pretty sore, huh? No, no, Louis B and I are friends. Just his plugs are burned. Let us through, boys. Hey, wait a second. This junior who's traveling on the plane, they say he wants a quarter of a million. You going to pay him today? After I see a workout. Come on, Regan, let's go. Yeah, you're a real big man, Grundy. I'm going to be, Regan. El Romano. Best rep of any horse in South America. So that's it, huh? Where the ruins come from. Uh, What's that? Peru. Oh, sure. Peruvian National Airways gave Julio a special plane. Everything special. Like in the movies. Well, look, suppose you watch him unload. I'll take a back seat here. Oh, no, no, Regan. This is a big day. I want you to see what... What's the ambulance for? Don't don't look at me. Stick around, Regan. It could be you. It's Julio. Not the guy who owns him? Must be. I, I tried to hold him. They hold on break. Oh, my ribs. Take it easy, boy. We got you. What happened? Bounce, bounce. The landing, she is rough. That is all. Where is the doctor? You're going to the hospital. Lie down. Oh, I'm broken in six places. Lift up the stretcher. Come on, boys. Hurry it up. Oh, he kick, he kick me. Move fast, boys. Yes, hot. Hey, Mr. Bundy. Mr. Bundy. Mr. Bundy, the horse. 
Well, the guy by the plane started to yell just about the time they took Julio toward the rear of the ambulance. Grundy took a dive for the cargo door, and so did everybody else. And then I had to stand there while six feet of big shot cigar turned into a crybaby. Look, Regan. Look at the horse's leg. He's kicked himself. Okay, so he's clumsy. But he might not run again. He was going to be mine, Regan. Well, that's too bad. Call a vet. I have already paid 50,000 retainer on the horse, Regan. I'll send you a lawyer. I got an idea you're connected with this. Oh, dry up, Buster. It's an accident. Yeah? I got an idea there's going to be another accident. Yeah, Grundy. Maybe you're right. Go! <laughs> oh! Hey, stop him! Well, I didn't wait to see if he went down. Maxwell swung, but I took off through the crowd. I figured the clover field wasn't for me, and I wasn't going to stick around for the daisy. And then I spotted a ride, the rear end of Julio's ambulance. And I made it just as the buggy started to move. I pulled the door shut and tried not to step on that stretcher inside. I shouldn't even have bothered that. The stretcher was empty. The only patient was me. You are listening to the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. Graduate registered nurses between the ages of 21 and 45 may qualify for service with this fine organization. If you are interested in joining the Army Nurse Corps and believe that you qualify for a commission, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now back to Jeff Regan, investigator, and the story of the guy from Gower Gulch. Well, things were beginning to move like a hula dancer with a hot foot. Davy Crockett sent me out to pick up a roll of movie film. A Joan Fitzpatrick travelogue on beautiful Peru. There was something in it that was hot, but Crockett got himself plugged before he could say what it was. There were shots of a horse race in Peru. And when a big buster named Grundy turns up buying a nag from a Peruvian breeder, I figured a connection. So did Grundy. When the horse got hurt and Julio did a disappearing act with his money, everybody looked at me. That's when I took the shortest way to Hollywood in an ambulance, got my car, and made it for home. Only parked up the street from my apartment was that same 37-packet roadster I'd been dodging all evening. The blonde wasn't in it. She was sitting in my place looking real hopeful. Good evening. You keep late hours, Mr. Regan. No, it's the kind of friends I've got. Perhaps you ought to change them. I'll stick it out. What do you want? A little chance to talk to you. It'll keep till morning. Oh, but Mr. Regan, I've been waiting so long, you've got to talk to me now. Why? I'm Davy Crockett's wife. You've got something that belongs to me. I don't see any wedding ring. I... I don't wear one. Scare off the other boys? That's not a very nice remark, Mr. Regan. No, but you'll let it go. Only because it's not important. Oh, stop it. You're not Davy's wife. If the little guy had anybody he could trust, he wouldn't have had to call in the lion. All right, Mr. Regan. I lie. Now, let's have it, lady. What are you after? The roll of film. That figures. It's mine. Convince me. Mr. Regan, you're becoming very annoying. Well, why don't you call the police? But I tell you, it is mine. Let's see the pink slip. And so it is with heavy heart we bid adieu That's to... That's enough. Yeah, yeah. I thought I knew that voice. Mm. Davy stole the roll from my library. Now may I have it back? Homicide will turn it over to you when they're ready. I can't wait. Well, what makes it so valuable? I'm not sure. Then how do you know it is? Because I'm not stupid, Mr. Regan. Somebody goes to a lot of trouble to break into my film library... But he only steals one roll of film. Go on. I put the police on, Davy. Follow them to the jail. So you go after the film. That adds up to pretty important business. Did you push those holes in, Davy? Of course not. Now, you're going to get a chance to prove that when homicide starts speaking in your cupboard. About the film, I'll buy it from you. No sale. There's the door, lady. Use it. I threw the light switch and grabbed for the floor. When the noise stopped, I looked up. My landlady was going to be mad. The shots plowed a few holes into her flower pot. The blonde turned a couple of different colors and decided she could find safer company. She left with a fire escape without even goodbye. Well, I headed for the lions. The idea being to make sure that he'd turn that film over to the police and advertise that I didn't have it anymore. That figured to cool me off and I could catch some sleep again. When I got there, the lion looked kind of excited. He was wrapped up in a silk robe with red and gray stripes, and he carried a drink to match. He was holding a piece of that movie film up to the light. Hey, Regan, I've been calling all over for you. Where you been? I've been looking for a bed. I don't pay you to sleep. You're on a job. Now, I've been thinking since you left. 
We're handling this wrong. Yeah, now that's what I figure. Get on the phone. What for? To tell Homicide you got a package for him. You're turning over that film right now. Easy, Regan. You heard me, big shot. I'm tired of playing the fall guy. Now, Regan, you don't know what you're saying. I've been running over the section on that Peruvian horse race. And you know what? You picked the winner. And we're going to collect. Who's making book? The insurance company. Well, come on. Clear it up. Look at this clip. Yeah. Well, what do you see? What do you see? Looks like a horse. But look at him. He's way out in front. El Romano. Yeah, maybe. Now, here's the way I add it up. This film tells a story, or everybody wouldn't be grubbing around for it. Well, now, that takes a big brain. So somebody's engineering a phony. Who? That's what you're going to find out. But I'll tell you one thing. That nag's insured by Banner Trust, and they pay off big if we can turn up the swindle. All right. Give me that picture. Where you going? Over to Grundy's to check the horse. Now you're talking, Regan. You dig that out, and we'll be eating squap. Yeah. And if you don't, you'll be collecting your unemployment insurance. Well, the payoff's about the same. I didn't like it any better than a fan dancer likes a wind tunnel. I'd already seen enough of Grundy and his boys for one night, but when the lion gets an idea, he's like a hangman with a new rope. So I went out to test it. I found Horace Grundy's place. It was a bright new house in the San Fernando Valley. There was some fancy fence in back and a stable looked like the paint was still wet where it said El Romano. A trailer was parked on the road with a truck from the veterinarians. When Grundy opened the front door, he looked like he'd been sitting a three-day wake, but without any beer. Hello, Regan. Well, what's the verdict? It's bad, Regan. Bad. Tendons torn. Never run. Never. Yeah, you said that. I can't believe it. Uh Uh-huh. I knew somebody else liked animals. A guy from Gower Gulch. Decided to talk? Maybe. If you keep your hands in the audience. What else did Crockett say? Now you got him on the wheel. All right, you drive. That's better. Do you know the horse is insured? Not by me, it isn't. You don't own it. You just paid a deposit. Sure, 50 G's. You got it back yet? There's plenty of time. Julia was in the hospital. Oh? Well, now, if it wasn't for the accident, you would have coughed up another 200,000. Yes. No. Oh, what difference does it make? The whole deal's a bust now. What if that horse is a phony? Say some more, Regan. I don't know much more. Davy Crockett was a movie fan. You're doing fine. You had pictures? I wouldn't advertise them, but there's a shot of a horse winning a race. Take a look here. Give me that. All right, it's economy size. You're going to ruin your eyesight. I got a magnifying glass for my income tax. Well, let's get a light behind it. Now, let me see. Horse. Right, you get a star. Four white feet. I can do that well myself. Listen, Regan. Horse in the stable's got three. That does it. My boss gets promoted. Come on. Come on outside. I'll show no, you. No, I'll take your word for it. Let go of me. I got my information. Max. Maxwell, where are you? I told you, don't whistle the bulldogs. You're in it now, Regan. You're on my side. I drop your blood pressure. There's a handkerchief on the play. Hey, wait. Wait. Hello. I look for somebody. Good morning. Pan America. See, si, see. Si. I'm Julio. Is Mr. Grundy? Uh, it's the guy with his mouth open there. How do you do? I'm so glad to meet him. Choke person. it. Okay? You switched horses. Mm, no, no, you'll not understand. El Romano, he kicked me. Wait for the encore. Mr. Grundy, with belief, I'm telling you... Now, look, you better make it fast, Julio. This guy goes Shut off. Shut up, Regan. A man trades a stretcher for a slab. Let him talk. Mm, oh, the hospital. I did not go. Julio is honest. A debt comes first. The interest's going up. When El Romano hurts himself, I know the deal is off. I know I must see the consul, so we cash the check. What? Here we are. 10,000, 20, 30, 40, 50. Your down payment is up. Now we are one big happy United Nations, no? Well, that's what happened. Now there were two guys with their mouths open. By the time we got him closed, the little gent from Peru had waddled off someplace, and Grundy folded his money and started to laugh. He was happy, and at least I had what I came for. Figured I could dump the whole plate of spaghetti on the lion. The lead horse in the travelogue was a different nag from the one in the stable. So I got in my car and headed for home. But I picked up a newspaper on the corner, and then the whole bucket turned upside down again. The green sheet was loaded with publicity shots of El Romano from South America. And he was exactly the same oat burner that came in on the plane, feet and all. No switch there. Well, if there was something phony in this act, it was that winner in that Fitzpatrick film. Well, for a minute I felt like a test pilot in a yo-yo factory, and then the string broke. I took a fast run to the lions and one more look at those movies. I had it. The case was beginning to wind. 
Ten minutes later, I was back on Gower Gulch. Yes? Who is this? Regan. You alone? Don't be insulting. I'll open the door. What's the matter? You're slow. What do you want? Ask me in. No. No, I... Ask me in. Regan, look out! Be careful, Regan. I have a gun. Well, Julio. Uh, Yes, Julio. Uh Uh-huh. What are you doing here? Well, I told you. I know. Back at my place, you're aiming at her, not me. She's been to Peru. She has the films. You knew that. You wish like I know it. I go to the movies like everybody else. I keep my eyes on the winner. After Hollywood Park, I should have known better. Yeah, there are lots of races. El Romano was a dud. He came in last. Sixty lengths with Davy Crockett digging in the spurs. You gave the nag a build-up, phony publicity to the sucker and insurance company. A quarter of a million I was over. Can it. You could have never closed a sail without Grundy watching a workout. That would have been a slow boat to China. You want to be a sailor, too? Oh, stop being tough, will you? You wore yourself out when you kicked up El Romano in that plane. It looked good. Yeah, not to me or Joan. Look out, Regan. You are asking for a daily double. Well, then I'm going to take it across the board. Give me that gun. Leave me alone. Robert, no, you're breaking my arm. That's the idea. I'll kick you in the stomach. Oh. Oh. He better go back to his stretcher. Well. Yeah. My, you can be useful. Well, when I'm working. What about after hours? I'm not bad, you know. No, I never noticed. Look again. No, I'm all through with the ponies. You want to bet? Davy Crockett told me to play my hunches. Here I am. Yeah, but you're a loser. What do you mean? You threw those holes into Davy. It was Julio. Oh, you're trying real hard, but he was on the plane. What do I do now? Well, you might bid a fond to do to Gower Gulch. That's not funny, Regan. I know it. But you ran out of film. Well, the whole thing blew up like a hoop skirt in a high wind. Julio had a real good thing until he ran into the little man with a good memory and a dame with a fast trigger finger. Her blackmail pitch was already set up, but Davy figured to queer it, so she had to knock him off. Well, the hospital boys came after Julio, and homicide dated Joan, the travel queen. The lion was pretty excited about the way things worked out. He figured that the insurance company would come across with some green stuff for exposing a fraud. They did. That was the color of the season pass they gave him to the Burton Holmes travel lectures. is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. It's CBS at the same time next week for more hard-boiled action and mystery with Jeff Regan, Investigator. Written by Larry Roman and Jackson Gillis, produced by Sterling Tracy. Included in tonight's cast were Leo Clary, Clayton Post, Devon Patey, Ed Bagley, and Herb Ellis. Twenty-nine thousand nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. Four thousand of them, if they wish, may choose active duty. All nurses who receive commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of a great advantage in her work. Don't wait. If you're a registered graduate nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, drop a card for complete information to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From New York City... The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1,036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. (laughs) 
This week's adventure, A Case of Identity. Well, here we are, as usual, about to pay our weekly respects to our favorite rock and tur, the good Dr. Watson. What about tonight's story, Doctor? Well, tonight I have prepared a little challenge for you and our radio friends. Yes, the story I'm going to tell is one of Holmes' more mental adventures. It has its bizarre moments, of course, but still, all in all, its solution is fairly obvious. As you know, Holmes was the world's greatest master of the science of deduction. As a matter of fact, he unraveled this particular problem without moving from his armchair. Hmm. I wonder how many of our listeners have learned enough of Holmes' methods to do the same. Well, I think I can make a fair stab at it, Doctor, if the clues aren't too involved, that is. Oh, no, no. All the clues are right out in plain sight, Mr. Harris. All you have to do is listen for them and make your own deductions. Oh, but uh, before we become too involved with hidden clues, uh, hadn't we better discuss a few clues to the secret of good grooming without straining the pocketbook? A good idea, Doctor. If you need a fine new suit for business or a good-looking sport jacket for weekend wear and really want your dollars to do double duty, here's how. Insist on Clipper Craft Clothes. Famous for stretching your dollars, for giving you positively amazing value, is the fine local independent store in your community that sells Clipper Craft. Despite rising costs of materials and manufacturing, you can still buy long-wearing, beautifully tailored Clipper Craft suits for only $40 to $47.50. Luxurious tropical worsteds for only $33.75 to $40. And smart sport jackets for only $26.50. It's the Clipper Craft plan and the Clipper Craft plan alone that makes Clipper Craft clothes possible at these low prices. Concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Providing steady year-round operation, reducing manufacturing and distribution costs. And the savings go to you. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, back to the adventure you think we should be able to solve for ourselves. Right, Mr. Harris. It was <clears throat> during the middle years of our joint occupancy of the lodgings in Baker Street. Holmes and I sat relaxed in two easy chairs on either side of the living, ro living room fire. Holmes' long legs stretched out in front of him. His head wreathed in the smoke from his favorite pipe, a, a horrible black, greasy old clay affair that he coddled as if it were a child. Well, we had just finished an excellent breakfast, and Holmes was in the philosophic mood that so often accompanies the process of digestion. Strange thing, life, eh, Watson? Infinitely stranger than anything the mind of man could invent. Yes, I know that's one of your pet theories, and I dare you to put it to the test. Now, take today's paper. If you, if you can find anything bizarre in that, I'll, I'll buy you a new smoking jacket. I don't want a new smoking jacket, Watson, but I'll take up your challenge. Choose any article, any paragraph at all on this page, and I'll guarantee to find something outlandish. Very well. Here, take the very first heading... Husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's a half column of print about that, but I know what it's about almost without reading it. There's the other woman, the drink, the push, the blow. <laughs> no writer could invent anything more crude or commonplace. Your example, Watson, happens to be rather unfortunate. The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the cruelty complained of was that he had the habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife which you'll allow is an action any literary man would hardly be able to make believable. Well, maybe so, but that's just an exception. Life is made up of exceptions, Watson. There's one now, standing on the pavement on the opposite side of the street. Well, you mean that large, hebe-like young woman with the enormous boa around her neck and the curling red feather in the hat? Yes. <laughs> well, look how she oscillates backward and forward. And the way she fidgets with her glove buttons. Oscillation on the pavement always means an affair de coeur. She would like advice, but it's not sure that the matter may not be too delicate for communication. Mm, she's de decided to take the plunge. Here she comes across the road like a swimmer leaving the bank. I say, perhaps she's been seriously wronged. No, Watson. In that case, the woman no longer oscillates. She pulls out the bell wire to the front door. You hear that, Watson? Decidedly fluttery. The maiden is not so much angry as perplexed and possibly grieved. Oh, but here she comes. Come in, come in. I hope I'm not intruding. Uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Yes. Won't you sit down? 
Uh, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Oh, delighted. My dear young lady, don't you find that with your short sight it's a little trying to do so much typewriting? Oh, I did it first, and that's a fact. But I've got so now I know where the letters are without look... Oh. oh, but how did you know? Someone's told you about me. Oh, don't look so alarmed, my dear. That's just a bit of detection. Mr. Holmes can tell things like that by looking at you. It's uh, his way of showing off. Oh, I, I see, but it did take me aback your knowing things like that. It's my business to know things. I knew you used the typewriter from the appearance of your fingertips and the double line pressed into the plush above your wrists. It was equally obvious that you're nearsighted from the marks left on either side of the nose by your pince-nez. So you see, my dear Miss, uh, Miss, uh... Uh, My name's Sutherland, uh, Mary Sutherland. So you see, my dear Miss Sutherland, there's nothing terrifying in my conclusions. Well, no, not when you explain it like that. And now, perhaps you'll tell me why you came away to consult me in such a hurry that you managed to put on two odd shoes. Why, bless my soul, so I did. The right one's my Sunday pair. Yes, you must have been rather agitated when you left home. Yes, I did bang out of the house, and who wouldn't? It made me fair angry to see the easy way Mr. Windybanks, oh, that's my father, took it all. He wouldn't go to the police. He just sat there and said there was no harm done and everything would come right in the end. So finally I got mad and told father I was coming to you myself. Uh, you say your father, but surely you mean your stepfather, since the name's not the same. Yes, he's my stepfather. Mother makes me call him father, though it sounds kind of funny, him being only five years and two months older than myself. I see. How recently did your mother marry this Mr. Windybanks? Oh, about two years ago it was, Mr. Holmes. And I'll admit I wasn't very pleased, seeing as it was so soon after father's death. And him, a man nearly 15 years younger than herself. Enough to start complications in any home. Eh, hey, Holmes? Quite. But uh, please continue, Miss Sutherland. I gather your father left your mother fairly well off. Yes, sir, he did. You see, father was a plumber in Tottenham Court Road. And he left a tidy business behind him. After he went, mother carried it on. Although I must say that William, oh, that is, uh, Mr. Hardy, father's foreman, did most of the work. And a good thing he made of it, too. This Mr. Hardy, was he your father's age? Oh, no, sir. He was just two years older than me. The fact is, we had a sort of an understanding till this year Mr. Windybanks came along. Oh, and he didn't approve of Mr. Hardy? Oh, it weren't that so much as that he didn't approve of the plumbing business. Said it wasn't high class. Oh. Uh, Mr. Windybanks is a very superior gentleman himself, Mr. Holmes. Travels in wines for West House and Marbank, the claret importers in 10 Church Street. Oh, a real tough he is. I see. Yes, sir. So, after him and mother got married, he made us sell the business. They got £4,700 for the goodwill and the interest. But Mr. Hardy said it was practically giving it away. And so, him and my stepfather had an argument. And my stepfather told Will to clear out and never darken his door again. Hmm, quite theatrical. Yes, my stepfather's like that. Well, Will says he's off to Birmingham. And will I come with him? And I says, well, I can't hardly be expected to leave me own mother. So then he gets mad and biffs off. Without giving you a chance to change your mind? Well, yes. And how is he doing in Birmingham? Very nicely, I hear. Got his own shop and all. Oh, not that I write to him. I wouldn't send him a word if I was dying, I wouldn't. Of course. Serves him right for not being more persuasive. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, but that's neither here nor there, Mr. Holmes. The fact is, I, I, I don't know why I even mentioned Will Hardy. Except that I'm so unset in my mind, my tongue kind of wags on by itself. Uh, oh, let's see here. Where was I? Your mother had just sold the plumbing business for something over 4000 You inherited part of that, I presume? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I've got my own money, outside of the plumbing business, that is. Oh? It was left to me by my Uncle Ned in Auckland. It's in New Zealand stock, paying me 4%. Gives me a hundred pounds a year, it does. Then the capital amounts to around two thousand five hundred pounds. Yes, sir. But I can't touch that. Just the income. Hmm, quite a tidy little amount. I believe a single lady can do very nicely on sixty pounds a year. Oh, I could do on even less than that, Mr. Holmes. I'm a good one at managing things. But so long as I live at home, I don't want to be a burden to them, so I let them have the use of it while I'm staying there. You mean you give the money to Mr. Windybanks? Oh, no, Mr. Holmes. I draws it out every quarter and pays it over to my mother. That's very generous of you, Miss Sutherland. Oh, it's no hardship. I, I do pretty well with what I earn at typewriting. Makes me quite self-supporting, as you might say. Yes, these independent, modern young women. Soon they'll be competing with men in business. Oh, no, sir. I'm sure I wouldn't presume to be as bold as that. Hmm. 
Well, to resume, we find you are a young lady very comfortably fixed. Well, I, I'm not exactly rich, Mr. Holmes, but I'd give all I have to know what's become of Mr. Hosmer Angel. Hosmer Angel, eh? Quite a romantic name. Oh, yes. And he was romantic, Mr. Holmes. Recited Browning, he did. Sounds quite devoted. Oh, yes, sir, he was. I could swear he was. And now he's gone, too. Disappeared like into thin air. And naturally, I'm, I'm anxious about him. Being as it's the second time I've been left in the lurch, as you might say. I, well, I, I feel a bit sensitive about it. Of course. Had you quarreled? Oh, no, sir. We was as affectionate as two cooing doves. Mother said it used to make her quite sick to watch us. Oh, oh not that she wasn't all for Hosmer. That she was. Help me to keep it from father and all. Oh, then your father didn't know about this new admirer. No, sir. That is, not until later. And then he never really saw him. Hmm. And how did you first meet this Mr. Hosmer Angel? Uh, well, Mr. Holmes, I, I... I met him at the gas fitter's ball. How romantic. Oh, yes, sir, it was. The gas fitters used to send father tickets while he was alive. And afterwards, they kept on sending them to me and mother. Mr. Windybanks didn't wish us to go. He never did wish us to go anywhere. If I so much as wanted to go to a Sunday school treat, he would get quite mad about it. Rather unreasonable. Yes, sir. Well, it happened that the week of the ball, he had to go to France on business. So he wasn't there to make a scene when Mother and me went. <gasps> it was a lovely ball, Mr. Holmes. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It, it was there I met Hosma. He was a lovely dancer. You should have seen him do the polka. Swept you quite off your feet, I've no doubt. Yes, sir. Well, he called next day to see if Mother and I had got home safe the night before. And after that, I went out once or twice for walks with him. And, and things was going along as smooth as you could wish. And then Father came home and Hosma couldn't come to the house anymore. No? No, sir. Father didn't like me to have young men come to the house. Said it didn't look well for a young girl to have followers. Hmm, rather a tyrant, eh? Oh, yes, sir. But pretty soon, he had to go off to France again for a couple of weeks. So I started walking out with Hosma again. And this Hosma made no attempts to see you in the meantime? No, sir. I wanted to, but Mother said she didn't think it was safe. Oh, he wrote to me every day, Hosmer did. Oh, here, I, I, I brought the letters. I thought they might give you a clue. Quite right. We'll look them over later. Am I to take it that you and Mr. Angel had um, an understanding? Yes, sir. We were engaged after the first walk we took together. The first worker, eh, Holmes? And Watson, don't interrupt. What was Mr. Angel's business, Miss Sutherland? Uh, he was a cashier in an office in Leadenhall Street. What office? Oh, that's the worst of it, Mr. Holmes. I don't know. Where did he live, then? Oh, he slept on the premises. And you don't know his address? No, sir. Except that it was Leadenhall Street. Where did you address your letters? Uh, Leadenhall Street Post Office, to be left till called for. He said if they was to come to the office, he'd be ragged by the other clerks. <laughs> I offered to typewrite them like he did his, but he wouldn't have that said that when I wrote them myself, it seemed like there was something of me in them. That'll show you how fond he was of me, Mr. Holmes. He was always thinking of little things like that. Yes, quite suggestive. Can you remember any other little things about Mr. Hosmer Angel? Any little peculiarities? He was a very shy man, Mr. Holmes. He'd rather walk with me in the evening than in the daylight. Because he said he liked to hold my hand. But he didn't want to be conspicuous. Very considerate and gentlemanly. Oh, yes, sir. He was a thorough gentleman with the silkiest brown beard. Even his voice was soft-like. He told me he'd had quinsy and swollen glands when he was young, and it left him with a weak throat. How unfortunate. Yes, sir. His eyes were kind of weak, too, like mine, and he wore tinted glasses against the glare. I tell you, he was about five foot five and had small hands and feet. I see. And what happened when Mr. Windybanks, your stepfather, returned to France? Well, I wrote Hosmer and he came round to the house. And he said I'd have to marry him before father came back, as he couldn't stand the separation any longer. So I asked mother and she said, why not? Every girl was entitled to her own husband. Oh, well, mother was all for Hosmer from the beginning, almost more than I was myself. So you got married? Well, no. Well, that is... Not quite. Oh, what happened? Well, the wedding was set for yesterday morning. We thought it best to make it a quiet ceremony. It was to be at St. Saviour's Church with a wedding breakfast afterwards at the St. Pancras Hotel. Well, about nine o'clock, Mother and me was all dressed and waiting for Hosmer. I, I was a bit upset, I guess. You know how a bride feels, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I'm that nervous.
nervous. I, I don't know whether I ought to get married or not. Don't you fret, Mary. All brides is like that. Why, when I was married to your father, I was so jumpy, I split both me gloves. Oh, I know, but I hadn't known Hosmer very long, Mother. Maybe I oughtn't to jump off the deep end like this. What's the good of waiting, Mary? Better get married now before your father gets back. Yes, I, I suppose so. Oh, dear me, I, I wish my shoes wasn't so tight. Shh, here comes Hosmer now. Don't he look handsome with that flower in his buttonhole and all? No, you stay here, Mary. I'll answer it. A bride should act shy-like on a wedding day. Good morning, Osma. As the groom. Good morning, uh, mother. Oh, I'm fine. Uh, hello, Mary. <laughs> hello, Osma. What's the matter? You look kind of white. Oh, I, I, I'm all right. How are you? Oh, I, I, I'm all right, too, Osma. Well, we... We'd better be shoving off. I got a handsome waiting outside. Oh, but Hosmer, it's such a little way, and handsome's is expensive. Oh, you don't think that any bride of mine is going to walk on her wedding day? Now, who can that be? Hosmer, you're as full of jumps as a kangaroo. Now I'll go. What is it? <gasps> telegram? Oh, thank you. It's a telegram. M maybe somebody's died. I'm almost afraid to look. But here, let me. I'm uh, used to these things. Expect me home today. Erasmus G. Windybanks. Father! Father's coming home. What if he gets here before... No, <laughs> don't lose your nerve. You're of age, remember, so it don't matter how he raves afterwards. Oh, Mary, promise you won't let him uh, tear us apart. No, no. Swear it, Mary. Now, where's the Bible? Mary's carrying mine, the one I got married with. Both times. All right. Now, put your left hand on that Bible and swear that whatever happens, you will always be true to me and to me only. But, but what could happen? Oh, you never know. Now, swear it, Mary, for my sake. Swear it. Yes, Mary. Why not do as Osmer asks? All right. I, I, I swear. Oh, good. Now then, let's get on with it. Yes, Osmer. Oh, dear. Is my bonnet on straight? Yes, yes. Only hurry. Mr. Windybanks may get back any minute. Mary, don't forget your flowers. No, Mother. Well, hurry, hurry. Now, here's the cab. You first, uh, Mother. Now, easy, don't upset the cab. Now, Mary, that's right. Aren't you coming too, Hosmer? Uh, no, there isn't room. I'd must your dress. Uh, I I'll hail another cab. Oh, yes, there's a four-wheeler now. Hey, cabby! Now, you go on. I'll follow after. See you at the church, Hosmer. Uh, St. Saviour's driver. Yes, Osma got the other cab. It's falling us. Oh, my, my knees are knocking together like anything. Now, hush up, Mary. Anyone would think you didn't want to get married. Well, maybe I do. Maybe I do. Well, just hold your breath and it'll be over in no time now. Here's the church. You get out first and mind your dress. That's it. Now, now, help me. Here, not so fast. I'm no blinking acrobat. That's it. Be off, cabby. Oh, here comes Hosmer's four-wheeler now. Yes, she saviors like yes, but... What? Why doesn't he get out? Give him time. Maybe his knees is shaky, too. Come on, sir. What ails the man? Mother! Something's wrong with Hosmer. Oh, stuff. I I'm going to see. Wake up there. I I'll speak to him, Cabby. I what? The cab's empty. What? Something's happened to Hosmer. He's gone and left me waiting at the church. <laughs> Every day is value day when you insist on clothes by Clippercraft. Yes, we have to know our values are really great when we suggest you compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for very much more, which is exactly what we do suggest. Because there's a great big idea behind Clippercraft clothes in the form of the famous Clippercraft plan. You get the benefit of great savings made by concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Yes, the Clipper Craft Plan really streamlines the fine old craft of clothes making. When you can get such remarkably fine quality in suits for only forty to forty-seven fifty, 
in tropical worsteds for only $33.75 to $40, and in sport jackets for only $26.50, why pay more? For selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Baker Street, where we find Dr. Watson commiserating with the young lady who has been left waiting at the church. A shameful way for any gentleman to act, deserting his bride at the altar. Oh, no, Dr. Watson, I'm sure he didn't do that. Not on purpose, that is. He was too kind for that. And then there's that pledge I gave him. Oh, you think he foresaw some unforeseen danger, and that's why he made you take the oath? Yes, sir. Have you any notion what it could have been? No, sir. How did your father take it? I presume he found out. Oh, yes, sir. He was quite consoling, really. Remarkable. Oh, it drives me half mad to think of it, Mr. Holmes. It's not as if it was the first time I'd been disappointed. I understand. I shall be delighted to glance into the matter for you, Miss Sutherland. Now, let me advise you to turn the whole matter over to me and don't let your mind dwell on it any further. Above all, try to let Mr. Hosmer Angel vanish from your memory as he's done from your life. Then you, you, you don't think I'll ever see him again? I'm afraid not. Oh, dearie me. <laughs> You've been very kind, Mr. Holmes, I'm sure. I, I don't know how to thank you. Not at all, Miss Sutherland. Well, good day, gentlemen. Oh, where's my hanky? Oh, here it is. Oh, dearie me. Another romance blighted. <laughs> Holmes, what a horrid mess of bottles and test tubes. Yeah, that smells of hydrochloric acid. Marvellous, my dear Watson, marvellous. I don't believe you've budged out of this room since that poor young lady left early this morning. No, it wasn't necessary. Then you've solved it? Certainly. It was bisulfate of baritone. No, I mean the mystery of the disappearing bridegroom. Oh, that. There never was any mystery in that affair, Watson. Pretty self-evident, don't you think? Oh, no, can't say I do. Oh, really? But I let you look at Mr. Hosmer's love letters. But they were typewritten, even to the signature. Yes, that's what's really suggestive. Now, what's that? Mr. Windybanks, I fancy. Well, you mean the girl's father, uh, stepfather? Quite. I sent off a note to him this morning to his place of business. But I must say, who? And you... this afternoon, I received this business-like reply on West House and Marbank stationery, saying he'd be here at six o'clock. Come in, come in. Ah, Mr. Windybanks? Yes, Mr. Holmes. This typewritten note was from you, on which you set the time for this appointment at six o'clock? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, I'm afraid I'm a trifle late. It's about Miss Sutherland's missing suitor, eh? Quite. Uh, I'm sorry she's troubled you, Mr. Holmes. But you know what young girls are. Besides, it's a useless expense. Because how in the name of this and that can you expect to locate Hosmer Angel? Uh, pardon me if I disagree with you, Mr. Windybanks, but I have every reason to believe that I have located Mr. Hosmer Angel. Uh, uh oh. Ah, delighted, Mr. Holmes, delighted. Yes. I wonder if anyone's ever told you that a typewriter has really quite as much individuality as a man's handwriting. Oh, you don't say. Oh, but I most emphatically do. Every typewriter develops its own little idiosyncrasies. Now, this note of yours, Mr. Windybanks, you'll notice that all the E's are slightly slurred and there's a slight defect in the tail of the R. Yes, yes, I never noticed it before. Hmm, obviously. Now, I have here four letters which purport to come from the missing man. In all of them, the E's are slurred and the R's tailless. Well, uh, I didn't come here to waste time with fantastic talk like this. If you're going to catch the man, catch him. And let me know when you succeed. Certainly. Watson, be good enough to lock the door. With pleasure. Now then, Mr. Windybanks, I have caught Mr. Hosmer Angel. Because you yourself are that gentleman. But I... Well, well, what if I am? 
I didn't marry the girl, did I? It's, uh, it's not actionable. No, your conduct is even worse than that. It's dishonorable and degrading. In the first place, you're the sort of scoundrel who marries an older woman for her money. Not satisfied, you want to assure yourself of the daughter's income, which you'll lose if she marries. You make her break off with her first sweetheart. And when you see it's going to be impossible to keep others from falling in love with her, you arrange to do so yourself. Well, it, well, it was only a joke at first. I failed to see any humor in it. Well, I, I didn't know she'd fall for me like that, did I? You made the girl swear she'd be true and wait for you. And then you played the cad and disappeared. Well, maybe so, or maybe not. But I'm not breaking any laws. And as long as you keep that door locked... Quite so. Should you care to call a policeman? There's one in the street below. I'm sure your employer, Mr. Merrill Marbanks, who, by the way, is an old friend of mine, will be very interested in your little joke. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Holmes. You, you couldn't tell him. I, I'd lose my job and my, my, my social standing. Quite so. I'll keep quiet on one condition. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Anything at all. You are not to discourage any more of Miss Mary's suitors, past, present, or future. Oh, oh, no, Mr. Holmes, I wouldn't think of it. It was all just a little game, you see. Yes. Well, the game's over. Watson, you may show the gentleman out. Right. Now then. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, good day, gentlemen. I hope you won't hold any hard feelings, Mr. Holmes. And if you ever... Come need... along, no loitering, or I'll boot you downstairs. I'm a good man to do it anyway. Well, I'm going, I'm going. You filthy blackguard. I see, but I... I still don't see how you spotted the man. That typewritten letter, Watson, particularly the signature. Obviously, the man wanted to disguise his handwriting, which would have been familiar to the girl. Well, whose handwriting would have been familiar to her? Answer, the father's, as he was the only man she was allowed to come in contact with. Well, it's really quite simple when you explain it. Oh, by the way, are, are you going to tell the girl? I? <laughs> no, heaven forbid. I shall let Mr. Will Hardy of Birmingham have that privilege. I wrote him the facts of the case this morning. No, he'll be able to persuade her to believe it. I never could. Holmes, you're a moral coward. Perhaps, Watson. You remember the old Persian saying, There's danger for him who taketh the cub of the tiger, and danger also for whoso snatches a delusion from a woman. Now then, Mr. Harris, did you guess the solution? Well, when Holmes began to talk about typewriters, I started to have an inkling, Doctor. But before that, I'll admit I was pretty much at sea. Why, Mr. Harris, I'm surprised. And after all my teaching... <laughs> well, how about giving us a hint about next week's story, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Harris. Uh, next week, I think I'll tell you about a particularly complicated case of violent and untimely death that Holmes and I ran across on what started out to be... An uneventful excursion up the Thames. I call it the complicated poisoning on Eel Pie Island. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Complicated Poisoning on Eel Pie Island. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the network for the Indianapolis Speedway races on Monday, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Evening, Francis. You look like you're going out. Yes, sir. 
Miss Asher wants me to go down to the delicatessen for some cold cuts. Oh, where is Miss Asher? In the study, sir. Well, I'll see you later, Francis. Why don't you bring back some roll mop? Roll mop, sir? Herring with the bends. Very toothy. Uh, yes, sir. Ali Ali Oxen free. Red. Hi. Hi. Well, get the silk thing there. Lounging pajamas. Yeah. I guess we're going to stay in, huh? Uh huh. I just sent Francis out for some food. I uh, met him at the door. Look, I've got to do a few things in the kitchen. Why don't you stretch out on the couch and take it easy until dinner's ready? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm pretty tired. Might rock out. No, a little sleep might do you some good. Here, read a magazine if you want to stay awake. Hmm? Oh, swell. Gory detective. Who sends you these things? The corpse of the month? Mm-hmm. Pretty bad. I won't be long. Okay. Oh, no. The case of the bloody... Oh! <sighs> it was going on 11 o'clock, and the fog encircled the old house like a thin, wet blanket. Oh, swell. The figure of a man crept stealthily across the gravel of the garden path. Oh, these riders really dream it up. Hmm? Hmm? Miss Diamond? What? How did you get in here? I followed you from your office. Shh! You left the door unlocked when you came in. Well, now, look. I know I shouldn't have come into someone else's house, but, but this is a matter of life and death. Hey, stop pulling down the blinds. I don't want anyone to see us talking. Well, you're on the eighth floor. Who's chasing you? A herd of monkeys? Please. Please, you must listen. Now, look, if you got troubles, come to my office in the morning. Tomorrow morning may be too late. I'm supposed to die tonight. Try, try breathing. You expand your chest, take a lung full of air. No, no, I... Yes, it does wonders, keeps you around for days. You better get out of here. Please, Mr. Diamond, don't give me away. Please. Uh, yeah, baby, uh, wait a minute. I'm talking at the desk. Oh, bless you, Mr. Diamond. Yes. I thought I heard you talking to someone. Talking? Oh, no, no. Must have been reading out loud. This is swell literature. Hmm. The case of the grizzly ghost, oh. I like to keep up on the exploits of a private detective. You don't tell me anything about your cases. Oh, I'm modest. Hey, you got your coat on. Where are you going? Oh, Francis just called. He's had a flat tire. I'm going to pick him up in the other car. Uh, don't you want me to do it? Oh, I'm not going to let you out of this house. I'll be right back. Okay. Read the grizzly ghost. It's not bad. Bye, baby. Bye. Okay, Spider-Man, you can come out now. Oh, thank you. Now, what the devil's going on? I told you my life's in danger. I need help. Tell me about it. I haven't time now. Come to this address in about an hour. My name's Leeds. Leland L. Leeds. Oh, for Pete's sake. I must get back before they miss me. I don't want them to know I got out. Say I called you and told you to come over. Here's the address on this card. Please don't fail me, Mr. Diamond. Now, wait a minute. My fee's a hundred a day in expenses. Of course, of course. I'll have a check for you. Goodbye. <laughs> He went out like an undertaker stealing a can of embalming fluid. And I poured myself something just about as strong. Helen would scalp me for leaving, but for some reason, nutty little guys like that interest me. I left Helen the note saying I'd be back later and took off to the address Leland L. Leeds had given me. It was out of town about ten miles, but after hunting around for a while and running up a good-sized taxi fare, I finally found the house. Yes? Uh, uh, yes. I, I, uh, I got a call from a Mr. Leeds at this address. He asked me to come over. My brother? I don't know. Well, it couldn't have been. He's very sick. He's upstairs sleeping. Well, he was just coasting off to Dreamland when he called me. I, uh, I think you'd better let me in. Oh, a detective. All right. Just, uh, what did my brother tell you, Mr.? Uh, Diamond. He said his life was in danger. I'm Nina Leeds. I think you'd better come into the living room, Mr. Diamond. Dr. Miller can explain things better than I can. Sure. Roger? Mm -hmm. This is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Oh. Lee just called him. This is Dr. Miller, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Doctor. How do you do? Are you from the police? No, no. Private stuff. Oh, I see. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you made a trip for nothing. Oh, here are the drinks. Uh... Oh. George, uh, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. What? Mr. Diamond, this is George Brodine. How are you? Well, fine, thank you. Anything wrong? I don't know. Lee phoned Mr. Diamond and told him he was in danger. How did you know that, Doctor? I told Miss Leeds what he said, but not you. I'm Mr. Leeds' doctor. He's having a nervous breakdown and suffers from an extreme persecution complex. 
If he called a detective, I'm sure he must have said something like that. That's quite correct, Mr. Diamond. What do you do, Mr. Brodeen? Why, I'm with the New York Museum. I'm a friend of the family. I've been watching Lee break up for the past month. Mm Mm-hmm. May I talk to your brother, Miss Lee? I don't think you can. I gave him a very strong sedative. Let me get you a drink, Mr. Diamond. When Lee wakes up, you can talk to him. Sure. We went into the bar and she got out a big bottle and two glasses. I forgot all about Leland L. Leeds for a while and started uh, concentrating on his lovely sister. It was easy. Champagne? Uh, sure, but I've run out of slippers. I've got a small foot. Might take you a long time to get a nut. I drink fast. It's the open toes that bother me. I like the patter. Where'd you come from? Same place you did, lover. Experience Alley. What do people call you after they get to know you better? Oh, different things at different times. For now, you can call me Rick. And later? Oh, you'll think of something easier. It's like that when you haven't got much time to talk. Here's to later, Rick. Uh, yeah. What does a doctor specialize in? Roger's a brain specialist. Mental disorders, mostly. (coughs) It's Lee. He's off again. (coughs) Maybe he's been listening to Sam Spade. Come on. You'd better stay down here, Nina. I'll take care of it. I'm going up. Lee needs me. Uh, George, get my baggage in the hall. Right. You'd better not come in, Mr. Diamond. I think I'd better. (coughs) Nina! Nina! Lee, what is it? I saw the blood again. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm glad you came. Now, calm down, Lee. Everything's going to be all right. Get away from me. He thinks I'm insane. You all do. You want my idol and you stop at nothing. Now, there's no sense in this much self-indulgence. Uh, here's not... your bag, Roger. Thanks. What are you going to do? Just give you something to make you sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'll wake up and see the blood again. There's no blood. It's just your imagination. You're overwrought. You think I'm crazy. But I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. Now, this won't hurt. No, I... I, I don't want to sleep. Please, Mr. Diamond, help me. Lee, do what Roger tells you for my sake. Come on, come on, come on. The injection should take away. I'll get up. Just a minute. I, I, I won't go to sleep. Lee, please. Then leave Mr. Diamond with me. I want to talk to him. Well, I guess it'll be all right. Don't stay too long, Mr. Diamond. I want him to rest. Okay, Doctor. Remember, he's not at all rational. Come on, Nina. I'll see you downstairs, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's the idea, Leeds? I'm locking the door. I don't want anyone coming in. Pardon me for walking around in circles. I've got to stay awake. Uh Uh-huh. Those people downstairs are trying to drive me crazy. They must have been working overtime. They're after my idol. Your what? My idol. That carved image standing on the night table. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Here. Here, look at it. Look at it. Well, that's dandy. How many box tops did you have to save? Mr. Diamond, at this moment, you are holding $100,000 in your hand. I am? Last month, my grandfather passed on and left his entire estate to my sister and me. Among the effects was that idol. It was left to me. What is it? Platinum? Oh, no. No, Mr. Diamond. That is the lost idol of King Tut. I always wondered what happened to it. Oh. Oh, then you know the legend. Well, uh, I'm a little, little hazy on it. Maybe you'd better bring me up to date. Oh, of course, of course. It was supposed to have been buried with King Tut. However, the story goes that a slave absconded with it before they sealed the tomb. And that makes it worth 100000 I guess so. Uh, you guess. You don't know? I only know what my grandfather told me before he passed on. He told me its value and said there was a curse on it. Uh, what does it say? Crime doesn't pay? Well, Mr. Diamond, it seems that on the first night of the new moon, after one has gained possession of the idol, he will die. Next week, Tom Swift and his electric grandmother. You don't believe me. Oh, sure. No, you don't. You're just like the rest. But it may interest you, Mr. Diamond, to know that one month after the idol was uncovered and my grandfather gained possession, he died. It was a new moon. How old was he? Seventy-four. Oh, well, that couldn't be it. Now relax and tell me why you came to me. What about your fee? Oh, forget it. You can just buy me a broom to ride around on. Good night, Mr. Leeds. Remember, Mr. Diamond, it's a new moon. You don't have much time. Oh, brother... Did you talk to her, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you might call it that. Now do you understand? Your point's well taken, Doctor. What about that hunk of stone? Maybe if you gave him a teddy bear? Oh, the idol he's got is absolutely worthless. His grandfather had the same unusual ideas about it. Is there such an idol? Well, there's a legend, but no one has ever found even the slightest clue that it's a fact. Now, I've examined Lee's idol, and it's certainly not worth more, oh, any more than the granite it's carved from. Hmm. Well, I'll be saying good night. I hope he gets better. Can I get you another drink, Mr. Diamond? You certainly deserve something for your trouble. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, goodbye, Doctor. Mr. Rodin. Thanks, Miss Leeds. 
I wish I could make this up to you. I'll uh, take a rain check. It'll be raining a lot this month. Uh, yeah. Well, good night, Miss Leeds. Good night. I went out and got a cab. As far as I was concerned, the frightened little man in the nightshirt was going to end up modeling straitjackets, and a private detective would only add to the confusion. It was 8 o'clock, and I told the cabbie to take me to 975 Park Avenue. Helen would be angry, but it was worth going back to. A couple of hours with her could make a guy as contented as a bear that had just cornered the honey market. We pulled up in front of Helen's apartment, and I paid the cabbie. I was just going in when a small convertible skidded to a stop in front of the building. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond! It was Leland L. Leeds again, and you could still see part of the nightshirt under his top coat. He leaned out of the car window and called. Over here, Mr. Diamond. Please, I must talk with you again. I'd had enough of the jumpy little man with the idol, so I started into the apartment without answering. He called again, climbed out of the car, and started to cross the street toward me. I looked back just in time to see the other car swing in toward me. back into the street and looked after the disappearing car. The lights were off and I couldn't get the license number. It was too far away. I leaned down with the little man in the nightshirt. He was pretty far away, too. He was dying and hurt. Mr. Diamond? Yes, Leeds? Take the idol. When you left, I... I found out why it was worth all that money. They... They didn't want me to tell you so. So they... They followed me and... And ran me, ran me down. It's... It's in my coat pocket. He died lying on his back in the street. Several people were coming out of the building, so I reached into his pocket and pulled out a chamois bag. I guess the idol was inside, so I put it in my coat and went in to call the police. Mr. Diamond, Miss Asher's been worried. Hello, Francis. Tell her I'm back and let me use the phone. Certainly, sir. She's upstairs. Is something wrong, sir? You look worried. Man got hit by a car. I've got to call the police. Oh, my goodness. Is he hurt badly? Bad enough to get buried. Oh, my goodness. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to Lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's the Beaver Boys. Now put the Lieutenant on the phone. And what do you do with all those tired jokes? You can't keep using them. I give them away to idiots. Want to start a collection? No. Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, this is Diamond. I got a body for you. I go off duty in 20 minutes. Call back then. Lying out in front of Helen's apartment, 975 Park. Rick, my stomach is bothering me. Why can't you be a good boy and stay out of trouble? Take some soda and get over here. Take some soda? Every time you call, I end up taking enough to give an elephant the hiccups. Well, you're a fine one. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. I didn't know you were on the phone. Uh, Wait a minute, Walt. Hello, baby. I'm talking to the lieutenant. Hmm. Aren't you afraid you'll catch cold in that thing? I'm mad at you. Oh, you're cute. Hey, what's going on? Uh, Just Helen. If you could see her, your ulcers would start popping like chestnuts. Uh, Say hello. Uh, uh, The law sends you his greetings. Hello to the law. Uh, She says... I know. I heard it. Now, what about the stiff? His name's Leland L. Leeds. He got belted by a car. It was too far away to get the number. What makes you think it's a job for homicide? Get over here and Helen will give you the story. I've got some work to do. But uh, wait a minute, Rick. Oh, you're getting lazy. What's the matter? Don't you want to find out things for yourself? Rick, what happened? Francis told me some man got hit by a car. Right on your doorstep. Oh. Let's go into the other room, baby. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> We went into the warm study and Helen poured me a tall drink. I briefed her on what had happened earlier in the evening and she sat down next to me. There's something about red hair that does things to me. It smelled fresh and clean and with her that close, I could have been sitting in the middle of the Arctic and still kept my temperature above 102. Rick, do you have to go back out there? Well, somebody's got to tell his sister and in a way, I feel a little responsible. Are you going to give her the idol? Hmm? The idol. The thing you took from poor Mr. Leeds' coat. You could at least show me what I'm playing second fiddle to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I nearly forgot about it. Oh, here it is in the chamois bag. Oh, 
What an ugly little thing. And that's supposed to be worth all that money? Well, that was what leads, uh... Hey, something's missing. Yeah, one of the eyes. Must have come loose when the car hit him. Probably in the bag. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Rick! Yeah. Well, it was painted over. You'd never guess it unless you pried it loose. Why, it's as big as a marble. Is it real? Well, you've got enough of them around, you tell me. It is. Rick, I think it's a pigeon blood. Why, it's worth a fortune. What are you doing? I'm scratching the other one. Well, Mr. Leeds wasn't so squirrely after all. This is ridiculous. You only read about things like this. Two pigeon blood rubies. No wonder he thought it was worth $100,000. He said he found out tonight. He must have been scratching at them. Oh, then it wasn't just a hit and run. I don't know. Baby, I don't want to get hung up with a lot of explanations to Walt. Rick, what are you doing? Taking the other eye out. There. Now, now here. Hang on to these and don't let them get out of your little hot hand. When Walt gets up here, tell him what I've told you. Well, will you be back? An hour ago, I laughed at a little guy when he told me he was going to die. He said it was a full moon and he had a curse on him. I'm still a skeptic, but I'm a new boy when it comes to voodoo. I've got to hurry over there before the whole bunch of them turn into bats. <laughs> I went down in the service elevator and out on the street. The wagon was driving off with Leeds, and Walt and Otis were going into the building when I slipped up to the convertible and got in. Leeds had left the keys in the ignition like I figured, so I took off and headed across town. Twenty minutes later, on a lonely stretch of road, I started counting suspects. All three of them could be in on it. Dr. Miller, who said Leeds was insane. George Brodine, a man from the museum who said the idol was worthless. And that lovely sister... I didn't notice the car pulling up behind me until it was too late. It was doing a good 70, and as it swung around to pass me, the guy at the wheel cut in sharp and hit me broadside. Hey, look out! I went through a white fence and over an embankment. The car rolled, and somebody dropped the night on my head. I went to sleep. I don't know how long it was before I started coming around, but when I tried to shake myself back, it was like pulling my head out of a barrel of molasses. It stuck to my eyes and plugged up my ears. I tried to claw the stickiness away, but my hands were like two baseballs. I moved my shoulders and felt the stiffness in my back. It spread out to my hands and down to my feet. I opened my mouth and took in a lot of air. I finally made it. Someone was trying to get me from the highway, so I pulled myself clear of the wreck and started moving in a circle, keeping whoever it was at a good distance. I was too pushed around to put up a fight, so I made it back to the highway and walked along until I found a little gas station on the road. The joint ain't open. And then your lock's busted. No, it ain't. Then I floated through the wall. Where's your phone? It ain't for public use. Try isn't. Okay, wise guy, the joint isn't open. The phone isn't for public use, and you isn't so big you can't get tossed out on your face. And you isn't so wealthy, five bucks won't make a difference. Oh, why didn't you say so? Phone's on a wall. Thanks. You know the Leeds family? Yeah, they get gas here sometimes. Hello, Evergreen 34369 operator. How far is the house from here? I'm a little turned around. About a half a mile. Hello, Francis. Is Lieutenant Levinson still there? No? Well, just tell him to get out to 19319 Jackson Heights Boulevard. I've got a killer for him. Yeah, oh my goodness. Now hurry it up. You a cop? Shamus. What do you take for the use of your car for an hour? My wife would kill me. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. He gave me a lift in his old sedan, and ten minutes later I was ringing the doorbell to the Leeds house. I was glad the girl answered. She made me feel better right away. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Oh, thank you. Where are your friends? Raj and George. They went out to look for my brother. He disappeared right after you left. I'm terribly worried. Oh, uh, have you got that drink? I could use it now. Certainly. I don't know why Lee ran off like that. He shouldn't have been driving in his condition. Were Roger and George together when they left to look for Lee? No, they took separate cars. Why? Has something happened, Mr. Diamond? Have you heard from my brother? I guess I'd better give it to you straight. 
Your brother's dead, Miss Leeds. I'm sorry. Dead? Oh, no. He was hit by a car. It's all because of that horrible idol. That stupid, horrible idol. If my grandfather hadn't told Lee it was worth that much money, this never would have happened. Did you think it was worth anything? No, of course not. But we couldn't convince Lee. Now he's dead. (laughs) Would you please answer that, Mr. Diamond? Sure. You take it easy. (laughs) Nina, I... Oh, what are you doing here, Diamond? Did you find Lee? Why, no, no, I didn't. I've gone to every place I thought he could possibly be. I even looked up your address one over there, but the building was closed. You better go in and see Miss Leeds, Doc. She's pretty upset. Upset? Lena, what's wrong? Oh, Raj, it's Lee. He's been killed. What? That's right. But how did it happen? Bingo. I'll tell you as soon as I let Mr. Brodine in. There, there, Lena. Just let yourself out. Do you do? Come in, Mr. Brodine. Well, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I think I'd better have a sign made. The doctor and Miss Leeds are in the living room. Has something happened? Mr. Leeds is dead. What? This is the most surprised household I've ever run into. Roger, is this true? I guess so. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Nina. Is there anything I can do? No. No, thank you. Where did this happen, Mr. Diamond? In front of 975 Park Avenue. Car hit him. I was with him when he died. Oh, this is terrible. I thought at first it was an accident, but I'm not sure. What do you mean? When I left to come out here, someone ran me off the road, nearly killed me. Who would want to kill Lee and then try to kill you? (laughs) Probably a coincidence. Certainly, certainly. Probably just a drunk. Could have been. Lee gave me this before he died. A chamois bag. What's in it? The idol. Oh, that awful thing. What do you want done with it, Miss Leeds? I don't care. Just get it out of this house. What are you going to do? I don't know. You want the thing, Doctor? Why, what for? That's a good question. How about you, Brodine? You want it? Oh, well, what would I want a worthless piece of stone for? Well, as long as no one wants it, may I use this fire poker, Miss Leeds? What are you going to do with it? The idol is worthless. It's caused a lot of trouble for you and your family. I'm going to break it up. No! Give me that, George! Well, Brodine, you're sure getting grabby. All right, now all of you stay right where you are. Well, for a museum collector, that's a pretty modern gun. Yes, and I know how to use it. George! This is the hokiest case I've ever been on. Even the dialogue's bad. I suppose you think you're pretty clever making me show my hand like that. I read Gory Detective. I found that the idol was really worth all that money, but I had to make the killer tip himself. You did. Mr. Diamond, do you mean my brother was really right all along? In a way, yes. He believed what his grandfather told him. But it wasn't until tonight when he scratched one of the eyes of the idol that he knew for sure. Scratched one of the eyes? That's right. Pigeon blood rubies, painted over. Now I'm leaving you. That's good, but you're minus something. Minus what? A couple of rubies. I took them out of the idol. You're lying. Take a look at the bag. What? They're gone. I'll kill you for this. Give me the gun, George. Look out. He's going to shoot. Give me the gun. All right, everyone. This is the police. Shot Diamond, all right, Lieutenant. Put the bracelets on him, Otis. Sure. Come here, you. Not him. Put him on Diamond for disturbing the peace. Pin the medal on the other guy. No, no, no. Sure no. thing. How do you like that, wise guy? <laughs> oh, no. Rick? Oh, I'm dying. Ricky? Oh. Rick, wake up. Uh, 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 all right, all right, George, drop the gun. Rick, you've been dreaming. Mm-hmm. Oh, hello. Oh, you were having a big, fat nightmare. Oh. I came down from upstairs and you were asleep on the couch with gory detectives. Oh, well, well, I started reading some story and I got mixed up with the Egyptian idols and the rubies. I got shot. That's the case of the ruby eyes. That was the craziest dream. I solved the crime and got shot six times for my trouble. Lieutenant Levinson and Otis came in and arrested me for disturbing the peace. After you were shot six times? Yeah. (laughs) Otis loved it. That wasn't in the magazine. I worked out my own ending. Move in. That's pretty. What are the lyrics? Well, uh, there are an awful lot of them. (laughs) I'll sing them. Okay. I'm sitting high on a hilltop. Oh, I remember that. 
tossing all my troubles to the moon. It's from Thanks a Million. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. With Alice Faye. Things are bound to pick up pretty soon. Here neath the sky on the hilltop, seems to me the world is all in tune. I forget all the bustle and hurry, tossing all my troubles to the moon. I know someone will love me and everything will be just grand. Just so the stars up above me continue doing business at the same old stand. It's mighty sweet in the evening when I've had a busy afternoon. Sitting high, high, high on a hilltop, tossing all my troubles to the moon. Sing it again, Rick. I'm sitting high on the hill. The grouch. Yeah, listen to that. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you hey. worry. <laughs> how do you like that way, guy? Oh, that's really awful. Yeah, well, maybe you know how I feel when you open that big basso of yours. You mean I sound like you do? Look, Diamond, what do you think the rats keep jumping out of my window for? Well, maybe if you had some plastic surgery. <laughs> and your crummy jokes are as bad as your crummy singing. So please, save the world from a horrible fate. And cut your throat or something. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you all about... Oh, I'm sitting high on a hilltop, tossing all my trouble. Hey, hey you! Shut up! We want to hear Diamond. Yeah, shut your big bazoo! Yeah, shut up! What's that? You heard us. We want to hear Mr. Diamond. Oh, no, no, no. Rick. Yeah, my dear public. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Peter Leeds, Yvonne Patey, Stephen Dunn, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <laughs> now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? Detective Story fans will want to hear Madeline Carroll and Basil Rathbone in the detective melodrama, The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse, tomorrow on Theater Guild on the Air. And for more detecting, listen tomorrow for The Adventures of Sam Spade. He'll present his most humorous caper of the season. Yes, you'll enjoy both Theater Guild and Sam Spade tomorrow on NBC. Next, it's Free Ride to Danger with Dorothy McGuire on NBC. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Carnival scream rises high on Broadway, carried high on plumes of neon light, and its shape is of many things. The metallic anguish of a trumpet shriek, 
The futile beating against closed doors, the laughter, bargained for, bought, paid for, under the winking girl on the spectacular. Broadway's scream rises, shatters into fragments of glitter, prowls through the city, and finally touches you. Wherever you are, it touches you. For me, it was a phone call. A girl dying, it said, from a jackknife in a dime a dance palace on Broadway. Come to it, Danny. Maybe you can grab yourself a free dance. The welcome committee is out, the pale girls with the scarlet streaked across their mouths, and the restless scarlet-tipped hands playing in the spinning lights, reaching out for you. Someone called, said a girl was hurt. Where is she? Me, I called. Sure you don't want to dance with one of those girls first? Where is she? You're square. You're a square policeman. Come on, I'll take you to her. George is the neat type. Don't like to spoil the fun. That's why she picked the lonesome lounge to die in. You got her picked out where you're going to die. You should. You really should. The lounge with beaded curtains. With Georgia. Get out. Go dance. It's all right, Danny. You? You, Georgia? Me, Danny. Fran can stay. She's my good friend. Okay if she watches me die, isn't it? Who did it, Georgia? A dancer. Keen dancer. You should have been here for his mambo dancing. It was a show. Who? He stabbed you, Georgia. That makes it all right to tell me. Who was it? He bought five dollars worth of tickets. A man like that, you feel you know. Don't ask his name. It spoils it. With this knife? <laughs> yeah. While dancing. I'm keeping it for a souvenir. Make sure it's with me in the coffin, huh, Danny? Promise. You're a long way from home, Georgia. What brought you here? I like it here. Come here a lot. It's peaceful. The man blows the bugle so peaceful. The crowd, Georgia? Will the boys in the crowd stab you because you're not liked anymore? How can you talk when he's... Listen to it, Danny. Listen. A girl feels young again with music like that. After that, the place got cluttered up. People started to come into the lounge. Policemen with notebooks. A woman in a tweed suit with a press card in her hat band. A couple of men with a stretcher. The only thing the doctor picked up on his stethoscope was a trumpet blowing what is called the blues. Because there was no heartbeat from Georgia Gray. Because she was dead. Find out why. Go now to Mott Street, where it intersects an alley whose name no one remembers. Climb four flights of stairs and wonder briefly why the quality of sound and light in a tenement is like nothing else in the world. Walk a corridor where mice and men live together in perfect tolerance. And stop at a door. Stand in the light a little bit more so I'll know who's... It's Danny Clover, Benny. Oh, you come at the check? I'm okay, I'm okay. Can I come in? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, Danny, I'm okay. Except for the stomach. It hurts when I press it. You've been behaving yourself, Benny? Well, since I got out of the hospital, sure, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm beating now. He taught me to make things out of beads when I was resting in a ward. Belt buckles and ladies' uh, accessories. You know why I came here, don't you? I ain't a stool pigeon no more, Danny. I got cured of that, too. I'm a, I'm a beater now. Who killed Georgia Gray? I'm a beater. How long since you checked in with your parole officer, Benny? Oh, Danny. What about Georgia? You know as much as me. Georgia was close to Nicky Gowan. You know that. Bought his shirts from him. Ran down the drugstore for him. What's the word on Nicky? The crowd ain't happy with him, Danny. Oh, Danny. Leave me alone. I got an order from a lady down the hall for a love bracelet. I got to deliver to you there or I'll be breaking my contract. Nothing else, huh? Say help me, Danny. Nothing. Where's Nicky Gannon? 
Uh, I'm going to beat him now. Well, you, huh? Off your beaten path, aren't you, Danny? Inside, Nicky. Don't strong arm, Danny. I was going to invite you in anyway. Georgia Gray, Nicky. She's dead. Word came to me how you closed her eyes. I wish it had been me. Maybe you got there ahead of me, Nicky. Maybe you went dancing, saw Georgia in a place you never thought she'd be. Killed her because she was getting away from you. <laughs> oh, you're tired, Danny. Awful tired. No one gets away from me, not even the dead. Come on into the den. I want you to meet my mother. If she'll be hurt, I don't show her my friends. All right, Nicky. I wouldn't want her to be hurt. You'll wish yours had been like her. Just wait. Mother, look what I brought you, Danny Clover. Sit down, Danny. Have a mint. Nicky has a made-up special for me. Thanks. Well, special, huh? Nothing too good for my mother. It's always been like that with my son. Up to now. Nicky hasn't been good? He let his girl die in a cheap place. Dancing with another man for pay, for dimes. That cheapens his name. You could have stopped it, Nicky? How could I have known, Mother? I told you. Don't snap at me, Nicky boy. I'll slap your mouth. Wash it out with doit. Georgia liked that hole, Danny. I never understood why. She tried to explain it to me about the music, about dancing. Crazy for dancing. Who understands these things in a girl? When she had everything a girl... Everything you gave her. Everything you worked hard for. You're getting your share, huh, Mother? The funeral, too, Nicky? Will you buy me one like the one you're buying for Georgia? Let me show you the invoices, Danny. I never knew dying came so high. Inflation, huh? Maybe it'll wipe out the taste of what happened to her. Where it happened to her. It's just a maybe, son. Don't build a monument on it. <laughs> Want to know why they killed her, Danny? You know, Mrs. Gannon? They think my son is finished. Done. Used up. They killed a girl to frighten my Nicky boy. And you know what? My boy's frightened. Who does that to you, Nicky? Your friends? Your boys? You know when you see their bodies on a slab. It'll be in all the papers. You'll save the clippings for me, huh, Nicky? Oh, is it your dream, Danny? I told you. Wonderful girl, my mother. When I got back to headquarters, there was a file on my desk. The neatly centered sticker on its front cover was typed Georgia Gray. Open it, read it, digest it. Georgia Gray, age between 25 and 29, computed from data gathered from arrests. Hometown, Salina, Kansas. Followed a soldier to New York Port of Embarkation in 1943, but never caught up with him. So she stayed. Counter girl in a 5 and 10. Then model for ladies' garments. Then nightclub hostess. And two years ago in night court, after losing a race with a squad car, she said she'd retired. Because I don't have to work anymore, she said. No better reason, she asked. Name linked with Nicky Gannon from here on in. Address Park Avenue. Expenses shared by Fran Holland, who said now she'll have to look around. First thing I'm going to do is get another roommate. Did you get along well with Georgia? She had her ideas, I had mine. You know what I mean? Tell me. No, this and that. Georgia was what, a pretty girl? I'd say she was beautiful. Yeah, I guess she was very beautiful. Very. Ah, but she was ruining it. Ran around, danced, but she didn't enjoy herself. I know she didn't. She only enjoyed herself relaxing here with me. Something I haven't made up my mind about. Well, you better make up your mind about it, Danny. Sure. She had all that dough, and she lived with a dance hall hostess with me. You know why? Because she needed someone like me. To run home to her. Right. So she could have soft hands rubbing the back of her neck. To bring her cold tomatoes when she needed it. She run the orphan, friend? Look, Danny, she was dance happy. That's why she hung around the place I worked. A little bit of music and a guy in a high waistband with two strong feet could make her smile like she was happy. Did Nicky Gannon mind that she stepped out on him? Why did Nicky care? He used her for a front for his business. He didn't care about her dancing. Who killed her, friend? A man. What else but a man? What man? Who? You know what you ought to do, Danny? You know Tommy Chandler? Nicky's hood? The padded shoulder that stands near Nicky with his hand in his pocket. Ask Tommy. See how he reacts when you ask him. You know where Tommy is? I know where he'll be in the morning. 
You know where the ducks are in that pond in Central Park? Eight o'clock, he throws them bread. Stale bread. But what do ducks know? That one over there likes pump a nickel, Danny. Here, give him a piece. You'll make an impression. We've got none of these advantages at city jail, Tommy. You gonna arrest me, kid? No. Ducks will miss me. You want a piece of Papa Nickel too, Harm? Sure you do. You see how Harm looked at me, Danny? Sad. Like he already knows about the arrest. What are you taking me down for? We'll think of something. Feeding the pintails in Central Park? I won't be able to hold up the head for the shame, huh? Let's go, kid. That's your squad car over there? You got to blush when I say suspicion of murder? That's been done to me, too. Hmm. You didn't come out for a long time. Georgia. You got me case for that? Georgia was murdered. Maybe Nicky Gannon goes, too. The whole crowd will miss him. I'll tell you something else. Whoever stabbed Georgia ain't going to be around long, ain't he? The crowd will see to that, huh? I didn't say that. I just said a protection, that's all. Who takes over if Nicky is rubbed, Tommy? You? Take over what? A backroom poker game for matchsticks? What are you talking about? Well, baby, arrest me if you want, but don't ask me stupid questions. It makes Herm nervous. Here, Herm. Here you are, boy. Herm looked sad when I took Tommy away from him. All the ducks looked sad. For a minute. Then they found a new love with a stale loaf of bread, swam away, screaming for it. Tommy looked back over his shoulder, stopped to call them a name, got shoved into the squad car. But on the way down, a code call, a woman's voice in the police radio. Man dead, she announced with a quiet number. Then she said it plain, in an alley, 4th Street, off 6th. Get there, car 62. We got there. Mind if I tag along, Danny? Man, dead. I recognize from the number. You gotta share these things. Hold your gun on him, Muggerman. He wiggles a toe. Break it for him. Pleasure, Danny. Let me through. Let me through. They can't skate anymore, can they, Nicky? Not anymore. He was propped up against the wall, his head thrown back, his mouth open. Like he was trying to tell someone about it. The furtive dog scrubbing for food in the trash, not listening. The small crowd he'd assembled because the blood sighed across his shirt front, but not listening. Watching an alley wind gather soot at his feet. Watching me lean over him. Watching Nicky Gannon. Dead Nicky Gannon. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. You'll find Jack Benny in the desert this Sunday night on CBS. Jack and his gang are making a safari to entertain the boys at an airbase in Nevada. And for more laughs, there'll be another session with Eve Arden as the gay, romantic, fun-loving schoolteacher, our Miss Brooks, on most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> Broadway is wide enough for everybody. Generals in open touring cars, blondes in taxis, and sailors against lampposts. It's the place to come to, for one reason or another. To be a tourist, or get stared at by the tourists. To make a pitch, buy a bargain. Get cheated, insulted, or have your picture taken. And end the day with a memory, depending upon what you wanted, what you got, and what you gave for it. And part of the day's memento of Broadway will be the news item. Nicky Gannon shot down in an alley. Hoodlum slain in new outbreak of mob violence. Police seek clues in killing. Especially me and another man. 
The Sergeant Gino Tartaglia, who had once passed a civil service examination. And the medical examiner, Dr. Sinsky, reveals that death was caused by hemorrhage in the pleura, parentheses, lungs, closed parentheses. And that is why Nicky Gannon was done in. Thanks, Gino. Oh, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. Anything else? May I? Yes, you may. Thank you. You know, Danny, this shooting up an alley brings to man mind a case which was solved by Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town. Do we have to, Gino? Lady Jane looked at the deceased and flipped her shiny tuppence. Flipped her what? Her shiny tuppence. Lady Jane has a lucky tuppence which she flips before she undertakes a case. Ah, that Lady Jane. May I interrupt? Oh, you're the boss. Do you have anything else to tell me about Georgia Gray or Nicky Gannon, please? Oh, indeed I do, Danny, indeed I do. In the murder of Nicky Gannon... Tommy Chandler, our prime suspect, has been released, and without a nickel's worth of bail. What? I have said it. So help me if you're kidding, Gino. Why was he released? Oh, because another fellow has confessed to the deed. You remember Cozy Barrett? Even at this moment, he is with Sergeant Mugovan, confessing all over the place. And that, Danny, is all the news I have for today. Case is solved, huh, Danny? Isn't that ain't all of it, Sergeant? George ain't all of it. Lots of people met with me then ended up under a sheet in the ice house. You killed before, Cozy? Oh, hi, Danny. Come on in. Join the fun. This is a new kick, isn't it, Cozy, for you? Confessing to a murder? Well, what's the matter? You don't trust me? Read me to him, Sergeant. I'll brief it for you, Danny. Cozy says he took a pocket full of dimes to the diamond dance joint where Georgia Gray was. To celebrate the end of a perfect day, he tells me. You danced with her, Cozy? Sure I dance. How else I get close enough to kill? You didn't like the way she danced, huh? Crazy for it. Dream about it. Who else I dance away my heart earned dawn? That buys you her dying, too, huh? Oh, she gives his insults. And from a foot away, that. But I got close. Eventually I got close. Yeah, yeah. Get on the phone, Mugov, and have a policewoman sent up here with a portable radio. Danny, you all right? You've been working so hard. Do you... you got a thing against telephones, Mugov? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. Uh, what are you going to do, Danny? Yes, you got Mugovan. tricks with batteries and portable radios to make people talk? <laughs> I'm talking. Yeah. Why you need electricity? Should be right up, Danny. Hey, you're going to put me away, huh, Danny? To the sound of music, huh? You treat me nice because I'm nice to you, huh? Killing. A little out of your line, isn't it, Cozy? I always figured you as more of the purse snatcher type, the jackroll kid, the friend a drunk finds in an alley. Well, I got a right to come up in the world, ain't I? This gives me class, a reputation, the things a fellow needs so he can admire himself in the night. Sure, I understand. man has to get ahead. You sent for me, Lieutenant? You want this? Yes, come in, please. Turn on the radio. Go on, turn it on to dance music. That'll be all right. Dance with the lady, Cozy. Huh? Go on, dance with her. <laughs> yeah, you're crazy, Danny. I give myself up to you and you, you, you go crazy. There are people like me, honest. Dance with her like you did with Georgia. Show me how it was with Georgia. You know I can't dance, Danny. You know I wouldn't go near a dame to dance with her. They laugh in my face when they see me coming. You were never near Georgia Gray, were you? Not even close enough to... Then they promised me they'd get me off, Danny. They said confess, and then when I got off, they'd give me the big dough. Who promised you all that? Well, friends, Danny. I, I got good friends. They they, they, they promised me things. They, they called me up and, and, and promised me things. <laughs> you got to lock me up, Danny, so I don't disappoint them. You got to lock me up. Make it come true for him, Mugham, and lock him up. <laughs> Now the afternoon was two hours old, and the gray had turned into a wetness, a drizzle that hung skirling in the air before it touched the pavement. But the citizens didn't mind getting wet. It was a sight to see. The funeral procession wasn't very long, not like the good old days when a gangster's death took up a mile of Broadway. Not like the good old days at all. None of the mourners walked, they all rode. And the wreaths were wrapped in cellophane, which not only protected the snapdragons from the rain, but it was more sanitary. I went along because I'd known Nicky Gannon for a long time. The rain let up a little when they lowered him into his grave. And none of the mourners stayed, not even his mother. And I wanted to talk to his mother. Mrs. Gannon? Hello, Danny. 
You want to ride back to town? I wanted to tell you how sorry I... You talk like that, you don't ride with me. Come on. My son was a hoodlum. Why should you be sorry for him? We've talked together. We've had a beer together, that's the reason. You cry. Not me. Whatever you want. He was your son. My son got scared. A man gets scared, a man don't live anymore. And that's all his dying does to him, Mrs. Gannon? Look what I've got, Danny. A thug's funeral on a rainy day. He was your son. He's dead, Danny. I'm not. I'll think about him. Some things will come up in my mind from time to time that I've forgotten about right now. And I'll smile. And I'll think nice about Nicky then. Do you know who killed him? I know. Who? I said I know. The same person who killed Georgia? If I let you out of the car now, you'll get wet. You're going to do anything about the person who killed Nicky? I'm sure of it, Danny. Sure of what? It's going to rain all day. Funny, ain't it? The paper said it was. In a hurry, Danny Clover? Yeah, I am. Bother you, mister? Mm-hmm. But it bothers me more, your unhappiness. Let's have a good cry over it in my office, huh? You in the hallway suits me. I used to draft the hallways, spend my life in them, waiting to do things for unhappy people. Spreader of good cheer. That's your business at police headquarters, Mr... What name do you spread it under? Forbes, Counselor at Law, my card. Forbes, Counselor at Law. Someone came to you, said I was unhappy. You took the case. Almost precisely how it happened. They told you what makes me sad. Kindly people, they grieve when a policeman throws away a confessed killer. Cozy Barrett? It seems to them almost ungrateful. However, they respect your analytical prowess. You got something I can hang on my wall that says that? Something much better. Silver cup, maybe, with an inscription. Better? An envelope, manila with money. It could take you hours to count. No silver cup, huh? Better? A bonus, the killer. The real true killer of George and Nicky. That could bring so much happiness to a man like you. Where do I find it? Mm, where else? Envelope and killer. The Diamond Dance Palace, where Georgia danced upstairs, one o'clock. That's this morning. Be there in a smile of grow on your face. You've brought me true happiness, Counselor. Thank you. Then he walked away. At the end of the hall, he stopped and looked back over his shoulder, grinned at me. Then he turned up his collar and walked out into the street. This was at 7 p.m. Then a walk down Broadway and dinner and a double feature on 42nd Street. Then it was time to go. The Diamond Dance Hall was blaring against its time of closing. I walked through it, pushed my way across the floor into a doorway. No one stopped me. Then up a flight of stairs and into a loft littered with old telephone books, cigarette butts, a neatly stacked bundle of year-old newspapers. The only light, the light from the spectaculars down the street, spelling out the evening's pleasure. Forty girls, forty, no cover charge. Up front with Willie and Joe, continuous performance. Chinese food, fried rice and dancing. I waited. I didn't wait long. You here, Danny? Come on in, Tommy. Thanks. I brought you some. Here. It's all yours, Danny. Who is he? The killer that got promised to you. Dead? Uh huh. You bring the envelope, Tommy? <laughs> You bring it? <laughs> sure. Sure, I brought it. Here. Count it at your leisure. 15,000, kid. I don't know, Tommy. A dead killer. How am I going to explain a dead killer? I thought of that, too. What did you come up with? Danny, I found a guy in Skid Row. He wasn't doing anybody any good. So I figured he could do us some good. So you shot him? With a police positive. Just like you, carry. Here's the gun. You track this killer down, he tried to escape, you shot him, makes you a hero. That's right. And how many heroes have $15,000? <laughs> We're going to get along fine. You've taken over for Gannon? I deserve, don't I? Yeah, yeah, you do. Killing Georgia and Nicky Gannon, sure you deserve it. To courage. You don't know how much. Had me sweating there for a while that she didn't die right away. Only... Georgia was a girl with character. 
Live and let live. Die and let live. Great girl. Well, I call you from time to time, Danny. Wait a minute, Tommy. Get used to it, Danny. I said I'd call you. Don't go away. You're under arrest for murder. You practice in being a cop? Don't be a cop around me. You forgot something, Tommy. I can't be anything else. Let's go. Because you're pointing the police positive. You got trouble, sucker? It's that way all over. Don't let me fall. I got your coat. Don't. Don't let me fall. I, I don't want to die that way. Hold me. Yeah. Daddy. Daddy, hold. Hold me. His fingers clawed against the sheer stone. Daddy. Body twisting. Face torture. Daddy. Pleading for a return to life. Daddy. His body hung there below me. Out of reach. Daddy. Then the fabric that held his life together gave way. Daddy. And the noise of the street came up to meet him. Killed his scream. When I got outside and walked through the gathering crowd, I remembered something in my hand. Tommy Chandler's torn coat. It's the gathering place of all the sleepless nights, this Broadway, and all the unwept tears. The place to come to, erase what's happened, start all over, make a memory, and try to forget it, if you can. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's cast, Anthony Barrett was heard as Tommy Chandler, Francis Cheney as Fran Holland, Martha Wentworth as Mrs. Gannon, Larry Dodkin as Nicky Gannon, Joy Terry as Georgia Gray, Leo Cleary as Benny Fane, and Junius Matthews as Cozy. Every Saturday night on CBS, Jan Murray gets on that coast-to-coast phone and gives away a thousand dollars at a crack if you can identify the phantom voice. Be listening for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walters speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My name's Jeff Regan. I get ten a day in expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigator, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Man with the Key. A block above Wilton on Hollywood Boulevard, there's a street they call Taft. It isn't very long. About 48 palm trees and a couple of bad sewers. It figures that the guy who laid it was nearsighted. He didn't see the hill three blocks away. Got kind of a tired look, like an old lady who's been moving furniture. There's a dirty gray apartment house on the right-hand side of the street. That's my place. 308. A low ceiling and a leaky faucet, a telephone that rings at the wrong time. It was last Monday night, about 11 o'clock. 
I was in bed listening to the party next door when it rang. It was the lion. Regan, get your clothes on. That the way you sleep? You're going to be busy. We got a new client. Now tell me all about it in the morning. Special messenger came to my place 15 minutes ago with a C note. Any good? It was from somebody named Dora King. Well, who's that? That's what you're going to find out. I can see better in the daytime. She's waiting for you right now. Oh, yeah. At a place on La Brea called the Southerner. Should I take my banjo? Don't be funny. She wants to talk to you, so get over there. Well, what does she want to talk about? How would I know? Well, don't you ever check into things? That's what I pay you for. All right, where's last week's salary? You'll get it. When? As soon as I find out if your expenses were legit. Now get busy. That all? No, call me right after you've seen her. Why? I want to know what's what. You mean you want to know if she can afford more than a C-note? You're getting out of line. That's what they told Gypsy Rose Lee. Well, I got over there about 11.30. Turned out to be a small place. Long on the shadows and short on the whiskey. There was a bald-headed guy playing a piano in one corner. I guess he'd been inside for a long time, because... He'd never been out for a music lesson. The bartender was the only other guy in the joint. His name couldn't have been Dora King. So I went to work on a straight shot and waited. Two drinks later, a girl in a black dress walked in. She took in the piano player and the bartender and me. I won. She started toward me with a slow, easy kind of a walk like a panther looking for breakfast. When she oozed onto the stool beside me, the bartender got damp all over her. The air conditioning wasn't doing him any good. What'll it be, miss? You make it the same as his. Okay, I'm bourbon and water. Got a match? Yeah. Got a cigarette? Mm-hmm. Got a name? Maybe. I'll bet it's Regan. All right, you got that much. My name's Dora King. I'm sorry I'm late. You ever on time when you meet a guy? No. Your money, you can spend it any way you want. You always this nice to customers. I don't get paid to be nice. What do you get paid for? Have you got a story? Mm, I haven't had my drink yet. Hey, you. Coming up, coming up. I'm jet propelled. Here you are, miss. Hey, hot night, ain't it? You waiting for the weather to change? It ain't gonna change in here, brother. What's your first name? Jeff. Hmm. I don't like it. Neither do I. I'm going to call you Regan. All right, let's start calling. Have you got a license? Covers up a hole in my wall. Mm-hmm. Have you got something that says you're what you say you are? All right. Here. Hmm. The lion's eye. Six feet, 170. Brown eye. Hmm. You fit? Yeah, I got a mole on my left shoulder. <laughs> Let me see you. You pass. Okay, you won the toss. Let's kick off. Well, this isn't where we play. We'll go in my car. Where? You'll find out when you get there. Maybe I won't like the field. You trust me, don't you? No. Good. Uh, Fill her up again. We're just leaving. Floor show starts in a couple of minutes. That uh, piano player going to be in it? Yeah, he's my brother. He's going to play something he wrote himself. Any good? Stinks. Maybe you better go. The bartender was pouring himself four fingers of rye and about a fingernail of water when we walked out of there. We climbed into a big Nash convertible, parked in front of the place, and headed for Santa Monica Boulevard. Then we turned east, past Western, down to Vermont, and south to Marathon. All at once, we were climbing a hill on a dark street. That gave us a view of the city. Twenty years ago, a real estate broker might have had something, but now it was just an old neighborhood with a sad look. Like a toe dancer with a short leg. Nobody said anything. I was beginning to have a feeling that maybe she'd forgot her compass when she slowed the car down. She pointed to a two-story house in the middle of the block, and I nodded. Then she shoved the car in second and spun around the corner and came to a stop. I got out and walked around to let her out. She didn't move. End of the line. Short fare. Time for you to go to work. What kind of work? The white place back there, 3936. You saw it? It came through. It's a boarding house. I already got a room. On the second floor, number 10. Knock twice. Prohibition's dead, lady. There's a man there. His name's Bender. Ben Bender. That'll wake him up. He's expecting you. You're quitting? My job's finished. You're the new help. 
Well, what do I do? He'll tell you. That all? One thing more. Come here. Yeah. Part of my fee? That's extra. I don't generally get tipped. Just for luck. You act like I'm going to need lots of it. You are. When do I see you again? You don't. Goodbye, gorgeous. I stood there and watched her drive away. And then I noticed it. Somebody in a black coupe coasted around the corner, kicked into high gear at the bottom of the hill. I kept watching, but whoever it was hadn't read the traffic laws lately. He didn't use his lights for two blocks. Oh, it registered. He was on a tail job. And Dora was nice to tail. Thirty-nine, thirty-six marathon. Inside, it smelled like stale beer and rotting wood. Room number ten was at the top of the stairs. The door was already open. A thin guy with a hungry look was sitting on the edge of the bed. He was all bones. He didn't get up when I came in. He just kind of looked at me, and his eyes were full of water. All of a sudden, he pulled a bandana out of his pocket and began coughing. <laughs> You're sitting in a draft. All my life. <clears throat> you, Regan? A girl with warm lips said I'd find you here. Thanks for coming. Sit down. <laughs> I just got back from a trip. Up north? Yeah. Sanitarium? State said I needed a cure. Did it take? What do you think? You're still coughing. The doctor said I could go. You can give me a going away present. Ten bucks and a suit of clothes. <laughs> it's a bum rap. That's what they all say. Who are you? Ben Bender. Big Ben Bender. Huh? Does that mean anything to you, Pilgrim? Must have been before my time. Yeah. How old do you think I am? I'm out of practice. You look 60. And then 45. That's what seven years in the sanitarium will do. <laughs> you ought to get a specialist. Already got one. What's his name? You. No, I'm only an intern. You'll do. All right, what do you want? When the guy goes up there, he makes a lot of friends. And a lot of enemies. Sometimes you can't tell one from the other. Does it make any difference? Big Ben don't trust nobody. No? What about that girl? Dora? Forget her. Her job's done. That's what she said. See this key? Yeah. I wear it around my neck. I won it for seven years. You'll wear it for the next seven hours. Why? Them friends and enemies I was telling you about. What does the key fit? My safety deposit box at the American Security Bank. You meet me there. Tomorrow... The ten. What if I oversleep? Stay up all night. I'll pay for the no dose. Just be there. After that? Then your job's finished. <laughs> it's off the softest door you ever made. Look, now you kept this key seven years. Why can't you keep it for seven more hours? My business. What's in the box? My business. Okay. Any of those friends or enemies drive a black coupe, white sidewalls? I don't know. Why? My business. I left him sitting there. He looked as happy as a sword swallower with the hiccups. Well, I put the key in my coat pocket, but it felt hot, like a dynamite stick with a short fuse. If Big Ben had been holding it for so long, somebody else might want it. Maybe somebody who drove that black coupe. Well, I went out the back entrance, walked down an alley, and doubled over five blocks to Vermont. I stopped a cab, and I had him take me over to the lion's place. It was 2.30 in the morning when he opened the front door. He was wrapped in a bathrobe big enough to keep all the silkworms working overtime. What do you want, Rika? Information. You have been drinking? I've been working. What kind of work? Well, I got a key. That all? That's what they say. Who's they? A con named Bender. Ben Bender? That's right. I thought he was doing a long run up in Quentin. Well, he's out now. Where does Dora King fit? Taxi service. She took me to Bender. He gave me the key. Let me see it. All right, here. 
safety deposit box. That's right. Nurse made to a hunk of metal until tomorrow at 10. What then? Well, I meet him at the American Security Bank and turn it over to him. Well, do it. Now, look, Big Shot, this key's hot. What makes it hot? Whatever's in that box. What's that? How should I know? Find out you got the key. You got the client. Now, just a minute. Somebody waves a green back at you and you think it's a rainbow. That's enough. Oh, stop it, will you? It's another bum client and you know it. Let me worry about that. If Ben held that key for seven years and won't hold it now, he's scared. What's he got to be scared of? Somebody else who wants in on the play. So what? I'm holding the key. That makes me the clay pigeon. You're getting paid for it? Just be there tomorrow at ten. Alive. Well, I left the lion and went out to the street. Nobody was there. I hailed a cab and he let me off in front of my place. Nobody was there. I opened the front door of my apartment. Nobody was there. I began to feel like a good bet for the Lonely Hearts Club. It was a good feeling. I sat up all that night waiting. Nothing happened. I felt about as popular as a bald-headed chorus girl. Nobody made a play. It was five minutes to ten when I pulled into the parking lot next to the American Security Bank. The car next to me was a black coupe with white sidewalls. It could have been the same one that tailed us the night before. But then I figured there's a lot of cars in L.A. like that. But I leaned in and I looked at the registration. This one belonged to a guy named Al Spandy, who lived in Van Nuys. I wrote the address down and walked into the bank. The guard in a blue uniform waved me downstairs to the safety deposit boxes. It was ten, and still nothing happened. I began to feel kind of relieved, like a flagpole sitter when the wind died down. Big Ben hadn't showed yet. The only one there was a blonde sitting in a glass cage in front of the vault. She looked at me, and I began to wonder what she did on her days off. Good morning. May I help you? Yeah, I want to see if the rent on my box has been paid. Here's the key. Mm -hmm. 60B. Just a minute. I'll take a look. 60B. 60B is all paid for. Well, I guess my partner must have taken care of it. This isn't a joint box. You're the only one who can get into it, Mr. Bender. Would you like to go in now? No, I'm waiting for somebody. We're all waiting for somebody. I'm waiting for a man. So am I. Been waiting alone? Years. Here? Yes. Better places to wait. The ones with money keep coming here. My name's Claire. I'll remember that. Will you remember this? Granite 3408. I'll try it on my phone. When? As soon as I get a spare nickel. I'll give you one. Well, you'll run out of them that way. Uh-uh. That's why I work in a bank. Kind of hard on the depositors. Your, uh, friend's late, isn't he? I can wait. Maybe he forgot. You should have tied a string around his finger. No, lady. He already had one around his neck. <laughs> Well, she went back to copping nickels, and I sat down in one of the plush chairs and waited. 10.30 came, 11 came, Benda didn't. I began to get an uneasy feeling, like a bubble dancer with a slow leak. At 11.10, I couldn't take any more waiting, so I left to head for Benda's place. Outside the bank, a thin guy with a sharp head was hawking papers. I slipped him the nickel that the blonde had given me, and he handed me a daily news. I wanted to see what a horse named Larry R. had done at Belmont. I didn't get beyond the first page. Benda's picture was there, right next to Governor Dewey's, only Ben wasn't running for office. They found him in his room full of bullet holes. I guess he finally got a cure for that cough. I took my car out of the lot and headed for home. I mixed myself a tall one, and I was just getting to the bottom of it when a couple of guys kicked my door open. Regan? Yeah. I'm Lieutenant Anderson, homicide. This is Sergeant Pennelly. Hi. Don't you guys believe in knocking? My knuckles are sore. Mmm, nice stuff. Well, help yourself. It's out in the kitchen. Don't drink on a job. Pennelly? Me neither. The boys should have told me you were coming. I'd have called some girls. Not on a job. Pennelly? I got a wife. All right, Regan, find your hat. What for? Well, you want to look nice. We're going downtown. You and me and Pete. Right, Pete? Right, Andy. No, it's too hot there. We thought of that. We'll give you a nice, cool place, won't we, Pete? Sure will, Andy. You got a warrant? Uh, no, we just figured you might want to tell us why you did it. Did what? Tell him, Pete. Knock off Ben Bender. 
And burn his feet. You're out of your mind. Now, Regan, we know you saw Bender last night. We know you got out of a car on the corner and walked up to his place. We know you were the last one to see him while he was still alive. You got a witness? 31. A girl told it. Oh, you're trying real hard, Anderson, but you haven't got anything. If you were the last one to see him alive, you're the first one to see him dead. That's how we figured. Did you figure on a guy named Al Spandy who drives a black coupe? I never heard of him. And how about a dozen other hoods who knew Bender? Now you're trying hard, Regan. You haven't even got a foundation. We got the whole building. It'll never stand up. We'll see. All right, you tell me why I did it. You private eyes get folders on bank jobs. I get them from Charles Atlas, too. Bender was in on an $80,000 heist eight years ago. He went up for carrying a concealed weapon, but the money was never found. You know that the Imperial Bonding Company's offering $5,000 for the recovery of that dough. A lion. Uh, don't make any dates tonight. You're not going to be available. All right. The lion will tell you I was working on a case when I saw Bender. Oh, we already talked to the lion. Well, what did he say? He says he hasn't seen you for five days. You are listening to the story of the man with the key. Tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. If you were a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. These commissions are still available, and those who meet the high standards and qualify may elect active or inactive status. Those who request inactive status will continue with their civilian nursing duties but stand ready to serve in time of emergency. Nurses who elect active duty become commissioned officers in the regular Army. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now back to the story of the man with the key and Jeff Regan, investigator. Well, I had about as much chance as a violin player with no chin. Anderson and Pinelli took me down and locked me in one of the rooms upstairs. They didn't ask any questions. I guess they figured they had enough answers. Oh, it was a real nice fix. A dame named Dora King takes me to a con named Ben Bender. He slips me a hot key and says, meet him in a bank at 10. I'm there on time, getting the phone number of a blonde named Claire, only Ben doesn't show. Somebody burns his feet and fogs him before he can keep the date. And then there's that black coupe registered to a question mark named Al Spandy. And then the lion deals one from the bottom. Oh, it was a screwy picture, and I was right in the middle of the frame. Well, I spent the next four hours taking in some free entertainment from the drunk in the next cell. Okay, Regan, on your feet. Bastille Day? You sprung. Well, I was getting tired of the floor show anyway. Try and make it Saturday sometimes. That's our big night. Hard if I bring a date? I get a phone. I get a phone. My wife. That guy ought to be at Ciro's. Where do you think we picked him up? Regan, I'm running out of patience with you. How many times have I told you to keep out of trouble? Why didn't you tell him I was working on a case? I went to a lot of trouble to get you out. And you went to a lot of trouble to get me in. <laughs> that was easy. Still got that key to Bender's safety deposit box? I got it. Tomorrow morning at 10, you're at that bank getting into the box. You're crazy. It's in Bender's name. I'll teach you how to spell it. I won't do it. Homicide might like to know you got that key. Now, you listen to me and we'll both make dough. Where I'd be, I couldn't spend it. If the 80000 bucks from the bank job Bender pulled happens to be in that box, like I think it is, Imperial Bonding owes us five grand reward. I don't like it. You owe it to the company. Now listen, you. Bender was knocked off for this key. Whoever wants it might make another try. Nobody knows you got us. Well, I'll give it to you and nobody will know you got it. Regan, I'm giving you a chance to straighten yourself out. That's right. What do you mean? I feel stiff already. <laughs> Well, it was a triple play. Homicide to the lion to the black coop. I went home to wash off some of the jailhouse Lysol. When I walked in the front door, I had company. A gray flannel suit with a yellow tie was sitting on the edge of my bed. Both hands were full. The whiskey was mine. The gun was his. When he saw me, he set down the bottle and 
Walked over and put the gun right against my neck. It felt cold, and I got kind of nervous, like a hula dancer in a forest fire. Hiya, Regan. Been waiting for you. You like my liquor? I'm a rye drinker myself. I'll bring your own next time. That ain't being sociable. You weren't invited. Huh. How could I have been? You don't even know me. You're Al Spandy. You drive a black coupe. What I have for breakfast? Egg, and it's all over your tie. You look hot, Regan. You have to hold that gun there. Right there. Same one you used on Bender? The same. All right, now give me, Regan. I told you, I don't have any rye. Where's the key? I don't use one. My door's always open. I'm talking about that key you got from Bender. I don't have it. Do you hear any music? Yeah, but I'll sit the next one out. No, you won't. This is a men's cheat. I'll step on your toes. I don't mind. It's a polka, and I want to do it with you. Oh, it was a long dance, but Spandy didn't get tired. I knew I wasn't going to last the evening out. And then I saw Dora King standing in the doorway back to Spandy. She was taking everything in like a Hoover vacuum cleaner on a dirty rug. She had a twenty-five in her hand, and she knew how to use it. Thanks for cutting in, lady. I I had to do it. He, he was killing you. Yeah, I'll take the gun, huh? You know I had to do it. Yeah. Here. Oh, Go on, drink I... it. Yes. Now, you want to tell me all about it? Yes. I wanted to tell you at first, but Ben wouldn't let me. He's not around to stop you. Do you think Spandy hurt him much before he killed him? I wasn't there. He was sick. He couldn't have taken much. Why'd you tip the cops on me? I thought you might have done it. Now I know different. Tell that to homicide. I will. You better. Spandy can't. He's dead? That's right. You still don't trust me. No, I don't. I couldn't help myself once the gun went off. Big Ben was my father. Yeah? He didn't want anyone to know. All he wanted was to give me a break. Why'd he hire me? He was afraid. Yeah, that's what he said. Regan? Yeah? May I have the key? I haven't got it. You can get it. Maybe. You know what's in that box? I think so. Or why don't I turn it over to the police? That's my job. Like I told you. I'm Big Ben's daughter. Yeah, lady. You convinced Spandy. Well, I called Homicide, and Anderson and Pinelli handled it. We all wound up downtown. It didn't take them long to find out that the gun Spandy used on me was the same one that killed Big Ben. Dora gave Anderson her story... He said it would take some fixing, but he could keep her out of the papers. It was justifiable homicide. She wouldn't even be indicted, but they had to hold her overnight. Well, it was almost daylight when I pulled to a stop in front of my apartment. I was beginning to feel a little better, but it didn't last long. When I walked into my place, it looked like the L.A. Dons had been having a scrimmage. Every corner had been gone over. Oh, it didn't make sense. Bender was dead, Spandy was dead, Dora King was downtown, but somebody still wanted that key. Well, I crawled into what was left of my bed and set the alarm for 9.30. I didn't sleep much. I kept seeing keys and faces and $80,000 bills. Ten o'clock the next morning, Granite 3408 was still sitting behind the same desk near the same safety deposit vault. She gave me the same look. I waited for you to call last night. I spent the nickel. On a doctor? I'd like to get into my box. All right, Mr. Bender, sign here. All right. Looks like part of the new freeway. One thing about a vault, it's quiet. So is a tomb. Live alone. Yeah. Well? All right, sunshine, open your eyes. My box number is 60B. Back and wait, I can't. Easy, baby. You'll set off the alarm. You and I can make a great team, Bender. Uh, you know my name's not Bender. What is it? Regan. You and I can make a great team, Regan. Is that what you told Al Spandy? Why well, bring up a dead issue? What's your deal? You got Bender's key, I got the bank's key. You need both of them to open up the box. It's good so far. Go on. Well, there's $80,000 there. Let's not let it go to waste. 
Big Ben waited seven years to open that box. Look what happened to him. I waited just as long as Ben. And seven years is harder on a girl. How'd you work it? Ben and I had a great plan. I was the cashier Ben heisted. Only I just gave him a bag full of paper. The real dough's in his box. Well, that's the safest way. Keep your money in a bank. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when it cooled off, both of you go in and pick up the dough together. That's the way it was supposed to work, only Ben was dumb enough to get himself picked up and tucked away for seven years. Oh, well, you made real good partners. Nobody trusted anybody. I trust you. Is that why you went through my place looking for the key last night? Oh, girls got to use their head. Besides, you might have been home. Ben and Spandy are dead. We don't have to worry about either of them. The money's still here. Well, we got the keys that'll open the box. Can you add that? Yeah. What's the answer? About 20 years. What do you mean? That bonding company will see that you get the full load for grand larceny. You wouldn't turn me in. Don't make book on that. You and I'd make a great team, Regan. We can't lose. That's what USC thought. <laughs> Well, I called Anderson and Pinelli, and they came out and picked her up. I rode down as far as the office with him. That wrapped it up. When I told the lion what had happened, he was as happy as a college boy in a harem. He got on the phone right away and called up Imperial Bonding, told him to make out that reward check for five G's to Anthony J. Lyon. But he was real good about it. He took me for a ride in his new Nash convertible. Well... I guess he deserved it. He was really the patsy that had done all the heavy work ever since he bailed me out of jail. Because that's when I slipped Bender's key in his pocket. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyons. Jeff Regan, investigator, written by E. Jack Newman and Larry Roman, produced by Sterling Tracy, is heard each week at this time over CBS. Tonight's cast included Ken Christie, Yvonne Patey, Marvin Miller, Paul Fries, and June Martell. If you are a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. All nurses who receive reserve commissions will benefit from the opportunity for specialized training offered to them by the Army. Inactive reserve status will not interfere with the nurse's civilian life, but the educational opportunities offered her by the Army Medical Department will be of great advantage. For further information, drop a card to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Dick Arant, Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Mike Shane isn't burning the midnight oil over some unsolved crime. He's generally doing the next most interesting thing, talking about one. Right now, he's leaning back in his easy chair, doing a powerful lot of talking to his old friend, Inspector Faraday. It's a stag session, for Mike's assistant, Phyllis Knight, has gone home early this evening. Of course, Faraday, I don't know much about the case, except what I've read in the papers, but it seems to me that you're going after the wrong guy. Mike, this Joe has got a prison record as long as a kangaroo's tail. Why should he sidestep a little thing like murder? Just because he has got a prison record as long as a kangaroo's tail. Look, I remember a case back in New York that's almost a carbon copy of this. I, I've got some newspaper clippings on it in the files here. I'll read them to you in just a second. You don't get the point, Mike. This killing is gruesome, horrible. It would take a hardened criminal to carry it through. Doggone it, they're here in the files somewhere. Now, Phil could turn right to it. Yeah, she went home kind of early this evening, didn't she? Yeah. She's got a girlfriend staying up at the apartment with her. <laughs> went home to help her pack up. Friend from out of town? Uh-huh. 
girl had a fight with her fiancé and wants to play hermit for a few days. I know. The old feminine trick. Goodbye forever. Till next Saturday night. Right. I'll get it, Mike. Hello? Mike. Well, thank heavens you're still there. This is Faraday, Phyllis. Mike's ransacking his files. I'll get him for wait you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You better hear this too, Inspector. Maybe it's your business. What's wrong, girl? You sound scared blue. I am. I know something's happened. I don't dare look. All right, but what is it, Phil? Yeah, wait, wait a minute. Let me talk to her. Here. She sounds like she's going to cry. Hello, Angel. Oh, Mike. Mike, get over here quick. Now, wait a minute. Calm down, honey. Now, tell me what's wrong. Well, you, you know Lois was leaving my apartment tonight, and I came home to help her pack. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, Mike, she's not here. At hmm? least I don't think so. Now, please, Angel, wait a minute. I can't tell what you're talking about. Well, I found her trunk already packed and locked. And, yeah? And I think... Yep. I, yep. What? What, honey? What? I think her body's inside. <laughs> At last, I thought you'd never get here. Honey, we came as fast as we could. Yeah. Where's the trunk? In the bedroom. Hmm. All right, now tell me what happened. Well, I found the hall door off the lock, so I expected she'd be right back. I kept waiting, and then I started to worry. She had that row with Nelson. He threatened her. <laughs> you see what I mean, Faraday? A woman's intuition. <laughs> well, the, the baggage man came. He started to take the trunk, but then... Then I heard it. Heard what? Something slumped inside. And the trunk seemed so heavy, I, I told the man to leave it. We weren't going to send it after all. Oh, great. I looked at it real close, and, and when I saw the padlock, I, oh, that's when I phoned you, Mike. Mm-hmm. Well, I see it. It's mere blood on the lock. But that's not unusual, honey. Maybe she cut her hand when she closed the trunk. Oh, for heaven's sakes, I'm no child. Look here in this closet. There. There are all Lois's dresses, still on the hangers. They weren't packed in the trunk. It just means that she hasn't finished packing. I thought of that, too, Mike. I started to push the trunk back against the wall, but it wouldn't budge. There's something inside of it, and it isn't clothing. Well, let's see. Hmm. I'll say. It's loaded with something. There. There, you hear that? Something slumped inside. Just as you tip the trunk, Faraday. Okay, I guess the only way we can satisfy you is to open it, if we can find the key. Oh, here, I've got it. It's, it's here in her purse. That's another thing that scared me, Mike. Lois's handbag. Just laying here on the dressing table. Let's have it, Phil. Honey, wasn't that the hall door? Of course. There's your girl now. Oh, oh it's about time that she... No. No, it's Nelson. Hmm? Let's see. Yeah. You looking for somebody, partner? Huh? Oh, uh, I, I didn't think there was anybody you here. You always walk right in when there's nobody home? Well, I meant, uh, I, I thought Lois was here alone. Uh, I'll come back again. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, we'd like you to stay. She uh, she may be in any minute. Well, I, I really... Uh, come in a minute. Come on in. We'd like to talk to you ourselves. Come on, come on, come on. I, I, I don't understand. You're friends of Lois? Yes. This is Mike Shane and Inspector Faraday. I don't understand. You don't have to. Okay, Phil, let's have that key. Here. Thanks. Hey, here, what are you doing? That's Lois's trunk. You haven't any right to do Maybe it. not, uh, but we like to open surprise packages. Oh, oh, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's a mistake. All right, Mike. Let's swing her open. Honey. Yeah? What? What's inside? No, no, don't look. I'm afraid you were right. <laughs> Coroner's on his way. Oh, it, it doesn't seem real. Just a few hours ago, I was talking to her, and now... I know, honey, I know. It's hard to take. You, young fellow, what's your name? Huh? Uh, Nelson Carter. Supposed to be the girl's fiancé, huh? You don't seem to be particularly upset. Uh, I'm stunned. What, uh, what brought you here? I came to see Lois. I, I was here this afternoon and we had another fight. I came back to apologize. That's something new. First time you ever apologized for anything. You drove the poor girl half crazy. Well, it was her fault. She wouldn't listen to me. I was right from the very start. Oh, sure. So right you never let her have a thought of her own. You hounded her with your rightness. 
That's why she moved in with me, to get away from you and your pestering phone calls and your fights. That's a lie. You came between us. Lois told me this afternoon you said she should forget me. I told her so at breakfast. But she couldn't. She was still in love with you. Huh? She was going back to her apartment tomorrow morning. There's something I don't get. If Lois was using Phil's apartment as a sort of hideout, how did this fellow know she was here? That's my business. It's also ours, son. What time did you come here this afternoon? Why, about 4.30. Hmm. And the girl's been dead three or four hours. Say, look here, if you're trying to pin this on me, you're crazy. Maybe. Lois told me about your insane temper. You threatened to kill her. I did not. Oh, you're a pack of fools. But I think I do know who did it. Yeah? Who? Wait a minute. Hmm? Who can that be? Oh, it's too soon for the coroner. I'll answer it. Good evening. Good evening. I'm well, sorry to bother you at this hour, but we had some trouble about a pickup at this address. Oh, what kind of a pickup? Why, uh, a trunk. I'm the traffic investigator for the transfer company. We gave one of our drivers a pickup order at this apartment, but he didn't bring it in. In fact, he's disappeared. Oh, wait a minute. I can explain part of it. I told your driver I'd changed my mind. I didn't want the trunk sent. Oh, oh, I see. You... Oh, you were Miss Phyllis Knight. That's right. Haven't I, uh... Haven't I met you somewhere before? Your voice sounds familiar. It ought to, Mr. Shane. You used to hear it every day. Hmm? Going up, sir? Floors, please? An elevator operator. In the Rust Building. Well, I'm... I'm sorry I disturbed you, but we're just trying to locate our driver. Good night. Yeah. Mm, uh, good night. That's funny. Why should a baggage company driver disappear? Right after he came for this trunk. I wonder... All right, kids, let's get back to business. Now, Mr. Carter, you start to say you knew the killer. Yeah, Lois's old boss, Joseph Spiegel. He's uh, head of the Spiegel Chemical Laboratories. She told me this afternoon he was coming to see her. Yeah, but he doesn't know she was here. Lois quit her job with him last week. As soon he did know. Why should our next boss want to kill the girl? Because he's a crook. I used to work in Spiegel's laboratory, and I discovered he was stealing formulas from other companies. So I quit. Uh, but not Lois. Oh, no. Now, she was his private secretary, and her boss was just a soul of honor. That's what started our fighting. Yes, but when she learned you were right, she did quit. Three days ago. All right. But it sounds like a pretty flimsy reason to kill a girl. Not if Lois had the goods on him. He wanted to stop her tongue. You weren't fighting about that this afternoon? No. No, she told me she was going to go to work for another chemical company. I told her when I married, I didn't want my wife working. Well, we both got pretty mad. She said she'd never marry me. I can imagine how you took that with your conceit. I, how about it, Mike? I don't know. I'm a little worried, Faraday. This is Phil's apartment. She's been living here alone up till the past few days. Yeah? Lois and Phyllis are about the same height, same color hair. Yeah. Maybe... Maybe somebody thought he was killing Phyllis. Huh? Who'd want to? I haven't an enemy in the world. Oh, you've got hundreds, of angels, as many as I've got. Oh. Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight have sent plenty of lugs up the river. Yeah, but Lois and I don't really look alike, Mike. A, a killer would be awfully certain before he did it. Why should he, honey? Yours is the only name on the mailbox. If some crook hired a gunman to come to this address and knock off the girl living in apartment 660... Listen, Mike, that stuff doesn't happen in San Francisco. Those are the old Al Capone days. <sighs> Well, maybe I'm a nervous Nelly. I just don't want Phil running any danger. Mike. Yes? Come here a minute. Look here. Hmm? Here. This ashtray. Uh -huh, I see what you mean. Mr. Carter, do you uh, smoke? What? Uh, yes, a uh, pipe. Oh. There's a cigar butt in this ashtray. Spiegel. He smokes them all the time. I told you he was coming here. Maybe we should check that right now. You know where he lives? Yeah, he's got an apartment at his plant. It's next to the laboratory. That's on uh, Bay Street. Okay, suppose Phil and I mosey over there right now and swap formulas with Dr. Speaker. Good, and if the coroner gets through here in time, I'll join you. Oh, Mr. Shane. Hmm? Have you got a gun? You think I'll need it? You might. Spiegel's a huge man with a cunning, fiendish mind. <laughs> well, thanks for the warning. I'll be ready with a few shenanigans of my own. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Quality of workmanship and materials has always been the hallmark of successful business. That is why Union Oil Company has copyrighted the name Stopware. You see, Stopware lubrication is more than just a grease job. 
It is a system that has been worked out from years of experience to give your automobile the best possible care. With Stopware Lubrication, you can be sure that nothing on your automobile has been overlooked or hurriedly serviced. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. Only the finest, high-quality greases are used. And while your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. As a proof of Stopware's superior lubrication, you receive a written guarantee with each job. Stopware lubrication jobs are a matter of pride with Union Oil Minutemen. And you'll know why when you take the wheel after a Stopware servicing. You'll find your car rolls smoother, handles easier, stands up better with regular Stopware lubrication. So, ladies and gentlemen, with correct car servicing so important these days, why take a chance on inferior work? Stopware, the best attention you can buy, costs no more than ordinary lubrication. Remember, Stopware is an exclusive, guaranteed process, available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. It is a dark and foggy street in San Francisco's commercial district. Light streams out into the night through an open door, the entrance to the Spiegel Chemical Laboratories. In the doorway is the huge silhouette of a man. Shane? Michael Shane? Yes, sir. I do not know you, sir. I'm aware of that, Dr. Spiegel, but Miss Knight and I would like to talk to you. It's very important. Impossible. Tonight I'm working in my laboratory. It's about Lois Lavers, Doctor. Lois? Oh. Come in. Close the door, please. We will talk in the laboratory. I must get back to my experiment. This way, please. Thank you. Jeepers, he is a giant, Mike. Mm Mm-hmm. And those thick glasses make him look like a movie horror man. You said... Mr. Sheen, you are a detective. How did you know that? Well, I rather expected Lois might talk to someone. She's a very neurotic girl. She imagines things. I'm afraid she's past that, Dr. Spiegel. She's dead. Dead. Murdered. It's a pity. She had a fine brain. But uh, too much imagination? My laboratory. I caution you both not to handle the tubes or retorts. They are very fragile. Oh. Golly, it's it's an elaborate place. What are you experimenting on? That, madam, is my business. Doctor, I believe you knew Nelson Carter, Lois' fiancé. Hmm, he used to work here. Capable, but a wild temper. And very jealous. Of you, perhaps? Yes. I used to take Lois to dinner so I could continue my work without interruption. Nelson misunderstood. Yes. I should not be surprised if he killed her. Perhaps. Uh, you saw Lois this afternoon, Doctor. About what time? A <laughs> very good detective. <laughs> About five o'clock, I would say. How did you know she was staying in my apartment? One moment. There is trouble with this retort. Better? Better? How did I know? It is very simple. Lois telephoned me. Her last paycheck was incorrect. I brought her a new one. Is that all you want to see her about? No. Also, I asked her to come back. She was an excellent secretary. Mr. Shane, what are you doing? Just admiring your laundry in the sink. Laundry? Does your experiment include bleaching of blood-soaked handkerchiefs, Doctor? Good heavens. Yes, they they are my handkerchiefs, yes. But the blood is not from Lois's veins. Ooh. She was strangled, then stabbed to death by a sharp instrument, Doctor. Like this surgical knife here. <laughs> Perhaps I I show you how I use that knife. In this cage. Ooh. Rats. Hundreds of them. One hundred, madam. Disease, very sick rats. When my experiments are concluded, they go in here. Into this bin. Oh, no. Very dramatic, doctor. But it doesn't fool us. Sure, sure, you wanted Lois to come back to work, but she told you she was going to another chemical company. That scared you, doctor. If she told about your stolen formulas and your other cookery... Oh, so she did talk. I thought this was a trick. Don't you reach for your gun, Mr. Shane. My hand is already in my pocket. You killed her. You lie. She's not dead. It's a trick to get something on me. Get out. Get out of here, both of you. 
Now you will forget you ever came here. You will drop this investigation. I don't take orders from you, Dr. Spiegel. This time you will. Your young lady has sense if you have not. Good night. Oh, I thought he was going to keep us in there and experiment on us. Yes. <laughs> he's a cold-blooded baby. Yeah. Mike. Hmm? Hey, hey, the inspector. There, he's parked in that police car. Oh, with Nelson. Yeah. He's got here in time to see the bums rush. What are the odds? I don't know, Inspector. He's devilish enough to commit murder. Should I take him in for questioning? No, no, not yet, not yet. He'll be here. He doesn't scare out. Mike found handkerchiefs soaking with blood. He, he said he was experimenting with rats. Hmm. I think he was sincere, though. He figured we were on the trail of those stolen formulas. He killed her, I tell you. If the police don't get him, I will. Oh, stop acting. You're too dead anxious to pin it on Spiegel. Yes, yes, and the good doctor threw the honor right back at Nelson. I'm on the fence. Spiegel had the motive, Nelson had the jealousy and the temper to do it. Each saw the girl about the time she died. Mike, if you ask me, you're passing up a bet. Hmm? The killer stuffed Lois into the trunk so her body could be smuggled out of the building. Find where the trunk was going and perhaps we'll have the address of the murderer. But she ordered the trunk picked up herself, Phil. Maybe she didn't. Anyway, it's worth a try. Hop in, Angel. We're heading for that transfer company. Appreciate it, sir. You're coming down and opening the office at this time of the night. Well, lucky my wife saw you were a policeman, or she'd never have let me out of the house. <laughs> uh, this is our dispatch office. Oh, uh, by the way, have you located your missing driver? Missing driver? I, I don't understand. Why, your traffic investigator came to the apartment. The driver that was to pick up the trunk had disappeared. He, he was checking up. Well, that's impossible. All of our men checked into that. And we don't have a, what did you call him, a traffic investigator? Mike. He was a fake. Mm-hmm. It's not so good. Probably never ran an elevator in the Rust Building either. This thing is getting screwier by the minute. Oh, here we are. Here's the pickup order on the trunk. It's under the name, uh, oh, yes, Phyllis Knight. Not under Lois Lavers. Well, let's see. It was a phone order. Received 5.25 p.m. Yeah. Trunk to be sent to 9053 Jennifer Street. Hmm? Mm. Seems to me I've heard that address before. 9053 Jennifer 9053 Jennifer. Yeah, there's something about it. I should hope so. It's the address of Michael Shane. I was right, Inspector. I was right. Lois was killed by mistake. It was intended to be Phil. Well, if that's the case, then Carter and Spiegel cancel out. Correct, honey. The murderer had planned to kill Phyllis, send her body in that trunk to my apartment, and leave me to explain it to the police. All right, maybe so. Say the motive is revenge. You got a hundred enemies, Mike. One of them poses as a transfer company investigator, but who is he? He didn't leave a single fingerprint in Phil's apartment. Where do we start looking? Oh, if I could only remember the guy. I, I know his voice. But where have I heard it? When did I? I must know him. Well, he didn't know me very well, or he'd never have killed the wrong girl. Lois and I were the same height, same color of hair, Mike, but that's all. Maybe maybe he figured you changed a lot, honey, if, if he hadn't seen you in a long time, if he'd been away, if he'd ha- been... Faraday! Yeah, if he'd been away in prison. Kids, we're going to make a phone call right now. Hello, give me San Quentin. Phil, Phil, honey, close that door to the other room. I yeah. can't hear a thing. Hello, Inspector Faraday, San Francisco calling. Yes, I want to speak to him personally. Might get on that extension phone. Hmm? Yeah, okay. Hello, Faraday. What's on your mind? Plenty, sir. We need a list of all prisoners you've released from your little sanatorium in the past two weeks. Past two weeks, huh? Yeah. I'm afraid it'll hardly make a list, Faraday. Only one man. What's his name? Now, let me see. That was Ford. Harold Ford. That mean anything to you, Mike? Hmm. Well, never heard of him. Oh, who's that on the phone, Mike Shane? Well, you got sharp ears, sir. We, uh, we figured maybe you had released a prisoner who had a grudge against me. Some old enemy of Mike's who might try his hand at revenge. Oh, that's the only release we've had lately. In fact, Mike, you can subtract one enemy from your book. Hmm? Died here last week. Al Smock. Al Sm- Holy jumping. Now I remember. 
It's Al Smock's brother, Jack Smock. That's right. He had a brother. Came up here and claimed the body. Does that mean anything to you? Ha-ha! Does it? Set an extra plate in your dining room, Chief. We're sending you a new border. Goodbye, sir, and thanks a million for your help. Jack Smock. Jack Smock. He must have dyed his hair and put on glasses. Phil, Phil, you remember the case, the two brothers, uh, about four years ago? Yeah, yeah, vaguely. It was, uh, it was manslaughter. You helped send the one called Al Smock up for 20 years. Right, honey, right. Jack was supposed to be brothers Al, alibi. Yeah. But our testimony tied him up in bow knots. Yeah, that's so right. So Al died in prison. Now, brother Jack is out for revenge. Oh, fine. But where is brother Jack right now, and how do we catch him? Got it, honey. Jack claimed the body, so he must have buried him. Now we got to find that body. <laughs> We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Due to their position, the front wheel bearings of your automobile are subject to damage from dirt, water, grit, and brake dust. Because of their more exposed position, and because they are so important to safe, easy driving, front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings well greased can mean wheel shimmy, hard steering, and weakening of the whole front assembly. For these reasons, your neighborhood Union Oil Minute Man uses extra care when he lubricates your front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvents. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are carefully assembled in the races and greased with special equipment. With each bearing snugly sealed in a smooth, sturdy coating of Union Oil ball roll grease, your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service is nominal, so for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil front wheel bearing service. Thank you. At police headquarters, Mike and Inspector Faraday each holds a telephone in his hands. They have checked every cemetery in the book. Well, here's the last one. Shadow Mountain Cemetery. Yes, sir. Here it is. Albert Smock, interred last Friday. The plot was bought by a Mr. Jack Smock. Swell, swell. Uh, what's his address? Our records show it as 1960 Waterfront. This is it, kids. Looks like a busted down rooming house. And somebody's head sticking out of every window. Yeah, there. There's a sergeant at the entrance. Good work, Sergeant. Anybody try to leave the building? No, sir. I got two boys at the back door, two in the alley, and two by the fire escape. Okay, let's go in, Mike. I'm coming, too. You are not. You want a hole in your head? I might get one just standing here, Smarty. Hmm? Smock may be in that crowd across the street. Something oh. to that, Mike. Yes. Sergeant, your job will be to take care of Miss Knight. We're all going in. Right. Come on. Oh, jeepers, it's dark again. Why don't they light these stairs? Quiet, honey, quiet. All right. He's on this next floor. If he's in his room. The landlord said room 305. Now, let me see. That'd be here to the left. Keep close to the wall. There it is. That door there. There's no light shining under it. Maybe he's playing possum. Sergeant, you and Phil stay here. Lighten out against the wall. Yes, sir. Now... You ready, Fanny? Ready. Mm, he's playing coy. Open up, Smock. You're completely surrounded. Okay, so you won't open up. All right, Fanny? Yeah. So that's his answer. Okay, Mike, let's go. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll get the light. Oh, hurry up, hurry up. Here it is. Happened. Mike! Oh, he's flat on the floor! Mike, are you all right? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, Inspector, okay. Climb out from under that table. We, I know somebody got hit, but who? He shot the gun right out of my hand. Yeah, I know. 
I didn't know where to aim in the dark till he fired, and I saw his flash. Thanks to you, Mike, I'm still breathing. Oh, well, this man on the floor won't be unless we get an ambulance quick. You found out. I didn't think... Uh, You're right, buddy. You didn't think, period. Revenge doesn't take much in the way of brains. Just an awful lot of lives. (laughs) Don't be silly, Phyllis. Mrs. Faraday will be glad to put you up for a couple of nights. Here, drink this down. He's right, honey. Stay out of your apartment for a few days till you sort of forget what's happened. Oh, all right. I was just thinking. Hmm? You know, this was a freak case. Everything stacked up so strongly against Nelson Carter and Dr. Spiegel. Mm -hmm. And yet at the last minute, it turned out to be almost a complete stranger. Because we were looking for the wrong motive. Yeah, I'm worried about that guy Spiegel. He looks to me like a guy who'd commit plenty of murders. And will before he gets through with his career. No, you can spike that, Faraday. Lock him up for stealing chemical formulas. That'll keep him quiet. Eh, not a bad idea. Keep him so busy making little ones out of big ones that he can't make dead ones out of live ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope, honey, that this little episode won't scare you out of the detecting business. Nearly getting bumped off by your boss's enemies. He's got plenty more enemies besides Jack Smock. Oh, I don't know. I'd stick anyway. My boss forgets the attractions of the job. What? <laughs> what? Why, honey! <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, and Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Holliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the early twilight, Broadway is dappled with beginning shadows. It's the time of the small shock. The springtime's day starts its long scream down into night. It's time clock time, the hour for going home again. Close the ledger, lock the store, figure the overtime, smile at the boss, and out into the street. Blink, then run. The subway waits for no man. Home again. End another day again. My day was just beginning, north on Broadway and to the east, Central Park around the 80s. I pushed through the crowd whose focus was a park bench that faced the street. All right, come on, come on, break it up there, let him through. And Sergeant Muggerman tells you why you're there. Right over here, Danny. Lying right there near the bench. I found the knife. I didn't pick it up. I ripped... Who's the boy? Paul, uh... Paul Gilbert. Yeah. I haven't been home from school yet. Oh, you'll go home in a squad car, Paul. I promised him with the siren, Danny. Yeah, with the siren. What happened, Paul? How did the knife get there? I saw the man take it out of his own back and throw it down. And then the man staggered away. Mm -hmm. Did I show you this, Danny? All this blood? Wherever he is, he's hurt real bad. I want you to think for a minute, Paul. What did this man look like? 
Tall, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's all. He was tall. Uh, most grown-ups are tall, aren't they, Paul? All of them, except for midgets. One more thing, Paul. Was there anyone with this man? Think hard. No, I don't think so. Well, you told me that... The other man I saw wasn't with him. The other man in the hat just watched him. Then the man in the hat ran away. He wasn't with him. What did the man in the hat look like? He had a hat. That's all I know. I got scared. I ran. That's right, Danny. Paul ran right into Officer Curcio on the beat. Almost knocked him down. Curcio came back, saw the blood on the bench, the knife, phoned it in. Paul, did you know the man, the man with the knife? No. Uh Uh-uh. I usually don't come home from school this way. We had an after-school game with the 8B2 over there on the playground. This is the first game of the intramural. squad car might have been for Paul with a siren. Then the careful tracing, the sifting through the shadows of a city, the dust of a city, the hiding places of a city into which a wounded man must crawl and lie for a time and then wander in search of a kindlier place, a darker place, and leave behind him the trail of the wounded, the blood of his life. But the man who'd been stabbed had done none of these things. The hospitals told me that, the doctors, the fellow in the neat white jacket in the drugstore across from the park, who, not having a wounded man, offered me a special on shaving cream. Then the legwork of the man on the beat, harvesting the crop of those who had been at the scene of the crime, sorting them, packaging them, parceling them out to me, one by one. Look, mister, how many rights do we have to give you guys? I was calling on my girl. I brought her a box of chocolate-covered peppermint. She was beginning to understand me. We won't keep you long. You don't understand, mister. I don't stick close to my little bird. She busts out of her cage. I've known her to do that when I pop out two minutes for a corner newspaper. You were in the park this afternoon, saw a man who was stabbed. Can you describe the man? I was never in no park where an unfortunate got stabbed. An officer took your name. You made him erase it, start all over again because he wasn't spelling it right. So you caught me in a lie. Can you describe the man who was hurt? Describe? Who got a chance to get close to him? Everybody pushing, shoving like it was a parade for a general. I'm lucky I got a peek at the top of his fleeing skull. Well, that's all. Look, uh, I want to explain why I lied about not being in the park. Uh, my girl, the bird, thinks I work for a living. It's a little white lie I used to keep a cage. That's all. You can go. Then the man who is eager, whose eyes dart and pierce, who follows you as you move away from him, stays close to you, needs the lapel of your coat. I was real close to him. He had a knife in his back. He breathed in my face. I could tell you the color of his eyes, how close I was. Tell me. Blue eyes, washed out blue, and no tears in them, no tears at all, no remorse for the evil doing that had brought wrath upon him. Blue eyes. What color hair? Dirty. A dirty color. All matted. No. No, it was blonde and shining. And it was a kind of light that shone about it. That's because he was dying. Dying in protest against all the wickedness that'll drown. Drown us all. A big man, a short man, a... What does it matter how he looked? I was close to him, I tell you. He reached out his hand to me, touched my hand, tears on my face. Help him out of your office. Motion a policeman over, watch him be gentle with the man, take him away. And then motion for the next one to come in realize, of course, that you're imposing on my time. Not that I mind. It could be a welcome relief from those spoiled monsters I simper and smile at and diaper. You're a nursemaid, Miss Cram, is that right? Call me governess and call me Virginia. Miss Cram doesn't sound like me at all, don't you think? You take the children to the park every day? Four to five thirty, except on rainy days. Hmm? On rainy days, the children and I stay at home and I'm permitted callers from four to five thirty. That's on rainy days. You told an officer you saw the man who was hurt. I was making conversation. I needed that to get those brats out of my hair. You didn't see him? I wouldn't have gone near him. But I can tell you who did see him, the looker. Who? The looker. All of us in the park know her. She sits in a window across the street on the fifth floor, watches every move we make every day. Sits there and watches. It makes you feel as if you're being spied on, you know what I mean? Fifth floor, in an apartment on 80th and 5th. Well, you can't miss her. Just stand out in the street for a while. Her eyes will bore right through you. But on a rainy day... I know, you're permitted callers. That's all, Miss Graham. Yes? 
I'm Danny Clover, police. <laughs> we haven't done anything. I know. I don't even know who you are. There's no name card on your door. You want to come in and talk to us? All right. I'm George Mason. She's my... in the wheelchair. Diane's my wife. Uh, good evening, Miss Mason. Diane? Diane, dear. Diane, we've got a visitor. He said good evening to you. Uh, say hello, Diane. This is Mr. Clover. He's from the police. Mr. Mason, there was some trouble earlier across the street from... Now, you talk to her, will you? I'm trying something. Maybe it'll do her some good, talking to her. No one ever does, you know. You just talk to her and I'll answer you. All right. There was a man stabbed across the street from you, Mrs. Mason, in the park. Yes, I heard about it when I came home. Have you found the man? No. Mrs. Mason, I understand that you sit by a window every day. That's right, that one. She sits there and watches. It's her pleasure. Today? Every day. Then she must have seen what happened. She must pretty, have... Uh... Pretty, pretty. What? What are you trying to say, Diane? Can't you see how it is? I'm sorry. George? Yes. What is it? I saw a man today. I saw a knife today. Is there anything you can do? Can you talk to her? Diane... A man today... A knife today. Yes, well, can you tell me what the man looked like, sweetheart? Knife. Was he a big man? Was he a small man? Was he a nice man? Man. Did you like him? Try to erase from memory the eyes of the woman filled with the named terrors, the known terrors that dart and scurry, gnaw and nibble at the fleeting instance of serenity within her. And try to wash away in the city's night screaming the crooning of a tuneless song. And suddenly, the known words, a man, a knife. And know that the eyes that absorb all movement, all shadow, all light on faces, and things that pass before them, have seen nothing. Not the man who was stabbed, not the one who did the stabbing. And then the long walk to the darkened room, turn on the shaded light bulb and search the cupboards for sleep. And finally, it comes. In the morning, the scorching cup of coffee, the walk to headquarters, and the cheery greeting on the threshold from the cheery Sergeant Attaglia. Oh, welcome, Danny. Welcome to your abode away from your abode. Uh, good morning, Gino. Ah, the best. The sunniest, the bravest. Uh, not so early. Uh, Gino, all I've had is a cup of coffee. For which I am delighted. Huh? For which I am delighted. Come, I will escort you to your office, Danny. You will see there how I have taken the liberty to spread upon your desk a repast. <laughs> I shouldn't have done it, Gino. A repast consisting of a hot paper container of coffee and a half a dozen cinnamon bums. What a... The repast. Partake. Uh, looks good. How else should they look? The cinnamon buns were baked in the oven of Mrs. Tartaglia with her own two lily whites. Go ahead, partake. Munch, if you like. Mmm, delicious. Uh, thank Mrs. Tartaglia for me. Goes without saying. And now, to the events of the morning. <clears throat> uh, okay if I disturb while you munch? Mm, yeah. yeah. We of the department have discovered that this park bench upon which an alleged man was allegedly stabbed has been a lucky bench. Or unlucky, depending, of course, on the point of view of whom sat there. You'll explain it to me, aren't you, no? Goes without saying. The lucky part of the bench is that five weeks ago a man found upon it, wrapped in a newspaper, $300. Turned it over to Lost and Found. So? So is that four weeks ago, same man turned into Lost and Found from the same bench a like newspaper containing another 300 and we have not seen this pleasant, honest citizen since. Do you have his name? Oh, it goes with our... <clears throat> uh, Harry Forster, 1345 West 16th. Want I should keep the cinnamon buns hot for you, Danny? Oh, do that, Gino. You go ahead and do that. Please help me. 
please come in and help me. What's the matter? My husband. No one will help me. I asked the neighbors. They said, call the police. Call an ambulance. Please, help Where is he? You'll help. He's in our bedroom. I think he's... I think he's dying, and no one would... No one... You're Mrs. Foster? Yes, Harry's wife. He came home last night, and... And there was blood. He just looked at me like an animal, and... There he is, mister. Help him. Please help him. Dead. No. No, you're wrong. He's been dead for a long time. He was asleep. Only asleep. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. On CBS this Sunday evening, Charlie McCarthy will play a tattoo artist for a group of sailors, while beautiful Ann Southern acts as his reluctant model. There'll be more fun with Eve Arden, Amos and Andy, Red Skelton, and Corliss Archer. Stay with CBS this Sunday, for these great comedy programs will be heard on most of these same stations. In the Maytime, the sun grins down and pats Broadway's cheek. Broadway loves it. The sunlit minutes are added to the ten-minute break for a cigarette. The walk is slower, the sway gentler. The windows are opened wide, and the doors, too. And glints of sunlight are carried through long hallways on the sigh of a summer's wind, touching the lips of the girl at the typewriter, touching the hand of the man at the water cooler watching her, touching the steel of the file cabinets, warming them. And having made the tour, back onto Broadway and start all over again. But where I was, there was no warmth. Only a woman drawing a shawl tight around her shoulders and talking quietly to her dead. Harry, Harry, listen to me. You were right. We should have told them. We should have told them all about it. And you wouldn't be like this, and I would Mrs. Foster, what should you have told us? What? What did you say? What should you and your husband have told us? About the money, nothing else. The money he found on the park bench? Yes. You see, we should have told them, Harry. But he did, Mrs. Foster. He reported it. Turned it in. You don't understand. I knew no one would understand. Then maybe you can help me. Friday was always Harry's day off. From the factory out there. You can see it from here, see. On his day off, I'd pack him a little lunch and he'd kiss me goodbye. Walk up town to Central Park. He... Go on. He always went alone. He always sat on the same bench. Harry used to describe it to me. What he saw, people he talked to. Felt as if I'd been there with him. And one day he found money in a newspaper. And turned it in, like you said. The next week turned it in. But after that, I told him he didn't have to do that anymore. You mean he found more money? Is that what you're trying to tell me? What? You mean he found more money? For five weeks in a row. I told Harry he didn't have to turn it in anymore. I told him to go back. To be sure and keep going back. Every week. Yesterday, too. (laughs) And we'd be rich. No more of this. No more factory. Why didn't you call us when he came home hurt? Call a doctor? It would have spoiled it, ended it. The money, don't you see? I thought he'd live, and we... With that money... No. You couldn't. You couldn't see. Then she turned from me and walked over to the window, stared out of it. Across her shoulder, into the noon sunshine, I could see the factory emptying its lunchtime employees... The crowd breaking off its fragments, to the curb with the lunch pails, to the push carts for the ham on white and coffee. Then the other sound, the feet in the doorway, the entrance of the professionals, coroner, photographer, reporter. The man had been murdered. I left.
Then back again to Central Park and the park bench of the stabbing. Sit on it. A man named Harry Foster used to find money here, and he was killed. And a woman who had seen it happen, a woman who sat at a window every day. I looked up to the window. She wasn't there. I wondered why. I knew why. She was in the wheelchair. There was a man pushing it carefully down the steps. Can you scooch a little to the side, friend? Oh, need a hand? Uh, yeah, if you want. Ah, thanks. How are you feeling, Mrs. Mason? She ain't gonna answer you. I didn't know she left the house. Why should you even bother? Oh, I'm Danny Clover, police. Oh, hi, I'm Ben Taylor. I got a you drive down the street. Only Mrs. Mason here, different. <laughs> kind of a take drive. Oh, I see. Just today? Oh, no, all the time. Uh, from one to three, yeah, the elements willing. I take her for a ride. Sometimes here, sometimes ride. there. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, right away, Miss Mason. Uh, see you, Danny. Oh, wait a minute. How long have you been doing this, Ben? Right. Well, since her accident. Since at Coney last year. Hide her back here and up here, her head. Right. Car, right. Uh, I guess I better take her. I heard her cry like that before. I can't stand it. Sure. It's a nice day, Mrs. Mason. I hope you enjoy your ride. Oh, she will. She likes riding in the car. See you around, Danny. I watched Ben lift her gently out of the wheelchair, lift her into the back of the car, close the door, fold the chair, place it in the car trunk, then back and saying something to her. She looked up for an instant. Her eyes found me. Then she smiled and shaped a lost word with her lips. They were gone. And back at headquarters, the wall clock ticking off the hours of Harry Foster's death, ticking off the hours that his murderer came to a park bench, looked at it, smiled, walked away in the warm sun, ticked off the question of why money had been left there for Harry Foster to find week after week on Friday's twilight. And at four o'clock, the door opening slightly, and all you saw of the man was his cocked head. You Mr. Danny Clover? That's right. You want something? Only to know if you, Mr. Danny Clover, and to give you what I have in my pocket. They said I should give it to you, you being the interested party and all. Uh, what have you got in your pocket? This. An envelope. Stamped and everything. I found it. Now give it to me. It's addressed to George Mason. Anybody can see that. That's the husband of that woman. The cripple. The one they call a looker in the papers. The one they think they saw that stabbing. <laughs> I did right bringing it to you. Huh? It's been opened. You open it? Don't lie to me. You opened it and then resealed it. All right, I opened it. I'm a normal kind of fellow with all the normal curiosities. First, I was going to mail it when I found it. But then I saw who was addressed to. I couldn't restrain myself. I'm like the proverbial cat, Mr. Clover. It could be I... trouble for you being like that. Not when you see what's in it. Not when you see what it says. It says, you've made a terrible mistake. That's all. Not another word. See? You can't do anything to me for just reading that. You just read it yourself. That's why I brought it to you. Because I'm a cooperative citizen. Now, where'd you find I, it? At Grant's tomb. You know, I've been curious about that tomb for years now. Finally, I took time off to go to study it. Then I found a letter on the steps. And I never did get to really study Grant's tomb. Tough. You'll stick around, huh? Some of our boys want to have a long chat with you. They enjoy curious fellas. Sure, anything you say. I'm nothing if I'm not cooperative. Just nothing. I wouldn't say that, but you stick around, huh? Hi, Ben. Well, hello, Danny. Hey, how do you like this, huh? I rigged up so when it's a sunny day, the telephone is on the outside of my shack. Inspiration, huh? Uh, fine. Who wants to be on the inside when outside it's sunny? <laughs> you car renting Danny? I can give you rates. No, uh, just talk. <laughs> if you don't do business together, we never become enemies, huh? What's on your mind? Mrs. Mason. Ah, oh, yeah. Sad, huh? You know, if you set your mind to it and consider all she's been through, and then look at her, she's a pretty woman. I noticed. You said she was hurt in an accident at Coney Island, Ben. What, what kind of an accident? Uh, on a roller coaster. You know, one of them rides. Fell off. Right near the end of the ride. She stood up. Fell. Was she with anyone? Uh, yeah, her husband. You want to know something? In spite of the heartbreak of having a wife like that, you know, Mr. Mason is one of the nicest guys I ever met. What about Mrs. Mason, Ben? 
Hmm? What about it? Can anyone ever talk to her, have a conversation with her? I talk to her. About what? Hmm. Things. You know, uh, ain't it a pretty day, Mrs. Mason? Is there a draft on you, Mrs. Mason? I talk to her, but she just hums and sings. But you know, I think she's getting better. It, maybe I'm contributing. Where'd you go driving today? Um, down Riverside Drive. You know, the river, Grant's tomb, the churches. Thanks a lot, Ben. Any time, Danny, any time at all. Oh, hello, Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mr. Mason. We're, we're delighted to see you. Please come in. Diane, it's Mr. Clover. Diane looks better, doesn't she, Mr. Clover? Yes, yes, she does. I brought you something, Mr. Mason. Here. Huh? A letter? It's addressed to you. Read it. I don't understand. Read it. Yes, it is. It's addressed to me. But it's been opened. That's right. Read it. All right. The note says you made a mistake, Mr. Mason. <laughs> Mrs. Mason, your husband might be electrocuted for a murder he committed. Leave her alone. I wasn't going to touch her. Cut it out, Mrs. Mason. What's the matter with you? Have you gone out of your mind, Clover? I said cut it out, Mrs. Mason. I told you leave her alone. All right, you've come here to accuse me of murder, but leave her alone. George. Don't, don't worry about anything, dear. Get me a drink of water. What? What did you say? A drink of water, George. Cold water from the refrigerator. Diane. Darling, a drink of water. Do it. You won't be able to wait on me anymore. Mr. Clover's going to take you away from me. You're talking like... like you know what you're saying. You do know what you're saying. What's happening? What's happening to us? It's already happened. It's all over. <laughs> Poor George. It paid off, didn't it, Mrs. Mason? Sitting at the window watching. Watching for a man your husband could kill. Simple little man. He came and sat on the same bench every Friday. He got paid for a while. It was you. You wrote that first letter to Han. And this one. Made me pay blackmail to a man who didn't even know me, didn't know anything about me. It was so simple. Write a letter, put a stamp on it, drop it from the car. Someone picked up the first letter and mailed it. About five weeks ago, a letter with instructions in it. Why, yes. Leave money every Friday on the park bench. And the man who picked it up, Mr. Mason, you thought was a blackmailer, so you killed him. She's crazy. She really is. She's crazy. No, I'm not. I'm just a cripple, George. I can't move from this chair. Honest. But I'm not crazy. He's crazy. What did that first letter say, Mr. Mason? Well, that a man saw me push my wife off a ride at Coney Island. He demanded blackmail, but I didn't push, Diane. <laughs> then why did you pay the money, darling? But you weren't going to let your husband alone, were you, Mrs. Mason? Even after he did what you wanted him to do, murder a man. Another letter that one your husband's holding, telling him he killed the wrong man. It's not much to ask, is it? Wanting George to suffer? Look at me. You're an accessory, Mrs. Mason. Am I? What can you do to me? A cripple in a wheelchair. In a prison? Will that be different? Tell me how. I didn't push you, Diane. I didn't push you. You fell off that ride. You fell. Liar. Diane. You're a liar, George. Diane, will you listen to me? I made it up to you. I carried you. I waited on you. I, I went crazy that day. I hated you. I don't know why. I don't know. Oh, I know why. You're an evil woman. Evil. Poor George. You should have died. You should have. You should have. <laughs> Poor George. Poor <laughs> In 
It's night on Broadway now. There's easy laughter, and a trumpet scurls its music into the grinning mob. It's top of the evening. Have another drink on me, kid, and let's sit this dance out. It's a street gouged out of a scarlet dream. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lamont Johnson was heard as George Mason, Kathy Lewis as Diane Mason, and Virginia Gregg as Mrs. Foster. Others in the cast were Herb Vigran, Lou Krugman, and Johnny McGovern. Every Saturday night, Jan Murray takes a tip from Danny Clover and goes looking for people. Only Jan's beat is the United States. By coast-to-coast phone, he offers a grand in cold, hard cash if you can identify the phantom voice. So stay tuned now as Jan Murray and Sing It Again follow immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Presented by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux clear gloss, Linux cream polish, and Linux self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, the funeral wreath, or Nick Carter and the mystery of the white verbenas. In just a moment, we'll hear how Nick Carter made a funeral wreath give him the answer to a cold-blooded murder. But first, a word of advice. As a homemaker, you know what a job it is to keep a home attractive. That's why you've appreciated the new beauty which Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, has brought to your walls. And that's why you'll appreciate Linex Cream Polish, which restores your furniture's original handsomeness in one quick, easy application. Yes, Linex Cream Polish saves one whole step in your housekeeping routine, for it cleans as it polishes without tiresome rubbing. And it removes cloudy dust and polish accumulation, banishes fingerprints, helps to conceal ugly scratches, drying to a hard finish that leaves no oil to attract more dust. So ask for Linex Cream Polish now at your hardware, paint, or department store. Headquarters for all three great Linex home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that covers in one coat. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As we look in on Nick's office, we find Lieutenant Riley telling Patsy and Nick about a rather unfortunate experience. Well, it's like this, you see, Nick. Tonight, after old man Bramwell gave me the devil this morning about there being four robberies on his street in three weeks, I picked the best man I got on the force. And I sent him up to Pine Street, where all these robberies been taking place, and I told him to watch like his life depended on it. Mm-hmm. And then about one o'clock this morning, I got to thinking about it. And I decided to go up there and have a look for myself. Uh, just to be sure, you know. Sure, I know. The demon of the police force goes on the job himself. Oh, now, look, Nicky, you're going to let me tell this or not? Sorry, Riley, go on with your story. Well, like I said, uh, I went to Pine Street myself, and I found the cop I'd sent up there was right on the job, okay. 
and everything was quiet as, as far as I could see. So I asked him how he was making out. Nothing stirring so far, Lieutenant. No suspicious characters around at all. You've been right here all the time, eh, Green? Oh, every minute, Lieutenant. Good. I just dropped around to be sure. Uh, Lieutenant, have you got a minute to spare? What do you mean, have I got a minute? Well, it's like this. My wife's having a baby tonight, I expect. Oh. Uh, she went to the hospital this afternoon, uh, just before I came on duty. And being as how I'm out here where no one could reach me, I, well, I, I just kind of thought I'd... I'd you like want to her find out. to see if you're a father yet? <laughs> well, yes, sir. <laughs> and I, I thought that if you wouldn't mind watching here a minute, I, I just phoned from the drugstore just around the corner. Only take me a minute, sir. Oh, if you sure, sure. Go ahead and phone. I'll wait until you come back. But, but don't stand gabbing for a half an hour, man. Oh, oh I, I won't, sir. So he went off and left you all alone, huh? Oh, too bad. I say it was too bad. If we'd both been there, we might have got that dirty crook. So what happened then, Lieutenant? Well, I, I stood there in the shadow of the corner house, you see, watching. Uh-huh. And a moment later, I saw a dark figure come out of old Bramwell's house, which was just two doors up the street. Now, I knew Bramwell and his wife lived there alone with, with only a maid, so I wondered who it would be coming out there at that time of night. And what made me even more suspicious, there was no light on in the hall, like there would be if somebody was saying goodnight to him. So I says to myself, I'll just go over and find out who he is, because I'm not taking no chances tonight. And you went over? I did that. The guy just stood there at the top of the steps. He seemed to be fumbling with, with something in a bag there. And as soon as I got up to the house, he turned around and, and hung something right beside the door. But it was too dark to see what it was at first. But as he started down the steps, I saw it was a funeral wreath with a long streamer of purple ribbon on it. How was the man dressed, Riley? Just like an undertaker, Nick. Black gloves and a tall hat and a long black coat. Could you see his face? No, not very well in the dark, Patsy. Well, I wasn't looking for nothing like that. So I asked him who was dead. I regret to inform you that Mr. George Bramwell has just passed away. Bramwell, you say? Old man Bramwell himself? Yes, very suddenly. Almost in his sleep, you might say. Oh, and he was down to see me just this morning. Looking fine, he was. Yes, very sad. Well, if you'll pardon me, I must be going. Uh, Allow me to present you with one of my cards. In case you ever have need of a man in my profession. A card? Oh, yeah, thanks, thanks. This is J. Atherton Osgood, mortician. Yes. If you should ever need my services, I shall be happy to be of service in any way I can. J. Atherton Osgood. Osgood. There ain't no undertaker in this town by that. Hey, you, just a minute. There ain't no one. So long, copper. Lieutenant, Lieutenant, what happened? Uh, That man, the the one with the black bag. There's nobody on the street, Lieutenant. What happened to you? The undertaker. He knocked me down. (laughs) What's that? That that came from Bramwell's house. Uh, Come on. Come on. Are you all right, sir? Can you walk? Of course I can walk. Let's get going. (laughs) What's the matter here, lady? What are you screaming about? Look there. Bramwell. With his head all smashed in. Oh, gosh, Lieutenant, no wonder you're worried. I'm afraid to read what the newspapers will say. I can see him now. Lieutenant Riley of the Metropolitan Police talks to murderer on steps of murder's man's home and then is tricked into letting him go. Oh, it is a sorry day for me. Well, Riley, feeling sorry for yourself isn't going to hurt you anywhere. This man interests me. Huh? He goes to commit a murder and takes a funeral wreath along to hang on the door of his victim's home. That's a new one on me. Nick, why don't you give Riley a hand? See if you can't find this crook for him. I think I will, Patsy. That is, if Riley wants me to. Wants you to? What do you think I've been telling you this for? Just to pass the time of day? Very well, Riley, very well. Since you begged me so politely, I'll be only too happy to put my talents at your disposal. Where do we begin, Nick? Now, you say the murderer wore gloves. So you must have left no fingerprints behind him. Yeah, that's right, Nick. And I went all through the Rolls Gallery this morning. And there's nothing there that looks like him. Which leaves us, if I'm not mistaken, with two clues. The funeral wreath and the card he gave you. Uh, neither one of them is worth the tinker's dam. No? Why not? Well, that's the same kind of wreath they tack on anybody's door when there's a death in the family. And you certainly don't think that guy forked over his own card, do you? You're wrong on both counts, Riley. Now, how do you figure that, Nick? Well, take the card first. May not be, probably isn't his own, but it's somebody's card. Look at it, Patsy. It's not printed, it's engraved. Mm-hmm, you're right. 
If it was a phony, chances are it would just be a printed one. Ah, good morning, folks. Beautiful morning. Lovely morning, isn't it? Yes, nice I'll take you. You, you report. Hi, Johnny. Oh. Come on in. Oh, morning, Johnny. You're just in time. Now, look here, it? Johnny. Would you see if you dare to print a word of this in that yellow rag you work for? I'll... Now, now, for... now. Hold on, Lieutenant. It's not a yellow rag, and I don't work for it. I'm a feature writer and not a reporter. So just keep your shirt on, huh? Whatever it is, it's getting you all hot and bothered. Riley's in the spot, Johnny. And the very thought of publicity makes him squirm. Oh, fear not, fear not, lovely policeman. Your secret shall be locked forever within the four walls of my heart. Lovely policeman. Hey, Nick, what's this all about? <laughs> it's a long story. I'll give you the details later. But right now, I've got a job for you, if you have time to do it. Huh? Always at your service, Nicholas. And the beautiful Patsy. Speak on. I want you to get hold of someone who can let you into the public library. At this hour of the day? I don't care if it is early in the morning, and I don't care how sore they get about letting you in. But dig up somebody who can find you a copy of the Mortician's Annual. The Mortician's Annual? Yes, you know. It's the Undertaker's trade publication. See if you can find an undertaker named J. Atherton Osgood. Uh, J. Atherton Osgood, huh? All right, then what? Come back here and let me know what it says about him. And make it a rush order. This can't wait. Huh? Consider it done, Nicholas. I'm on my way. to loop. Nick, are you batty? Do you mean to tell me you think that guy's name really was J. Atherton Osgood? Not at all, Riley. But since it's a genuine business card, he must have picked it up somewhere along his travels. This man Osgood may help us get a line on him. That's too much for me, Nick. Uh, you want me for anything more here? No, not just now, Riley. I'll let you know if I do. Well, what are you going to do? I'd rather be shot than do what I have to do, Nick. What's that, Lieutenant? Go down to headquarters and explain to the reporters how it happened that that crook got away from me last night. <laughs> oh, well, well, good luck to you. And you better put a shamrock over your left ear for luck. Okay, Nick, okay, have your fun. But you're laughing at a sick man. So long. So long, Lieutenant. <laughs> I uh, don't envy Riley when the reporters get after him. Well, Patsy, we've got something to do ourselves. Get me the latest city directory. It's right here, Nick. I was using it. What do you want to know? I want a list of all the florists in the city. What on earth for? We're going to call on them and see which of them made this funeral wreath and for whom. So get busy. Nearly through, Patsy? Just a couple more, Nick. But what a list. Maybe we'll be lucky and only have to call on a few of them. I should hope so. Why, if we have to call on... Hi, folks. Your messenger is back. Johnny. Well? Oh, yes, yes. Very well. I might say okay. Well, what do you mean? Well, I routed out the sweetest little redhead sub-third assistant librarian you ever saw. His name was Myrtle O'Toole. And I got her to open one of the branch libraries for me. Did you get what I wanted? That? Sure. Uh, Myrtle was kind of sore at me for making her lose her beauty sleep, but, uh, I soothed her. Oh, yes, I soothed her. Mm, Casanova Winters in person. Johnny, what did you find out? Uh, hey, Yannick, down in black and white. J. Atherton Osgood, Funeral Chapel, Akron, Ohio. Yep. Johnny, Patsy, and I are going out. I want you to go through the files and see what you can find that has to do with Akron. Right, Nick. Uh, about what date? Say, um... Stay within the last year. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure of the dates yet. I finished the list, Nick. You want to go now? Yes, Patsy. The sooner the better. Okay. Get your hat and let's be on our way. Hey, Nick. Where are you going with that funeral wreath? I don't know for sure, Johnny. But I hope to hang it around a murderer's neck before long. So Nick believes the funeral wreath, which the killer hung on his victim's door, will lead him to the killer himself. What can there be about that wreath that makes it such an important clue? We'll see in just a moment. Ever notice how much a shining, clean floor adds to the appearance of any room? All your rooms will look brighter, more attractive, when you protect your wood floors and linoleum with Linex Clear Gloss, the durable coating that flows on easily without brush marks, drying to a hard, tough finish which wears and wears and looks well for a long, long time. Linex Clear Gloss gives a lustrous, transparent finish to all wood or linoleum surfaces in your home, resisting boiling water, hot grease, perfume, fruit acids, even alcohol. And it's so easy to keep clean. For Linex Clear Gloss keeps the dirt on the surface where it's easily wiped away. Its gleaming beauty, its protective durability, make it a standby in thousands of American homes. So get it now. Famous Linex, spelled L-I-N dash X. Linex Clear Gloss. The ideal way to protect your floors and woodwork. 
Remember to ask for it at your paint hardware department store, where you'll find all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that dries in one hour. And now back to our story. We left Nick and Patsy trying to find the florist who made the funeral wreath which the killer hung on the door of the man he had just murdered. That's it, Patsy. Just ahead. Uh-huh. I, Silverman. Well, I hope this florist can tell you more than the other four we visited. They didn't know from nothing. I hope this wreath doesn't get worn out before I find out who made it. Yes, what is it? Did this funeral wreath come from your shop? From my shop. Let me see. No, it couldn't be from here. All day yesterday, business was very bad. I send out not one single order all day. Only two customers. All right, I'll uh, I'll take your word for it. But how about the day before? Did you send it out then, perhaps? That's not possible, mister. These flowers, they are too fresh. They could not have been picked before yesterday. Or so fresh, they wouldn't be now. You mean the wreath was definitely made up yesterday? Sure, mister. Couldn't be before yesterday. The flowers, they are too fresh. Any idea who might have made it up? That I couldn't say, mister. It's a very ordinary piece. Could be anybody made it. Okay, thanks. Uh, come sometime when you want to buy something, maybe? Yes, mister? Thanks, I will. Any luck, Nick? No. I did find out the wreath was definitely made yesterday, but that's all. Oh. Well, who's next on the list? Before we visit the next place, I want to call Johnny and ask him what he found. Maybe that'll give us a lead. I found three notices in the Akron police, Nick. Any of them the man we want, Johnny? Well, I, I can't tell. Descriptions are so general, they don't mean much. What are the dates on them? Well, one is dated almost a year ago. One is dated about three months ago, and, and the other is two months ago. I see. Well, not much help there, I'm afraid. And, uh, wait a minute. Two of the men are wanted for murder and robbery, and the other for robbery alone. Okay, Johnny, sit tight. I may need you again. So long. So long, Nick. I gather he didn't find anything that will help us. No, not without some additional evidence. Too bad. Well, I'd better call on the next florist on our list. That's the only lead we have that's any good. Mr. Schwartz? That's right. Could you tell me if you made this wreath? Did I make it? No, mister, I did not make it. Well, could you tell me who might have made it? Let me look. Hmm. Yes. I could not say for certain, mister, but I am in this business a long time, and I think this was not made by the florist. Oh? That's so. Are you sure? Hmm. No, I am not sure. But it looks as if it was made by someone who has seen a lot of wreaths like this, but it's not a regular florist. Someone who's seen a lot of wreaths like it, but not a professional florist. Funny none of the other florists noticed that. They probably were not as experienced in the business as I am. Or they did not look closely enough. I am sure it is not professional. And, well, another thing. These flowers. Yes? Like a book, I know, all the greenhouses around here. And not one of them grows flowers like these. That I'm sure. Thanks very much. You've told me a lot, Mrs. Schwartz. So long. Goodbye, mister. Any luck this time, Nick? Patsy, I think we've got something. Oh, good. What is it? Find me a telephone. I want to talk to Mr. J. Arthur Osgood of Akron. Mm-hmm. Oh, thin, sallow-looking man. Thin cheeks. Looked like a cartoon of old man gloom. I see, Mr. Osgood. And you say he left your employ very suddenly? Yes, it was about three months ago. He went home one night, and he never showed up again. No word from him at all. That's the man, all right. Thanks very much, Mr. Osgood. Could he help you, Nick? Yes, Patsy. He says he had a man working for him as undertaker's assistant who left him suddenly about three months ago. And his description of the man agrees with Riley's description of the man who killed Bramwell last night. So what do we do now? Visit some more floors? No, Patsy. We visit some undertakers. so sure the killer works for an undertaker, Nick? It's logical, Patsy. He apparently came to town about three months ago. 
But he started these robberies, as far as we know, only three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Now, what could be more natural than for him to get a job at the trade he knew, undertaker's assistant? That would give him time to look over the town and decide where he wanted to pull his jobs. And it would also legalize his being in town in case anything came up to question it. Well, we've tried seven undertakers, and none of them had any nice, fresh assistants. Hope we have better luck at this next one. <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. Carter, we do have a new assistant, a Mr. Carnes, a very fine man, most efficient. Came here about three months ago, but I'm sure he can't be the man What you does are... he look like? Why, he's about as tall as you are, not nearly as heavily built. His cheeks are thin, and he looks rather like... Like old man gloom? Well, I wouldn't like to say that, but he does. Well, now that you... Mention it, he does rather resemble that character, yes. I'd like to see him. Why, he's not here today, Mr. Carter. He's home packing his bag. Packing his bag? You mean he's leaving town? Oh, just overnight, that's all. We're shipping one of our late <clears throat> clients to Cleveland. Uh, Mr. Carnes is going with a body to deliver it to relatives there. I see. Well, do you mind telling me where your Mr. Carnes lives? Why, I'm not sure, Mr. Carter. I've never become that friendly with Mr. Great Carnes. heavens, man. Surely you know where your own employees live. Oh, but he's not one of my employees, Mr. Carter. I'm not the head of this establishment. Mr. Grayson is. He could tell you, of course. Well, where's Mr. Grayson? I'll ask him. I'm very sorry to say he's not here today. Not here? No, he's been called out into the country to supervise a very special... All right, all right. And you say you don't know Carnes' home address? No, I don't. But I believe he lives on Oakmont Terrace, if I remember correctly. Oakmont Terrace? Yes, Mr. Carter, but I don't know the number. I'll find it. I'll... Oh, by the way, this body that Carnes is taking to Cleveland, who got it ready for shipment? Why, our Mr. Carnes did. He came to work early this morning in order to get it ready in time, and now he's... Thanks, that's all I want to know. So long. I mean just that, Riley. He lives on Oakmont Terrace, but I don't know the number. Now listen, Riley. Meet me at the corner of Oakmont and Danbrew as soon as you can. Okay. I want you to identify the man for me when I find him. I'll be out there in two shakes of a lamb's tail, Nick. I want to get my hands on that guy. I'll give him the worst trip. Yes, I know, I know, Riley, but wait till we catch him first. See you at Oakmont and Danbrew in 20 minutes. Just drive slowly along the street, Patsy. I want to see if I can get any clue to which is Carnes' house. You don't expect to find him sitting on his doorstep, do you, Nick? Hardly, Patsy. But one of the florists I visited gave me an idea. An idea about what? About the flowers and that wreath. He said that... Ah, there. That's the house. My hunch was right. You mean the house where Carnes lived? Yes, I'm sure of it. Why, Nick, how can you tell? By the garden in front of the house. Well, what can... Oh, there's Riley putting around the corner up there. Shall we go meet him? Yes. I want to get this over with as soon as I can. Right. Hey, Nick. What's cooking? Just this, Riley. I feel sure the killer of old man Bramwell lives in that gray bungalow up the street. Huh? I think he's probably in there now. I'm going in and see. You wait outside in case he gets away from me. Oh, but why not let me go in? Because you know him when you see him. I don't. So you wait outside. And you, Patsy, stay down here at the corner out of the way. But suppose he tries to shoot you, Nick. Wouldn't it be safer to take Riley in? If there's any shooting, Riley can come in and give me a hand. I'll do that, Nick, and happy to get a shot at that rat. Okay, let's get going. Leave your car here so he won't suspect anything if he should happen to look out the window. Yeah, sure. Hey, well, how'd you happen to get on the track of this mug? Investigation, Riley. Huh? Investigation and deduction, plus common sense. That don't tell me much. I'll give you the details later. All right, here's the house. Now, remember, stay here unless they're shooting, or unless he gets away from me. Mm-hmm. Then you grab him. Right, Nick. And good luck. Well? Mr. Carnes here? Uh, yes, that second door there. Shall I call no. him? No, for... he's expecting me, thanks. Oh, all right. You can go right in, then. Thanks. 
Hey, what the... Your name Carnes? Yeah, so what? I want to talk to you. Is that any reason for busting into a guy's... I mean, is that any reason why you should enter my room without knocking? Why, yes. I was afraid I might not catch you if I lost any time. You seem to be leaving town. I don't know what you have in your mind, but I'm sure I'm not the one you want to see. I don't believe I know you. Well, I know you. You work for Grayson the Undertaker, don't you? You're leaving town to chaperone a dead body to Cleveland. That's quite correct. I know a lot more, too. I know you killed George Bramwell last night in cold blood and took 3000 in cash and 10000 in jewels from a safe. It was a pretty slick stunt to impersonate a departing undertaker and leave the wreath in the door. Go on, you interest me. But that was where you made your mistake, Carnes. Because a florist told me that wreath wasn't made by a real florist, but by someone who's seen lots of them. So I figured that the killer who might have worked for an undertaker sometime was you. So you picked me out as the culprit. There's another mistake to use that card you picked up in Akron. Gave us a good line on you. Of course, going into the undertaking business here was an excellent idea. From your point of view... Gave you a splendid chance to find out where the rich homes were located without attracting attention. Is that all? Not quite. I have a hunch that if we were to pry up the lid of that casket you're going to chaperone out of town, we'd find you'd hidden the loot in there. This is all very entertaining. But so far, you haven't shown any proof that connects this wild story up to me. So I must ask you... How about this, then? That homemade funeral wreath was made of white verbenas. A very uncommon flower around here. And there's a fine bed of verbenas growing in front of this house. The only white verbenas anywhere around here. So put on your hat, Carnes, and we'll go out and let Lieutenant Riley identify you as the man who slugged him last night. You can go to... Oh! 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 Should take, should take better aims, Carnes. If you really hope to shoot your way out. You got nothing on me. I was just trying to... Whatever you're trying to do, that shot you fired just now was a signed confession of guilt. Yeah, you're all right, Dick. Did you get it? Yes, yes. Everything's under control, Riley. There's your killer. Hey, that's the guy, all right. Convicted by his own funeral wreath, which is poetic justice if I ever heard it. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. Here's a suggestion. Give your floors a handsome surface in a jiffy with Linex self-polishing wax. The liquid wax you simply wipe on without rubbing or polishing. Linex self-polishing wax keeps all your floors, wood, tile, and linoleum, looking their shining best. Yet it's so quick to use, and it dries to an elastic, satiny finish that wears amazingly and is unusually resistant to dirt and water. It contains the greatest possible amount of genuine carnauba wax with no gum, shellac, or resin to chip or crumble. So get it now, Linex Self-Polishing Wax, to keep your floors beautiful the easy way. If your dealer hasn't yet received his supply of the three great Linex home brighteners, he'll probably have them soon. Ask him to save one or all of them for you. Acme will see that he gets them, and you get them, as quickly as possible. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. How about it, Nick? Have you got something new and exciting for us next week? I think so, Ken. In the courtyard of a new and expensive apartment building, the body of a man was found floating in the lily pool. With a large knife in his back. There was practically nothing to tell us who did it or why. But when I got started on the investigation, I found a very confusing trail that took me all over town in unexpected directions. And led right to the murderer, thanks to a costly mink coat. Which, unfortunately, did not belong to me. Patsy, you made a nice little sum of money out of that coat, even if it wasn't yours. (laughs) True enough. (laughs) That was some compensation for what I went through. Well, it sounds interesting, Nick. What do you call the story? I call it Death in the Pool. Or the Mystery of the Mink Coat. And that's all until next week. So long. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled... Death in the Pool. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mink Coat. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated.
It is presented at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linex home brighteners. Linex clear gloss, Linex cream polish, and Linex self-polishing wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. In the Nick Carter Adventures, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Helen Choate is featured as Patsy. Lieutenant Riley is played by Humphrey Davis. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. Richard Diamond's Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, handy hints on homicide. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Just pick a victim. All right. Got it? Yes. Six of spades. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Helen. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight, Rick? Uh, depends on how many lights you leave on in the study. But are you coming over? Wouldn't miss it. I've been puckered up since 8 o'clock this morning. Francis has the night off. I'll have dinner for you in by the fire. Well, take it easy. The last time you built a fire, it got so hot I had to keep basting myself for a week. Oh, Rick. Sure. The next day I walked by Linda's and some guy grabbed me and shoved an apple in my mouth. <laughs> Said he'd get fired if I didn't climb back in the window and lie down. Oh, I'll see you tonight. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. Where did I put the soap? Mr. Diamond? Well, it depends on what you want him for. If it's the rent, he's being buried over in Jersey this afternoon. My name is Dr. Edward Gerson from Bellevue Hospital. I have nothing to do with the rent. Well, if you're with the Sanity Commission, Diamond's still in Jersey. It is apparent that you are behind in your rent and you wish to remain buried in Jersey for the moment. Well, it's not as bad as it sounds. Are you a potential client? I'm a psychiatrist, Mr. Oh. Uh... Well, pick a good one. How about Apple Knocker? All right. I'm in a rather peculiar position, Mr. Applenocker. Oh, I don't know. I always sit like that. <laughs> for the past four days, I've been treating a young man for an unusual type of shock. What did he do? Run his electric train in the bathtub? <laughs> You're quite an interesting case yourself. Are you always so unconcerned when someone comes to you with a problem? Look, doctor, everybody's got a problem. That's why I'm in business. If you've got a big one, you'll get by uh, my little remarks, and I'll be glad to see what I can do for you. Quite a philosophy. All right, then. Let's both get down to business, Mr. Apple knocker. Oh, now, uh, what's your trouble? This boy I mentioned, he disappeared five days ago. Hmm? You said you'd been treating him for four days. He couldn't have been gone very long. A day and a night. Hmm. He was found the next morning wandering through the Bowery. Unable to speak, unable to understand anything. I see. Someone took him to Bellevue. Luckily, the family's private physician is also on the staff at Bellevue. He saw the boy and called the family immediately. And you've been treating him ever since? Yes. Last night, the boy began to talk, make reasonable sense. Now, this would continue for perhaps a few hours, then he would lapse into a complete state of confusion. Each time he was given a sedative, and each time, as the sedative wore off, he talked for a while, knew who he was, started to tell about the missing night, and then lapsed once more into this state of, well, confusion. Hmm. And you think something happened during this missing night, and he doesn't want to remember it. Correct. Did you ever study psychology? Uh, every day, Doctor. I get enough screwy cases in here to make your clientele look like a bunch of Einsteins. And now stop unlocking my mind. There's a draft. <laughs> well, as you said, this boy won't let himself remember something that happened on that missing night. He'll talk about everything up to that point, but the minute he reaches it... Yeah, he jumps the tracks. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> uh, what do you want me to do? You uh, know what I want you to do, Mr. Diamond. Okay, okay. Now, here's one that will throw you. You know what I want you to do? <laughs> the boy's family is quite willing to meet any expense that you feel is necessary. Oh, remind me not to take you on a double date. <laughs> if I don't discover what happened to this boy on the night in question, I'm afraid he might lose his mind permanently. These periods of confusion are becoming more frequent, and sooner or later, 
he won't be able to distinguish between the real and the unreal. I'm going to put him under narco-synthesis this evening, and I'd like you to be present. All right, Doctor. What's the boy's name? William Carter. Be at Bellevue at 8 o'clock and ask for me. The boy's family will be there also, and you can tell them about your fee. Now, uh, just give me a quick answer and leave my motives alone. Is his family wealthy? Quite. And I'll see you at 8 o'clock, Dr. Gerson. You uh, would have anyway. Goodbye, Mr. Applenocker. You know, you can feel pretty silly when a guy like that walks in and answers all your questions before you got time to think him up. Anyway, I remembered my dinner date with Helen and put in a fast call to the little redhead. She was unhappy, naturally, but she said something about me holding the pucker and to drop around whenever I had the time. At 8 o'clock, I was standing in the long hall at the Bellevue Hospital. Dr. Murray, report to the second floor desk, please. Dr. Murray, to the second floor desk. Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, hello, Dr. Griffin. What's the matter? Dr. You look a little Hacker, nervous. Please, the hospitals bother me. That's very Dr. interesting. Hacker, please, the family please. is at the end of the hall. Let's go down. Uh, tell me, Doctor, just what exactly happens when you put William Carter under this narcosynthesis? It's an intravenous injection. It unlocks those little doors in the back of his mind. Gets him to talk. You'll see. It's really very amazing. Uh, right here. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Mrs. Carter. How's the boy? Uh, not much change. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. and Mrs. Carter. How do you How do? How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, Dr. Gerson wants me to find out what happened to your son the night he was missing. Have you any idea? He said he had a date. When I asked him who it was, he wouldn't tell me. That's all we know. I think William will be able to recreate what happened for you, Mr. Diamond. Now I'll leave you to discuss uh, business. And when you are through, stop at the desk. We'll show you where I am. Well, I... <laughs> well, I, I... Yes, Mr. Diamond. What is your fee? Oh, thank you. Believe me. A uh, hundred a day in expenses. And uh, your retainer? One day's work. Mr. Diamond... Can you help our boy? Uh, Mrs. Carter, I I don't really know. I'll write you a check. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, Mrs. Carter, uh, whatever it is that's strong enough to make your son jump his, uh, uh, lose his memory, it might you be... You think maybe it's something bad? I know it's something bad. How bad? I, I've got to find out. I hope it's not uh, more serious than I think. Oh, yes, I know. Here you are, Mr. Diamond. Oh, thanks. I'll keep in touch. I left the Carters with that lousy feeling in my stomach. I looked at the check. Two hundred bucks. For what? Maybe a down payment on a man's sanity. Maybe not. William Carter could have done a lot of things that missing night. Maybe that two hundred bucks was going to be a mortgage on murder. I went down to the desk, and an intern showed me downstairs to a small room with one desk lamp in the corner. I'm glad you didn't take too long. The patient will be down in a minute. Oh, uh, isn't this a little irregular, Doctor? I mean, uh, uh, oh, me listening in on a man's secrets? If he's done something against the law, I want you to find out whether it really happened. Well, if he tells you about it, it must have happened. He might have thought it happened. I can't take the chance. If he's committed some sort of a crime, I don't think I'll be able to do much for him. Now, I want you to sit behind that screen there and be perfectly quiet. Sure. Comfortable? Oh, yes, yes. The needle can't reach this far. Uh, this uh, should be quite interesting for you, Diamond, particularly in your kind of work. Uh, you can find out about uh, anything you want with this stuff, can't you, Doctor? If it's a recent shock, why? Oh, I was just thinking about a little blonde I know. Now, here he is. Uh -uh. Roll him right over here. Uh, oh. Now lift him over on the bed. Uh, oh. It's all right, William. Uh, Everything's going fine. Oh. All right, thank you, nurse. How do you feel, William? Uh, Can you understand me? Uh, say it again. Say it again. Can you understand me, William? Yes. Yes, yes, but keep talking. Say anything. Just, just make my mind stop jumping around. Sure. Uh, it's nice in this hospital, isn't it? Huh? It's nice in this hospital. Yeah. Oh, what's the matter with me? Just be quiet. Think about lying in a boat under the warm sun. Uh, 
Lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Lying in a boat. Uh Uh-huh. Just lying in the sun, rocking back and forth. What are you going to do? This won't hurt. You're going to have a nice, long sleep. Oh, yeah, please, please. I want to sleep. There. Now start counting. Uh, Do what? Do what? Tell me again. Start counting. One. One. Two. Two. You're doing fine. Keep counting. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. I sat behind the screen and listened to the doctor begin. At the start, Carter seemed almost glad to talk about it. He described the beginning of the evening. He had a date. A girl named Helena on 53 East 51st Street. Did you have a good time with Helena? Wonderful time. We went dancing. Where did you He kept talking all about the evening. Uh, They danced and drank. The doctor kept digging, working at him, looking for every little detail. After you got through dancing... We went to her apartment. We uh, had some more drinks. Pretty strong ones. Who made them? What? Who made the drinks? Uh, Helena did. Uh, Then he came in. Who came in? He did. uh, The man. The man? The man just came into Helena's apartment. Who are you? Helena, who is this guy? What are you doing here, William? What are you doing? What do you want? Get out. Get out. I don't care who you are. I'm not going to get out, William. I don't believe it. You're not her husband. Stop it. Take your hands off her. He's hurting Helena. Yeah. I'll fix you. Helena needs help. There. You hit him. Yeah. Gotta get out of here. Why do you? I gotta... I gotta get out. He's dead. I killed him. Well, Diamond, did you hear enough? Yeah. It's up to you. Find out if he really did it. Okay. Thank you. For what? Well, according to William Carter, he'd gone to a girl's apartment, the husband had come in, and he'd killed him. Cases like that don't make me a happy gumshoe, but I had a $200 retainer in my pocket, so I had to keep going. My first stop was the 5th Precinct Police Station and Lieutenant Walt Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis tying a square knot in his shoelace. I'll be right with you, gumshoe. Hey, Otis, what happens when you break one of those shoelaces? Oh, what do you think happens? I get a new one. For those shoes? What do you use, a mooring liner for the Queen Mary? Oh, why don't you lay off? I thought we was pals. Is the lieutenant in? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Otis, if your shoes wear out, why don't you do like the Dutch do? Oh, what's that? Wear wooden ones. Just go out and rent yourself a couple of rowboats. Oh. Hello, Walt. Good evening, Mr. Diamond, and thank you for stopping by so late. Well, now, what do you mean? You've got some horrible scheme up your sleeve, but I don't have to play straight, man. I'm off duty in exactly three minutes. It'll take two. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I want a list of DOAs for the night of November 12th. What's the matter? Can't you find a little old corpse all by your lonesome? Oh, shut up. does the police department have to furnish you with one? Well, if you just cooperate, sassy, you'll be out of here in two minutes. Here. Now, thanks. Wow. Hmm. Three of them, huh? If that's what it says. Why? Is the one we haven't found? Two women and a man. Yeah. The man's my department. Homicide. Mm. Herbert Fisher. Found in his wife's apartment on 51st Street. Married to Helena Fisher. Hmm. What about Helena, Walt? We're still looking for her. Neighbors say she and her husband hadn't been living together for several months. The old boy must have come home, found her with another guy, and got heated up. Either the wife or the other guy killed him. Huh? How do you know there was another guy? Well, the neighbors say a young guy started seeing her about a week before. Came up with her that night. We haven't a line on him yet, but we're checking. What killed him? Poker from the fireplace. Beaten over the head. Oh. 
No prints. Nope. Clean as a whistle. Say, what's with you? What are you so interested in this killing for? Oh, I just like to hear about crimes. Oh, now stop that. If you know something... I do know something, Walt. Yeah? What? One word. Will it help me solve this case? I don't know. Well, what is it? Bye. I left the precinct and headed back to Bellevue and Dr. Gerson. I had a hunch that was growing roots, and if William Carter's sanity was going to be saved, it would have to be done in a hurry. Up till now, only four people knew who was in that apartment when Fisher was killed. Myself, a missing girl named Helena, the potential killer, William Carter, and the good doctor. The girl hasn't gone to the police? Why, if William Carter did it? Well, that's what I've been asking myself all the way down here, Doctor. Unless she wants to protect him. That's the only one I could come up with. I want to ask you two questions, Doctor. First, do you think William Carter would pick up a poker and beat a man on the head? That's hard to say. He might. Would he then wipe his fingerprints off? According to what he told me, he killed the man and rushed immediately from the apartment. I'd say no to the fingerprints. Mm, That's what I'd say. He suffered the shock immediately after he killed the man. He knew he had to get out, but after that he can't remember a thing. May I use your phone? Certainly. Doctor, how could Carter be sure that he'd killed the man? Why, I don't know. If you remember, he didn't say. He just said he'd killed him. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. I thought you were going home. I got to sit up with a headache. Oh, well, I want some information. Where did the murdered man live if he wasn't staying with his wife? Oh, now, wait a minute. We know who did it. Hmm? You do? Sure. Some guy named Carter, William Carter. I sent some of the boys over to his house ten minutes ago. How do you know he did it? Because Helena Fisher walked into the station and told us so. You got the girl? Yeah, we're holding her until we pick up the Carter guy. Seems Carter was in her apartment with her. I know the story. You do? You do? I'll be right down. Well, they've got Helena, Doctor. She says William Carter killed her husband. Yes, I heard. Well, I'm afraid I can't do much for him now. I think you can. There's one thing that smells too rotten to make sense. Why did William Carter take enough time to wipe off those fingerprints? Because he didn't want to be discovered. Well, if he didn't want anyone to know he did it, why didn't he kill the girl? Oh, good Lord, I never thought of that. I got an idea. And it may mean you bending the law a little, Doctor, but it might save William Carter. What do you want me to do, Mr. Diamond? Is there any way you can find out from Carter exactly what he did after he struck the man? Of course. When he comes out of his sleep, he'll be able to talk about it. Can he be moved? Well, yes, if it's necessary. Then get him out of here. Take him somewhere. Even if his family covers for him, it's just a matter of time until Lieutenant Levinson finds out he was picked up and put in here. This is extremely dangerous. Look, if he believes he killed this guy, the girl's story will hold water. The only way that I can see to make him snap out of it is to prove to him that he really didn't kill anybody. That's right. Uh, Don't you think he did kill that man? Uh, Maybe, but I doubt it. Can he walk? Yes. Good. Take him down to my office. Here's the key. Stay there until you hear from me. You know, I I like you, Diamond, and I respect you, but this is... You want to save the boy's life? Of course. Then get him down to my office. I left the hospital and grabbed a cab back to the 5th precinct. Sometimes when things don't add up like ABC, you've got to go out into left field for the answer. Everything pointed to William Carter, and he believed it himself. But I kept thinking about those fingerprints. I told Walt my idea. Are you crazy? So the guy did wipe off the prints but didn't kill the girl. Whatever. People do crazy things the first time they knock somebody off. Besides, you can't go around posing as a police sergeant. Oh, now stop that, Walt. Admit it. There's a hole someplace. But you told me yourself the Carter guy admits killing the girl's husband. In his condition, he'd admit anything. He says he did it. The girl says he did it. What more do you want? I don't want any doubts at all. Will you just try the idea? If you'll tell me where you've got William Carter. Promise not to have the boys there? Just you? Yes, yes, I get me He's in my office. Wouldn't you know it? Okay, Walt. Get the girl in here and tell her just what I told you. I don't need any rehearsals. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Send Mrs. Fisher in here. Right. I hope you know what you're doing. You're putting me in an awful spot. Well, if it works, Walt, the state won't burn an innocent man. Yes, but this... Uh, Mrs. Fisher, Lieutenant. Oh, come in, Mrs. Fisher. Thank you, Lieutenant. Sit down. This is Sergeant Diamond. Oh, Oh, how do you do, Sergeant Diamond? Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Fisher? We've checked your story and everything seems to be all right. You can go home, but please don't leave town. Uh, I'm terribly sorry about this. I, I know I should have told you sooner, but William was... Well, I, I didn't know what to do. You did the right thing. Have you found William yet? No, but we will. 
But didn't you check his house? Isn't he with his family? No, he didn't come home at all. Oh, and that reminds me. You know, you're the only witness who can prove he did kill your husband. Oh, why, yes, I guess I am. Well, I'd be extremely careful. He just might, uh... Lieutenant! You don't think he might try and, and kill me, too? Well, you never know. After a man kills once and he's got time to think about it, he's liable to do anything. Well, then, I, I demand police protection. And you'll get it. Sergeant Diamond here has been assigned to the case. Oh, how nice. I'll do as much as I possibly can. Well, when do you start? Right now. I'll meet you out in the squad room right after I have a few words with the lieutenant. All right, Sergeant. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant. Perfectly all right. This is ridiculous. All right, all right. You get over to my office and pick up William Carter and the doctor. I'll stall Mrs. Fisher. Take her to a bar or something. All right. But if the commission hears about this, Sergeant Otis will be the new head of homicide. Oh, this is nice, Sergeant Diamond. Do you always guard people like this? Just the pretty ones. Oh, thank you. If you really think William might try to harm me, you'll have to stick... Pretty close, won't you? Mm-hmm. Do you mind? Not at all. What time is it? Uh, 11.30. Getting tired? Yes, a little. It, it's been a hard day. I'll bet it has. What if William comes to my place in the middle of the night? Where will you be? Watching the front door, baby. He won't get in. Watching the door from inside or outside? Outside, baby. Sorry. Uh, yes, so am I. <laughs> Here's my apartment, Rick. Oh, nice place. Well, I don't like it very much since... Look, couldn't I stay in a hotel? Oh, no. Too many ways for a killer to get in. But do you really think William might try and, and get me? What's he hiding out for? Well, he, he could be scared. All the more reason. Men like that don't hide out for a week if they're going to give themselves up. And if William isn't going to give himself up, he'll probably try to get rid of the one person who knows he did the killing. But William isn't like that. He wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't what? I was just going to say he wouldn't kill anybody. But he did. He knows he did. Yes. Well, I'm going out in front and check the building. I'll, I'll be back. Oh, do you have to go? That's a good idea. You just take it easy. But, but, but William has a key. Oh, well, then you better give me one, too. I'll be right out in front. Oh, all right, here. Uh, don't be too long, Rick. I can't stand this place long if I'm alone. Sure, baby. Over here, Rick. Yeah, yeah, I spotted you when you drove up. Hello, Doctor. I hope your plan works, Diamond. Yeah. Well, hello, William. He can't hear you. I put him into a deep sleep. He'll only answer my voice. There's only one way that we can get him into that apartment. Well, let's go. This is Fisher's scared step. William? Yes? Get out of the car. Uh, come on, Walter. You've got to be there to hear it. If we solve this one, I'll never tell anyone how. Let's go. Come with me, William. Now, William, remember, you are to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Uh, here's a key, Doctor. Do you understand, William? I am to go up to Helena's apartment and go in. Here's the key. Use the key to let yourself in. The key to let myself in. When you're in, close the door and stand in front of it. And that's all. All right, Mr. Diamond. Here we go. Of us went in through the front door, and Dr. Gerson briefed William once more. Then we led him up the stairs and up to Helena Fisher's apartment. I could hear her humming as soon as William tried the key. We all ducked. What? Who's there? Rick? Answer me, who's there? <gasps> William! What do you want? William, what are you doing here? William, say something. Don't just stand there. Oh, you... you you've got to get out. The police are looking for you. There's one downstairs right now. Well, say something. Stop staring. William, 
Get away from that door. Please, William, please, please. I... I know what you want, William. I... I won't tell anyone. William, say something. Don't look at me like that. You... You're going to kill me, aren't you? Look, William, you didn't do it. I killed him. I just told you he was dead after you hit him. When you left, I killed him with a poker. Will you please? All oh, right, Alina. Craig. Oh, he was going to kill me. Oh, sure. Like he killed your husband. Yes, yes. How's William, Doctor? I'll wake him up when he gets back to the hospital. He'll be all right when he reads Mrs. Fisher's confession. <laughs> What's going on here? You better go along with the lieutenant, baby. Why? He heard your whole confession from outside the door. What? Why, I, I... I just said he was going to kill me. Also, we found some of your fingerprints on the poker. You're crazy. I wiped them all. <gasps> uh, she's all yours, Walt. Let's go, Mrs. Fisher. You tricked me. You tricked me into saying that. Come on, lady. I don't want to get rough. I'll kill you, too. I'll... <laughs> I think you can take her along now, Lieutenant. <laughs> Holy cow. Why, Doctor? Well, I've never hit a woman before, but this one made me very unhappy. Well, you're a good doctor, uh, Doctor, but you're certainly no gentleman. You should have kicked her. kept you out so late. It's after midnight. Oh, I had to stick around and watch Otis turn into a pumpkin. Now, that's Cinderella. Yeah. Can you imagine Sergeant Otis as Cinderella? The good prince would slip his sacrum trying to haul his slipper around. Tell me a fairy story, Rick. Well, once upon a time, there were two idiots. Rick. And they lived happily ever after. Sing. Don't like it? Sing. I liked it. Sing. I'll do as I please. Rick. I love those dear hearts and gentle people who live in my hometown. Because those dear hearts and gentle people will never ever let you down. They read the good book from Friday till Monday. That's how the weekend goes. I've got a dream house I'll build there one day With picket fence and rambling rows I feel so welcome Each time that I return That my happy little heart Keeps laughing like a clown I love the dear hearts And gentle people Who live and love in my hometown well, how was that, honey? Well, Harold Applenocker, where'd you pick up that there song? Well, my hometown, Mountain View, back up in the hills of Arkansas. Oh, well, that sure was mighty fine. Well, little Bell, I'm glad you liked it. Mind if I bust you up with another eight bar? Nope. Bust away. I love the dear heart and gentle people who live and love in my hometown. Da -da 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 -da. Well, well. Yeah, I think I did pretty fine, that air strong. Oh, yes, sir. You done busted me up right proper. Oh, you ought to come over to Mountain View sometime, little Bell. Got dear hearts and gentle people all over the place. Oh, I'd like to make the trip. Oh, you'd love the people. You'd love to see them, love to greet them. How would you greet them, little Bell? How would you greet them? What would you say? Howdy. Oh, they love you, little Bell. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Sam Edwards, and Norman Field. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. 
Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC Sunday? There's a full evening of great entertainment in store for you tomorrow on NBC. You'll hear rib-tickling comedy on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. And for mystery, there's Sam Spade's latest caper. Tomorrow, Sam meets a Mr. Tom Turkey. For the very best radio fare, always tune to NBC. Coming up, it's Brian Donlevy and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Gallon Camps present Pat Novak for Hire. Cinderella lost a shoe and so she got a mate. The modern miss has learned from this in Gallon Camp Shoe Raid. Four miles to a Gallon Camp. Yes, Gallon Camps, the family shoe stores with the yellow fronts, the largest shoe chain in the West with stores from Canada to Mexico to serve the West. G-A-L-L-E-N-K-A-M-P-S, Gallon Camps present Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak, for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you don't get prizes for being subtle. If you want to make a living down here, you've got to get your hand in the till any way you can. You rob Peter to pay Paul, and then you put it on the cuff. It's a happy life if you don't mind looking up at a headstone, because sooner or later you draw trouble a size too big. I found that out Tuesday night. It was about 11 o'clock when I came out of the office and I started down the waterfront. It was raining and the street was as deserted as a warm bottle of beer. As I got near the corner, an old man stepped out of the darkness and started across the street. It was a short trip because a car started up down the street and the old man couldn't have made it with a pocket full of aces. <laughs> Well, I started over to him. The car slowed down for a moment and then turned the corner and disappeared. As it passed under the street light, I caught a glimpse of the license plate in a dull, surprised way, the way you'd grab a feather out of an angel's wing. I bent over the old man and I rolled him on his back. He was breathing hard as I cushioned his head. Please help me. Can you please help me? Well, that's a big order, mister. Uh, I must talk to you. Well, if you've got any good quotes, you better get them off your chest fast. My pocket. Inside my pocket. You please put your hand... In here? Yeah. Sure. Two envelopes. What about them? One is money for you. You have the other one. So far. The other one, please keep sealed. And you will give it to... John St. John. John St. John? Yeah. Well, where does he live? You don't understand. It's not... I want to tell you. You don't understand. Well, he was right on that one. I didn't understand a thing except he slipped out of my arms and stopped paying taxes. I dragged him over to the side and I went through his stuff. There was nothing there, no identification, just a card with an address on the other side of town. I opened the envelope and $300 tumbled into my breast pocket. The other one was sealed. There was no name on it, but up in the corner there was some kind of marking. It looked like two crosses spliced together. There wasn't anything I could do for him except pray, and I owe some back dues. So I went over to my office and called police headquarters. I told him where the old man was, and then I checked in the phone book. There was no John St. John listed. Well, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan, a good guy... But to him, a hangover is the price of being sober. I finally found him singing in a Mason Street bar. Dinky, dinky, dobby, sure, dinky, dinky, day. Jocko, the fine Jocko, story. I want to talk to you. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time for the counterpoint. I'm singing a song, a little sentimental thing from my childhood. It'll keep. 
I got a problem, Jocko. You'll always have a problem, Patsy, because you can't keep out of trouble. You know that, don't you? You have no self-control. Yeah, all right, Jocko. You have right. no more self-control than a bucket of mercury dumped in a marble staircase. All right, Jocko, check the bright talk. I just saw a guy get killed. You're like some violent disorder in nature, some large but unprofitable storm. Yeah. You keep whirling in circles, Patsy. And if you ever go more than ten feet in one direction, it's because some woman is nine feet away. Yeah. Then it begins all over again. Are you all through? Yes, get to the point. That's another of your troubles. You never get to the point. Some old guy was killed down on the Embarcadero. He checked out fifty feet away from me. Who killed him? I don't know. Then why do you care? Professional jealousy? Some car came out of nowhere and clipped him. You sure it wasn't an accident? Yeah, just like the fall of France. Will you stop kneeling me, Jocko? I told you the guy got killed. He was murdered right in front of me. I gotta find a guy called John St. John. How St. John? John St. John. I don't feel like vaudeville tonight, Jocko. The old man gave me $300 to deliver a letter. I made him a promise. Well, you can break it now with only the slightest risk. I got the license number of the car. I want you to hop down and look it up. Then check at headquarters to see if the guy's got a record. I don't like policemen. They depress me. Check it. I gotta go out here to this address. Here. Uh-huh. Well, what kind of neighborhood is it? Well, it's not exactly a neighborhood. It's more like an architectural afterthought. A lingering defense against the early California bear. All right, all right. No speeches. Just check on that license plate. Now, if I'm not at my place, try this address here. Yes. That's always very interesting at this time of night. Uh, goodbye, lover. Well, Jocko was right about the neighborhood. When I left him, I doubled by my place and I left the envelope. I put it in another envelope and stashed it behind some books. Then I headed out to look up John St. John. It must have been about midnight when I got there, and it was the kind of a neighborhood where a for-rent sign reads like a ransom note. I found the place, though. It was an old rooming house, a third-floor apartment. I knocked at the door, and when she opened it, I knew it was time to wire home for money. If they pick a Miss Blowtorch of 1946, she'll be right up there in the running. A tall, blonde blister with lots of Fahrenheit. She stood there leaning against the door, smiling and looking at you as if you had gold-plated muscles. Gave you a weak feeling where your dinner ought to be. And her voice came right out of the oven. Well, you're out kind of late. Yeah. I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. Oh? Won't you come into my cobweb? Sure. For a spider, you're nice and chubby. Well... A Spider-Man. My name's Lee Norton. You want to write it down? Hmm. I'm Pat Novak, and I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. You seem to be running a temperature on the subject. I don't know a John St. John. Well, I found a dead man lugging around your address. Why? I don't know. Perhaps he admired me from afar. Like a sunset or something. No, he stopped admiring sunsets about 20 years ago. I see. What are you, the avenging angel? He gave me a sealed envelope. And you were supposed to give it to a man named John St. John. That's huh? right. He gave me 300 bucks to ease the pain. Yeah, I figured that. You don't look like the charitable type. He was a nice old guy, so I'm going to find his boy. Perhaps I could help you. You got a clear, fast track. Let's see you go. I told you I don't know John St. John, but I'll do this much. Yeah, I know. You're going to be big-hearted and offer to take that letter just in case you ever meet someone named John St. John. How did you pay the rent this month? Keep the kettle on. I'll only be a moment. Oh, Lee, if we're early, just give us a magazine. No. Come on in. Thanks. Well, just enough for bridge. You're right. You're only gone a moment. Who are your friends? Don't suck. Did they lock the manhole before they left home? His name's Novak. Yeah, that's a pretty name. Don't rhyme with anything, but it's pretty, huh, Joe? Yeah, it's all right. Let's have the letter, Novak. You got hold of a bad rumor, fella. Ah, uh, the one I got's good. Let's have it. I don't want to strain your mind, Junior, but try to understand. I don't have a letter. Ask him again. Go on home, mister. You're not going to get anything out of me except a small tip. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll give you a nickel for your friend, too. All right, Joe. Now, <laughs> uh, hold him up. Yeah, just a minute. He's got a head of hair. Hold him up. <clears throat> All, right. All right, Mike. That's enough. Oh. Well, that's enough. All right, baby. Don't look so sorry. You can't have everything. <laughs> We'll be back to Pat Novak in just a moment. Have you ever worn uncomfortable shoes? Perhaps the size was wrong or the shoe was the wrong shape for your foot. 
But no matter why, there's nothing more uncomfortable than shoes that don't fit. The more you're on your feet, the more you know it. Gallon Camp specialize in properly fitting shoes for the whole family, right from the toddler's first important step. And Gallon Camp's good shoes are built to give support to active feet. Listen to an authority on shoes. He's Mr. John F. Stahl, 64 years young, a retired postman with a hobby. <laughs> you guessed it, he likes to walk. He says, I've been on my feet most of my life. Since 1935, when I retired as a letter carrier, I walked 10,000 miles. I just walked to San Francisco from Trinity Center, California. That was 410 miles. Walking is fun, but take it from me, you must have good shoes. That's why I stick to gallon camps. Gallon camps are good shoes. And there you have it from a man who knows. Gallon camps are good shoes. That's why Gallon Camps are the West's favorite shoes, and Gallon Camps' tremendous volume makes possible Gallon Camps' reasonable prices. For style, for quality, for reasonable price, for good shoes for the entire family, visit the stores with the yellow fronts. Mr. Stahl walked 410 miles to shop at Gallon Camps, but there's a store in your neighborhood. And now back to Pat Novak for Hire. You know, it's easy to sleep if you got the right friends. When those two gun-ups were through, I hit the floor and made Rip Van Winkle look like an insomnia victim. I didn't like the floor, but it was in better shape than my face. I don't know how long I was there, but it must have been a couple of hours. I rolled over once and tried to get up, but it was like trying to barbecue a cake of ice. There was a sick, sweet smell in the room. I tried to place it, but my nose was out on strike, so I went to sleep again. Next thing I knew, it sounded like New Year's Eve. <laughs> Oh, Patsy, oh, up on the couch. <coughs> What's the matter? Nothing. If you're a kitchen stove, the room's full of gas. Oh, some of my playmates, I guess. Well, you weren't at the apartment, so I tried here. Yeah? What time is it? Two o'clock. Who got the quaint idea of the gas chamber? A girlfriend. It was love at first sight. Did she get the letter? I left it home. Yeah, you're getting smart. Yeah. Three hundred dollars worth. They lifted my dough. Uh, you couldn't use it where you were going. I, uh, checked on that hit and run card. It's listed under the name of Sidney Bronson. Has he got a record? No. Well, everybody's a beginner. Well, let's go home. It'll be dull, but you'll get used to it. Wait until I wash my hands. Sure. Patsy. Yeah? What did your girlfriend look like? Was she the lively type? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Because she's not anymore. Yeah. Those gunsels play rough. She's kind of pretty. What did she do besides send out vibrations? I don't know. But she knew all about John St. John. Yeah? She picked up a bait like a hungry bass. Also, look at that ring. How did you get around to that? The insignia on it. It's the same one that's on the envelope. Spliced crosses. Let's go home, Patsy. The police will be here. Yeah. Even Hellman will know she's dead. Come on, we bet. On your way out the door, Jocko, try it sideways because I think it's blocked. Hello, Novak. You look pale. It's my color scheme. What do you care, Hellman? None. She looks peaceful. Yeah. Be quiet or you'll wake her up. Oh, tiptoe. She always cut her throat before she goes to sleep. Who is she, Novak? I don't know. It's awful cozy here for a bunch of perfect strangers. I don't know every dead girl in town, Hellman. You'll have to check. You can still write, can't you, Novak? Huh? That's all you'll need down at headquarters. Come on. Get out of the haze, Hellman. You don't know who's dead yet, but you're going to book somebody. Yeah. What are you doing up here, praising the joint? I came up to find a guy named John St. John. She doesn't look like a guy named John St. John. She was my lead. I came up here to smell out a rat. She had a half Nelson on me when two Gunsels walked in. They came up to fix the gas meter, I think. You stay out of this. I'll make every effort. Now, if you're smart, you'll fingerprint this place, Hellman. Those boys were cute. They've been in somebody's jail. I'll handle my job. You stick to murder. It'll go a long way to pin this on me, Hellman. I can go a long way, Novak. Not with what you got to drag. We get a call in the middle of the night, come up here and find you standing over a dead girl. That's right. And you want me to sprinkle powder all over. Back up and take a better look, Novak. The view's fine, Hellman. And if you'll take a good look, you'll know why. You haven't got anything to give the DA except a slim lead and a fat hand. You're going to need help. Not on this one. You need help to find the street. Come on back to center, Hellman. Even with both hands, you couldn't... Yeah. 
Oh, forget it. So take the medicine like a good boy. I'm not going to walk out and let the two of you tour the town. I'm going to book one or both of you on a murder charge. All right. Book Jocko here, then. I love you in a generous mood. You got a string, then, Hellman. Somebody's got to find John St. John. Uh, who's going to find Jocko? Stop worrying. I'll bail you out. You haven't got the right size heart, Novak. You'll let him die on the vine. Helm, sometimes you're guilty of unexpected wisdom. I know it's reflex action, but it's consoling anyway. I want you, Novak. I want you bad. I'll take this guy as a down payment, but I'm going to close out with you. Remember that. I will. All right. Come on, mister. Wait a minute. Patsy, you're not going to let him lug me off like this? What else can I do? The guy likes you. Now, it was a bum curve to throw Jocko, but somebody had to dig us out of a hole, and Jocko wasn't the boy. You can't shovel dirt with a bar rag. I had no idea where to start. There were two murders, and they were both tied up with John St. John. He didn't look like a good guy to know. There was that insignia, too. The one on the letter and the girl's ring. Oh, sure, it could be coincidence, but... That's what they said about Bluebeard. The only thing I could do was open that letter. So I went back to the apartment. I didn't have to turn on the light. They were running in pairs tonight. She was sitting there on the couch, proud of a pair of long, silk legs and smiling like a guy who knows he's got a million bucks in the bank. She was blonde, too. A little more lemon juice, maybe, but blonde anyway. She was nice and comfortable, and I got the idea she'd just signed a lease. Good evening. How do you do? Not very well so far. A sly remark, Mr. Novak? No, I'm just bringing you up to date. Your girlfriend's dead. Yes? Yeah. I just want to let you know the gas jet's out in the kitchen. Oh, don't shout. I'd like you better if you purred. I don't need your vote. Who's John St. John? I don't know John St. John. Is he worth breaking your heart over? There's a good guy down on the clink sweating out a murder rap for me, so I want John St. John. Mm, you've got nice friends. Who's Sidney Bronson? How does that fit into the picture? This started with a waterfront corpse. The leftovers belonged to an old guy that was hit by a car. The car's registered in the name of Sidney Bronson. Mr. Novak, you seem so intense. It's a pity to waste it on random speculation. I told you. I got a friend in the jug. Mm, loyalty's a nice trait. One of your nicest. Yeah. You're a pretty thing, Patsy. Well, don't get fooled by the rapper. I'll take a chair. Anybody ever brief you on trouble? You're hard to see that far away. Come on over into focus, Patsy. Yeah. You're pretty, Patsy. You look like you want to bill a sale. I'm the gentle kind, Novak. I'd just like to break your ribs. Go ahead. I can get a brace. Come here. Mr. Novak, I'll bet you do a swell rumba. Yeah? What's on your mind? What you're going to say when you find out about this gun. Huh? That's right, sweetheart. My finger isn't hollow. Back up and take a look at the gun. Mm. Well, you got to that purse, huh? That's right. Well, you've ruined my confidence. I'll give you a testimonial. In the meantime, I want the letter. You go after everything the same way. I want the letter. Well, it's in the desk. Come on. Right here in the top drawer. <clears throat> oh, let go. Stay away from me. I'm already here, lady. <laughs> Come on, oh. all right. Drop the gun, sis. Drop it. Well, you can let go of my arms now. Well, that's your version. Let, let go of me. Let go of me. I... Oh. Oh. What was that for? A little something on the house, and I'll beat it. Well, you've ruined my confidence. You're lucky. Go on home. You won't change your mind about that letter? No. Well, suit yourself. I'll be going. Oh, Patsy. Yeah? I can't help you on John St. John, but I wouldn't worry about that fellow, Sidney Bronson. Huh? Why? Because I'm Sidney Bronson. See you soon. Dad began to look like a big, fat, well-fed double cross. I had to find out what was in that letter, so I made tracks for the bookcase. All I could do was browse because the letter was gone. Well, things didn't look rosy for me or Jocko. I was about to buy a file and bake a cake when the phone rang. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. The coroner got a report on that dead girl. She died at 12.30. Now, that's pretty close. What's he got? A stopwatch? Fifteen minutes either way. 
Those fingerprints panned out, too. Yeah? A couple of L.A. strong arm men. Well, that's new for L.A. You got a call out? We already picked them up. Your favorite's name, Welcome Dangliers. Well, I could make a joke. I already got one. They're set up with a perfect alibi for 12.30. Well, that means I killed the girl. Nobody's arguing. I got some more news. Yeah? I'm out at the Seal Rocks. Well, you got the figure for it. We just found an envelope floating around the water. It's one of yours. You better come on out. You found an envelope? So what? So the envelope turns out to be in some guy's pocket. Come on out. Well, that only meant one thing. Whoever took the envelope out of my place got popular. It was getting late, so I grabbed a cab and rode out to the beach. When I got there, Hellman was standing down in the water. He had Jocko with him. The surf was rolling in, and Jocko wasn't much better. Hello, Patsy. Hello, Jocko. How's jail? Dry. Thanks for coming, Novak. You're sweet. Where's the envelope? Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the same one. That makes you look good. There was a letter in here. Did you take that with the guy's money, Hellman? You got all there is. Hmm. This guy on the beach is the third one. It's my opinion the case will solve itself. We're running out of people. Who is the guy? His name's Walter Avery. Here's his stuff. Yeah, what's left? Well, the spliced cross really gets around. Eh? Keeps bobbing up. Here it is on this guy's fountain pen. I'm going to run this guy through the morgue, and then I'm going to look you up, Novak. Yeah? Sure. We want you done with us. That's right. I'll introduce you to all the best people. Good night, lover. It was close to five, so I tagged by my place for some sleep. I tossed around like a fish on the living room rug. Hellman called about nine to throw more dust in my eyes. He said one of the airlines had a passenger to Portland named Walter Avery. Just to make it tough, the guy made the 12 o'clock plane and got off at Portland. I had left field all to myself. I got dressed and I looked up Sidney Bronson's number. There was no answer, so I went over. The place was locked and I looked up the janitor. He wasn't going to let me in, but it turned out that his wife had a birthday coming up. Well, I found something in the apartment. It was a card and it said, Bellcrest Sanitarium. And down in the corner there was a guy's name. Dr. Emil Schoenig, psychiatrist. Vienna without the walls. The Bellcrest Sanitarium was down on the peninsula, so I borrowed a car and headed down that way. Everything was fine until I got in the front door. They didn't even let me register. I woke up on a couch in Schoenig's office. It was dark outside, and my left arm was throbbing like a love story in a woman's magazine. The radiator sitting beside me was Sidney. You're a deep sleeper. I think I got some help. What happened to my arm? Hypodermic. You only need one arm, anyway. In your case, I need a spare. Who did it? Dr. Schoenig. Oh, he's a darling boy. Where is he? Out on the phone trying to figure out what to do with you. What's that make me, a patient? Mm, that's one way of putting it. You made things easy. We were coming to you for the letter. Hmm? You want to try that over again? We were on our way when you stumbled in. You're wrong, Sid. Somebody's given you a fast pitch. That letter was gone when you were up at my place. I don't want a bum rib, Patsy. I want that letter. The trail in the field, Angel. I told you, the letter's gone. A guy by the name of Walter Avery took it out of my place. Walter Avery? That's right, and somebody thanked him. They found him this morning, making like a dead seal. Walter Avery left for Portland last night. A plant, sweetheart. You better read up on your friends. Yeah. Thanks, Betsy. I told you to watch him, Sid. You had more shots. What's the difference? Oh, none, I suppose. Uh, why don't you mix us a drink while I talk to Mr. Novak? I'll be right with you. Well, Mr. Novak, you're one of my best patients. Well, that's because I like your needles. You better go easy on that drink. Yes? Why? Well, you'll get drunk and run somebody down the way you did that guy on the waterfront. Oh? A good guess. You should be proud. That's a good, sensible, final emotion. Here's your drink, Emma. Thank you, my dear. As to you, Mr. Novak. Sorry, there's no drink for you, Mr. Novak. You probably will be. Huh? Forget it. Emil, I talked to Mr. Novak before you came in. He thinks you're a heel. He does. And so do I. I can stand it. He told me about Walter Avery. I'm sorry about that. Walter got that letter. You killed him and took it. I was supposed to blunder around until you got rid of me, too. That's a bum joke, Emil. You're getting hysterical. With laughter, Emil. You put one of your boys on the plane. Only Novak aired the wash too fast. Suppose I did. 
Somebody ought to bring you up to date, Sydney. You've been hanging on too long. The free ride's over. I might as well tell you now you're all through. I carried the whole bunch along and... <coughs> and I'm all through. <coughs> Steady, Emma. What's the matter with me? <coughs> What's the matter with me, Sid? Give him a hand, Novak. He just got a bad drink. You wouldn't do that, Sid. I'm full of surprises. You got a stomach full of poison. You got a stomach full of poison in 15 seconds, Emma. <coughs> Put down that gun, Emil. I want you to, Sid. Please, Emil, put down the gun. I'm a selfish fellow. <coughs> this happens kind of fast for you, fellow. Lots of noise, huh, Patsy? Yeah. I'll get you a pillow. I'd rather have your lap. Uh, you get mercy, not love, baby. Yeah? Thanks for small favors. How do I look? Not so good. That was the three and two pitch. Yeah, I had it coming up. I'll tell you about John St. John. I know. There was no such guy. That's right. It was the name of the group. Those spliced crosses? Yes. You found out a little late, but it's always that way. That's the way I found out about you. Yeah. I had a funny little hunch about you and me. I found out a little late. But I know now, Patsy. Does that help? Well, John St. John was the name of an organization buying and selling government information. That old man tried to tell me, but he checked out too fast. I began to figure something like that when those spliced crosses started showing up. Shoney killed the old man in Sydney's car. He couldn't stop because I was around. The two girls and Walter Avery were both in on the deal. Shoney knew who I was when he saw me go into my office. He trailed me to my place and left Avery there to look for the letter. He killed that girl up in the rooming house, and then he found out she didn't have the letter. When Avery showed up, he took it away from him and threw him to the fish. He was trying to shake Sidney by sending her up to my place after he had the letter. The scheme went haywire when I showed up at the sanitarium. He was trying to work himself out of that one when the payoff came. John St. John? Well, right from the start, Jocko said he was either dead or in the state pen because anybody with a name like John St. John would have killed his parents as soon as he got old enough to find out about it. We'll return in a moment to find out what bothered Inspector Hellman. But now it's Cinderella time. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a mate. The modern miss has learned from this in gallant camp she'll rate. A pretty face, a graceful figure, lovely shoes. That's a combination that no man can resist. What a delightful feeling to know that from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, you are the picture of glamorous perfection. Here's what Marilyn Buford, Miss America 1946, says. Probably the most fun of being chosen Miss America is modeling the gorgeous clothes. What girl wouldn't be thrilled to select costume after costume from a collection of America's leading designers? And after seeing the importance they attach to the right shoes for every costume, I'm glad I learned about gallon caps years ago. Yes, Marilyn, there's magic in a pair of shoes, as every woman knows. And having the right shoes is no longer a luxury thanks to gallon caps, the home of lovely shoes at reasonable prices. And that's why Miss America's favorite store is the favorite store of America's Misses. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in gallon camp she And now back to Pat Novak. Oh, it worked out all right. They found the letter out at Shoney's place, and there were some plans for jet planes and a few other trifles. Hellman asked only one question. How come Shoney didn't kill me before I could talk to the girl? <laughs> it's always that way with a guy who commits murder. Either he goes too far or he doesn't go far enough. Be sure to join us next Sunday evening and every Sunday, same time, same station for radio's newest show, Pat Novak for Hire. And don't forget the store with the yellow front is the Gallon Camp Shoe Store. 
Gallon Camp shoes are good shoes. There's something about them you'll like. Franklin Evans speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. You gotta put it in block letters because down on the waterfront in San Francisco there's a price tag on everything. You gotta do that or marry a rich widow. I don't like to work that hard. So I rent boats and do anything else that's cash and carry. Oh, it's all right if you don't mind trouble. Because that's one thing you can't duck. It's like trying to dance the minuet in skis. And the best trouble always looks good from the outside. You're all smiles and feel like a kid opening a hand grenade under the Christmas tree. I found that out Tuesday night. It was around 7 o'clock. I was getting ready to close the office when this little guy showed up. He was about the size of a golf bag with arms. And if he had a cigar box, he could see over a pool table. He walked up to the desk and started talking in a voice that made you think he was trying to put Lily Pons out of work. Hello, you know back? You're doing all right so far. What's on your mind? I'm Jackie Gregg. You heard of me, huh? You're the shy type, I know. I'm Jackie Gregg, the jockey. You heard of me, huh? All right, now I heard of you. Put the show on the road. I'm looking for a horse. You want to find me a horse? Yeah, I breed him in the back room. What color do you want? You're so tough I got to take that from you? Calm down before you wind up in a boy's choir. If you got anything to sell, put it on the line or beat it. I'm riding a horse tomorrow called Fleet Lady. She's disappeared. She's not here. I'm supposed to ride the sixth race with her tomorrow. The Bonanza handicap, and she's gone. All right, she's gone. Maybe your horse likes to go out at night. I haven't seen her. Get to the point. I'll give you 200 bucks to find that horse. Somebody took her in a van. I uh, trailed her down here at the waterfront. But you lost him up at the ferry building. That's right. Something funny's going on. My mom disappeared, and you gotta find her. This is a big waterfront, and where's the 200 bucks? You'll get that, all right. Down by Pier 19. The van turned in. Think you can find Fleet Lady? I don't know. Who owns her? Woman named Sybil Thornton. She's uh, mixed up, I think. Yeah. Why steal your own horse? I don't know. Run a ringer, maybe. That's a tough trick. This woman's got some good ones. You want the two hundred bucks? Yeah. How are the odds? What's the difference? You're gonna open a book? You better take the two hundred bucks now. Yeah, the dough will keep. You sound frightened, Junior. And you sound nosy. Here's the two hundred. I want you to find the horse. You let me know at the Kingston Hotel, huh? Sure. And if you don't find anything around the waterfront, maybe you better try the track. Ask around there. Yeah. By the way, how do you fit in? How come you got $200 interest in that horse? Maybe I love horses. What do you care if maybe I love horses? I don't. The guy like you's got to love something. Oh, yeah. It was a sweet proposition. A jockey in search of a horse. There's something phony about the whole thing. I had the 200 bucks, but I didn't feel good. It was like a guy stealing a murder gun to help out in a scrap metal drive. Well, after the little guy left, I closed the office and started to hit the docks, but it didn't work out. You know, you can buy good whiskey these days, so you feel funny walking up to some guy on the pier and asking, have you seen a racehorse around here, mister? By nine, I was sure the horse wasn't around, so I borrowed a car and drove out to the track. I found out where Sybil Thornton's horses were quartered and headed down that way. It was pretty dark, so... When I bumped into her, all I got was a vague outline. She had a good-looking vague outline. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I'm full of regrets, too. Should we try it again? But you're a little mixed up in your animals. They keep horses here. You don't seem to mind. No, you lean nicely, but you'd probably feel safer with a platform. Yeah. Well, we try this again when I've had three good meals. That's a horse. Yes, I know. In fact, I own it. I see. That'd make you Sybil Thornton. Yes, what would it make you? A guy named Pat Novak looking for your horse. I was hired in the waterfront to find her. My, they grow big on the waterfront. You must get a lot of sun. 
By the way, is Fleet Lady missing? Your jockey says she is. That's why I'm snooping around. Didn't know he had any friends. He's got a checkbook. How about Fleet Lady? Is she tucked in bed? Yes. Well, let's take a look, huh? Find it very dull, Mr. Novak. Yeah, that's what they said to Anthony. Let's see the horse. Suit yourself. She's down this way. Okay. I'm doing this out of the bigness of my heart. I think you're wasting my generosity, Mr. Novak. I don't use it all this trip. It's from the stable. Come on. Down about here. Fleet lady stall. Here. There's a flashlight on the wall. All right. Oh, poor thing. Do horses die broke, too? Who is it? Fleet lady? Yes. Are you satisfied? No. I'm going to ring up headquarters. You crazy. Then I'm going to call Jackie Gregg and tell him his hunch paid off. I wouldn't do that, Mr. Novak. Stop kidding me, sweetheart. She didn't get killed in a fight with another horse. Gregg figured somebody was telling the machine. That's why Fleet Lady's dead. That's why I'm going to call headquarters. Suit yourself, but remember what happened to Fleet Lady. Are you getting tough, Angel? No. You just wouldn't look good with a saddle, Mr. Novak. <laughs> Well, I watched her as she turned and walked out of there. It was the kind of a walk that makes you flip the calendar and find out how far away spring is. I looked around a while, but it didn't do any good. The place was full of doors, so whoever killed Fleet Lady got out easy, like a rumor at a church picnic. I closed the door and went down the line to call headquarters. As I stood in there talking, I saw Sybil Thornton drive away. It was a long convertible with red asbestos seat covers. After I called headquarters, I went back and waited near the stable. About a half hour later, a police car pulled up, and when I saw who got out, I began to get unhappy like a three-legged man in a ballet school. It was Hellman from Homicide, and he had a squad with him. All right, all right, I'll talk to him. Hello, Novak. Where's your trainer? Your boys get paid to laugh at you, Hellman. I don't. Yeah, where's the horse? What are you doing on the case? I came for the ride. You mind, Novak? No, I just wondered if they wised up downtown. Huh? Because you could find a dead horse, Hellman. If they staked it out in the middle of Market Street, you'd find it before long. I'll try this time. Where is it? Stall 18, over there. Yeah. Keep an eye on them, boys. I'll be back in a minute. In here, Novak? Yeah, the one with the teeth like yours. You better shut up, Novak. Don't get jumpy. I, you haven't seen the horse. Just shut up, huh? It wasn't going to be much of a conversation anyway. What color horse was that, Novak? What do you mean? Take a look at it. Yeah, I did. I just took a look. It's a smart horse, Novak. What? That's right. That dead horse in there is wearing a double-breasted suit. Hellman got the message straight. I walked in and took a look. Jackie Gregg was lying there on the floor as dead as last year's love. The sickness didn't show until we rolled him over on his stomach. Somebody had gone duck hunting in the middle of his back. I began to feel a little sick myself, and I was ready to send out for the same gun when Hellman started to talk. You forgot to mention the guy when you phoned headquarters. He wasn't there. I was in here before, and the guy wasn't around. What was he doing under the horse? I don't know. Hellman maybe crawled out of a crack. I don't know. There were two shots. I came in and found the horse. Yeah? Check the horse. You're trying to tell me the horse shot back? Who is he? A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg. He gave me 200 bucks to find a missing horse. Yeah? A horse called Fleet Lady running into Mara's handicap. This is the end of the line. How do you know it's the same one? I don't. Maybe you've got to be a horse to tell. Why don't you ask one of your boys? <laughs> Yeah, your boy's real tough. Call him off, Hellman. He's nasty. We all hate him, Novak. It's all right. I'll put it on your bill, Hellman. That's good. You can write it up at headquarters. Hellman, you ought to rent an idiot. The heavy thinking's too much for you. I can piece this together. We come out here and find a dead man with you kicking up dust 40 feet away. Look, Hellman, I didn't kill the guy and call up headquarters. I know they're bad in homicide, but I'm not that big-hearted. We got a spare hook for you, Novak. That's where you stay until somebody gets you off. Well, you can start out with Sybil Thornton. Another horse? She's got the speed for it. Look her up. She owns Fleet Lady, and she was dashing around in the dark here, playing easy to get. I'll look her up. You better leave the boys behind, after all. She's only a woman. When you see her, ask her about that van down on the waterfront and what she was doing before I made that phone call. I'll tag all the bases. Don't worry, Junior. And if things fit together, you'll both be in the jug. I'll see you later. I got work to do. Yeah, it's getting late. You better put the boys back in the cave. I began to worry after Hellman left. There was no murder gun, and he didn't have too much to go on, but there was no one else wanted my job. 
Oh, I knew the girl was going to have an alibi. I was the last guy that Jackie Gregg had seen. I had about as much chance as a fat girl at a Princeton prom. Hellman didn't like me, and he was a smart cop with a disposition like a ton of rhubarb. Well, I had to start right from scratch. I felt like Adam the first morning he woke up. So I looked up a guy named Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor and a boozer who would give you a lift if you show him where the stirrups are. He's a good guy, but he thinks all food makes a gurgle. I hit all the bars and finally found him up at Maggie Nielsen's apartment. She's a good-looking voice that lives up on the hill, and Jocko was working his way into her liquor supply. Hello, Patsy. You're just in time to join me for my first drink of the evening, uh, or uh, one of my first at least. Yeah, I see. Maggie's not here, but I found her whiskey. It was in plain sight, locked in the closet under some newspapers. All right, Jocko, when are you going to sober up? Oh, I plan to do it briefly on April 1st, when the rest of the world plays the fool also. Look, I'm in trouble, Jocko. you got to help me. Good. I have a special bottle I use to forget your troubles. Now, look, stop caressing that jug and listen to me. I'm in a jam. Patsy, there's nothing in nature so sad as a half-empty bottle. It's like a broken vow or an unfulfilled promise in the skies. A falling star, almost. All right, Jocko. A falling star, and you shrug it off, never realizing that a whole world has ended at that moment. Yeah. A hundred million dreams, maybe, and you watch it fall and make an asinine wish. That's all the good it does a star to fall. It gives some kid a chance to wish for a bicycle. You all finished now, Jocko? Yes. What kind of trouble? Anything I could aggravate? I'm mixed up out at the track. A guy by the name of Jackie Gregg is dead and I don't look good. Oh, Hellman? Yeah. The guy's a jockey and he hired me to find a horse named Fleet Lady. Did you? The horse and the jockey ran a dead heat, but there's something funny about the whole deal. Did you talk to the jockey? No, not enough. Oh, Patsy, you've got to break yourself of the habit of waiting until people are dead before you think of a question. Jocko, I want you to hit all the horse rooms. Find out what you can about the sixth race tomorrow. It's the Bonanza Handicap. Now hurry up, will you? If it's the sixth race, why can't we wait a while? Start now. Get everything you can and call me. I'll leave a message at your place. Where are you going? I don't know. Maybe up to see the girl. Oh, Patsy, you're going to be waving at the hangman's wife when they spring the trap door. I gotta see her. She owns Fleet Lady. Well, why don't I see her? She's got a stake somewhere, and I got a lot of questions. What could you do up there? Ah, uh, yes. If it weren't an academic question, I'd argue the point. Oh, it looked like a bum deal right from the start. Patsy, you have the instinct for recognizing trouble, but not the intelligence to duck it. Save your breath, will you? You're like a man walking under a scaffold on a building. You realize it may crash down and kill you, but instead of hugging the building where you can't get hurt... Like every other dope, you scurry for the edge of the sidewalk where you're bound to get hit if it falls. Jocko, will you get out to those horse parlors? I need facts, not fables. Now, give me a hand. All right. Give my love to Fleet Lady. Her name's Sybil Thornton. I'll bet I'm not far wrong. Good night, lover. After I left Jocko, I went to the Chronicle Morgan. Looked up the NBC program director, Paul Stangle. We pulled out the clips on Sybil Thornton. They were nice and fat because she'd been to Reno four times and hadn't broke training for years. She'd been traded around more than a Red Sox pitcher. The clipping said she was 32. There were a lot of pictures. And from her eyes, you got the idea she was around 35. But there were arguments the other way, too. Well, there weren't any stories on her for the last few months, just a few items from the columns. They all said the same thing. She was hitting the night spots with a gambler named Rudy Hauser. There were pictures of him, too. Now, he would look good in a cave with heavy curtains. I asked Paul. He said Hauser had a gambling place out on Geary, so I took a cab out there. For ten bucks, the guy at the door said Sybil Thornton had left the place an hour ago. That made me feel good. When Hauser opened the door to his office, I lost the glow. Yeah? What's with you? I got a problem. You got the wrong door. Well, you can't get any tougher, so I'm coming in. Mm. Suit yourself. I never throw anybody out until I'm sure they've lost all their money. What's on your mind? A horse named Fleet Lady. She disappeared at 7 o'clock tonight. Oh, you check under the rug, I'll try the cabin. She got back just in time to greet somebody's guns. If I say no, will you go out and lose your money like a good boy? Fleet Lady was owned by a gal named Sybil Thornton. The columns say you're number five on her list. Well, they never lie. The whiskey's too good. Also, a little bird says she was in your office an hour ago. That's right. She said your name's Novak. Yeah. Next time you got a bombshell, give it a test run. With Fleet Lady dead, your money's gonna look real good in the six tomorrow. Well, makes you think the gal would throw a race. For the same reason she goes out with you? Huh? When a gal takes a great dane like you out in public, it generally means the guy's a few bucks ahead of her. Ooh. You wanna fight the team now, Novak? Mm -hmm. 
And just remember, sometimes you can't be right in a gentleman, too. Yeah. I hope that's the way you feel when they pick you up for Jackie Gregg's murder. Huh? Oh, you do a real nice double take, mister. The jockey checked out with a horse. I didn't know that, Novak. Yeah, with no brains, you built this gambling club. I didn't know he was dead. If I told you that, Novak, I'd meant it. He's all right for a little punk. I'm sorry he's dead. So's he. I'll see you later, Hauser. I gotta nose around and find out where you were tonight. Yeah. You seem all right, Novak. So I'll tell you. If you got any dough left when you leave my tables, bet it on a horse named Fleet Lady in the sixth race tomorrow. Do you always bet on a dead horse? You got the tip? Use it or bury it, but don't loan it out. <laughs> case was a regular grab bag when I walked out of Hauser's office. I began to tick off the things that didn't add up. First on the list was that van down on the waterfront. If it was Fleet Lady, who got shot in the stable? If it was the ringer, that meant Fleet Lady would run tomorrow. Oh, I couldn't figure out why Hauser was so sure she'd win. An idea kept racing around in the back of my mind like an ant in a cookie factory. Jackie Gregg lied about that van down on the waterfront, but Why? Not to bail me out of the poorhouse with 200 bucks. Oh, I got part of the answer when I stopped with the pay telephone and called Hellman. Yeah, Hellman talking. This is Novak. I got some news. You'll have to put it on the back page. What do you got? Your friend Jackie Gray had some love life. Well, there's a chance for you, Hellman. Who's the girl, Sybil Thornton? Yeah, we found a picture in his wallet. The gooey kind. I bet you stole it for long train rides. What time did he die? The right fit for you between 9 and 10 o'clock. Two shots from a 32 caliber pistol. How about the horse? 45 caliber. Two people. It's getting involved. Maybe, maybe not. You got two hands, Novak. Look up a guy named Rudy Hauser. He's got a joint out on Geary Street. I got enough friends. You look him up. I did. He's still talking about Fleet Lady and tomorrow's race. All right, maybe he's sentimental. Look, Novak, I'll pick out my own work. I don't need free help from you. Jackie Gregg paid 200 bucks and look what he got. That suits yourself, but Rudy Hauser and that gal are close friends. Yeah? Like two-part harmony in a telephone booth. Get off the dime, Hellman. Hauser's got that gal in his hip pocket. She owns Fleet Lady and he's betting her to win. You're trying hard, Novak. It's got to be a slow field to lose to a dead horse. Wake up, Hellman. You couldn't smell a rat in a basement full of cheese. I did all right in your apartment. Huh? That thirty-two caliber pistol, we found it in your place. See you later. Well, I wasn't too worried about that. Hellman's smart enough to know a phony plant. I began to think about that thirty-two caliber pistol. It's a woman's weapon. Well, that doesn't prove anything. So is a bread knife if she's in a bad mood. Must have been about midnight when I got to Sybil Thornton's place. She was wearing black lounging pajamas tied tight around a slim waist. She looked like a wasp with a nice sting. And she had company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. Mr. Novak, this is Ronnie Stark. Hello, Novak. Yeah. Well, he's not very friendly, Sybil. He's just parting because they're going to arrest him for Jackie's murder. How do you like Hellman? You've known him longer. Yeah. Somebody left the murder gun up at my place. Where you been all night? Please, Mr. Novak. You're embarrassing Ronnie. That's right. I'm blushing, and it's not the whiskey, Novak. I see. You must stay longer, Ronnie. Uh, she's persuasive, huh, Novak? See you tomorrow. You won't forget, Ronnie. No, I won't forget. I'm betting on you, Novak. What won't he forget? Mr. Novak, I hope nobody ever asks you that question. Hmm. You don't want to talk about putting that gun in my apartment? No. Let's talk about Rudy Hauser, then. Hmm? Your meat grinder friend. We just had a good talk, and he opened up a new road. What'd you tell him? Don't break a spring. He's all right. Will you do me a favor, Patsy? Like not talking to Hauser anymore? Huh? That's right. Won't do you any good, Patsy. It'll do me a lot of good. How's he going to know which horse got killed? I'll bet you lied to him, Angel. It's my apple cart, Patsy. Leave it alone. Sure. But play your hand right, baby. Because I'm going to watch your cards. And if you got one that says Jackie Gregg, I'm going to call you the hard way. Patsy, you nice beast. I really think you would. Sit down. Yeah. A drink? No. Do you good? Not right now. Well, you've read the book. Just a couple of chapters. I bet they're the right ones. You better watch out, baby. I may be a long shot. Well, you care as long as I bet. I don't. That's good. I didn't think you'd mind. Aren't you beginning to crowd the beachhead? Don't be a sissy, Patsy. You can't live forever. All right, Angel. It's time to wire the folks. Mr. Novak, just 
Wait until you know me better. That's for me. I left the number. It's your fault, then. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. What'd you find out, Jocko? Not much. Nobody seems to care about the sixth race. I care about it. Well, that's because you killed one of the jockeys. The rest of the people have a more casual interest. How do the odds run? Oh, no heavy favorites. Been here and sleepy time gal figure to be the best at around five to one. What about Fleet Lady? Down the line somewhere. I talked to one fellow. He says she's a dog and couldn't beat a paralytic goose over a hundred yards. Yeah, what else? That's all. What do you mean, that's all? Start digging, Jocko. We're not getting any place. Not even at your end? Huh? I counted on you to do better than that. Good night, lover. <laughs> On the way home, I bought the morning papers. There was no story on Jackie Gregg, no details, and most of the story was a statement by Hellman on Hellman. There was no mention of Fleet Lady, and at one o'clock in the morning, there was nothing I could do but roll into bed. I woke up about nine, called Jocko. It was like sending a message out to the Farallones by Indian Runner. He just muttered and said he'd meet me out at the track. Well, I had to have some more dope, so I called Ira Snow... He calls the races and bets on them. The way he does it, a horse is a real beast of burden. He was playing elf when I got him on the wire. Yeah. Ira, this is Novak. What do you know about the Bonanza handicap? It's a horse race. Oh, you're funny. What about the field? Are the horses any good? Uh, for hamburgers, maybe. Nothing else. How about Fleet Lady? Eastern track. Nobody knows. Would she be worth a heavy plunge? Yeah, if you want to be a muck. What's this all about? Ira, I'm in trouble. How about a fix? Could they run a ringer in on Fleet Lady? Yeah, it's been done before, but it ain't easy. That's what I figured. How's Rudy Hauser on horses? He ain't. He got burned a long time ago. He never bets. Well, I think you're wrong. Look, Novak, I know every guy in town that's got the itch. Rudy Hauser, no. You know a guy named Ronnie Stark? Sure, he runs a book. Why? Nothing. May see you at the track. I'm going to make a bet. Yeah, I'll tell the horses. <laughs> That left me in a hole. If Ira was right, Rudy Hauser on Fleet Lady didn't make a bit of sense. I got out to the track about 2.30. Jocko was there, and Hellman was wandering around up in the grandstand where they couldn't push him into a starting gate. Sybil Thornton waved from her box as I walked by to get a better shot at the starting line for the sixth. They were almost at the post when Jocko came back from the betting window. Well, Patsy, I bet two dollars on a horse called Scotch Victory. It seemed like a good omen. Yeah. I saw your friend Rudy Hauser at the window. Huh? He was pouring money down on the favorites to win. Well, that's why the odds have gone down on Vin Air and Sleepy Time Gal. Look at that board, will you? Yeah, Fleet Lady's gone all the way up to 12 to 1. Yeah, from 8 to 1, all the way up. Maybe the word got around she's dead. No. That's the funny part. She's down there. See, number three on the rail. Not a peep out of anybody. Stand up! Hot Mother is going to the front by one length. Sleepy time gal by a head. Fleet lady between the horses is running third by one length. On the outside, it's Vinair and Old Soldier. Going into the clubhouse turn, it's Hot Weather by two lengths. Sleepy time gal by a half length. Fleet Lady is moving up on the outside. It's been air fourth by one length. An old soldier. Down the back stretch, it's hot weather by two lengths. Fleet Lady moving up on the outside is now second by one length. She runs Running well for a ghost. Yeah. Rudy Howes had better hurry up or he won't see much. What? He better hurry. He left the track ten minutes ago. Huh? Are you sure, Jocko? Yes, I heard him tell someone he had to make a phone call just before the betting closed. Well, Jocko, you're a sweetheart. Oh, I like to think Come on, let's that, go to that stable. Uh, the race is no It was over five minutes ago. Well, how about my two dollars? Come on, will you? There's only one person who'll try to fix a horse race. That's a horse. Well, I knew there was going to be trouble fast. The horses were just coming under the wire when I waved to Hellman and started for the stable. When we got there, Sybil Thornton was clearing out like a fire sale. I'm in a hurry, Patsy, darling. Let me by. No, you made a bad play, Angel. Stick around. Let me by, Patsy. You heard him, lady. Stick around. Thanks, copper. I'll take charge. That's a big gun, Hauser. I got a big beef. You let me drop a hundred grand, Sybil. It's your idea, Rudy. Not this way. You let me drop a hundred grand because you ran Fleet Lady. The program said Fleet Lady, and that's who ran. I brought those odds into line at the window. 
My other lady looked bad on Fleet Lady. You didn't stay to watch her trail the field. All right, I didn't stay. You lost your hundred grand. You killed the ringer. You were a smart big shot who was going to sew up the race. You ran Fleet Lady and cost me a hundred grand. All right, cop, I'll move away from her. Over this way, Sybil. No. Oh, don't let him do it, Patsy. I want to see how tough you are. Come on, Sybil. Let's you and me move against the stall. Watch out, Hauser. You're backing into the horse. Grab the horse, Novak. He's going to trample him. You grab him. It's your idea. Dan. Yeah. You should have learned the first time you can't beat the horses. That's a bump joke, Novak. I guess it is. Now that we're all here, who do we book for Jackie Gregg's murder? I'll answer that, friend. Who's this guy? It's one you missed, Hellman. Hello, Stark. Hiya, Novak. Well, what are you waiting for, Sybil? Tell the man you killed Jackie Gregg. Had enough trouble today, Ronnie. Now you got more coming. Well, you figured it out yet, Novak? Hauser dumped his 80 grand on you. That's right, it's a lot of spending money. Wait a minute. Ronnie, I don't like this. Well, you get your half, baby. I'm going to write out an I.O.U. When they book you for murder and the vote's in, you can't use it. You wouldn't do a thing like that, Ronnie. A dead girl can't spend 40 grand. She killed your guy, copper, and tried to palm it off on Novak. I was there, so I'll testify. Ronnie, you're a no good guy. Ah, don't be silly. I love justice. A booker for murder, copper. I want to tear up that I.O.U. <laughs> Well, Hellman finally worked it out. It started out as a fixed race, and when they were all through, it was up to the horse. Rudy Hauser put the squeeze on Sybil for some dough. She offered to run a fast ringer in place of Fleet Lady, so Hauser could pick up a bag full. Rudy just wanted to make sure, so he sent one of his boys around to knock off Fleet Lady. Only the guy killed the ringer instead. Well, that was a break for Sybil. She made a deal with a bookie named Ronnie Stark to take all of Hauser's bets and guarantee him that Fleet Lady couldn't win because she wasn't that good a horse. It panned out that way. She let Hauser think Fleet Lady was dead. He spent the 20 grand at the window pushing up the odds on Fleet Lady and dumped another 80 on her to win. The moving van? Now, that was a phony story Greg used to get me to scare Sybil. He wanted in on the deal. He went back to the stable that night, got in a beef, and she killed him. She had him out in her car. When I went to make that phone call, she figured it was a good way to pass the buck. Well, Hellman asked only one question. Why would a nice, tame horse go crazy and trample a guy to death? Jocko had the answer. The horse that killed Hauser was a filly. <laughs> Casting Company has just brought you the fourth of a new series, Pat Novak, for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tal Avery, Stacey Harris, Hugh Thomas, and Carlisle Bibbers. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. listening reminder. Tonight, don't miss Jane Wyman when she guest stars and explains how she created her unforgettable role as the deaf mute in Johnny Belinda. Hear Jane Wyman tonight on this ABC station. This is ABC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> the Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. <laughs> The people 
people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Even the busiest detectives can't always be detecting. And on this late Saturday afternoon, we find Mike Shane and his pretty assistant, Phyllis Knight, driving through the timber country high up near the Nevada border. They're on their way to keep an important date, a date with a wedding. But no, not theirs. It's the wedding of Betty Harrison, daughter of the timber tycoon, and Mike has been unwillingly dragged along to help Phil carry out her social obligations. You know, I ought to have my head examined coming way out here to see two people I don't know get married. Oh, Mike. Betty was my closest friend at finishing school. Yeah, but I only finished uh, high school. Now, where do I fit into this high society stuff? Michael, it's a quiet wedding. We're the only guests. And I'm supposed to hold the bridegroom's fevered head? Mike, where is your romance? Romance I've got, Angel, but when it comes to rice and orange blossoms, <laughs> I'm strictly allergic. Mm -hmm. You're hopeless. Hey, look. Look, there's the Harrison place. Place, you say? That, my love, is quite a shack. And there's Betty. There's Betty waiting for us. Yeah, say, honey, that, that guy with her looks familiar. Huh? Mike, that's Inspector Faraday. In the flesh, and that spells trouble. Betty? Betty? Phyllis. Phyllis, I'm so glad you've come. Oh, you look wonderful. Me too. Betty, this is Mike Shane. Hello. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, I'll be. Mike and Phyllis. Say, Inspector, aren't you early with your vacation? No, I'm here on business, Mike. Mr. Harrison phoned me. Said he was leaving on the second section of 98. But he transferred to his own private trainer for me to meet him here. Father wasn't planning to come up for the wedding. Then all of a sudden, I get a wire that he is. Well, that must be Harrison's train now. Yes, it runs up to a little station behind the house. Well, then why don't we walk over and meet it, huh? Let's. Father will be surprised. Betty, hey, where's the bridegroom? Don should have been here by now. Oh, bridegrooms are always late. Those last three hours. You be hey. quiet. Betty! Oh, there's Don coming now. Hey, he's a bit of all right. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm late. Had a flat tire. Oh, Don, dearest, this is Phyllis Knight. Hello. Mr. Shane, Mr. Faraday, Don Manchester, my fiancé. How do you do? Hello, there. How are you? Well, there she is, a coming around the mountain. Yeah. You know, this is something yeah, to see, an engine pulling one coach. <laughs> they dropped the lumber cars off at Camp Junction. Oh. Hey, look. Hey, look. There, there's somebody getting off. Oh, that's Mr. Oliver, father's business associate. Oh, that's Mr. Miller getting off the back platform. I still don't see Mr. Harrison. No. Oh, Mr. Oliver. Oh, hello, Betty. Where's father? Oh, as usual, in his private compartment. Hasn't even stepped out since we left Northwood City. He's probably napping again. Oh, he certainly was fine company. Well, I'm going up to the house. Yeah, that's one happy character. Let's climb aboard and get farther. Sort of like a welcoming committee, mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Uh, Inspector, watch yeah. your lumbago on these steps. Never mind my lumbago, Mike. <laughs> watch out for those fallen arches of yours. <laughs> oh, get him. man. <laughs> Here's father's compartment. I'll sneak in and shout boo. Father! Something's wrong. What is it? What is it? Father! It's Harrison stretched out on the floor. Oh, Betty's fainting. Here, put her on that couch, Don. Wait a minute. Rub her wrist. Wait a minute. I'll get some water. Well, Inspector, how's Mr. Harrison? He's dead, Mike. Looks like a heart attack. Uh-huh. Maybe so, Inspector, but this heart attack has had a little help. What are you talking about? About murder, Inspector. Froth on the lips and dilated eyes don't spell a heart attack. Somebody slipped Mr. Harrison a nice big slug of poison. <laughs> Get Betty up to the house, all right? Yes, Inspector. Phil and Don are taking care of her. You still think Mr. Harrison was poisoned? I know so, Inspector. Look at his neck, stiff, and his jaws locked, eyes wide open and staring. Mm -hmm. I've got a little plan, Inspector. Would you like to try it? You know me, Mike. Well, look. No one knows we suspect murder, and whoever pulled this job figured on a local doc calling it a heart attack. So? Now, you take Harrison's body into Northwood City along with that thermos of coffee we found by him. While you're checking for poison, Uncle Shane here will keep his big o ears open here. All right, honey, how's Betty? Oh, she's a little better, Mike. She's sleeping now. Oh, the poor kid. 
Say, uh, what was that Betty said about her father not coming up for her wedding? Well, originally he didn't like the idea of her marrying. But she was going to go through with it anyway? Yes. Then Mr. Harrison changed his mind, that's all. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mike, when you start double-talking, I get worried. Angel, look, there were three men on that private train making a 50-mile trip. Now, come to the end of the line, what happens? Well, I'm listening, Mike. Miller gets off the back platform and scoots. Oliver hops off the front and goes away mad. And we go aboard and find Mr. Harrison dead. Uh-huh, that's it. This Mr. Harrison is the big boss, honey. You'd think those other two would wait for him, sociable-like. Oh, it's probably just a coincidence, Mike. Uh, and is it a coincidence that Faraday is here? On business? All right, all right, mastermind. So what do you make of it? Uh Uh-uh, Angel. A good detective works from facts, so let's go get some. Facts? Where? Where, Mike? Mr. Miller's room is at the end of this hallway. Let's stop in and say hello, huh? Oh, I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, Hebby, too. Here's his room. I'll knock. There's no answer, Mike. So, being friendly people, we'll go in and wait. Well, you can't just barge into somebody... Why not? The door's not locked. Come on, come on. Mike, I don't like this. Well, now, don't you worry your pretty head. Wow, the remains of a fire in the fireplace. I always love to poke around ashes. Now, let's see. Those look like letters. Mm -hmm. Letters, they were. Letters to Betty. Well, she's asleep in her room. While someone conveniently burns her mail. Mike, let's get out of here. What's the matter, Angel? There's just us two. That's where you're wrong. Mike. Huh? Well, well, Mr. Miller... And with a nice shiny gun. We don't like snoopers around here. Get going. Uh, Just a mistake, Miller. Just a mistake. That kind of mistake isn't healthy. Get out while you're still lucky. Sure. By coincidence, we were just leaving. Come on, Angel. Right away. The gentleman doesn't like our type. And I'm afraid the feeling is very mutual. These couple of scraps I took from Miller's fireplace don't help much, honey. Well, I can't understand why anyone would burn Betty's letters from her father. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, plenty of books around. Michael, after all, this room is the library. Encyclopedia? Modern timbered methods? Look, honey, here's a book, Famous Scotland Yard Murder Cases. Well, that ought to help you, Mike. And here's a bookmark. In the section on poisons. Mike, here comes Don. Mr. Oliver's with him. Huh? Mr. Shane. Well, what's up, Don? I told Mr. Oliver you're a detective. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes, uh, something quite confidential. Miss Knight is my assistant. Oh, never mind. Never mind. I'll go look up a sandwich. Okay, dear. All right, Oliver. Now, what's the trouble? Mr. Shane, I want protection. Protection from what? Miller. He threatened my life on the train. Oh, what happened? Well, shortly after Miller came aboard Mr. Harrison's private train at Northwood City, I discovered him going through some of Mr. Harrison's private papers. Then what? We had an argument, and he drew a gun on me. What is Miller's position in the company? Frankly, I don't know. He's on Harrison's personal payroll. Betty's been rather worried. She felt that Mr. Miller had some sort of a hold on her father. Yes, that's it exactly. It was a very suspicious relationship. And uh, you want me to do what? Watch Miller every minute. He's dangerous. Mike? Yes, honey? Mike? Yes? A telephone call for you here in the den. Oh, okay. Oh. Faraday. All right. Okay, Phil, close the door. All right. Hello, Faraday. Well, what's the dope? Yeah? Well, that might help. Oh, sure, sure, they're all here. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Okay, Inspector, hurry back. So long. What'd he say, Mike? I was right, honey, 100% right. Harrison was loaded with strychnine. Well, then it, it was murder. And that's not all. I heard the click of an extension phone... There are extensions all over the house, Mike. Someone listened. We're keeping company with a murderer, honey. And the trouble is, we don't know who he is. But he knows we're looking for him. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Dirty or burned-out spark plugs can cost you a lot of gasoline. In fact, as much as one tank full out of ten. Now, that's a serious loss in mileage, particularly so when it's unnecessary. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman is equipped to give you complete spark plug service. The performance of each plug is accurately measured on a special tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, 
The Minuteman will clean and re-gap them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with correct replacements. Then you'll not only save gasoline, but your engine will run smoother. Union Oil spark plug service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engines seem to be rough and listless, drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil spark plug service. It will make driving easier. Gas coupons go farther. It is a few minutes later. Mike and Phil have learned that what started out as a happy wedding has turned into a grim case of murder by poison. We find them walking rapidly towards the station behind the Harrison's house. The murdered man's private coach is still there on its siding, made almost invisible by the tall trees which turn the weak moonlight into gloomy shadows. Come on, honey. Well, I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I want to see if that briefcase is still in the car. Inspector Faraday remembered that Harrison mentioned some important papers he was bringing up with him. Well, then whoever was listening on the extension, they know about it, too. Right, and I want first crack at that briefcase. Hey, maybe you do, Mike, but huh? so does someone else. Yeah, a flashlight. In Harrison's private car. Maybe it's the murderer. Hang on, honey, we'll find out. Mike! Mike, there he is, at the end of the car. Hey, honey, look out! Did he hit you? No, no, a clean miss. Oh, he got away out the front. Could you see who it was? No, a flashlight in my eyes. Well, we'll catch up with him sooner or later. Oh. Let's go look over the compartment. Here it is, the briefcase. Oh, what a break for us. We frightened him away without the case. Uh, uh, sorry, honey, bad guess. The lock on the briefcase has been forced open. Oh, and whoever was here opened it and got what he wanted. Correct. Now, here's some papers. Business letters, checkbook. Some kind of a report. Honey! What's the matter? This report. It's from the Atlas outfit. Atlas? Uh Uh-huh. The the detective agency in Los Angeles? Sure, sure. Listen to this. On the basis of our completed investigation, you have sufficient grounds to instigate criminal action against Z. Z? Evidently, Harrison didn't want the name mentioned. Well, Mr. Harrison was certainly checking up on somebody. And getting ready for the kill. I'll bet that's why Inspector Faraday's here. Mike, this is the motive for the murder. All we have to do is find out if Miller or Oliver is the Z in that report, and we've got the murderer. Partly right, Angel, partly. But I'd say it was better this way. Find out which one of them is Z, and the other guy is the killer. Huh? I don't get it, Mike. Look, Angel, look. The murderer listened in on my, my telephone conversation with Faraday. Yeah. He heard the inspector tell me about this briefcase, and he knew it held evidence that could hang him. Well, of course. That's why he dashed down here. Right, Angel. He beat us to the briefcase, and yet this report is here for us to find. Oh, oh. You see? Mm-hmm. He wanted us to find this report, and that means the killer isn't Mr. Z. As soon as we get back to the house, I'll send a telegram to the Atlas people. Okay, but these high heels don't go very well with forests. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. There's someone on that other path. Trees behind this tree. Right. Whoever it is, he's walking fast. He's going past. No, he isn't. Hey, you hold it. Hey, what the... Mike. Mike, it's Miller. I say, what's the big idea of roughing me? I just want to ask you a few friendly questions, Tom. Oh, now, look here. First, about a gun that took a couple of shots at us. Oh, you're off the beam. I'm not carrying a gun. No? Well, don't mind me. I'll just search. Oh, go ahead. Well? Well, Mike? No, no gun. But you could have ditched it easy enough. Oh, Miss Knight, Mr. Shane. It's Don. Well, what's the hurry, Don? Uh, I was out for a walk. Is something wrong? Plenty. I'm glad you're here. Well, I don't understand. Yeah, Shane. How about you doing some explaining? Okay. Mr. Harrison was murdered. What? Murdered? But why? Who? That's what we're finding out. Miller, you're on the spot, and it's plenty hot. Are you saying I killed Harris? He was poisoned on that coach, and you and Oliver were the only ones aboard. Oh, that doesn't prove a thing. It proves there's a 50-50 chance that you're it. Listen, smart guy, your mathematics aren't so good. There were three of us on that train. Sure, sure, but only you and Oliver walked off. I don't mean Harrison. Somebody else got on that coach. (laughs) Oh, now we have the ever-present mysterious third party. Not so mysterious. He's standing right next to you. All right, Don. 
That means you. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Shane, I did get on Mr. Harrison's train at Mill Junction. Well, Shane, guess I can be running along while you turn the heat on him. Uh, not so fast. I still think you know some of the answers. You know, maybe I do. And maybe I might just do a little talking to the right party. And when it will do me the most good. You're sticking your chin out a mile. This is murder. Well, I'll be around resting in my room. No, I don't trust him at all. Yeah? But you're still right in the middle of this, Don. You were on that death train. Oh, but I only stayed a minute. You see, Mr. Harrison was asleep, and I didn't want to disturb him. Which still doesn't explain why you drove out of your way from Northwood City to meet the train at the junction. Oh, it's a very personal matter. Look, Don, look, a man has been murdered. Wait, why should I want to kill my future father-in-law? Harrison wasn't too happy about you marrying his daughter. Oh, but he changed his mind. That's why he sent me a telegram this afternoon, asking me to meet his train. Oh, and what kind of a telegram might that be? Well, I have it right here. Read it for yourself. Here, honey. Huh? I'll hold the flashlight. All right, Mike. Wait a minute. Uh, Don, have changed my mind. Happy to have you as son-in-law. Meet my train at Camp Junction. We'll ride in together. Much to talk over. Harrison. Sounds all right. Let me see you, Angel. Here. Yeah, from Northwood City at 3.20 today. Yeah, I wish I could help in some way. Yeah, sure, but... Hey, what was that? It's a window. Someone lowered it. That's Mr. Oliver's room. Mike, he must have heard everything. Yeah, and something tells me we'll be hearing his little story very soon. That's right. The telegram is to the Atlas Detective Agency, Los Angeles. Uh, this is it. Please advise immediately. Name of Z. Yes, Z, the last letter in the alphabet. Name of Z in report to Harrison. Right. Sign that Michael Shane. That's right. Send it right out, please, and phone the reply here to me at Harrison's place. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the answer to that telegram should mean a lot, Mike. Well, it'll help, darling, but there's some angles I don't get. Miller is a mysterious employee of Harriet Harrison's, all very hush-hush. Oliver's scared stiff of Miller... And Don goes walking around in the moonlight right after somebody takes a shot at us. Oh, you can't blame him for that, Mike. Here the night before his wedding and his future father-in-law is poisoned. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. But there's one thing we do know. There's a killer here. Well, there's a car outside. That must be Inspector Faraday and in a big hurry. It's too bad you haven't the murderer all signed, sealed, and ready to deliver. Now, Angel, now sarcasm doesn't become you. Well, well Mike, Phil... How goes the home front? Oh, quite a few interesting details for you, Inspector. Whatever you're figuring, Mike, forget it. Ah, uh -uh. uh, that means the Inspector knows something. Plenty. While you two were taking it easy, I cracked this case wide open. Yeah? Well, give. Who's the murderer? Miller. Miller? Sure. I thought his face had a familiar profile, so I checked on him with headquarters. And found what? He's got a record a mile long. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be willing to wager it's for blackmail. That's right. But how did you know? Inspector, are you forgetting? Mike is smart. All right. I hope Miller's still around. He said he'd be in his room. Good. Let's go pick him up. Okay. Let's go. Well, Mr. Shane, it looks like Faraday beat us to it this time. Oh, he's just a good man, honey. Yeah. Tell me, what's the line on Miller? Oh, the usual stuff. Hires out as a private investigator and then turns the information he picks up into blackmail. Wow, cute boy. That racket should put him in clover. Yeah, but this time, Mike, it'll put him right in the middle of the lethal chamber at San Quentin. Ooh. Here's Miller's room. Yeah, no need to knock, Mike. Just open it up. Okay, here goes. Miller, we want you... Say, what? Well, there's your man, Inspector. You can take him in, but unfortunately, he's very dead. We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. It's true that clean spark plugs make a difference in engine performance and gasoline mileage. But it's also true that even the finest spark plugs cannot fire properly if the ignition cables are defective. These cables are the small, fine wires which carry the electricity from the distributor to the spark plugs. They should be carefully inspected whenever your spark plugs are checked because old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity which means that only a thin, weak spark reaches the plugs. 
So to get new performance out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minuteman to check both spark plugs and ignition cables. Then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. Phyllis, Mike, and Inspector Faraday have just burst into Miller's room, only to find him dead, shot through the heart. This new development has put quite a crimp in the inspector's plans, and Mike is pointing this fact out to him. Looks like you were wrong about Miller, Inspector. At least wrong about his being the murderer. Miller could still have been the one who bumped off Harrison, then somebody took care of him. Well, that would leave us with two killers. Well, could be, but it doesn't stack up that way. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take Oliver in and charge him with murder. Okay, so you're charging with murder. But how are you going to make it a stick, Inspector? How about motive? What, what evidence do you have? Oh, two and two make four, Mike. Harrison must have been poisoned on that private train. So it had to be Oliver. There's Miller lying there, absolutely eliminated. All fine and good, but it leads us to one other little item. Don was on that train, too. Don? Betty's fiancé? Mike, you saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent him. Don couldn't have been the murderer. In this business, honey, we've got to figure every suspect guilty until we know they're innocent. Yeah, Mike's right. Oh, Phil, would you step into the other room and phone the coroner down at Northwood City? Yeah, yeah, sure, Inspector. I'll give him your compliment. You know, this business is beginning to make sense. The one who poisoned Harrison had to get rid of Miller because he knew too much. Miller said he might do some talking when the right time came. Well, Mike, for my money, Oliver fits into the picture. He's our man, and I'll get some evidence out of him. Oh, I'm sure he knows Inspector. plenty, but... Yeah. Inspector, I tried to call the coroner, but the telephones are dead. Uh-oh, the wires have been cut. Well, that don't make much difference. Oh, yes, it will, Inspector. You see, I'm expecting a reply to a telegram I just sent, a very important telegram. About this case? Yes, sir, in connection with the detective agency's report to Mr. Harrison. The answer to that why might be just what we need. Oh, now that the phones are dead, what are we going to do? Do? Simple, darling. The inspector will sit tight here while you and I go for a nice moonlight ride back to Northwood City. There it is. There's the telegraph office just on the other side of the tracks. Okay, I'll park the bus here. Now, watch it. Easy crossing these tracks, honey. Oh, thanks for the tip, old boy. But you could have carried me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> More trains. Yeah, this is the main line from San Francisco. So isn't this the place where Harrison transferred to his private train? Correct. Well, here's the telegraph office. Good evening, folks. Can I help you? Uh, yes, I'm Mike Shane. I'm expecting a wire from Los Angeles. Mm, Shane. Let me see. Yeah, your telegram's coming in now. I'll have it for you in just a minute. Okay. Look, Mike. Hmm? There's another. The train just pulled in. Now, oh. that's 8.20, miss. Only stops for a few minutes. 8.20? Well, it's late. It's 8.35 now. Nope. Train's on time. That there's the second section of the 8.20. Oh. So many people traveling, huh? Yep. Too many. That's why they run two sections. Like this afternoon, the second section of 98 came in at 3.40 with a whole parcel of folks. Is that right? You know, honey, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Isn't it? What are you staring at me that way for? Well, here's a telegram, mister. Oh, swell, swell. Oh, come on, come on. Who was Mr. Z in that report? Well, this does it, honey, this does it. That Z is nobody else but Oliver. Oliver? Then Faraday's right. No, Angel, Faraday isn't right. Oliver wasn't Harrison's murderer. But uh, come on back to Harrison's place for a little meeting of the minds with Inspector Faraday. <laughs> All right, is uh, everybody coming? Yeah, they're coming, Mike. I told Betty, Don, Oliver. Good girl, good girl. Now, uh, now to open these French windows. There. Okay, Faraday, now out on the porch with you. Right, Mike. Bill, drape that beautiful body in that chair. Oh, thank you. Yes, well, Lord Master. Well, here comes Betty and Don. Oh, hello. I'm sorry it was necessary to bother you. Don and I understand. I'm glad to help in any way, Mr. Shane. Thanks, Don. Come over here. Stand by me out of range. <laughs> Certainly, but... Uh, how to range? I don't understand. Now, what is all this rigmarole about in the middle of the night? There's nothing to get excited about, Oliver. I asked Miss Knight to call you downstairs for a conference. A conference? About what? About mysterious happenings around here, but particularly about why Harrison had you investigated by a detective agency. Hmm? Mr. Shane, what do you mean? 
I mean you've been cheating the Harrison Timber Company out of thousands of dollars. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, Mr. Harrison trusted me implicitly. He did, until he finally caught up with you. That's why he was going to turn you over to Inspector Faraday today. I won't listen to this. There's no proof. There's plenty of proof, all written down in black and white. What's more, you knew Harrison had you dead to rights. That's why you poisoned him. You're mad. I never killed anyone. It's no use, Oliver. You're hooked like a fish. Oh, I didn't murder him. You can't frame right, me. He's running. He's running towards that window. I'll oh, stop him. No, Don, no. Drop that gun. That's better. You knocked the gun out of my hand. You let Oliver get away. Oh, no, no. Here comes the inspector. And he's got our friend Oliver by the well-known collar. Oh, no. Here is Mike Squirman, but safe and sound. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Take him in, Faraday. You've got enough on him to make it stick and stick hard. Yes, he's a dead duck. Oh, Mr. Shane, I can't believe Mr. Oliver would kill my father. But, uh, he didn't, Betty. What? Well, you just told the inspector to take him in. Sure, Don. I'm taking Oliver in for theft. But for Mr. Harris's murder, we'll take you. Me? Oh, what? What are you saying? Sorry, Betty. Don wanted to marry you in the worst way. He married a couple of other girls with wealthy parents. Oh, Betty, don't listen to him. When your father suddenly wired he was coming up, Don knew it was the showdown. That's ridiculous. Oh, no, no, no. You had a hunch Harrison engaged Miller to investigate It's a lie. You saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent me just this afternoon. Sure, Don, sure you got a telegram. A telegram you sent to yourself. All you did was slip over to the Northwood City, wait until the train pulled in, and then send that telegram to your own address and sign Harrison's name. Oh, nothing but lies. No, lies. no, 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 son. It's a fact, a fact that we can prove. Because you made a mistake, a bad mistake, Don. You saw the train pull into Northwood City and thought that Harrison was on it. But you didn't know that there were two sections of that train today and that Harrison was on the second section. You sent that telegram 20 minutes before Harrison got there. <laughs> You know, it's wonderful to be getting back home, here by the Golden Gate. Oh, I like it. You know, honey, one of these days they're going to put up a statue for me, right on Market Street. Well, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. You're such a genius. <laughs> well, maybe not a genius, but quick with the answers, mm. huh? Speaking of answers, is mm? a couple you still owe me? Oh, please, honey, no more Now, questions. remember, remember, Mike, that statue to a genius? Okay, okay, shoot me the question. When did you know for sure that Don was the murderer? When we found Miller shot, of course. Why then? Don't you remember, honey, when we caught uh, up with Miller sneaking back to the house from Harrison's private train? He said he would talk to the right person when it would do him the most good. Yeah, yeah, I thought he meant Faraday. Oh, no, no, no. Our blackmailing friend was talking right through us to the only other party there, which meant Don. He was throwing out a hint for a payoff. Well, of course I know, but how about... That's the... all, honey, please, that's all. Positively all. And hold on to your hat because I'm turning. Just a minute. This isn't the way to the office. You're turning into Golden Gate Park. Ha <laughs> ha! Is that bad? <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
In the mid-afternoon light of Maytime, Broadway shimmers and Langer walks the street. The dream walk, rhythm to the pulse of the sleeping neon. To the sun-warmed blues yawned out of loudspeakers. To the slow, erratic dance of the litter of night, held close, thrown away by a gutter wind. And with the rest of Broadway, you stand and watch, or follow the crowd, and lend your heart to the whispered cry that this day, this time, will not get away from you. But it does. It always does. The web of blood in the alley was already dust-heavy, its threads leading you to the man huddled in a forgotten anguish against the flaking brick of an alley wall. His hand still clutched to the bullet wound as if he tried to claw out the pain and never made it. And the other man leaning over him, being gentle and polite, as he searched the dead man's pockets, then finding something and looking at it, then making the only observation left to him. It's a nice day, wasn't it, Danny? What did you find, Muggerman? Found him like that, all broken up about the bullet in his chest. He tried to tell me why it was there. The word never got out. It was phoned in? Yeah, from the back room of a bar down the alley. A friendly chap wandered out for a breath of fresh air, saw this, ran back to the bar, made his phone call, bought drinks for the house. He's still celebrating if you want to talk to him. You talked to him? Yeah, friendly lush, invited me to a cold beer. I didn't take it. He knew this man? Never had the pleasure, he told me. All the citizens of the alley never had the pleasure, I checked. Uh Uh-huh. What's that in your hand? This? Oh, I almost forgot. It's a ticket for parking made out to a Charles Crandall. Overparked in the loading zone. He can snap his fingers at it now, huh? This your witty day, Muggerman? I try, Danny. Days like this, I guess I don't make it. Oh, anything else, sir? Huh? Oh, not a thing, nothing. Except that expensive watch on his wrist. You have to listen awful close to even hear it ticking. Very expensive. It's running, but in this alley you can't hear it ticking. No wallet, no identification, just the parking ticket, is it? That's all. A wristwatch and a parking ticket. Not much for a grown man to leave behind him, is it, Danny? Then the alley, formerly known only to the chalk writers, the garbage collectors, and the shortcut homers, then the alley became cluttered with new faces, mostly scrubbed. The girl in the picture hat on the Pekingese, a maid in the baby carriage, the dad and his son. Mostly these, interspersed with enough men from the police department so that I could leave. I did. Back to headquarters briefly with a traffic ticket. And to the traffic department, long enough to check an automobile license number against a name and be given an address. Charles Crandall, rooming house on West 17th Street. And go there. Wait a few seconds until the woman at the front door had finished shaking out her mop. Good morning. (laughs) Guess I should say good afternoon. (laughs) House cleaning, you sure lose track of the time. I'm looking for Charles Crandall. I'm from the police. Oh, my... Charlie hasn't done anything, has he? Is he home? I wish you'd answer me. I'm his landlady, and I never had a better roomer than Charlie. What's Charlie done? We found a man with a traffic ticket in his he pocket. Charlie told me parked illegally. Is he home? Why, no. Charlie hasn't been home for the last couple of days. I see. Yeah. Charlie's engaged, you know. No, I didn't. Brought his young lady over just last week, introduced as Rosemary. Such a nice girl. Help me with the dishes. Rosemary what? Oh, I don't remember quite. Nielsen or something. Rosemary, such a nice name for a girl going to be married. Can you tell me why Charlie hasn't been home? Of course. Sometimes he stays at Rosemary's house. Her parents love him like he was their own, like I feel about him. Was Charlie about 5 feet 11, blonde hair, heavily built? But not fat, you understand. Charlie takes exercise every morning. When the chandelier shakes in the parlor, I know Charlie's taking his exercises. And the chandelier shakes every morning before he goes to work. Do you know where Charlie works? Surely Charlie's a longshoreman. That's another reason why he's not fat. Works the peerless steamship line, unloads. That's an idea. Do you want to talk to Charlie? Why don't you go there? You're a policeman. They'll let you talk to him. The foreman said your name was Charlie Crandall. 
Yeah, that's right. I'm from the police. Oh. Oh, the parking ticket, huh? I'm not surprised. I am. I didn't think you were alive, Charlie. Come on. If I'm not being too previous, where are you taking me, Mr. Clover? You'll see. I had parking tickets before. Nobody ever took me by the arm and let me down a cold, damp hallway. That's so? Nobody ever? Never. So help me. I've been missing out on things. Life has passed me by, huh? In here, Charles. Don't tell me. Let me guess. It's a morgue. Uh Uh-huh. I keep looking at such things in the papers whenever you boys put on a safety campaign. Look, the paper says. Drive carefully, or this on the slab is you. Because I got a lousy parking ticket, you're making me live it? This the new up-to-date method. There's a chill in the air here. How come I'm sweating? Take a good look, Charles. I'm looking. I make your promise. I will drive carefully, observing all the traffic signals, and I will never overpark in a loading zone again. Promise. Cross my heart. Gypsy blood oath, if you want. You know him? Cover him up. Put him back. I've had him. I said something, Charles. You know him? Who knows people who ask for this kind of thing? A shelf for a grave. I'm grateful to you, though, Mr. Clover. You've introduced me to a new experience. You've given me a memory I never had before. We found this parking ticket on him, Charles. Yours. Huh? Look at it. Yours. Why do things like this happen to a man like you? It's very complicated. I'll listen. You sure you got the time? You got nothing better to do? Down here, there's all the time you'll ever need. Fortunate me. That's right, Charles. Count your blessings. What I'm building up to, if you give me the chance. Last night was a blessing. Maybe this, what you're showing me, was a part of it. I wouldn't know. When the mood hits you, the part you know, I'll wait. Well, last night was my night in Sally's bar on 3rd Avenue. Oh? This man was found in an alley near Sally's bar. I wouldn't know about that. All I know is Sally's a man with an open ear. I cried into it. Yeah, you'd had a tough day. That, too. I'm a longshoreman, remember? That, too. So you cried a glass full of tears into Sally's ear. Yeah, about the engagement ring I needed for my girl. Or my betrothed, I call her. About the engagement ring I couldn't afford to buy for her. Because a man like me don't lay away for things like that. Must have been very dramatic. Ah, yeah, I put it on. Maybe more than it needed. Because a girl walks over to me, runs her fingers across the beard on my cheek, tells me she has heard the whole thing, or the big trouble I'm in with my betrothed. And she stopped your weeping. You could say that. She told me there was a jewelry store, Scully's jewelry store down the street, to come with her, to pick out any ring in the window I wanted. Like a fairy tale. Yeah, you could say that. So I went with her, pointed to the fattest ring in the window with the fattest numbers, a star sapphire. She says, meet me again tomorrow. I'll get it for your half price. Good girl to meet in a bar. You'll never dream how good. After that, she takes me back to Sally's. Let's me exchange my other sorrows with her. You had more? Only one more I could call to mind at the time. The parking ticket. Well, she says, give it to me. I know where to fix it. You uh, believed her? I hear it's been done. And that's the last you saw of the ticket? The gypsy blood oath, if you still want it. Who was the girl? Helen, addressed Sally's bar on 3rd. Go to her, Mr. Clover. A girl like that can ease many sorrows. Just ask for Helen. They'll know. Don't thumb through any travel folders, huh, Charles? Why should I? I found a home here. Cover him up, huh, Mr. Clover? It's chilly in here. Sally's Bar on 3rd Avenue, the boy had said. Go there and ask about a girl named Helen... Because Charlie had given her a traffic ticket, and the ticket had turned up on one John Doe, dead on arrival. Third Avenue is a tenement five stories high and miles long. At nine o'clock, the night is going full blast. The open-air card games for juveniles only, the doorstep trysting places. And every seven minutes, the elevator screams. Somewhere between Com Chu's Hong Kong hand laundry, special attention paid to pleated dress shirts, and the Blue Star delicatessen, cream soda and hot corn beef two bits, somewhere between there was Sally's bar. I walked in. What's yours, friend? Beer. To make a draft. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
One dime. Thanks. Your name's Solly? You own this place? Yeah, so? You work here every night? Yeah, why? Skip any nights this week? Hey, what's with you, buster? You spent the dime, drink your beer, listen to the music. I'm looking for Helen. Who? Helen, tall, blonde, you know. Look, buster. You're here every night, aren't you? You ought to know Helen. I want to show you something, friend. See this? A ball bat. I bought it from a kid who swiped it from the Yanks' dugout. I sawed it off. You want to hear how it goes? That's the way it goes when I slap it on a bar. You want to hear how it sounds otherwise? You want to... Cop, huh? Why didn't you show me the badge before? What about Helen? I get it. Don't be a cop. You figure I tell you about Helen, huh? What about her? I told her to stay out of here. What'd you want me to do? Hit her over the head with the bat? The other night she was in here talking to a longshoreman named Charlie Crandall. You know anything about that? Who's in trouble? She or this Charlie? Charlie Crandall was talking to you about an engagement ring. Do you remember that? Who remembers for what reason my ear gets bent? Helen, I know. You want her, huh? Where do I find her? You wait on that bar stool, she'll be in whispering at you for a drink. Or well, you can't wait, try the second floor back at the corner house at the end of the block. This side of the street. Can't wait, huh? Walk down to the corner house, which the sign at the head of the steps said allowed no visitors after 10 o'clock. And the other sign at the end of the corridor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Wash out the bathtub. And the door that was swinging open briefly... Then closing. Opening. Helen. Helen. Get no answer. The tenement draft swings the door open and presents a room, a torn apart room. Nothing was in its place. Nothing was undisturbed except the girl on the bed. The strangled girl with the tumbled blonde hair. The dead girl. The murdered girl. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Anyone interested in an auto ride from Hollywood all the way to New York? A fella in Hollywood named Jack Benny has to make the trip. He's got a fine Maxwell automobile, and he's looking for someone who loves sharing the scenery and the expenses. For full details and fascinating highlights, be listening to CBS's Jack Benny Show this Sunday evening. And remember, Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, will be on hand, too. Springtime on Broadway is like springtime on a thousand other main drags, except for one thing. Mother Nature doesn't function on Broadway. Nothing grows. It gets constructed. But nobody bothers. There's the salary to be earned, baseball scores to be considered, and the weather to be discussed. However, as in all times and places, there are the crackpots. Some even delirious enough to give you odds that Broadway's liable to get blown off the face of the earth. You waste a shrug on that one and flip the newspaper over another page. And scan the quarter column on the right-hand side. Girl murdered in tenement house. Police seek link with death of unidentified man. Which was straight reporting. I know, because I was the policeman directly concerned. Next morning, open the notebook and scan the personal brand of shorthand. See now an item. Charlie Crandall had been taken by the hand and led to the window of Scully's jewelry shop to pick out an engagement ring. Go there, look in the same window, and walk into the store. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I'm Danny Clover from the police. Yes? I'd like to see the manager. Well, well, I guess I am, until Mr. Scully comes in. What did you want to see him about? I'm his wife, and... Take a look at this picture, Mrs. Scully. Have you ever seen this man before? I might have, but I don't know him. Personally, if that's what you mean. Maybe I've seen him someplace. Who is he? The man we've got in the morgue. Now, uh, take a look at this picture. The young girl, also in the morgue. How terrible. Do you know her? She could be anybody. Somebody's sister or sweetheart. In the morgue. In a police morgue. Oh, what happens to people, Mr. Clover? What? My, my. Look at him. <laughs> Hello, honey. Like it? Blue coat and brown pants. 
Well, it's different, George. I took my brown coat to the cleaners on the way to work. It got soiled. I... Oh, sorry, dear. This gentleman... Oh, uh, this is Mr. Clover, George, from the police. And this is my husband, Mr. Scully. Oh, Mr. Oh, something I can do for you, Mr. Clover? Yeah, just take a look at a couple of pictures. Here, this one. Hmm. Never saw him. Well, take a look at this. No. Her either. Dangerous characters, huh? George, they're dead. They're in a police morgue. No, I don't know either of them, Mr. Oh, Clover. Oh, George. I'm talking to the gentleman, Louise. But I'll forget if I don't tell you now. Uh, my wife is forgetful, Mr. Clover. That's a good kind of wife to have. What is it, dear? Mrs. Reed was in here for her diamond brooch. I couldn't find it. Well, why not? Why couldn't you find it? Mrs. Reed was furious. You promised her you'd have the catch repaired by this morning. Well, it's ready. Why couldn't you find it, Louis? I looked. It's not there on the repair rack. I looked all right, but I couldn't find it. Call up Mrs. Reed and tell her your husband's here, Louise. Tell her to stop in for a brooch. Well, do it, Louise. You're not missing anything from this shop, are you, Mr. Scully? Missing what? I don't know. I don't understand what you're talking about. A robbery, anything like that? You're joking. If I had a robbery, I'd know I'd been robbed, wouldn't I? You want anything else, Mr. Clover? No? Then you'll pardon me, won't you? Sure you will. Gino. <sighs> What's the matter, Tartaglia? You got a big sadness? From your office window, Danny, you can see the harbor in the yon. It makes you unhappy, huh? Lady Jane Pugh, the ne'er-do-well girl detective from London Town, she has pushed off from our fair shores, Danny. The paper said she grew lonesome to eat an English kipper in the fog. Uh, it happens to a girl sometimes. You're fighting me, Danny. Don't do that at a time like this. There's only one thing to do with a grief like yours, Gino. Tell me, Danny. Don't tease me with it. Tell me. Bury it in work. You mean... I tried, Danny. It don't help. There it is on your desk. Hmm? You buried your grief in this envelope? A part of it. The rest, what's in the envelope, is news from the FBI. Concerning the fingerprints of the man now in the morgue whom you found bullet holed in the alley. They matched them? To a minor hoodlum. Name of Johnny Malloy. Used to work our fair city. Crossed a few sweaty palms with silver. Address unknown. I informed them his new address. Finally caught up with him, aren't you? Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. This is Rosemary Nelson, Mr. Clover. Can you come to our house right away, please? Who did you say? Rosemary Nelson. I'm Charles Crandall's fiancé. He told you about me, he says. It's about the ring he gave me. The engagement ring. I don't want it. Nor him anymore. Please come. Now what's your address, Rosemary? The brownstone with the marble stoop. 1827 West 58th. You'll be here? Right away. You going out, Danny? You mind? Well, if you want to leave me alone with a memory, it's all right. Go ahead, Danny. I'll be all right. I've been alone before. Bye, Danny. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to her, Mr. Clover. She's upset. A lover's quarrel upsets a girl like Rosemary. I know. We've had them before. And that's all it is, Rosemary? Just a quarrel that needs a policeman to referee it? Look at this ring, Mr. Clover. Beautiful. Star sapphire, huh? Take it. I don't want it. Give it back to whoever Charlie got it from. You know where I got it from. Who I got it from. How I got it. Don't make a tear-stained production out of it. I'm not crying, Charlie. Not anymore. That's one thing I used to like about you. You never gave me a reason to cry. You got a star sapphire, didn't you? Is that what eats you? Because you never had a thing like that before? Because the star shoots pains through your head? Oh, leave me alone. Just you leave me alone, you hear? Rose. Rose, honey. Where'd you get the ring, Charles? Honey, Rose, baby, listen to me. I told you I'd tell the police. I dropped into Scully's jewelry store a little while ago. I noticed a little square, clean place in the window, like where a ring box had been. This the ring, Charles? Yeah, yeah. You need an engagement ring, lonely man. Take it. Looks like I don't need it anymore. Helen Griffith get it for you like she said she would? Half price and everything? Half price and everything. You could go ask her. Except I read in the paper she's dead. So you'll have to take my word for it, huh? You were with her. You were with her. And she sold you the ring. And now she's dead and you want me to wear it. 
Get him out of here. Get him out. Yeah. Why don't you do that, Mr. Clover? It ain't the same between Rosemary and me anymore. So why don't you do like the pretty girl asks? Let's go, Charles. I'm sorry, Rosemary. Oh, leave me alone. Just you leave me alone, you hear? What are you waiting for, copper? What is Come it? Come on. What are you going to hold me on? Suspicion of murder? Until they come up with a new one. Danny? Danny? Over here in the squad car. Woman down at headquarters, Danny. Turning the air blue with complaints about Scully the jeweler. Says he... Tell us about it on the way down, huh, Muggerman? It'll pass the time for all of us. You, me, and our boy, Charlie. <laughs> This is Danny Clover, Miss Christie. What am I supposed to do? Put two fingers in my mouth and whistle? You made a complaint about a jeweler named Scully. What's the complaint? Don't talk to me like that. What is this, Mungman? I'll handle it for you, Danny. Now, look, Miss Christie, you told me something about a watch and about Scully's jewelry store. I want you to tell Mr. Clover. What's the matter? You got amnesia, Sonny? Please tell him. It's about my layaway plan. Whirl that around for a while. Danny, this is a mad dream. We lost that one, Mike. Try another move. Miss Christie. I told you it was my layaway plan. My layaway plan. You mean you bought something for Mr. Scully on a layaway plan? You don't, don't you, boy? What did you lay away, Miss Christie? A watch for a man's wrist. I'm courting. Figured a bullet of it would make him happy. You still haven't told us what the complaint is. That's Scully. For 11 months now, I've been paying down on the watch, see? Come in with the last payment in my hot little fist, no watch. Scully tries to sell me another one. That watch have a gold face, gold wristband? And if you flip open its backside, there's 17 jewels visible to the, if you'll pardon the expression, naked eye. Hey, Danny, that sounds like the watch we found on that guy in the alley. Yeah. Entertainer, Mugovan. You heard what the man said, Sonny? Entertainer. Then a squad car, and on the way to Scully's jewelry shop, the gathering together of the after images of two people's dying. Item, Miss Christie. The fact that her wristwatch had disappeared from Scully's store had turned up on a murdered man's wrist. Item, Helen. The fact that she had gotten a star sapphire from Scully at a big saving. The fact that she'd been murdered. Conclusion. Mr. Scully had been robbed, or he'd been giving away merchandise. Anyway, it was a conclusion that needed Mr. Scully. What can I... Oh. Hello, Mr. Clover. Is your wife here, Scully? In the back, sort and stock. Get her. Well, if it's important, Mr. Clover, but she's busy. Get her. Mr. Clover... Well, all right. Louise? Louise, come here for a minute. I haven't finished the stop, George. Leave it and come here. Mr. Clover wants you. Who? Mr. Clover, you remember, the policeman. Well, tell him to come back, George. If you stop me in the middle of the stock, I'll forget what I've done. Don't worry about it, Mrs. Scully. It won't take long. But what do you want? I told you I couldn't recognize those people. I know. Your husband couldn't either. Well, what's the matter? Don't you believe us? Yeah, don't you believe us? Tell me something, Mrs. Scully. Did your husband ever locate Mrs. Reed's diamond brooch, the one that needed the catch fixed? Well, why ask her? Ask me. Yeah, yeah, I found it. Oh, you mean I found it, George. You remember we laughed when I found it in the repair case after looking there a dozen times. I just couldn't understand it. Because when you looked a dozen times, it wasn't there. Tell her where it was, Scully. What are you trying to do to us, Clover? Tell her where the brooch was, Scully, and the wristwatch and the star sapphire ring. Oh, my. He, he's crazy, Louise. I don't know what he's trying to do. Oh, my. George. Well, George, I'm not going to lie for you. You might as well know that. After all, you've done something wrong. I know I'm a plain woman, George, and I'm in my 40s, and I make myself forget a lot of things. But not this, George. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You lied to me, George Scully. You said you took your coat to the cleaners, and you never did. 
When I was in there today, the cleaning man asked me about you. Said you hadn't been in for such a long time. Uh, I told you a little white lie, Louise. I lost my coat. You must have lost the keys to the store, too. Is that why we've been using mine? Is that how that hoodlum Johnny Malloy looted your shop, Scully? Walked in and took your coat when you had it off. Well, when it's hot, a man takes off his coat. But your keys were in the pockets. Why didn't you report it to the police? Because you were with that woman again, weren't you, George? That's why you couldn't report it. But I was only drinking with her in a bar. I don't care what you were doing. After all, you promised me. Louise, I... I I lied for you about the pictures. But I'm not going to lie anymore. Not about her. Even if she is dead. Louise! What do you want me to say? I don't know. Tell her you killed Johnny Malloy. Only he didn't have the loot. He'd already given it to Helen, so you had to strangle her to get it. And you got it. Hey, I don't know what got into me, Louise. I didn't want you to know. It was such a beautiful night. I was walking along. I stopped to light my pipe. It was in front of the bar, and I heard a tap on the window. It was Helen. She waved me in, and I... I just didn't want you to know. But you promised you wouldn't. And now look at you. George Scully... You're a murderer. I think we'd better go, Scully. Louise, you gotta help me. We'll get a lawyer. He'll tell you what to say. I won't lie, George. I just am not going to lie anymore. <laughs> In May, the night sighs down on Broadway like a rosy promise. Someone smiles and takes your hand, whispers. And for an instant, the lights are brighter, the noise louder, and your scream mixes well with the scream of the night. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Lou Merrill was heard as George Scully, Jeanette Nolan as Louise Scully, and Adam Williams as Charles Crandall. Others in the cast were Peggy Weber and Joy Terry. Say there, Sing It Again's current phantom voice is really a phantom. For the past two Saturdays, she's mystified everyone Jan Murray's called in his coast-to-coast Sing It Again phone. Tonight, Jan may call you. If you can name the phantom, she's worth $3,000 in cold, hard cash. So stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. Joe Walter speaking. This is CBS, where you laugh at Jack Benny every Sunday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Portions of the following program are transcribed. Here is Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Are you, Mr. Diamond? Creditor or client? I'm a client. I'm a diamond. I'm glad. It's a little informal, but hello, glad. Call me Rick. Oh, oh no. No, no, no. My name is, is Julia Bates. Mrs.? Yes, but you don't have to call me Mrs. Bates. I'm a widow, you see. Oh. In fact, it, it may help our relationship if you call me Julia. Oh, well, here we go again. All right, Julia, you can call me Rick. The fee's 100 a day in expenses. I want you to stay at my house tonight. 
Uh, I said a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, the, the, the fee is all right, Mr. Uh, Rick. Money means nothing. Yeah. Well, you think your way and I'll think mine. I'll make out a check right now. No hurry. Any time in the next ten seconds. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Now, about this assignment. Well, it, it, it may sound silly, but I'm afraid of the house I live in. Oh, dandy. I said it might sound silly, mm-hmm. but it's deadly serious, I assure you. No, I'm sure it is. You see, my husband, Warner Bates, died three months ago. Mm-hmm. He was a very strange man and believed devoutly in many forms of mysticism. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he built this house as a monument to his beliefs and, and filled it with secret passages and rooms and steps that lead nowhere. Why not move out? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. It's because of the money. Oh, in his will, Warner stipulated I was to live in the house for a period of three months following his death. Three months is up tomorrow. And it doesn't help that Warner is buried in the basement vault. What's he doing, watching Benny's money? Well, he, he had a crypt built in the cellar, and a, a key, the only key to it, was placed in his coffin. Mm. What's supposed to happen tonight? Well, let, let, let me tell you the whole story. A, a month ago, I began to hear the strangest things in the house at night. and I found food half-eaten on the kitchen table. Ever try setting traps? Well, the worst shot came when I went to the cellar a few days ago. I found footprints in the dust, naked footprints, leading to and from the crypt. Maybe you had to take a shower. Oh, please, please let me finish. On his deathbed, Warner swore he'd visit me at the end of the third month, and if he could, take me with him back to the spirit world. Oh. And tonight is the night. Yes. Mm. Oh, at first, I, I didn't think it would get me, but... Oh, I'm scared. Really scared. Yeah, well, uh, now, look, baby. Let's get off this mystic kick. Who inherits if you don't live up to your requirements? Well, that's just it. No one. That is, no person. The money goes to charities and schools. Mm-hmm. Mr. Anderson, the executor of the estate, says the will is foolproof, legal, and binding. Either I live in the house until noon tomorrow, or forfeit the inheritance. So what you wanted me to do is hang around tonight and see that hubby doesn't go death walking. Yes, that's right. Uh, you don't have to be there till dark, but, oh, don't be any later than that. Say, six o'clock? Uh, excuse me. Diamond Detective Agency, freewheeling corpses, ask the man who kills one. Uh, Rick, when are you going to stop those awful slogans? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Got to call you back, got a client. Oh, all right. Is she pretty? I don't know. I'm parked behind a curve. What? Oh, forget it. I'll call you back. Bye. Now, uh, uh, Julia, uh, you better go on home. Where's your broom? Broom? Do you think I look like a witch? Mm, You don't look like one. More like the good fairy after she'd heard about men. Now, you fly on home, sweetheart, and I'll see you at six. Uh, uh, Don't be late. I'll be there with bones on. I tried to uncurl my toes and get my mind on business. Thinking of my spook client didn't seem to help, but it was, uh, business. It was getting pretty late in the afternoon, so I put the office to bed for the night, picked up a bite to eat, and went over to the 5th Precinct to keep a coffee date with Lieutenant Levinson. When I walked into the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis with his nose in a book. Now, hello, Otis. What's with the book? Don't tell me you're learning to read. Hey, hey, hey. Hello, Shamus. Uh, hot tricks. The book, Sergeant. What's the book? A book? Oh, what book? Oh, uh, uh, Lieutenant's inside. He said for you to go right in when you came. Otis, uh, tell Uncle Richard about the book. Oh, it's just a book. Here, yeah, I was trying to improve myself. Well, don't feel ashamed, Otis. You've got reason to do that. Yeah, very funny. I see. Hmm. The art of graceful dancing. Otis. Well, what's wrong with me dancing, Shamus? I... I don't want to be no social outcast. Dancing? Well, maybe. But graceful? Otis, you couldn't be graceful even if your feet did match. Tell you what, though. I'll give you a hand. Now, just open your arms and pretend you have a dame. Go on. I'll start you on a waltz. Well, okay. Da, da, dee, dee, dum. Tweet, 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 tweet. Da, da. Oh, no, 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 Otis. You look like an elephant with sprained yeah. ankles. Now, try again and close your eyes. Yadadum dee 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 dee. Oh, this way, sir. Oh, this. Put me down. What? Oh, oh. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I thought you was a dame. You what? Oh. I, I mean, I had my eyes closed. I, I, I was dancing. Oh, Lieutenant, the, the shamus talked me into it. Rick, would you mind telling me what you were doing? Saving Arthur Murray ulcers. Oh, yeah. Well, come on in and get some coffee. And Otis. Yeah. Shut up. 
Shall I pour? Uh, please do. You know how I like mine, Walt. Yeah, no cream, 12 lumps. Uh, better change that. I would think so. Okay, how many? Make it 14. Your coffee's stronger than mine. It's not so strong, Nick. Here. Mm, thanks. You better bite that spot off the desk. The varnish is beginning to smoke. Your jokes aren't any better. Gonna stick around for the heart game tonight? I uh, can't, Walt. I've got a client with a house full of spirits. What? The dead kind. With you on the job, there'll be corpses jumping out of every window. Uh, yeah. Well, if they start, I'll give you a call. I know, I know. Why don't you give up give being a detective, Rick? Play postman or something. Walt, you just don't seem to appreciate my favors. Uh, uh-oh, I'm getting late. It's nearly six. It's a peaceful night, Rick. See if you can't keep it that way. Oh, sure, Walt, sure. This is one night you can take it easy. Uh, give me two more lumps, please. Leaving Walt and heading to the Bates house, I was feeling as happy as a bird in a hat full of worms. I had a hundred bucks to stall off the landlord, a lovely red-headed girlfriend with curves, and a spook client with, uh, trouble. Everything great. Then the storm began to blow up. It had started to rain when I saw the Bates house on Temple Street. A big, ugly house straight out of a horror story with gables and shuttered windows. And as if that wasn't enough, I was met at the door by a butler who was a tiny thing, about seven feet tall and 300 pounds, with a face like the devil with a hangover. Come in. Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to see uh, Mrs. Bates, of course. You are Mr. Diamond. She left word with you? I need no word. I am the seventh son of a what? The seventh son of a... Oh, no, this could go on forever. Okay, lead on. The name is Kane. Yeah? How's your brother? Well, forget it. Where's your, uh, Mrs. Bates? In the drawing room. This way, sir. Cozy little mausoleum. What time do the ghosts come out? Usually right after the vampires. Sir. Oh, dandy. I hope they have an early show. Oh, it will be soon enough, sir. The dead are restless tonight. Maybe if I rocked them to sleep, I... Got a rock? Mrs. Bates. Oh, yes. Mr. Diamond. Oh, thank you, Kate. Uh, hello, Rick. How, how do you like my house? Oh, it's, uh, it's lovely. What do you use for doorknobs? Heads? And what's with the big zombie? You didn't mention him. Kane? Oh, he's a fixture around here, but mm. I get frightened more when he's around than when he's gone. Oh, well, now you take it easy, baby. Come on over and sit down and let me chase those fears away. Oh, that is an idea. Name me a better. Uh, can I fix you a drink? Oh, I, I think I'll take a glass of milk, sir. Here you are. Oh, now, hey, look, Crusher, put a bell around your neck or something. One more surprise like that, and you'll be best man at a funeral. My apologies. Your milk, sir. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Come on, Julia, let's get back to where we were. And you, Kane, you... Hey, where'd he go? Rick. Rick, there it is. Huh? Yeah. But, but, But that's the way it starts. Listen. It's the stairs to the cellar. Someone's climbing them. What? Oh, it's probably Kane. You wanted me, sir. Kane? Then who... You wait in here, Julia. I'll go out and get our nosy uh, friend. The, the cellar door is at the end of the hall. I left Julia looking as nervous as a one-legged man walking a tightrope and took off down the long hall. There was only one door, the one to the cellar, so I opened it and flipped on the switch. I was moving my ankles down the creaking steps when I heard trouble. (laughs) What the devil? Julia! Julia! Are you hurt? What is it? Rick! Rick, over there in the closet, a a dead man! A dead... Oh, no. There's no dead man in here. Not there. But I saw him, Rick. I swear there there was a man in there. He was all bloody and there was a big knife in his chest. Oh, but you must have been mistaken. About a corpse, Rick. He was there. Oh, I don't see it. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, You're on the floor. Blood stain. You see, there was a man in there. Hmm, this is blood, all right. But where'd the body go? He couldn't have been moved that fast. Unless... 
Where's Kane? Right here, Mr. Diamond. But I did not move the dead one. No? Where were you just now when Julia screamed? Having tea with a vampire? No, I was in the kitchen, sir. Do not be mystified, Mr. Diamond. Accept the fact that you are in a house controlled by the other world. There's been a murder, Kane, and that brings it into this world. But, who are you calling? A real-life cop who likes to know about dead bodies kicking around. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Oh, no. I know that tone. Where's the body? I wish I knew. Come on over to 209 East Temple Street. Wait. What do you mean, you wish you knew? Is there a body there? Well, it's here someplace. Now, don't argue. Get over here. Wait, wait. And wait. hurry. Now, Kane... You can go back to the kitchen, but stay there. Don't roam around. As you wish, sir. And now, Julia, baby, we're going to do some investigating. I- investigating? That's right. I got a big yen to see what's in that vault downstairs. And this time, I'm taking you with me. But, Rick, it's locked. I hope so, but I'm not making book. You, you mean you think it may actually have been Warner come back from the dead? And, and kill that man, I mean? Right now, I don't know what I think. I wouldn't be surprised to run into Dracula sitting on top of the wolf man. Here's the basement. Hey, who turned out the light? I know I turned it on before. Yeah, that's better. Come on. Oh, Ricky, did it's cold down here. Oh, hurry, Rick. I'm getting scared. No, I don't like the feel of it myself, but I want to check this vault. See? See the footprints there in the dust? I see them, but I don't believe them. Not yet. Yeah, I'll try the door of the vault. Why, it's unlocked. Yeah, and look what's inside. The coffin is empty. It's empty, all right, and it's open. Well, are you going inside? Uh, no, no, I... I think I'll stay out here. <gasps> the light! Rick, who put out the light? It wasn't Edison, baby. We got company. <gasps> I told you I'd come back for you. Hey, what is this? I am dead. You know who I am, don't you, Julia? Yes. Hmm? Yes, I I know it's you, Warner. I'm coming for you tonight, Julia. I will appear at nine o'clock. I'd better set my watch. Be prepared to meet me, Julia, at nine o'clock. No, no, Warner, no, no. Take it easy, baby. Rick, you down there? Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, Walt, turn on the lights. Sure. There, they're on. Rick, what are you doing? Oh, a block. I should have known. Well, do come upstairs and join us. We're coming, Walt. Now, what is this all about, Rick? Where... Uh, in a minute, Walt. Otis, help Mrs. Bates into the living room. She's pretty shaken up. Sure, Shamus. Come on, lady. Now, what is this all this about, Rick? Now, come on back downstairs with me, Walt, and get your gun out. Somewhere in this cellar is a dead man with a lousy sense of humor. Well, we searched the long cellar, but good, while I briefed Walt on the events of the evening. Neither was much of a success. Walt didn't believe me, and our ghost remained a ghost. As we went back up into the living room, I was at a point where I didn't believe the things myself. They couldn't have happened, but they had. Hey, uh, Otis, where did Mrs. Bates go? She went upstairs to pack Shama, said she was going to leave. Leave? And give up her dough? Oh, for Pete's sake, she can't... Not just because of this ghost house. Ghost house? Oh, this is the wackiest yet. Rick, if I didn't know you were so... Walt, do I look like I'm happy about these things? I'm at a point where I'm believing in spooks and spirit worlds and dead men who talk from out of nowhere. Yeah, so the Shamas is afraid of spooks. This I'm loving. Otis. Yeah, I know, Lieutenant. Shut up. Did I say that, Otis? Well, no, Lieutenant. What do you want me to do? Shut up. Oh, oh. Gee, I wish I had a glass of water. A glass of water, Sergeant. <laughs> oh, come out from behind that chair, Otis. It's only came. Who's he? Well, didn't he let you in? No, we found the door open. When we rang and no one answered, we came in. Oh, did you? Hey, Kane, where were you? Didn't you hear the doorbell? I knew the door was open, Mr. Diamond. And I was busy. Like maybe playing ghost? No, sir. Baking a cake. Cake? Oh, swell. Rick, I'm all packed. Will, will you take me to a hotel? Now, but Julia, look, you can't leave. Think of the money. Money or no money, I'm getting out of here, Rick. That was Warner's voice, and I... I, I 
just don't have the nerve to stay. Oh, but look, baby, you know there aren't any such things as ghosts. Do I? You were in the cellar with me. You heard him. And did you find anybody down there afterwards? Well, no, but... but just a minute, Mrs. Bates. You saw a murdered man earlier this evening, didn't you? You know I did in that closet. Yeah, well, until I find out who he is and who killed him, you don't leave this house. But, 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 Warner... I'm sorry, Julia. We'll protect you, but you can't leave. Otis, take Mrs. Bates into the library and make her comfortable. Hey, Yellowton, come on, Mrs. Bates. Well, oh... Now, Rick, enough is enough. How could there have been a body in that closet one minute and not the next? Where did it go and why? Well, how the devil should I know? She saw it, screamed, I ran back, opened the closet, and it was gone. Oh, great. Now, come on. I want a better look at that closet. Well, it looks all right. Wonder how it sounds. Use your gun butt on the walls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, but where's the latch? There must be some way to open this section. Try those hooks. Yeah. No, no, not them. Hmm. Maybe this rack. Look. Secret room, just like in the movies. Oh, oh, there he is. Yeah, we found the corpse, Walt. And how he disappeared so fast. Oh, some mess. Blood all over him. Walt, hey, this is no corpse. What? Oh, now, don't start that. No? Well, look at it closer, Walt. It's a dummy. Well, I'll... It is. A wax dummy with blood smeared on it. No wonder I wasn't meant to see it. Oh. This is it. I'm getting out of this crazy house. Corpses that talk, corpses that aren't corpses. I've had enough. This is just plain ridiculous. Now, wait, Walt. Someone planted this dummy, and someone is trying to scare Mrs. Bates out of this house. That same someone is in this house right now, and if he hasn't stopped, it may mean her murder. How are you feeling, Julia? I'm exhausted, Rick, but I... I... We found the body, Julia. It was a dummy. A dummy? Well, then... Then there wasn't any murdered man? No. This whole thing is a bluff. Even that voice in the cellar. Oh, no, that couldn't be. That was Warner's voice, Rick. I know it was. And he's not in his coffin. I know, baby. And I think that's all phony, too. Now, tell me, who knew that only key in the coffin business? Well, just myself. And, and Mr. Anderson. Anderson? Oh, that's right. You remember. He was Warner's lawyer. Oh, yeah. How about Kane? Did he know of the key? Well, I don't know, Rick. He may have Warner confided in him a great deal. Rick, this isn't getting us any place. Come with me. Otis, you stay with Mrs. Bates. Yellowton. All right, Walt. What are we going to do? Grill the dummy? Go ahead. Be funny. But I want to search this whole house. Oh, Walt, this place is a nut house full of secret rooms and hocus pocus. It'll take two maps and a Ouija board to get around in it. Well, I'm going to get around in it. And up these stairs is as good a place as any to start. Hello, Walt. Oh, stairs that lead to a blank wall. Rick, that's too much. Now, would you stop playing games? Playing games, he says. Oh, where is my bicarbonate? Here you are, Lieutenant. Ah. Sorry to be late. Where's the thunder, Kane? You're Mr. Q. Will there be anything else, sir? I don't see how, sir. Not unless Frankenstein drops in for a game of jacks. I doubt if he will. Tonight it's at his house, so... I'll be on hand if you need anything. We won't. Go on back to your embalming. Come on, Walt. You feeling okay? Oh, I'll never feel okay again. Rick, I've stood for your getting me mixed up in some crazy cases, but this night I'll never forget. Oh, don't quit on me now, Walt. We still have to find that spook and keep Julia from being killed. How? Please, tell me how. Look, he said he was going to appear at 9 o'clock tonight to take her to the spirit world with him. Yeah, well, I'll get a squad down here to see that he doesn't. No, no, Walt, wait. He'll never show up if we're all hanging around, right? Well, yeah. Uh, the only way we can catch the ghost is for him to show up, right? Yeah, go on. So what do we do? So we pretend to leave, make a big fuss about giving the whole thing up. Then we sneak back in and hide. We wait and see if he shows up, and when he said he would, and if he does, we nab it. Case closed. Well, it sounds screwy, but to wind this case up, I'll buy anything. Where do we hide? We'll get Julia to wait in the living room. We'll sneak back and hide in that secret room behind the closet. If the ghost shows, we can grab him as soon as he gives himself away. And I think he'll show. After getting Julia to agree to the idea, Walt, Otis, and I made a big thing about leaving the house. Then we sneaked back in and hid in the secret room back of the living room closet. The closet door was open enough so we could see Julia pretending to read on the couch. And for the next few centuries, we waited. Waited for a dead man to keep a date. What time is it, Rick? 
It's two minutes to nine. If he's going to show, it won't be long. Hey, you think a dead man really can come back to life? If you don't shut up, Otis, I'll give you a personal chance to try. I wish you'd hurry. Yeah. Well, it's just time now. I hope Julia plays her part okay. She looks pretty nervous. No, why would she be nervous? She's only waiting for a dead man. A phony dead man, Walt, I hope. Now, don't you start believing in ghosts. You know there aren't any <laughs> such things. Rick, the lights went out. Shh, listen. I told you I would come for you, Julia. It is nine o'clock. Oh, Warner, please, please don't take me up. I don't want to die. Rick, it's to... him. Shh, wait a minute, Walt. I am of the dead, Julia. I am your husband. Yes, yes, I know you, Walter. You must leave this house, Julia. No. Come on, Walt. Right. And Otis, be quiet. Oh, oh, I will. I know enough not to make any noise. But... <laughs> what was that? Rick, Rick, hurry. Come on, let's grab him. We all took off after the ghost. It led us on the screwiest chase yet, in and out of the secret passages, upstairs, and then back downstairs again. Trying to lay hands on him was like trying to swat a fly with a piece of string. He finally made a break for the outside door. Then, not to be outdone, I made like a big athlete. was a pretty nifty tackle, Simon. Rick, Rick, think you okay? Yeah. As soon as I get this hood off, I'm going to have a few words with this spook. There. He's out cold. Oh, just bring Mrs. Bates in here. Oh, okay. Come on, you. Wake oh. up. Who is he? I don't know. Come on, wake up. Oh. Before I make a real ghost out of you. Oh. Okay. Okay, don't hit me anymore, please. Uh, yes, she is, Lieutenant. Mrs. Bates, do you know who this man is? What? Why, it, it's Warner's lawyer, Mr. Anderson, the executor of the estate. Sure, baby, had to be. All right, Buster, what's the story? Oh, all right, all right. It was the money. If I could get Julia to break the will, I, I had a dummy charity set up so I could get the estate. He's all yours, Walt. Wrap him up. It'll be a pleasure. Otis, put the cuffs on him. Take him out of here. Yeah, Lieutenant. Come on, Spooky. Well, that takes care of that. Hey, what about Kane? He must have known about all this. Of course I knew, Lieutenant, but I did not wish to intrude. Those who interfere with the dead pay their own penalty. Lose their haunting license? <laughs> Nothing. Oh, sir, my cake is done. Would you like some? It's devil's food. No, thanks. I'll skip it. With nuts? Ah. Uh... Julia, walk me to the door. Well, of course, Rick. I'll leave you with Kane, Walt. Tell him a ghost story. Feeling all right, baby? Oh, yes, much better. I'm fine now that I know there's nothing to be afraid of. Tomorrow I'll be moving into an apartment. Uh, will you come and see me? We have things to talk over. Like what, honey? Like sharing a mood. You know, just the two of us. <laughs> With that, she reached up and showed me what she meant with a big smoochie. Oh, I'd have probably stuck around, but I was afraid the house would be too disturbing. I wouldn't have minded having to get up to chase the bats out of the room, but with Kane showing up every time I wanted something, well, that could have led to complications. So I left Walt and Otis to clean things up, bid a not too fond farewell to Kane, and went from the house of horror to the one that was full of redhead and a piano. The redhead was wearing a red dress with a new, uh, uh, you know what I mean. Well, didn't think you were going to make it. Uh, I had a tough case tonight, honey. Thought I might not get away at all. Mm-hmm. I'll bet you did. Why, Helen, baby, all of a sudden you sound suspicious. Without any effort, darling. Especially when it comes to blondes. Uh, blondes? You mean girls? Girls. Blonde girls with hair like this on your lapel. Oh. And the lipstick on your cheek and the look in your eyes. Oh, you know how it is, honey? Brilliant detective saves clients' life and fortune. She had to be grateful. <laughs> Brilliant detective. You keep on making me so jealous of you, and one of these days the world is going to lose a brilliant detective. No. Someone going to rub out Sam State? Oh, what's the use? Oh, now, baby, don't be mad. Come on, let's next. No. I'm upset and I'm unhappy. If I sing, will you be happy again? No, no. 
Well, I'll try. I'll sing my widowed head off. I need your love so badly. I love you oh so madly. But I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. I thought at last I'd found you. But other love surround you. And I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. If you'll surrender just for a tender kiss or two, you might discover that I'm the lover meant for you, and I'd be true. But what's the good of scheming? I know I must be dreaming. But I don't stand a ghost of a chance with you. Happy? You sang night. Do we neck? No. No, it's still early enough to catch a late show. Well, if I take it to the show? Uh, yes. Okay. What's the show you want to see? Oh, it's a wonderful horror picture full of spooks. The ghost talk. Oh, no, no, no. have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Paul Fries, and Robert Clark. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Portions were transcribed. Tonight's story was written by Herb Burdum and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Tal Avery, inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? There's great comedy in store for you on the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show when Phil and Frankie go shopping for Alice's Christmas present. And there's excellent drama on Theater Guild on the air. Tomorrow, Richard Conti, Diana Lynn, and Shirley Booth will be starred in the Pulitzer Prize-winning play, Street Scene, on Theater Guild on the air. Portions of the following are transcribed. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Yeah. Down, up, round, and down. Mr. Diamond, I presume? Yes, and maybe no. Down, up, round, and round. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand you. Uh, yes, I'm Diamond, and you're not presuming on me, not if you're a client. Oh, no, that's not what I mean. What is that object you're playing with? Uh, this? This is a yo-yo. You make it go down, up, round, and down. See? Uh, yes, yes. But, but I came in on business, Mr. Diamond. I want to hire you. Just drop it like this. Down, up, as a detective. Oh. Well, a hundred a day in expenses, and I throw in the yo-yo lessons free. Give me the Mr. Diamond. Are you in a business? Do you have the hundred a day? I do. I am. That's fine. Your name? Oh, I, I can't tell you that. Goodbye. <laughs> Will you kindly put that thing away? 
I have a terrible head. Oh, I don't know. It's not so bad. Carve it yourself. Why, you insufferable... Now, wait a minute. Until we've had a formal introduction, the word insufferable is your ticket for a new set of dentures. Now, why don't we get formal and save your gums that lonely feeling? I told you my name is not important. That I believe, but let's kick it around anyway. Is that necessary? Look, look, you said you wanted to hire me. So either tell me your name or what you wanted me to do, or let me get back to my practicing. Uh, I, I should find another detective, but you came highly recommended, so... All right. Uh, you can call me, uh, Johns. Other wife? What? Forget it. The initials on your briefcase read J.B. Oh, oh, that, uh, it's one I borrowed. So, now that I've conquered your coyness, what's the Pitch? Pitch? Oh, oh, you mean my assignment. Oh, it's very simple, but first, I must insist that no word of this conversation leaves your office. So far, no one would believe it anyhow. But my ethics are in good order, Mr. Johns. Good, good. This must be kept very secret. Shall I pull down the blinds and stuff the keyhole? Oh, that shan't be necessary, thank you. Your secret is... Uh, murder, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I just knew you were going to say that. Where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse? Oh, that's what I came to you for. I want to have professional advice on every angle before I kill. Now, you've had police experience. Uh, I... Unless my hearing aid's on the blink, you're saying you want to commit a murder. Oh, not want. I'm going to. This evening. Oh. What do you want me for? The victim? Oh, I have the victim. The opportunity. Method. Uh, and the man to handle the uh, details. However, I want to be sure that I'm not tripped up by my lack of foresight to police procedures. Uh, sure, 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 yeah. Uh... Whom are you calling? The police, but you'll probably get sent to Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, your ethics. Ethics about concealing or helping a murder are free passage to Sing Sing. The phone. Put it down quickly. Oh, my. Isn't that shiny? A real gun. Those things are illegal, you know. Must you shake it so much? Uh, oh, uh, sorry. I, I'm a little nervous. Oh, swell. So, uh, you're nervous. Uh, quiet, quiet. I'm thinking. This visit has obviously been an error. But perhaps not a fatal one. Let's see. I have it. Into the closet. What? With my bicycle, it'll be too crowded. Your bicycle? Or oh, my exercise bicycle. And that's my there's my rowing board and oh, my be quiet. Stop walking. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now open that door. Oh, okay. Uh, now that bicycle. It has a seat? Well, uh, yes. Sit on it. So the Diamond Detective Agency sat in the stuffy closet listening to the sound of the desk being pulled over and jammed against the door. Not having anything better to do except call myself names, I rode. On my fifth lap around the world, I gave birth to a brainchild and began applying the art of leverage against the blockaded door using both legs and the flat of my back. Result? A charley horse. On the third lap following, I came up with something more substantial. A heavy barbell. Four smashes and three torn ligaments later, the thin door collapsed over the desk blocking it. I picked my way over the debris, trying to focus my eyes to the light. By instinct, more than sight, I found the phone. But as I reached to pick it up, I suddenly realized I was shaking hands with someone. Back up, Diamond. Oh, this is getting ridiculous. All my clients waving guns at me. I'm no client, Diamond. Mr. Johns wants I should keep your company for a while. Oh, well, you're a small one. This gun makes me a big one, Diamond. Real big. That's why my nickname is Big Man, even though I'm only four feet tall. Oh, maybe I could help you. I've got a lot of exercise things. Be funny or shut up. How about a few yo-yo lessons? <laughs> Say, it's very funny. Shut up. Big Man, what would happen if I took that gun away from you? You want to try? Uh, I was giving it a thought. But on second thought, uh, no. Yeah, smart Shamus. I can empty this magazine in your stomach before you make two steps. It... Rick, I... Oh, I didn't know you had a client. Take it easy, Diamond. I got a gun in my pocket. Uh, uh, uh Helen, Helen, baby, come in. Uh, uh, meet Big Man McCarthy, an old, old pal from PS69. Big Man, this is, uh, Miss Asher. Oh, yes, delighted, Mr. McCarthy. Hey, same here, chick. Say, pal, you got good taste. Some built. <laughs> such a flatterer. Rick, what happened to your closet? Uh, the termites broke my non-aggression pact. Uh, what's on your mind, baby? Well, I came to see if you were ready for the benefit tonight. You are, aren't you? Oh, well, am I? Just watch this new yo-yo trick. They call it round the world. Oh, wonderful. Oh, Rick, you know so many things. Where'd you learn that? A PA-69, of course. Where else? Mr. McCarthy. Do it again, Rick. I want to see how you do it. Sure, baby. Just watch. You take it in your hand like this and throw it out like this. <laughs> oh, Rick, you struck that poor little man. No. 
Well, that poor little man had a big nasty gun in his pocket and it was pointed right at my breakfast. Why, that horrible little... Why didn't you hit him harder? He might have hurt you. Oh, darling, are you sure you're all right? Uh, I'm sure, baby. Well, you send for the police. He should be behind... Now, look, Helen, this is my department. You'll go along with your errands. Rick, he's dangerous. Helen, will you go away? I have a few questions I want to ask this little hood, and you'll be of no help, believe me. Well, all right, but you be careful. Oh, and uh, about tonight. It's not at my apartment, but the park is penthouse up above in the same building. Now, come early and help Francis and me get things ready. Stop pushing. I'll see you tonight, baby. Oh, Rick. Are you sure I can't stay? Go, scat. Now, for you, Mr. Big Man. Come here. Wake up. Wake up. The mule train went that way. Come on, come out of it. Ah, uh, uh, it's you, huh? Yeah, me. Now, what's the real name of your boss? Who's he going to kill? You can stop the questions, Diamond. I'm not going to talk. You want me to wring it out of you like a wet wash? Who is Mr. Johns? You know, there's a big advantage in being a little diamond. Yeah, you can hide under smaller rocks. <laughs> Who's your boss? There's another advantage, too. A man my size can be awfully hard to catch. What? Hey, come back here. He never looked so good. Shut up, Otis. He's really been worked over. Wonder what gang did this to him. Rick. Rick, snap out of it. Oh, oh. Rick, what happened? Oh, it just came through the door. Oh. What? Coming through the door couldn't wreck you like that. Oh, without opening it? You mean... Oh, no. You got that shiner by running into the door? <laughs> Shut up, Otis. Okay, Rick, where's the body? Uh, beside you. Now, that's Otis. I mean, where's the corpse? Uh, the corpse isn't a corpse yet. Otis, get my bicarbonate. Hey, Yellowtooth. Go on, Rick. The corpse isn't a corpse. Tell me, what is it? A ghost? Exactly. Otis? Hey, hey Yellowtooth. Mm. Now, Rick, do me a favor. Please tell me what you're talking about. Oh, you aren't trying, Walt. All I said was that the corpse isn't a corpse yet and that it's a ghost because I don't know who's going to be the corpse. Rick, before I go stark raving mad, will you tell me what you're talking about? Well, a man came into my office this morning, said he was going to commit a murder. Threw a gun on me when I started to call you. Locked me in a closet. I broke out only to find he left this little man, big man, the midget who just ran out of here. Stop, please. So Helen came in. I turned the tables on big man. She left. I asked questions, drew a blank. Big man started to run. Why didn't you nab him? He ran through the door. I ran into it. You're up to date. <laughs> I'm up to date. Get him. I'm up to my ears in confusion. So we've got a man who's going to murder someone. All right, what's his name? He said Johns, but it's a phony. Initials on his briefcase read J.B. Uh, say, Shamus, what do you look like? Uh, Otis, do you have a son? Oh, uh, you know I don't. Well, that's what he looked like. Rick, are you sure this J.B. is planning to kill someone tonight? Well, if he isn't, he sure took a lot of pains for nothing. Let's get down to headquarters. I want to check the files. Well, okay, but we don't keep files on ghosts. Well, by the way, why did you come up here? Helen called. Said you were holding a pigeon for us. Oh, lovely girl. I'll say... Can I have a dance with her at the benefit tonight? Uh, no, Otis. I think I better fix you up with Francis. Swell. Otis, you gravelhead. Francis is a butler. Oh, it's all right, Lieutenant. I like them foreign dames. Well, that's all the pictures, Walt. I've looked them all. Johns doesn't have a record, neither does a big man. Yeah, they wouldn't. The one time we get a chance to stop a murder before it's committed, and we've even got a good description of the potential killer. Well, this... This J.B. was no bum. Not even an ordinary working man. His clothes are expensive, and the briefcase he carried probably cost more than your weekly salary. Now, it's an even bet he belongs to the social upper crust. That or close to it. Well, that would narrow the field a lot, but still... How I... about the newspapers, Walt? They have society reporters who know anyone who is anyone... It's a long shot, but name, name me a better. You can go through the newspaper logs. They might have a picture of Oh, some... no, no, Walt, no pictures. I'm nearly blind from looking at pictures now. Thanks, but I'll try the reporters with a description. It sounds like you're going to search for a needle in a haystack. Oh, Otis, please, your cliché is showing. Ah, uh, that's screwy. You can't kid me. Only dames wear clichés. How could mine be showing? Sergeant, when you die, will your brain to a clinic? Maybe they'll discover a cure for it. Ah, lay off. Besides, I got a good idea for your investigation. I wouldn't miss hearing this for my next two issues of Batman. 
Yeah, I was thinking you could maybe save a lot of time if you got an artist to draw a picture from your description. They do it in all the movies and catch crooks easy. Otis, how would you like a transfer hey, to Walt. Staten? Wait a minute, wait a minute. He may have an idea. I know where there's an artist who could sketch J.B. from a description. It's crazy, but you may as well try it, Rick. Otis, you can drive him there. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, tell him yes, Walt. I can't stand to see him cry. All right, Otis. You can use the siren. <laughs> Otis, it's right at the head of the stairs. Uh, who is this guy? Her uh, name's Vladimir, and be careful, he's temperamental. Oh, that's okay, I've been vaccinated. What, what, what? Open up, Vladimir. Runga Glenn, go away. My name's Patrick O'Brien. It's Diamond, not the landlord. Comrade, come in. Stalin. No, Vladimir, that's Sergeant Otis. Oh. What a startle he gave me. Uh, Vladimir, can you sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch a man's face from a description? Can I sketch... Did I not once sketch the whole Russian army and with one pencil? Okay, Vladimir, but can you do it? Comrade, you doubt it? I am the greatest artist that's impossible. I can draw... Uh, Comrade, you are paying cash money. Cash money? Oh, for that I can draw you Siberia and never miss a salt mine. I'm such a genius, I can't stand myself. Another man, Vladimir. Can you sketch the man's face? I think so. Okay, but make it fast. I'll give you the general idea and correct you as you go. Corrections you can make. One criticism, I go back to my shave cream signs. Come with me to my hizzle. <laughs> Almost, Vladimir, but the nose still isn't quite right. Make it look a little more like a pickle. Sweet? Dill. Off that side, just a pinch. Oh, like this? Yeah, yeah, you've done it. That's him. Ah, how much do I owe you? For you, comrade, hundred dollars. What? Fifty dollars. A buck. S sell my genius for a buck? <laughs> I die first. A buck and a quarter. Oh, comrade, please, I'm capitalist now. A buck and a half, last price. I wouldn't get... Last, pr last price, I take it. But I may die. If you do, give me a call. It's a good job, Vladimir. Of course. Was I not the artist to sketch the Tsar himself? Of course, it didn't pay so well, but it was great honor. Looks pretty fuzzy to me. Comrade Diamond, your patronage I appreciate. But if you must bring along this peasant, don't. Even his face makes me sick with the repulse. Uh, Otis, come on. You'll have to pardon him, Vladimir. Whenever his shoelaces come untied, his brain slip out. See you later. Oh, Chichornia, comrade. When we left Vladimir, I sent Otis back to Walt and took off for the newspapers. I showed the sketch to one society reporter after another and watched the many heads shake my eyes began to cross. It was 6.30 when I finished playing Quizmaster, and there was no use kidding myself. I had struck out. I had to tell Walt, so I started for the 5th Precinct. I was at a point where I'd have hocked my social security for 30 seconds with a little big man. Then as I walked down the street, I suddenly felt the nerves in my spine jump down into the pit of my stomach and goose pimples skidded up my back like scared rice. It was a feeling I'd had before. So without turning, I headed for the steps of a basement apartment. <laughs> Well, I got my meeting with Big Man all right. And it came within inches of being a vamp into a Gabriel solo. Big Man apparently thought his shots hit pay dirt. But when I peeked over the top of the stairs, he was in his car and going. I took in the torn knees of my pants, said a few messages to the spirit world that would have barred me from any seance, and hauled what was left of the Diamond Detective Agency to see Walt Levinson. Well, you can have it, Walt. This is getting ridiculous. Beating my brains out, getting shot at, and for what? Shot at? That's right. I said shot at. You can have the whole stupid mess. I like to get fees for playing post office with slugs. And if a guy gets killed, call me. I'll help with the embalming. But, but... Oh, but nothing. 
It's 7 o'clock, and I'm not sticking around to split a three-way crying job over a killing that may already have happened. I'm going to Helen's and get a drink. Oh, all right. Go ahead, Rick. There's nothing more you can do anyhow. I'll see you later. All right. And you stop looking like a panda with a bellyache, Otis. No, what did I do? Oh, shut up. Uh, hey, where are you going? I'm going out and punch the first little guy I can find right in the nose, just on general principles. I left the precinct and headed for Helen's party. I remembered that the benefit was being held in the penthouse and went on up. I was surprised to find Helen's butler, Francis, opening the door. Good evening, Mr. Depp. Oh, my, did you have an accident? This day has been an accident, Francis. But if you mean my clothes, I was playing spin the bottle with a bulldozer. You do look a little battered, if I may say so, sir. You ought to see the bulldozer. What are you doing opening the door up here? Oh, the Parker's butler was taken ill, sir. As I was helping Miss Asher with the decorations anyway, I remain to take his place for this evening. Is she here? Yeah, yeah, she's in the living room, sir. Thanks, I'll go on in. Here. Hello, baby. What? Hit you a bus? Just the door and the sidewalk. The bus I get later. Oh, Rick. And just look at your suit. It's ruined. Now, what's with the concern over my suit? You lobbying for my tailor? I wanted you to look your very best tonight. Here, let me see those knees. Come on, sit over here. That's it. Now... Oh, well, they're not as bad as I thought. Oh, cheer up. Maybe they'll get infected. That'll help. Who did this to you, Rick? Our sweet little friend of this morning, Big Man, or I should say his boss, J.B., he's the one who sent Big Man after me. J.B.? A specter sent to haunt me for my past sins. He hired the little killer you saw me sock with my yo-yo. Your yo-yo? Oh, you haven't lost your yo-yo, have you? Oh, Helen, baby, your Ricky's nearly been killed. Must you worry about my yo-yo? I'm sorry, but it is all right. In my pocket, here. See? Good as new. Oh, that's fine. Now, what about this J.B. person? Why did he send Big Man to kill you, Rick? Because I know he's going to commit a murder tonight. Maybe doing it right now. Wait a minute. You said Big Man. Did you let him go this morning? Uh, yeah, yeah, I let him go. And I've worn my feet off up to my eyebrows trying to find out who his boss is and who's on the spot to get knocked off. Oh, poor Ricky. I wish I could help you. It's not me that needs help now. I quit. It's the guy J.B. is after. J.B., uh, are those his real initials? Yeah. No, we've had lots of things to go on. Initials, descriptions, even a sketch of him. Here, I've got it in my pocket for all the good it did. Oh, wait, don't tear it up. Let me look at it. Oh, Rick, silly. This is no murderer. That's a sketch of Johnny Blackwell. It's a... Helen, you know who this man is? Of course. It's Johnny Blackwell from Newport. He and his wife are up here visiting Adam Worcester. Rick, what is it? You're... You're all turning blue. All day long, I... When you were in my office, you could... Oh, if I'd only asked Helen... Yes, Rick? Get me some cyanide, no water. Oh, but you must be mistaken about the sketch. Johnny Blackwell can't be a murderer. Well, I'm getting out of here. Where can I find him? If you'll just sit still, he'll come to you. Adam Wister's bringing him and his wife to the benefit tonight. <laughs> Well, that's the way the screwy world works sometimes. One minute you're on your uppers, with a stick of bologna, you're trying to hold off three guys with swords, and Kismet makes a switch and tags your side for a gain in your living. I called Walt to pass on the good news, and in eight and a half minutes by the clock, he joined me with Sergeant Otis in the kitchen from where we could peek out at the growing crowd. Let me take a look, Rick. Has Blackwell come in yet? Oh, stay back. I'll let you know. Otis. Get out of that icebox. Oh, I'm hungry. You heard me. Oh, that's fried chicken, Lieutenant. Fried chicken? Mm, I haven't had... Otis. Oh. Walt, Walt, come take a look. There's Blackwell. Where? Over there, just sitting down. The man with the sandy hair. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Who are those people with him? Well, the woman must be his wife. Oh, but get a load of the little weasel. That's big man, the guy who got away from me this morning. Oh, and the other man? Must be Adam Wister. Helen said he was bringing the black holes. Well, he did. So now we wait for the play. Well, we waited and watched the black bull party settle down to enjoy itself. Big man acted like he hadn't eaten for a week and made hors d'oeuvres vanish in his mouth like marbles down a manhole. 
After what seemed like weeks, the situation grew, suddenly took shape. On Blackwell's urging, Big Man rose to dance with Mrs. Blackwell. Mrs. Blackwell was a dark-haired honey with curves right out of one of my better dreams. But my mind was on her husband and Worcester. As soon as they had the chance, they got up and headed out of the room. Watch them, Rick. They're headed for the library. Come on, this way. Through this door and down the hall. Well, Adam, it's nice to be visiting you again. So glad to have you, Johnny. We're sorry to hear about your losses in the market last year. The story here was that you were cleaned out. Hey, Diamond, what's he saying? Shut up, old Oh, I still have a little money, Adam. In fact, I'd like to buy back in with you as a partner. You don't have that much, Johnny. And your wife won't give it to you. She may, Adam. She may, and quicker than you think. Walt, come on. We picked the wrong victim. Let's find the big man. Hey, it's nice on the terrace, Mrs. Blackwell. Yeah, real nice out here. I don't like it. It's chilly. Oh, it'll warm up, Mrs. Blackwell. No, I'm going back in. Better not. I don't like the way you're acting, big man. Get out of my way. Get back and shut up. How dare you talk to me like that, you little... Now I'm big, Mrs. Blackwell. Real big. (gasps) A gun? What in the world? I'm going to kill you. Kill me? Yeah. Only it'll look like an accident. Why, this is ridiculous. What kind of a joke is this? (laughs) It's no joke, Mrs. Blackwell. Your husband don't think it's no joke. He wanted me to tell you he was real sorry. Now I'm going to kill you. You mean it. You really mean it. Yeah, sure, Mrs. Blackwell. Mr. (gasps) Blackwell needs your dough. Bad. Back up. He can have it, all of it. Only don't kill me. Don't. Sorry, Mrs. Blackwell. Too late. Now start back. Please, please. Over to that wall. You're going to play Humpty Dumpty. That's right. Now get up on the wall. No. I'm a guy who's willing to help you. Me too. Diamond, why you... Catch the girl, Walt. Big man's mine. He he was going to kill me. All right, Mrs. Blackwell. Take her inside, Otis. Rick, you okay? Yeah, getting my hands on this little rat was better than a year's vacation. Well, we sure heard enough to give both him and Blackwell a long vacation on the state. Keep him on ice. I'll collect the other one. I'll be delighted. Uh, Oh, my joy. Oh, waking up... Uh, What a shame. (laughs) What a lovely party. I do love these informal get-togethers, don't you, big man? It was short but very sweet, the wind-up of the no-one-was-murdered case. The score was the kind to make you forget you didn't get a fee. Two killers caught, no victims. When I saw Walt take the little big man, not so big without his gun, and his boss Blackwell off to the Bastille, my worries melted like a snowman in a blast furnace. And speaking of melting, the lovely Mrs. Blackwell showed signs of being upset. So, what could I do but console the pretty little thing? Oh, Mr. Diamond, I think you were so wonderful and brave. Oh, you show a few nice points yourself, Mrs. Blackwell, and call me Rick. You saved my life, Rick. And call me Rita. You can get to the point quick. Why, Rita. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Blackwell. I know you must be terribly upset. Oh, Rick has been a great comfort to me. I'll bet he has. But I've arranged for Francis to take you home. Uh, now. Now? Oh, well, thank you, Miss Asher. And Rick. Yes? Don't worry about the name calling. Just say, hey, you. I'll know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. By you. Well? So help me, I'm innocent. With lipstick on your collar? That orders. I've warned him to be careful with my shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, time for my yo-yo act? Your act. I... Oh, Rick, uh, about that... No, now, now, look. I've worked my finger to the bone practicing. Don't tell me. Uh, why, you specifically asked me to be here tonight. I, I know. And come on with me over to the bandstand. Oh, no. No, you don't. I'm an artist tonight, not a singer. No sing, no yo-yo. You mean if I sing, I can do my yo-yo act? If you make it pretty. Uh, it's blackmail, but I'll do it. Well, you stay right here. I want to talk to the orchestra leader. Okay, I'll practice. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Richard Diamond, his piano, and his yo-yo. <laughs> Sing good, Rick. Like a robin with a sponsor. Are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright 
Cause I only have eyes for you, dear. The moon may be high, but I can't see a thing in the sky. Cause I only have eyes for you. I don't know if we're in a garden. Or on a crowded avenue You are here, so am I Maybe millions of people go by But they all disappear from view And I only have eyes for you present an exhibition of dexterity. Now? Now. Oh, no, Shamus, no. You're doing it all wrong. You gotta use more wrist action. Oh, the start of the act. Oh, come on, let me show you. Here, give it to me. Now, you, you start it down, like this. <laughs> Helen. Yes, Rick, he's better. Uh, let's go home and Nick. Wait till I get my hat. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Hans Conried, Grace Albertson, Sidney Miller, and High Everback. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions of the program were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. <coughs> now this is Tal Avery inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night is packed with entertainment when you stay tuned for NBC's star lineup of shows. There's always a program of interest on NBC. Now stay tuned for Edward G. Robinson and the Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around 10 o'clock, I left the cafe tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. Before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the Mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers Three. <laughs> I made a dry run down the boulevard Barkeel, and sure enough, the stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. 
As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. This is a very personal matter. All right, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now, just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. At first, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. Want to stay with that story or try another one? <sighs> Mr. Jordan, would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then. Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend. But very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? <laughs> you are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? You have the dough with you? Certainly not. It's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan. At the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me, my 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, Moody, Moody. Yeah, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work night. Uh, what did you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. <laughs> now, take my wife. Always wants to know what happened. What? Oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, no, that's Morgan, Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan. Killed in mysterious explosion, salvaging operation. Off the coast of Ras el Had. Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. Huh? My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. A reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Mudafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, Come in. So I did. I, I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. Yeah, we meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. <laughs> no, no. There's enough hot air over at the cafe tambourine to keep me in shape. I'd like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, why, I... I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tournay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tournay was arranging for me to give someone a massage uh, at the sanitarium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know I've he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? I get reasons for believing it. Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! I got out. 
If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fata Brahms to show up. So I sat out in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Jordan? Yeah? Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Jordan. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Mr. Jordan, I saw you talking to a man named Fedor Brahms. Nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan. But I can guarantee you, he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Jordan, a man does not yolk when he is 40 fathoms on top. Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? i uh, sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bid, Swenson. You got competition. I hung up knowing that Fata Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Malau wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Svensson's door. No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh, what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room and the dresser upside down. It looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 there has been a fight. But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yes. Oh, oh, what are these? Oh, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter. and It read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address... 62 Fernier Road. It looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Brahms. Next, Jan Swenson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Morey. I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. I'm Mrs. Phipps. May I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh. You'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from him. Shh, please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes. Everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. Shh. I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fader Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with the gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. (laughs) 
Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium, and Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door. How did you find me, Rocky? In the telephone book. Uh, same old Rocky. This here, your finger man? Yeah. Me and Philip Tony, my bodyguard. Well, we've already met twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside our phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tony, eh? I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three. Well, count them. Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they, they are having a relapse, Angus. Maybe I better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. Uh, I'm beginning to see what you mean. Same as there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky. I'll pay you every cent if you promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can trust Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. You hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there. Oh, sure. Well, feels loaded. <laughs> I'll have a little left. <clears throat> yeah. Here you are. Fifteen thousand dollars. Cut it if you like. Well, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm going to show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. Angus put his valise back where it was and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs trying to decide what I was going to tell Fader Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough. I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator when we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I, I walked into the room and, and there, there he was. There's no doubt about it this time. Oh, Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things moved fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man, he rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. Well, Jordan, I'm afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Jordan, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. And Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. $300,000? He's missing. 
I believe 15,000 of it is in your pocket. Tonya did talk, didn't he? May I see it? Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my door. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, George? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look them up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, and by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But, um, about that 15 grand, Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find this three-thumb you speak of. But, Jordan, the facts remain incriminating. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, George? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. Sabina was first on my list. She took my bait once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Tornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open-air market on Farron Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have, too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I gotta find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. I went to the open air market on Ferran Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. Sure, done. I'm coming in, Tournier. Yes, yes, of course. I I thought you were in jail. Well, weren't we all? There is a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd start leveling with me, Tournier. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky, but I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. Well, try these for size. Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus, Fader, and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Ras el Had. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hauled up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Cairo. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300000 But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door, but I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fader Brahms again, or Svensson or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fader Brahms. Sure, I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. But take that shiny cannon out of my face. It hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Well, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat, all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard a sound went up on deck, and I heard oars fading into the fog. It was Angus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. 
I see. Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car? Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not lying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get them together. You you know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. I waited till Fader Brahms drove off around the corner. Then I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. Wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got, uh, what, 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 what is this? Captain Morey, if you'll be at Sika and El Modar in half an hour, I'll produce him. Jordan, go home and go to bed. But Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should I send an escort? Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, Jordan. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. Sam was in no cooperative mood. But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. <laughs> Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it. A quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. <laughs> Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. A pistol blazed almost in my face. And everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps and went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. <laughs> When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Zabaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. Oh, the Sharon again. Why here? We, we, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wronged me. Fader Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, and Fader Brahms. They're all the same man. Oh. Uh, it's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. 
When did you know this? Uh, he should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes, make sure I didn't lose interest. Mm -hmm. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Maury. Dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No. I wasn't sure till Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Maury, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. So when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Morey, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. Just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fader left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that, uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, uh -huh, I see. Perhaps during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, oh, oh no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? My dough? Well, you see, Georgian, there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Jordan, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. You will get your money. You always do. <laughs> Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Girard and was produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, use Fitch, Fitch, shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, use Fitch, shampoo. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo and ideal hair tonic, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. This Saturday night, I'm going spellbind, you about. Caught me while spending a week and the fee for my last case in zestful living at a summer hotel, which was so swanky that the help hardly spoke to the guests. For $25 a day, I had one of the 50 bungalows on the hotel grounds. For 30 I could have had one with a window. Well, anyway, there was a girl up there. <laughs> Isn't there always? She was named Janice Cole, a sort of a social secretary to the hotel. She was about 28. Her eyes were so big and blue they made you think of mountain lakes. And her hair was as black as a jealous rage. She had a figure that made you think you'd seen her before in a swimsuit. Oh, she was real quality. Much to my high blood pressure, she was engaged to a society playboy with a dollar for every suntan in Florida, and his name was Clint Hayes. There was dancing going on in the ballroom of the hotel, and Janice was dancing with Clint. But she was watching me. I thought I saw fear in her eyes. They finished their dance right in front of me.
Well, I certainly enjoyed that exhibition, Clint. Glad you liked it, Rogue. Dancing with Janice is a wonderful way to spend an evening. I believe that. Well, how about the next one, Janice? Oh, uh, I, I can't, Richard. I, I don't feel very well. Oh, really, darling? <laughs> yes, I, I think I'll go to my cabin, Clint. I, I have a terrible headache. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, dear. Is there anything I can get for you? I've got some aspirin. Oh, no. I, I think I'll just lie down for a while. I'll be back as soon as I feel a little more like enjoying the party. After Janice Cole left, I ducked Clint and mingled with the crowd, fencing in and out of polite conversation and keeping up a gay front to cover the worry which was stampeding around in my mind. I couldn't forget the lost look in the eyes of Janice Cole, a look that was so full of fear and hopelessness that it haunted me. I decided, after sweating out 30 minutes of wondering why she was so frightened, to drop by her bungalow and have a fatherly chat with her. I casually worked my way along a chain of conversations to the open door and faded unobtrusively out into the night. There was a light in Janice's bungalow. I walked rapidly toward it. The door was ajar. When I knocked on it, it swung open. And I saw Janice lying there, a red pool expanding on the Navajo rug under her head. I took a few steps into the room. Oh! I was on the inside of a giant bell, clinging to the clapper with a strength of desperation. It swung through eternity like a giant pendulum. And at the end of every arc, the universe was shattered by the sound of the tolling. I couldn't stand the noise. I let go on the tremendous upsweep and was catapulted through space at a terrifying breathless speed. The ringing of the bell grew fainter and fainter. And then, oh, there was quiet. I drifted peacefully for a while and landed as gently as a snowflake on a sparrow's wing. And I rested on cloud eight in the blackness of complete oblivion. <laughs> hey, Chiefy! Chiefy! You better come out of it! Oh, go away, you go. Or go away. I'm not well. I've been hurt. There are things going on that you ought to know about, Rogie. I don't care. I'm on my vacation. You're in trouble, Rogie. Bad trouble. Remember that dead girl? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, what are you going to do about it? Let him get away with it? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Let me alone. Well. Well, I guess you've been hit on the head once too often, Rogie. Lost your nerve, huh? What do you mean, midget? No fight left in you. Hmm. It's too bad. I've got plenty of fight left in me. What's going on down there? Well, you better go down and see, Rogie. Come on. I'll help you over the side. Okay. Come on. Give me a push, you gore. Oh, you're a fine alter ego, and I'm proud of you. I try to take care of you, Chiefy. Over you go, Rogie. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I dreaded opening my eyes because I remembered that dead girl lying there. But I opened them at last. And what I didn't see made me think I'd lost my mind. Where the body had lain, staining the Navajo rug... There was a Navajo rug, but no stain and no body. I wobbled to my feet. My knees were made of soup. I grabbed the bed for support and threw my massive intellect into high. There were strange things happening here, and they were happening to me. I decided to stay mum and get back to the dance to see what I could discover from the behavior of the inmates. I took out my pocket comb dressed my hair around the bump on my head so I wouldn't look like I had to, wiped the bed and the doorknob clean of my fingerprints, and looking much better than I felt, rejoined the party. Clint was talking with Nancy Bowman, another luscious lady on the hotel social staff. Hello, Rogue. We've been looking for you. Oh, hi, Clint. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Richard. Where have you been? We're oh, getting a little fresh air. How about this dance, Nancy? Can't. I promised Clint. Oh, go ahead. I'll be noble. 
Janice should be coming back soon, anyhow. No. All right, then. You're on, Mr. Rowe. Oh, for you, my dear, both of them. See you later, Clint. Bye. You don't answer that Clint's a lucky man getting a girl like Janice. She's what the boys in the back room call a dish. Ah, I suppose Janice isn't lucky getting a man with a million. <laughs> Not my type. Now, I don't have the million, but no, I'll have then a... let's just dance. Oh. Now that Janice has her millionaire, I'm out to get mine. You girls old friends? No, oh, I've worked up here with her summers for a couple of years. She's a grand girl. Everybody loves her. She's engaged to this, uh, this creep with the millions? Yes, they're going to be married in two weeks. Don't you ever read the newspapers? Oh, I guess it wasn't on the sport page. Probably not. Though the way Janice stopped him, it could have been. Kitty, 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 kitty. May I cut in? Hi, Frank. That's up to you, Richard. Well, I never give up beautiful ladies to strangers. You don't know Frank, the ladies' home companion? That can be taken care of. Introduce me, Nancy. Mr. Rogue, this is Frank Pitts, friend of Janice. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Rogue. Where is Janice, anyway? She promised me some rumbas tonight. Well, uh, she wasn't uh, wasn't feeling very well. She went to her bungalow to get a little rest. You insist on cutting in? Unless you have some very fine arguments against it. Well, I, I guess I haven't. Nancy, I hope I'll see you later. Uh, you will. This is a temporary thing, Richard. <laughs> oh, what happened to your dance, Rob? A man cut in on me. Oh, that's Frank Pitts. He doesn't belong here, Rogue. He's all shoulders and no money. Hmm? I understand that he and Janice are old friends. That's right. Frank Pitts has been in love with Janice for years. They're from the same town back east. No kidding. Oh, uh, well, he was in love with her too, huh? Desperately. But I don't feel sorry for him. He's not good enough for a girl like Janice. No, no, Clint. A girl's entitled to old friends. You seem to be the jealous type. Oh, I used to be a little like that about Betty Callahan. I'm not I... jealous, Rogue. You just hate to see a girl like Janice making a fool of herself over a no-good like that Pitts. Ever since he arrived today, she's been moody and dejected. Oh, that's and... the way it is. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? You and Janice had a spat over the old flame. We and... did not. You're being most impolite, Mr. Rogue. Janice and I are happen to be Mr. in love. Rogue. Yes? There's a man outside who would like to talk with you for a minute. Why? It's most important, Mr. Rogue. Please come with me. Okay, excuse me, Clem. You look a little upset. What's the matter? Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. May, may I ask what you're talking about? No, I, I can't tell you, Mr. Rogue. But in all my years in hotel management, this is the most terrible thing that's ever happened to me. Here he is, Mr. Mills. Mr. Mills is our district attorney, Mr. Rogue. Oh, oh well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Mills. What can I do for you? You're Richard Rogue, the private investigator from Los Angeles? That's right. Why? Well, I'd like to talk with you, Mr. Rogue, about a murder. Oh, yes. Why, sure, sure, Mr. Mills. Always glad to lend my talents to law enforcement. That's nice of you, Mr. Rogue, because you can help a lot on this case. Why did you murder Janice Cole? <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, dandruff on the shoulders and coat collar of a well-groomed person is as out of place as snow in July. That's why so many persons who want to have a smart, well-groomed appearance use Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo regularly. For Fitch shampoo has a special solvent action that dissolves unsightly dandruff. When you apply Fitch's to your hair and scalp before adding water, this solvent action goes to work. So it's important to remember not to wet your hair before the shampoo is applied. After massaging your scalp briskly for a few minutes, then apply water. An abundance of cleansing lather will form to carry away the dissolved dandruff. Then the lather rinses out easily and completely, leaves the hair immaculately clean without a trace of dandruff. Yes, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is a real aid to good grooming. Use it regularly. You can buy an economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, or have a professional application at your beauty or barber shop. Now, back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> My guilty conscience was calling me names and giving me bad advice as I stole out of the ballroom with the D.A. He had accused me of murder. I knew who was murdered. I'd seen her in her bungalow, dead. Janice Cole. The D.A. was as quiet as a grave during that walk and not a bit more cheerful. I made a couple of abortive attempts at conversation. 
but I might as well have been talking to a totem pole. I couldn't understand why he was heading for my bungalow until he opened the door, and I saw Janice lying there on that blood-stained Navajo rug, just as I'd seen her a half hour before in her own bungalow. I tried to say something, but the words couldn't get by the lump in my throat. I just stood there, my mouth hanging open, and my stomach frozen in a hangman's knot. I could feel the DA's eyes boring into the back of my head. Well, Rogue, why'd you do it? Well, I didn't. I didn't kill her. How do you explain the fact that she was killed here in your cabin? She wasn't. Now, look, Rogue, you better organize yourself, huh? You're supposed to be a smart investigator. Give me a gun. I haven't got it on me. It's in that drawer there. Yeah, we found that one. This girl was shot to death with a twenty-five automatic. Any prints on it? <laughs> We're going to take yours for comparison. Am I under suspicion for this murder? At the moment, that's all you're under. I finally hope you'll be under arrest for it the next half hour. Oh. You know, Mills, in a homicide, you usually have to have a motive. Be- hey, what's that? Why are you waving those newspaper clippings in my face? What are they? Uh, the motive... You were blackmailing Miss Cole, Rogue. We found these clippings in your briefcase. What do you mean I was blackmailing her? I didn't even know her. Now, look, Rogue, you're smarter than that. Here's a whole envelope full of clippings covering Miss Cole's trial for the murder of her first husband back in Passaic, New Jersey. Her name was Jane Sherman then, and she was released for lack of evidence. Remember the trial? Of course I do. Poisoning. But what's that... So you found out that this Jane Sherman, now known as Janice Cole, was all set to marry a million dollars... And you've been blackmailing. Oh, I don't know anything about it, I tell you. I don't know how those clippings got into my briefcase. It must have been planted there when I was knocked out in Janice's bungalow. It's a switch, Rogue. You were knocked out in her bungalow, eh? When? Uh, look, Mills, I, uh... I know this whole thing's gonna sound fantastic, but I want to tell you the whole story. I came up here on my vacation. I never saw Janice Cole or whatever her name was before tonight. Disbelief walked across the DA's face as I unspun the web of circumstances which tied me into this murder. As I listened to my own story, I knew I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't been there. I showed him the bump on my noggin. He just nodded. I talked on, and as I talked, I realized that I was acting like every murderer I'd ever questioned. I know my face was red, my eyes were shifting as I browbeat my brain and was trying to think of some circumstance which would at least give me the benefit of a reasonable doubt. Finally, I, I stopped talking. He took my fingerprints, and we went to Janice Cole's bungalow. There I got my first break. All right, Rogue. Now, where was the body lying when you first saw it? Right here. Right here. Come here. Look, look, look here. Look under this rug. Uh-huh. And blood on the floor where it seeped through the rug that's now in my bungalow. Do you see it? Yeah. Blood all right. Well, Rogue, that's the first thing that's made sense since we got together. I suppose there is an outside chance that somebody's trying to frame you. Enough of a chance so a conviction would be hard to get, Mr. D.A. Look, you know me. I've got a little standing in my profession, a little substance. Give me 24 hours to get this thing hung around the right man's neck. All right. If I don't have you locked up tonight, will you try and have the right man for me in the morning? I'll have him. Now, tell me, who knows about the murder? Well, the maid who went into your cottage to turn your bed down for the night. And the manager... Well, I've told them both to keep quiet until I give them the go-ahead to talk. Then none of the guests know about it yet, except the killer. That's right. As far as I know. Okay, Mills. Okay, now. You keep it that way until morning, and I'll come up with a guilty man for you. Big talk. I had been framed with loving care, like a sweetheart's picture. The D.A. shoved off to take care of the grisly details of moving the body from its temporary resting place on my bungalow floor. And I started shaking Janice Cole's bungalow down. There were particles of curved glass on the floor near where the body had been lying. I picked them up carefully and fitted the larger pieces together. They could only have been the crystal of a small, square wristwatch. It might be the clue to the killer. I went back to the main hotel building... The Saturday night party was still going strong. I rejoined the merry throng and looked for Frank. He seemed to me to be the logical suspect. He was from Janice Cole's hometown. He would have known about her trial for murder. I found him talking with Nancy in a corner, and he had on a large, round wristwatch. 
Nancy's watch was a dainty diamond and ruby affair, small and oblong. Hello, Rogue. Nancy's been beating the bushes looking for you. I have not. I just was mildly curious about where you disappeared to. I wanted to get rid of Frank and finish that dance with me. Well, this is as good a time as any. May I have the next one? You may have all the rest of them if you like. What's the matter, Richard? You have a pensive look. Well, I was uh, just trying to figure something out. Oh? I was supposed to have a dance with you at 9 o'clock. Where were you? I was here. I got here just at 9. Didn't I, Frank? Don't try to prove anything by me, baby. I don't know. At 9 o'clock, I was having a drink with Clint Hayes in my bungalow. Hmm. Well, <laughs> there goes your alibi, Nancy. You weren't here. Alibi? Why would I need an alibi? I was here. You weren't. I looked all over for you. Oh, now, let's not argue about it. Let's have the next one, huh? I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> no tricks now. Hi, Clint. What? Oh, how come you're sitting this one out? Oh, I am. Uh... Hello, Rug. Well, I'm sorry I startled you. I was just in a deep fog. Hmm? Nancy come back yet? No. Nancy, uh, I just changed her name there, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm kind of worried about her. Well, she's subject to headaches like this, poor kid. Maybe you'd better run over and have a talk with her, huh? Oh, I hate to bother her when she's feeling bad. Look, uh... Clint, just to settle a little argument, yeah. were you and Frank Pitts having a drink in his bungalow at 9 o'clock? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we were. How'd you know that? He just told me. Just a silly little argument. I wish Janice would hurry back in time for the last dance, at least. Clint Hayes had on a large, square wristwatch. And he and Frank had unbreakable alibis. Nancy had none. They were my three prime suspects, and it looked to me like Nancy was about to be elected. I was sitting there, looking for Nancy, and carrying on a pointless discussion on headaches, their cause and cure, with Clint, when Nancy came running over. Come on, Clint, you too, Richard. We're all going down to the pool for a moonlight dip. And I, I don't think I want to, Nancy. Oh, come on. Just because Janice is feeling rocky tonight, there's no reason for you to be grumpy. Come on, Richard, get your swim trunks and give the girls a treat. Huh? All right, all right, I'm in. Come on, Clint, a little dip will do you guys. No, I, I don't oh, think Oh, come I... on, Clint. Oh, might as well, Clint. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Well, Nancy, we got it all organized. Yes, Richard and Clint are crazy about the idea, aren't you? Oh, okay, I'll join you for a while. Mm, nice man, Clint. Hurry up now. See you at the pool. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. Are you planning to have a new permanent to help you achieve that cool, crisp look this summer? If you are, here's a good point to remember. Shampooing with Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo will put your hair into grand condition for that cold wave or permanent. That's because Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is such a thorough cleansing agent. It gets the hair immaculately clean and dandruff-free. Then, since it's completely soluble in water, it rinses out easily, leaving no dull, soapy film. Your hair is left radiant with no dirt, dandruff, or soapy film clinging to the hair strands to obstruct the work of the waving solution. Yes, permanent wave equipment manufacturers, such as the Realistic Permanent Wave Machine Company, E. Frederick Incorporated, and Duart Manufacturing Company all agree that really clean hair is the first requisite to a successful permanent wave. For a soft, natural-looking wave, prepare your hair first with Fitch, F-I-T-C-H, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Then use Fitch's regularly to keep your wave looking lovely. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. My performance in the pool that night made Nero's fiddle solo in the light of a burning room seem like the height of propriety. Here was Richard, the fall guy rogue, swimming and laughing with Frank, Clint, and Nancy, a bunch of murder suspects. A matter of hours before the law put a pair of stylishly plain bracelets on me and claimed me for its own if I hadn't solved the murder of Janice Cole. But there was method in my madness. That swim gave me the information I wanted. In fact... It gave me the murderer. I left before the swimming party broke up and went to one of the guest bungalows. An open window made the job of getting in as easy as falling in love. I found what I was looking for in a chest of drawers. Then I sat down and waited for my victim to come in and turn on the lights. Rogue, what are you doing here? Waiting to talk with you about a murder, Clint. Shut the door. Come in and sit down, Clint. 
I want to know all about what happened to Janice. Janice? Something's happened to Janice? Yes, Janice, and don't act so innocent. What do you know about her murder? I didn't kill her. What makes you think I killed her? I didn't say you killed her, but I'm sure you know something about it. You know, you shouldn't get involved in murder, Clint. It's too complicated. (laughs) You're just talking, Rug. You killed her. You were blackmailing her and you killed her. Ah, no, 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 Clint. You weren't supposed to know anything about that. In fact, you couldn't have known anything about it unless you were the guy who framed me so nicely. I'm a little mad at you for that, you know. And I'm going to get a confession of that murder out of you some way or other. Now, do you feel like talking or do I have to beat it out of you? What makes you think I did it, Rogue? Take off, uh, take off your wristwatch. Now. Now. Look at your wrist. Why, I... You see that small square of white skin where you used to wear your small square wristwatch? That was the giveaway, Clint. You see this watch here, the one I found hidden under the shirts in that chest of drawers there? The crystal's broken, Clint. That was broken in the struggle which, with Janice tonight just before you shot her. The broken glass was found on the floor of the cabin right where the body was before you moved it to mine. Now, do you feel any more like talking, Clint? Why did you kill her? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. Hmm? I got until morning for you to start talking, and I've got more socks in a ten-story laundry. Now, let me know when you want to start singing. You know what happened in that room, and you're going to tell me. I didn't kill her. I didn't, I swear. I didn't, Rogue. I was there. Sure, I was there, but well, I... you didn't kill her, who did? I can't tell you. Come on, Clint. You're not smart enough to work out that frame on me. Who was in this with you? I wouldn't answer that if I were you, Clint. Drop the gun, Rogue. Oh. Uh, oh, hello, Frank. Uh, well, you're mixed up in this, too, huh? Well, maybe we can arrange a double execution. I didn't tell him anything, Frank. I didn't tell him a thing. I know it. I was listening. Sit down, Rogue. Sure, sure. Glad to, glad to. You were the brains of this deal, weren't you, Frank? It's pretty obvious that that quivering mess over there wasn't, isn't it? It's a good thing I was keeping my eye on him tonight. You see, Rogue, when he opened the door and turned on the lights, I saw you sitting there, and that's why I came in the back way. I was afraid that Clint would talk too much. You think of everything, don't you? I try. What are we going to do now, Frank? This this rogue, he, he knows I was there when Janice was murdered. Knows you were there? Well, you might just as well know that you shot her then, huh? You did, you know. Well, it was an accident. Was it? I'll decide that. Aren't you forgetting me, fellas? Oh, no. No, we're not forgetting you, Mr. Rogue. It really doesn't make any difference who killed Janice as long as uh, you disappear with all the evidence pointing to the fact that you did the job. No, 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 Frank. I don't want any more killing. Shut up. I'm handling this affair. I'm going to keep you out of the gas chamber, Clint, if you'll just shut up and do as I tell you. Take Rogue's necktie off and tie his hands. We're going to knock him off and throw him over a canyon where he'll never be found. Oh, you are? Well, I might as well take a crack at it. (laughs) Give me that gun. (laughs) Grab him, Clint. Grab him. (laughs) Well, 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 thanks, Clint. You were... Very handy with that chair. How come you hit him? I couldn't... I couldn't let him kill you. I just couldn't. Oh, well, all right, all right. Take his necktie off and tie his hands with it. We're going to take him for a ride down to see the district attorney. I killed her, Rogue. I killed Janice, but it was an accident. I swear it was an accident. Well, you'll have a dandy chance to explain that to a jury, Clint. But now, come here. I've, uh... I've got something for you. Oh! That's for helping to frame me. Oh, brother, is that D.A. going to love me? Well, that was the end of the case. Frank had been blackmailing Nancy, uh, Janice Cole ever since her engagement to wealthy playboy Clint Hayes was announced. And that night, when Frank went to Janice's cabin, Clint followed him. When Clint arrived on the scene, jealousy took over. Frank drew a gun, and Clint jumped him. In the struggle which followed, Janice was shot while the gun was in Clint's hand. Helpful Frank, the cues scared Clint of the murder and talked me and talked him into framing me. Frank saw lovely visions of many happy years of blackmailing a millionaire. That broken watch crystal was the only thing that kept the frame from working. So I get my brains beat out, I put the arm on a killer and blackmailer. My vacation is broken up like a drop light bulb, and I didn't make a dime. Oh well. <laughs> Let's face it, if I hadn't been so clever, I'd be doing a life sentence instead of Clinton Frank. I would like that. No. I've heard, I've heard that stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron, iron bars a cage. But it's hard to illustrate the truth of that old saw to a guy who's behind the former looking through the latter. You know what I mean? <laughs>
This is Dick Mushmouth Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a doctor, a dentist, and a miserly old lady who comes up dead. We call it, Where There's a Will, There's a Murder. Thanks for listening, and now here's James with a hair doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. By the way, Dick will soon be seen in his newest Columbia picture, Johnny O'Clock. Laugh a while, let a song be your style, use bitch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, use bitch shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> this week's adventure, the case of the complicated poisoning at Eel Pie Island. Well, here it is, time for our weekly visit to Dr. Watson, but... Hello, his study's empty. Say, don't tell us the good doctor has forgotten his appointment. Certainly not. I'm out here on the terrace. Oh, yes, now we see him on the other side of the French door, stretched out in that deck chair. Come on out. Thank you. There's another for you, Mr. Harris. Make yourself comfortable and I'll divide a very superior sunset with you. (laughs) Fair enough, doctor. Hello, what's this you've got on? Joseph's coat of many colors certainly couldn't rival that one, Doctor. Don't tell me that's one of Clippercraft's new sport jackets. Well, no. This is what we called a blazer in my younger days. Oh, yes. The sort of outfit Holmes and I used to wear punting on the Thames. As a matter of fact, my wife was going through an old trunk and ran across it the other day. Puts me in mind of the adventure of the poisoning at Eel Pie Island. A case at once violent and diabolically complicated... Yes, having decided to tell that story this afternoon, I appropriately donned the old blazer for the occasion, don't you know? Well, what does Mrs. Watson think of it? Oh, she's threatened to to, to leave me if I step off the premises in it. <laughs> I see what she means, Doctor. It is a bit, shall we say, uh, spectacular? Oh, that's the trouble with the rising generation, Mr. Harris. No individuality, no dash, no style. How do you expect to impress the young ladies of your acquaintance on summer picnics or beach parties and boating expeditions? Well, by wearing Clippercraft sport coats, of course, Dr. Watson. Mm, yes, I, uh, I seem to have led with my chin that time. Oh, not at all. Just you take Mrs. Watson along when you go down to look at the new Clippercraft tropical suits and sport jackets. She'll be pleased to take you anywhere in any of them, I'll bet you. And she'll be doubly pleased because they won't knock holes in the family budget either. The man who insists on Clippercraft clothes says goodbye to high prices insofar as his clothing budget is concerned, for Clippercraft clothes have never been anything but high in quality and low in price. And that goes for today, too, despite rising costs of materials and manufacturing. But great values like Clippercraft's would not be possible without the famous Clippercraft plan. The plan's the reason you can buy high quality Clippercraft suits for only forty to forty seven fifty. Find tropicals for summer wear for only thirty-three seventy-five to forty dollars, and smart sport jackets for only twenty-six fifty. Yes, the great Clippercraft plan that concentrates the buying power of ten hundred thirty-six of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast provides steady year-round operation, reduces manufacturing and distribution costs, and delivers the savings to you. Now, for your own sake. We urge that you compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. See your Clippercraft dealer tomorrow. But now, back to the fatal poisoning on Eel Pie Island. Uh, the title sounds indigestible to begin with, Dr. Watson. Eel Pie Island. 
Look, is there really such a place? Oh, the ignorance of the man. If you'd ever been boating on the Thames, you'd know it well. Mm, yes, Eelpai Island lies in the prettiest stretch of the river between Richmond and Hampton Court. Furthermore, it has a very popular inn which is famous for its ale and its eel pie. Oh, naturally. A cold, refreshing mug of ale after a pull up the river in the hot sun and a delicious slice of cold eel pie. Mm. Uh, I could certainly go over the first item, Dr. Watson, but uh, I'm not quite so sure about the second. You know, Mr. Harris, that's exactly what Holmes said some 20 or so years ago. It was Sunday afternoon and Mary was expecting some relatives for tea. Noticing my agonized expression, she handed me this blazer and suggested Holmes and I go for our annual June boating expedition up the Thames. Consequently, four o'clock found us in a four-oared skip, briskly skimming past Ham House, the Jacobean seat of the Earl of Dysart back in 1610, of course. Oh, obviously. Yes, we were skimming. Holmes was as fresh as a daisy after a mile's pull up from Richmond. <laughs> I'm afraid I... I had begun to melt. Stroke! <clears throat> Get your back into it, Watson. Stroke! <clears throat> And that's the third time you've missed count. Uh, stroke. Sorry, Holmes. My, my stomach keeps getting in the way. Huh. That's what comes of being a married man. Meals at regular hours. Nothing oh. to jolt you out of your rut. Oh, I was jolted out of it four years when I rejoined during the late war. I enjoy my rut, thank you. I, I don't wish to be jolted out of it again. You mean you don't ever miss the old Baker Street days? Oh. The, the excitement? The suspense, the danger. I enjoyed all in retrospect. I say, hold. That's Eel Pie Island up ahead. What do you say? We pull under those willows for a bit of a breather, eh? I don't need a breather. I wonder if the ale at the inn is as cool as I remember it. Brown, tangy, I can just feel it trickling down my throat. Uh, and the eel pie. Crust all flaky and tender. I have no interest whatever in eel, Watson. <clears throat> Nasty, slimy fish. Ugh. Besides, we're in duty bound to demolish the contents of the hamper Mrs. Watson prepared for us with such loving care. From the contents, I suspect she hoped we'd be gone a week. No, Watson. No eel pie. Stroke. Oh. <clears throat> Holmes, you unfeeling. However, I do think I could be interested in a mug of ale. Yes? Yes, Watson. They're right. Stroke. Thank God you have some human weaknesses. Ah, there we are, all tied up in ship shape. Watson, you unpack the hamper while I go for the ale. Oh, no, no, don't bother. I'll go. I... I want to stretch my leg. No, what's now go? I thought of it first. Oh, so you can have an extra mug while you're waiting. No, you don't. We'll both go for the ale. <laughs> Come along, then. Oh, be careful. You nearly landed in the river. Oh, it's these white trousers. They must have shrunk since last summer. <laughs> Can't go bounding about like a mountain chamois the way you do. <laughs> That's a perfect day. What is more charming than the Thames on a Sunday in June? The little boats filled with the flower of the countryside, the... The dainty parasols, the, the airy dresses, the, the lacy petticoats so coquettishly displayed. I thought you were supposed to be a woman hater. <laughs> I was admiring the scene quite impersonally, Watson, from the artist's viewpoint. Uh, I have artistic blood in my veins, you know, on my mother's side. Oh, Balderdash. Help! Help! I, I beg pardon. Oh, did you hear that? Yes, it's a fat woman in the purple bombazine of the next punt. She's managed to terrify completely the little wispy man who's her escort. Walter, you fool. Get a doctor. You want me to die? I'm a doctor, madam. May I be of assistance? Oh, yes, please. Please help us. Uh, my sister thinks she's been poisoned. I know I've been poisoned. 
It's in my tea. I just made us a nice pot of tea. It was quite all right, Minnie. I drank some too, you know. My cup wasn't all right. It tasted bitter. Then why did you drink it? I didn't. Just a mouthful. Oh, oh, oh. My stomach. The pain in my stomach. My neck felt stiff all day. The pain in my stomach. Here, the, the diaphragm is contracting it. I shall want hot water. The tea kettle is still half full. I, I can light the spirit lamp. We haven't time. Salt. Have you some salt or mustard? We have both. Minnie always brings everything. Good, we shall have to give her a good emetic. Clean out her stomach. An emetic? No, I, 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 I won't take it. I, I won't. won't. Oh. Minnie. Minnie, don't. Oh. Oh, good Lord. She had him convulsed. Yes, marked on his father mouse. That grim. That horrible grim. The rhesus sardonicus, Watson. Chronic scandal. I'm afraid we're too late. wish the police or the coroner would get here. It seems so awful to leave poor Minnie stretched out in the boat. Oh, that dreadful grin on her poor dead face. If only she hadn't suffered so before she died. She was very fortunate, Mr... Mr... Uh, Weatherby. Uh, Walter Weatherby. Uh, Minnie was my sister. Miss Weatherby was very fortunate, Mr. Weatherby. She died remarkably fast, all things considered. If she'd been a younger, stronger woman, death might have been delayed for hours, even days. I take it she had high blood pressure and weak heart. Yes, sir. Uh, And diabetes, too. We all have it in our family. Uh, That is all but Robert. Oh? Oh, Thank heaven she went quickly. I I can't bear to see anyone suffer. Uh, I can't even bear to kill a fly. Uh, The only reason I keep that vermin killer in the potting shed is because the nasty things have been destroying my tulip bulb, don't you know? Oh, so that's where the strychnine came from. What strychnine? The strychnine that made your sister's cup of tea taste so bitter. Of course, Holmes. That's what brought on those convulsions. Strychnine, they're quite typical. Were they, Watson? But of course. The gasping for breath, the protruding eyeballs, the rigidity and convulsions. Uh, But but there couldn't have been any strychnine in the tea. Uh, I drank four cups myself. Tell me, Mr. Weatherby, did your sister have anything in her tea that you didn't share? Cream? A drop of rum? Bit of mint? No, no. Nothing like that. We both took it weak with a lot of milk. Oh, Minnie did have strychnine, of course. Uh, that is saccharine, I should say. Uh, I prefer to go without sweetening myself. Uh, we aren't allowed sugar, you know, uh, because of the diabetes. Saccharine, of course. She carried the pills in a box, a reticule? Oh, no, sir. Uh, she had a plain paper envelope. Uh, here it is on the floor of the pan. Don't touch it. Don't touch it, I say. Oh, no, sir. Not if you say not. Hand it to me, Watson, with your handkerchief. Very well, Holmes. Hmm. Empty. She used up all the pills, I guess. And no wonder she had six cups of tea. Minnie did enjoy her afternoon tea. And she did enjoy all her meals. Uh, poor Minnie. Holmes, sir, uh, how do you account for the fact that the five previous cups were drunk without complications? Probably because only the sixth saccharin pill was poisonous and bitter. The shock of finding it poisoned, you know, to a woman with her heart, that certainly helped to bring on the convulsions. It was undoubtedly pure accident that pill was saved to the last. You say your sister suffered from diabetes, Mr. Weatherby. She doesn't look it. Oh, that's because my brother Robert took such good care of her, of all of us. He gives us injections of that new drug, insulin. Uh, They discovered it last year. It does wonders for people with diabetes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, My brother's been lecturing on it at all the medical schools all over England. By Jove, of course, your brother must be the famous Dr. Robert Weatherby. Obviously, Watson. Tell me, Mr. Weatherby, how long have you and your sister suffered from diabetes? Oh, uh, only about four months. Uh, My other sister, uh, Nellie, had it too. She died two months ago. She... Oh, dear, poor Nellie. She was really my favorite, you know. Too far gone for the incident to do much good, I suppose. Oh, no, sir. We None of us had any symptoms of diabetes before last year. I I did have my dizzy spells, of course, uh, but we never thought it was anything like that. 
Oh, no. Thank heaven insulin was discovered in time for us. Uh, not that it seems to have saved Minnie or Nellie either. But surely you must realize that your sister didn't die of a diabetic seizure, Mr. Weatherby. Oh, no. Minnie went the same way as Nellie went, of poison. Uh, only uh, I didn't do it. You, you must believe me. I didn't do it. I say, Holmes, hmm? here comes a boat. It's turning in here. Yes. It's the police launch. Oh, thank heaven for that. I, I thought they'd never get here. Hello there. Is this where there's been a murder? <laughs> well, well, if it isn't our old friend, the bellowing beetle of Scotland Yard, Inspector Lestrade himself. <laughs> Welcome, Lestrade. Welcome aboard. We have quite a cargo for you to inspect. Uh, hold! Uh, how in thunder did you get here? I am a bird of ill omen, Lestrade. I'm attracted to a crime like a vulture to carrion. Oh, Holmes, really? Uh, so you admit it is a crime? Huh? A murder, Lestrade. A beautifully staged little murder. But look here. I, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. I, I wouldn't hurt a fly. Uh, Oh, ho. so it's Mr. Walter Weatherby again. And I suppose this is another sister you've done away with so you could inherit her share of the Weatherby bills? No, I didn't do it. I didn't hurt Nellie either. I swear I didn't. I know, you slipped through our fingers the last time. We had our suspicions right enough, but we couldn't prove anything. The jury thought you looked so meek and mild, butter wouldn't melt in your mouth, so they brought in a verdict of suicide. <laughs> And the poison was found in her cough medicine that time. Which poison, Lestrade? Strychnine, Holmes. Oh. What else gives people convulsions like the woman just had here, they tell me? This chap's got a potting shed of vermin killer all full of strychnine. But I've kept it locked up ever since Nellie killed herself. I carry the key with me. Hmm, interesting. Uh, we don't need any of your fancy deductions this time, Holmes. This time we caught him red-handed. There was no one in the boat but him and his sister. He gave her a cup of tea and it killed her. He gave her six cups of tea, Lestrade. Only the last one seems to have contained anything suspicious. There it is on top of the hamper, and still three quarters full. Oh, really? I'm surprised you didn't empty it out. I never tamper with clues, Lestrade. I merely point them out. It's up to you to draw your own conclusion. Well, don't worry. I've done that already. This Weatherby chap's guilty, and he won't wiggle out of it this time. Mm -hmm. By the way, Lestrade... What do you make of the wool scarf wrapped around the victim's neck? It's a hot day, but Minnie's wearing a purple scarf. Uh, next, I suppose you'll tell me she wasn't poisoned, she was strangled. Oh, no, I, I wouldn't... I mean, I'm not strong enough. Minnie was suffering from a stiff neck. It came on this morning. Uh, Robert suggested that I take her out on the river to see if the sun would break it out. Nevertheless, the scarf is significant, Lestrade, and the violent contractions of the diaphragm. Don't forget those. I suggest you have your best surgeon perform the autopsy. We won't need any autopsy if we find strychnine in that teacup. Oh, you'll find strychnine, Lestrade. Never fear. What makes you so sure? I tasted it, you know. I tasted it. Talk things over with any of the millions of men who wear Clippercraft clothes, and you'll soon find out why Clippercraft clothes have won more friends than any other label in America. Well dressed men are loyal to Clippercraft because Clippercraft is loyal to them. Clippercraft is devoted to just one thing giving you the best clothing value in America. Through the famous Clippercraft plan, you get the benefit of tremendous savings made by concentrating the buying power of 1036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. Locally owned, independent stores. Stores you can trust. It's the biggest idea that ever hit the clothing industry and eased your clothing budget. Where else can you get such remarkably fine quality in suits? For only 40 and 47.50. In tropicals, for only 33.75 to $40. And in sport jackets, for 26.50. The answer is... Nowhere else, except in the fine stores everywhere that feature the Clippercraft label. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. 
These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, sport jackets, and tropicals. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. We find them in the waiting room of the famous Dr. Robert Weatherby. Watson is decidedly ill at ease. Holmes, I, I don't know why you insisted on coming here. To present our condolences, of course. After all, we were in at the death, as you might say. Holmes, really? And to find out more about this new drug. What's it called? Oh, yes, insulin. Yes, I might have known it was your insatiable thirst for information that brought you. Not your humane instincts. Of all the cold that is quiet, Watson, someone's coming. Um, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Quite. The doctor will see you now. Uh, step this way, please. Oh, thank you. After you, Holmes. This was your idea. Well, well, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. This is indeed an honor. I'm indeed grateful for your efforts on my poor sister's behalf. My colleague, Dr. Watson, was the physician on the case, Dr. Weatherby. We, well, that is, uh, everything possible was done, you understand. I, I can't begin to express my regrets. Oh, please don't blame yourself, Doctor. I couldn't have done more for her myself, I'm sure. An overdose of strychnine is so violent and so sudden, don't you know? Then the autopsy showed strychnine. There was no autopsy necessary, Mr. Holmes. The contents of the teacup proved the case. And then, of course, when my brother confessed... Confessed? Yes. It seems he had one of his dizzy spells while my sister was drinking her tea and lay down in the boat for a moment. He must have been unconscious for several moments. At least he doesn't seem to remember what happened during that length of time. Of course. A trance. Some ambulistic. He must have administered the poison while in a semi-conscious condition. Yes. Poor Walter. I've always known he subconsciously resented both his sisters. They were so big and robust. Walter was always rather frail. I suppose I should have had him committed after Nellie's death, but, well, somehow I couldn't persuade myself that he was really dangerous. I see. Would it shock you very much, Dr. Weatherby, if I were to assure you that your brother did not kill either of his sisters? But, Mr. Holmes, the evidence. The death struggle indicated strychnine. A strychnine was found in the teacup. He was the only person with her all afternoon. And then his confession. You can't get around that. I imagine your brother Walter takes rather easily to any form of suggestion, Dr. Weatherby. With your permission, I should like to have a talk with him. He's in Bow Street Jail, I understand. Uh, that's correct, Mr. Holmes. But I'm afraid you must postpone your interview until later in the day. when he's had time to recover from his insulin injection. He's already had it? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, I was just about to go around to the jail and give it to him. Splendid. We'll go with you. Dr. Watson is particularly anxious to learn this new technique of administering insulin. Oh, Holmes, really well, not. Some other time I shall be delighted. But what better time than the present? We promise not to discuss your sister's murder, Dr. Weatherby. But I understand, well, that is, uh, Scotland Yard is in charge of the case. Would they permit interference? Scotland Yard has learned it's always wise to allow me to interfere, Dr. Weatherby. It so frequently saves them from making fools of themselves. Oh, this way, gentlemen, please. He's in here. Wait a moment till I unlock his cell. Inside, please, gentlemen. Thank you. Well, Walter, we've come to see you. You remember us, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson? Oh. Oh, Robert. Robert, I, I didn't think you'd ever want to speak to me again. And, and these kind gentlemen, Robert, they did all that they could, Robert. Oh, it was too horrible the way she died. Easy, I old just... chap, easy. Oh, but how could I? Oh, my mind is all blurry. Everything is all confused. Yes, I... That's because you haven't had your incident. That's right, Walter. 
Now, you just wait till I fix the hypodermic. You'll feel better in no time after your injection. Uh, just sit down, Walter. Roll up your sleeve. Well, well, quite a little party we're having here this morning. They told me you'd crashed in again, Holmes. Morning, Lestrade. Well, if it's against the regulations, Inspector Lestrade, I, I mean, that was his idea, not mine. I, he assured quite me... Quite all right, Dr. Weatherby. Scotland Yard grumbles a good deal about Sherlock Holmes's interference, but we found out it's sometimes a good idea to let him rave. Many thanks, Lestrade. As a matter of fact, you came just in time. We are about to witness a very interesting demonstration. <laughs> An injection of insulin isn't as drastic as all that, Mr. Holmes. In a few years, thousands of people will be getting insulin daily, injecting it themselves in all probability. Now, uh, hold out your arm, Walter. Then it's really quite harmless. I mean, even to a person not suffering from diabetes. Oh, yes, yes. It might accelerate the rate of metabolism slightly for a time, but nothing to worry about. Then Nellie's death and Minnie's death couldn't possibly have been caused by the injection you gave each of them the morning of the day in which they died. Good Lord, no. What a fantastic idea. Not so fantastic, Dr. Weatherby. I'm quite convinced that neither Minnie nor your brother here suffer from diabetes. Your sister Nellie I didn't see, unfortunately. My dear Mr. Holmes, without a blood test, how can you possibly tell? I had the eye of a trained diagnostician, Dr. Weatherby. The tone of the skin was too healthy, particularly in Minnie's case. No. I suggest you were giving your brother and sister injections... For a much more sinister reason, Doctor. But that's preposterous. Even if they proved not to be diabetic, insulin injections wouldn't harm them. I grant you all but the final injections were harmless, Doctor. Nonsense. My sister certainly didn't die from any injections I gave them. Death in both cases was later, much later. You're positive those injections were harmless? Positive. You wouldn't care to prove it by giving yourself the injection you've just prepared for your brother. Why, I... That is, if I do, I, I, I won't be able to give him his dose. I only have one with me. As you can see, Walter is near collapse. I won't be responsible if he doesn't get his insulin. I've prepared for that emergency. Dr. Watson has brought along a small amount of the drug. I'm sure it'll suffice. Well, I... But, but this is really too ridiculous. Well, now, <clears throat> I'm not so sure. You say it won't hurt you to take that insulin. Go ahead and take it. Well, I... That... I know, I know it sounds silly, but I've never had the nerve to give myself an injection. Oh, I'd be happy to oblige. No, no, Watson, let me. I'm quite good at it. And I don't want any accidents with the contents of that hypodermic. Now then, give it to me. Give it to me, I say. No, no, you can't make me. You can't. Stand back. Don't anyone touch that broken hypodermic or the fluid it contained. Good Lord. Why not? Unless I'm very much mistaken. It's a particularly deadly culture of tetanus bacteria. I'll just take a sample. Carefully. Between these glass slides. Now, Lestrade, if you'll tell the guard to bring the strongest carbolic acid he can find, I'd say we'll have this case just about washed up. A nice fellow that Robert Weatherby turned out to be, eh, Dr. Watson? But look, why the strychnine in the first sister's cough medicine and the second sister's teacup? Because the symptoms of tetanus poisoning and strychnine poisoning are so remarkably similar. Tetanus takes much longer, of course, to develop. Robert could be sure of being at a safe distance when the death occurred. Mm, diabolical, I'd say. Yes. Holmes suspected tetanus when he heard of Minnie's stiff neck and noticed the contraction of the solar plexus. Those symptoms do not occur in strychnine poisoning. Of course, I should have noticed them too, but what with the presence of strychnine in the cup, it's so easy to jump to the wrong conclusions, which is what Robert Weatherby had counted on. Uh, but again, why did Dr. De Weatherby plant the strychnine? To implicate his brother, who was known to have a quantity in his possession. Mm, nothing like killing off the whole family in one fell swoop. Yes, and he would probably have gotten away with it if Sherlock Holmes hadn't happened along. But uh, now, isn't it about time for that suggestion about next week's story? It certainly is, Dr. Watson. Well, next week, now, let me think. I uh, suppose I tell you about a visit Holmes and I paid to Castle Mortlake and how I was splattered with blood from a famous silver chandelier that was supposed to bleed whenever a catastrophe occurred in the family. It wasn't ordinary blood, however... Yes, that was an adventure in which Holmes' knowledge of bee culture came in very handy. The 
makers of Clipper Craft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lockram. Special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Case of the Bleeding Chandelier. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The summer evening flows gently over Broadway, and the carousel sounds of the street's carnival begin. The brazen trumpet screams, calling the believers to the basement sanctuaries at a dime of prayer. The barkers of the night shout their spiels into passing ears, and the rustle of perfumed silk rides the June wind. You're shoved and pushed and mauled, and there's no bitterness because the taste of night melts in your mouth. You ride the rides, walk the midway, toss the hoop to win the cupid. You try not to notice the plucking at your sleeve. But finally you turn. Your palm is crossed with violence. You hold on to it until the man in the tweed jacket and the gray flannel slacks takes it away from you. Gives death back to the other man, its owner. Sprawled across the silk sheets of his bed, the blood from his bullet wound draining the sleep out of him. And because blood like that can stain the reputation of an exclusive apartment hotel, the man in tweed makes a suggestion. I offer it in all modesty, Mr. Clover, a mere suggestion. This can be... can be... What, Mr. Tracy? What can it be? Handled discreetly, of course. You can do that. You have the power, the know-how. Keep it out of the papers. Treat the frightful mess with velvet gloves. Anything else? I... nothing more I can think of at the moment. Not that I can bring to mind at the snap of your fingers. That's good. Now you can do something for me. Understand me, Mr. Clover. Managing this place is all-consuming. I spent years at school, here and abroad, learning the quirks, the ins and outs of the profession, the very... All that education, maybe you can spell out for me the murdered man's name. Did I forget to introduce you? Pity. The fellow over there on our bed was once Frank Dunn, a bartender, of all things... A rather crude chap, I thought. But genteel of... enough to pay the tab in this slick joint of yours. Well, they do bartenders like Dunn well at the trade winds, I hear. The club on West 52nd? I wouldn't know where the place was. Do you mind? Tell me more about Dunn. Well, he appealed to the female of the species, shall we say. They called on him constantly, at all hours. Tonight? Difficult to say. But do you not detect the faint odor of a lingering perfume? The aura a woman leaves? Pardon, I'll rid us of that. Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Frank? Would you put Frank on the line, please? Uh, Frank just stepped out. Could I give him a message? Who are you? Why do you answer for Frank? I know he's there. Does he not wish to speak with me? Who is this? Who shall I say is calling? No. No, there is something. This is not the way Frank would have it with me. Hello? Hello? Yes, please? This is the police operator. Trace that call. And the call was traced. Drugstore on 43rd and Broadway. A phone booth there. The third one from the left as you pass the Chiron reducing display. Only who knows who's been using the phone, the clerk in the white coat asked me. You don't have to have friends in Washington to use the phone, mister. You need a dime, that's all. Anyway, what was she, a spy or something? So if that's all, he had work to do. He left. So did I. It 
It was a short walk up to 52nd Street and the nightclub that's known as the Trade Winds. Outside, a beach boy in a custom-made loincloth said aloha and pointed inside. And inside, a beach girl said aloha and offered her nose to be rubbed, which came with a cover charge, the price of admission to tropical paradise. And it was, even to the tropical birds playing tropical games and singing their sad songs in huge cages of gilded bamboo. And sitting in a fan-shaped wicker chair in the corner was trader Milt Barker, wearing yellowed linen, his eyes bleary with the grandeur of it all. Until he saw me. Hey, damn it. Grab yourself a wicker and take a load off. Yeah. What a place you have here, Mel. Wait till you see the floor show, Danny. Got a dame here that does a routine on a bed of hot coals. Melt, I... Uh... You uh, try the authentic cuisine yet? You like fish? I got cold huma huma nuka nuka apawa. That would set you crazy. Uh, you sit still. I'll slice you some from the middle. Sit down, Melt. Huh? All right. So I'm sitting. I'm sitting, so... About a bartender here, Frank Dunn. Frank Lee ain't showed up yet tonight. He commits something? He's been murdered. Kismet. Pure kismet. Fate, Danny. The way the department figures, it took a murderer to do it. Yeah, I guess. How'd he go out? Shot. Like I say, kismet. What are you talking about? A guy like Frank, it figures. It just don't make me surprised. Come on, Mill, talk to me. What's on your mind? Well, he served smiles with the tall, cool ones. When Frank wiped the bar in front of a female patronesses, it had a meaning all its own. Personality. Keep talking. Well, Danny, a guy like him... Well, uh, Dame would be embarrassed leaving less than a fin or a phone number for a tip. Did he cause any trouble here? Frank? No. An operator with a head on him. Wait until the male escort was occupied elsewhere, then. <laughs> well, Frank would drop a small onion in a cocktail glass in such a way that patronesses would leave teeth marks on the bar. Uh, like, for instance... Well, well for instance, uh, who? Uh, Louis Hathaway is current, Danny. You know, the dame who is Mrs. to Edward Hathaway, the guy who manufactures hardware. You know Hathaway's hardware, nails, home. Yeah, well, tell me more about Mrs. Hathaway. She's current. That's all I know, honest. Come on, Danny. Eat some of my cuisine. I'll make you a regular lava lava. And so, as the surprise pink spotlight dimmed slowly over Trader Milt's paradise, I heaved a sigh for the regular lava lava that would never touch my lips and bid a fond farewell to the land of the Huma Huma Kuka Nuka Apawa. At the Park Avenue apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Edward Hathaway, a maid in gray silk and high spiked heels told me they were out for the evening. She tightened a black shoulder strap to inform me that the Hathaways never informed a person in what glamorous places they were boozing it up, that this usually took till dawn. I said I'd come back in the morning. She said sometimes a person didn't know what side his evening was buttered on and kicked the door shut with her heel. I guess I didn't wait the polite and proper interval after dawn because the girl who opened the door to me this time was still yawning. Another thing, the long night had left no scar on her kind of beauty. But can it wait? Whatever you want, can it wait? You're Louise Hathaway? Uh-huh. Sleepy Louise. Tired Louise. If you weren't a stranger, you could rock me back to sleep. I need it so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, you're the one Celeste told me about. Celeste the maid. What do you think of her? She thought much of you. <laughs> Come on in. Tell me about it. Celeste's in bed. I let her stay because we dragged her out of it when we came in. Couldn't find the keys. You know how it is. But I'll drag her out again to whip up some eggs for us, if you like. No, thanks. Big night last night, huh? Ah, the biggest. You build a lovely city here, officer. Lovely and fair. And at night, it glistens. Frank Dunn, was he a part of the night? You just played the only sad note there is, officer. Frank wasn't in it. Not anywhere. Why do you play a sad note like that to me? 
Because he's dead. Murdered. I don't think I'd ever let you rock me to sleep. You're cruel. Well, Frank, what about him? I wouldn't know about him, wise man. Once it got bad and I tried to... Frank winked, grinned, splashed whiskey on my dress. That's all, huh? Just a clumsy bartender. So much more you'll never know. Once I was at the trade winds having dinner with hubby mine, and there was a phone call for me, and I took it, and it was Frank calling me from the bar. And hubby mine didn't know why I suddenly turned happy. He had sense enough not to ask. Your husband knows how you felt about Frank? I don't know. I don't care. I always made him tip Frank a lot of money, take him with us after he was through work. <laughs> well, it's going to be cheaper for hubby mine with Frank gone. For me, for me, such a high price, I don't mind telling you. Will you wake your husband, Mrs. Hathaway? I want to talk to him. <laughs> He's awake. You can talk to him at his factory. Hathaway's Hardware Incorporated. Always the first man there. Sleeps an hour after I've kept him up the night. And off to the factory. Off to make a bed of nails for me. Off Just to... stay here in case we want you, Mrs. Hathaway. So you can talk more to me about Frank? It'll be a pleasure. Deep and fair. A pleasure. Any time. That'll be all, Miss Garvey. All right, sir. Who are you? I gave my name at the gate, Danny Clover. From the police, aren't you? That's right. What's on your mind? I just came from your house, Mr. Hathaway. My house? What's the big idea? What did you want there? I had a chat with your wife. My wife? You don't go to my house, policeman. No more. You understand that? You don't bother Louise. You want something? You got a ticket to sell? You got something that gives you worry? You come to me. Louise, don't get bothered by police. She gets bothered, Hathaway, any time the department feels the need. Yeah, you think so, huh? You get bothered, too, mister. Go ahead. Call your lawyer. Say murder to him, because that's what you and your wife are involved in. Murder? Call your lawyer, Hathaway. Look, now... The death of Frank Dunn, bartender, at the hands of person or persons unknown. Your hands, your wife's hands, both... At... I thought you were kidding. I'm not kidding. Louise is a kid. I got a young wife, Clover. Wild sometimes. Country kid come to the city wild. And not excusing her, understand? I like to watch it. She knew Frank Dunn. So she knew Frank Dunn. So I know Frank Dunn. A thousand people know Frank Dunn. She didn't kill him. Why should she kill him? What could he do for her? Give her a double martini? A couple of those go a long way. Look, Frank Dunn was a joke passed over the bar to Louise. Louise is married. So that settles that. All right. Who killed Frank Dunn? I'll tell you this. If he would have put a finger on Louise, I'd have killed him. One finger on Louise. I've told her that time and time again. And she and Lily think Who? it's... Lily. They think it's smart. They got to have cocktails at five. They go in by themselves. Who's Lily? Lily. Lily Prokosh, a dopey dame who writes poetry, wears glasses that goes like this. Lily Prokosh. Prokosh? Foreign? Yeah, talks accent talk. Where do I find her? Lily. Sometimes I pick up Louise at Lily's place in the village hotel. Yeah, I know where it is. Good. Maybe you're onto something, Clover, huh? Billy? It was painful. I opened my eyes and the knife was in me. Here. I say, open your eyes, Lily. It is still the dream. I can't feel my body. I can't move. Lie here. Look at the Operator, get me in the house, body. doctor, quick. Help me. Help me. Wait a minute, operator. Never mind, operator. You 
listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. This combination is your open sesame to Sunday night musical delight. CBS Guy Lombardo time, featuring the sweetest music this side of heaven, and the Mario Lanza Show. Enjoy Guy Lombardo's music. Enjoy vocals, old and new, by Mario Lanza. Mario, singing sensation, called both the new Caruso and the hottest singer in a decade, may be heard Sunday nights on most of these same CBS stations. The nice thing about Broadway, the good thing, the reason why you run the rest of the way until you get there, is that Broadway never lets you down. It's all things to everybody. For the gourmet, the foot-long wiener with a seated roll. For the musically inclined, the rosette of loudspeakers over the slightly used record shop. For the art lover, the windy corner. And for those who just like to walk and be amazed, there are people who will be amazed right back at you. Walk it or wait it out. The day's 24 hours long, kid. Take that dream along. It'll happen to you. One way or another. But where I was going... There was no dream, only the reality of a girl lying there frail against the decor of plump upholstery, the expensive drapes, the built-in silences, the lifeless girl, the stabbed-to-death girl. And talk to a man about it, the practice talk over the telephone, because a policeman speaks of death by formula. Apartment 612, huh? Yeah, I got it, Danny. The door to the suite was open when I got here. The girl's name is Lily Prokosh. Okay. The one who called Frank Dunn when I was in Frank's apartment. I'm pretty sure that, Gino. Anyhow, coroner, lab boys, the works. I'll talk to you later, Gino. Lily? Lily, it's me. Lily. Oh. Oh, I, I, I didn't... Come on in. Oh, that's all right. I, I can come back later. I'm from the police. Come on in. Come on, come on. Who are you? Police? Why, I... Lily! What? What happened to you, Lily? What did they do to you? Are you somebody to her husband or brother? I I live across the hall. I, it's the first time I've ever seen her this close. The first time I've ever knocked on her door. I had a little speech. I was going to tell her what my name is. What do you know about her? I listen for her every day. Yesterday, when she came in, I What time was that? that? 6 p.m. Did she go out again? No. I, I know because I spent all that time making up my mind to knock on the door and tell her I was a neighbor and what my name was. And that's all you can tell me about her? Yes. Lily? Lily, listen to me. My name is Harry. Harry Lynn. <laughs> Tartaglia. Tartaglia. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you, Danny. And the way I was standing here in the corner daydreaming, I'm not surprised I did not hear you come in. Dreaming? Ah, uh, huh? Because of the talent I discovered only last night in our little six-year-old girl, Aida. Oh, tell me about the talent. Oh, Danny, the way my little Aida plays the piano. Mm. Hmm, plays good, huh? Oh, not only good, Danny, but she plays the piano underhand. What? And by ear. By ear. Gino. Yeah, Danny. Did you run down that stuff I asked for on the phone? Goes without saying. What'd you Danny, get? Danny, uh, this is the only comment? It's not important. What did you get, Gino? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Lily Prokash, a writer of things that rhyme, gathered material nightly for her rhymes in the trade winds at the bar stool facing the station of the also deceased bartender, Frank Dunn. Hmm. In the daytime, escorted said Frank Dunn to literary teas. Last night, came home at six, an hour after the established time of Frank Dunn's murder. Nothing else? Only that the knife handle was wiped clean. I kept after the boys, Danny, but that's all they could dig up. Yeah. Underhand. Yeah, Danny. Ah, you should see little Aida. I'd like to. I really would. Be sure to invite me sometime, you know. I see the wicker chair is still open, Milt. Danny, Danny, sit in it, kid. Two nights, 
I see you each time. To what is due this sudden harvest to Danny Clover? Not that the trade wind ain't humored. But to what is due? You know a girl named uh, Lily Prokosh? Well, names don't register with me, Danny. I'll ask for a reason. Is there a reason? A tall girl, blonde, harlequin glasses. Spoke with a little bit of an accent. The one who wrote lousy sonnets on my napkin? Yes, she was a poet. The one who always comes in here with Mrs. Hathaway? That one, Danny. Well, what about her? You tell me. Lily Prokosh and Frank Dunn. Hey. Yeah. Yeah what? The other day. What are you talking about? The other day. Uh, yesterday. The day Frank met his kismet. She was in here with Mrs. Hathaway about 5.30. Asked for Frank. I told her he wasn't to work yet. I started to tell her where Frank lived, but she said, never mind, she already knew, left. And then what? Then what? Is she left. Left Mrs. Hathaway with a martini at half-mast. The poet walked out. To see Frank? Yeah, yeah. She bumped Frank, huh? A doll like her. What do you know? And then start all over again. Back to the room where I'd first seen Frank Dunn with his blood on the monogrammed sheets. Back to the room where this particular set of violence had begun to shape itself. And touch once more the things that had belonged to a man who had been well-loved. The gold money clip with his initials written in chipped emerald. The gold cigarette case. The gold keychain. The silk robe that hung in the scented closet. And on none of these things, the mark of an identity. The whisper of a killer's name. And all of it with the man in tweed at your elbow, commenting, snickering, fingering the imagined price tag. Hmm. This little trinket must have cost one of them a good deal of her rainy day savings. Put it down. Dead, don't touch. Is that it, Mr. Clover? Exactly that. There's an etiquette about these things, hmm? I've been wondering, Mr. Clover. My brow is furrowed with wonder. I noticed... Hardly touches me, though. Sorry, Tracy. I've been wondering why you asked me to partake with you of this, what shall I say, this chamber of horrors. Because you're a liar, Mr. Tracy. And I indulge myself on the proper occasion. What was the occasion of my doing it to you? Yesterday, when you showed me Frank Dunn. Oh, oh, that. You mean when I didn't reveal to you who had been visiting the bartender at his siesta before death? Now's a good time for revealing. Sorry, but it's slipped my mind. There's nothing the police can do about a mind like mine. Is there, Mr. Clover? Correction, there is. Who was here, Tracy? Who was here? Else you'll beat me. You hardly make it worthwhile defending a dead woman's honor. Who? That foreign thing, with the wind in her hair and the mist on her eyeglasses. Lily Prokosh? I've heard her announce herself that strange way on the house phone. She stayed long enough with the bartender to read him her newest poem... They had an interruption. You can reveal that, too. It'll cost me a dear little savings plan I had in mind. The interruption. Who was it? Lovely, frolicsome thing. Never been here before. Knocked on the bartender's door. Was waved away, it seems. Tapped on my office door. Asked if I had a deck of cards. Wanted to play away love's bitterness. Sympathized? Played against her? One forty cents. Would have won more, only... Only what? In the midst of a deal, I had a call from the bartender ordering me to whisk the Prokash thing away by freight elevator. I did. When I got back, my card-playing lady was gone. You won forty cents from her? That ought to make a girl like that unforgettable. Ever seen Louise Hathaway, Mr. Clover? I have, in society columns. And that evening... She played cards with me. She's precisely what you say. Unforgettable. And walk the night streets and try to figure why did Louise Hathaway call on Frank Dunn and not being able to see him content herself with playing cards with a hotel manager? Why had she gone to see Frank? She knew her friend Lily Prokosh was there. A lot of whys... And keep on walking, east from Broadway to Park and up to the 70s, and stop in front of the Canopy Department House, pause, smoke a cigarette, then go in. And on the second floor, ring a bell. Wow. 
What do you want? Hello, Mr. Hathaway. I told you before... Let's go inside. You can tell me all over again. Thanks. Who is it, Edward? That cop. Yeah, me. Oh, hi. See, Mr. Clover, I stayed as put as put can be. I'm glad you did. That'll make it easier. What are you two talking about? Oh, we've got secrets, Edward. Yeah. About Frank Dunn. Oh, Danny, Edward knows all about that. Look, Louise and I were playing chess. Chess, huh? You know a lot of games, don't you, Louise? All the ones that are fun. Did you have fun losing 40 cents yesterday to that hotel manager? What's he talking about? What am I talking about, Miss Hathaway? <laughs> Louise. Stop it. <laughs> Darling, listen to me. Let me handle this. Take your hands off me, Edward. Louise. You knew Lily was with Frank Dunn. Why did you go there, Mrs. Hathaway? Why? That's right. Well, Lily was my friend. I didn't want to see her get in any trouble. I told you to let me handle it, Louise. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> you see, like I told you, Mr. Clover, she's wild. Louise, you're in a little trouble now. Let me handle Take it. Take your hands off me. Can't you understand? Take your hands off. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I lost my temper. I didn't mean to slap you. Hardware man. Fat man. Bald man. Nothing man. Jump. Jump, Edward. Louise, don't make me lose my temper again. Why don't you jump for the man, Edward? You do everything else I want you to do. Tell the man what you did for me, Edward. Oh, crazy. What are you talking about? About murder. About murder, Edward. You once told me something, Mr. Hathaway. You said you'd kill anybody who laid a finger on your wife. Yes, he told me, too, over and over again. That's why you always followed me, Edward. That's why you followed me to Frank Dunn's apartment house that night. Shut up, shut up. <laughs> and Frank wouldn't even look at me. He sent me away, Edward. And you killed him all because I spent an hour playing cards with a hotel manager. I was never with Frank, Edward. Never. But you killed him for me. <laughs> Go ahead. Jump for the man. I followed you. I always follow you. I couldn't stand that you're going to see that man. Take the hardware man away, Mr. Clover. You too. What? For killing Lily. You couldn't have Frank. Lily was luckier. So you killed Lily. Oh, no, Edward did that for me, too. Didn't you, Edward? Didn't you, Edward? No, I didn't. I followed you to Lily. Her door was open, wasn't it? I saw Lily after what you did to her. Oh, you don't know what you're saying, Edward. Listen to me. You love me, Edward. I'm going to have to sign a confession, Louise. What I just said about following you to Lily's, I don't have to admit that. Sign my name to it, I could deny I ever said it. I don't know whether I will or not. I'll have to think about it. I love you. Honestly. Truly, Edward, I love you. Jump, Louise. Jump. Jump. Broadway's quiet now. It's the four o'clock in the morning hour, the hour without color. But in a while, dawn will dip down, and there'll be fury again, and roar again, and crowd. The restless wandering, the puppet dance, the running after nothing at all. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Louise, Herb Butterfield as Edward, Joe Granby as Milt Barker, Edgar Barrier as Neil Tracy, and Gladys Holland as Lily Prokosh. <laughs> Just once around the clock aboard the second hand for Singing Again, an hour of comedy, music, and cash for the CBS listener who can identify the phantom voice. Jan Murray is your host, Judy Lynn, Allendale, the Riddlers, and Ray Block supply the music. Stay tuned now for Singing Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. 
Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If some of you have wondered where Mike Shane has been during regular office hours the past few days, you'll find the answer on the front page of this evening's San Francisco papers. That's right, the murder trial of Jack Holmes. At this moment, which is along about 6.30, Phyllis Knight has one of those newspapers spread out on the desk before her. As she glares at the headlines, Mike is talking on the phone to Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Faraday, yeah, I just got back from court. Didn't take the jury long to decide. Less than two hours, Mike. That boy is no more guilty than I am. Sure, somebody killed the watchman, but not Jack Holmes. Now, don't take it so hard, Mike, just because his sweetheart hired you to investigate. All right, all right. Maybe I'm sentimental about those two kids, but I say Jack Holmes isn't the killer type. And with a nice girl like Janet Miley... Oh, Faraday, Faraday, I let him down, and Janet was so certain I could help him. Take it easy, Mike. You did your best, but the evidence was against you. Yeah, sure, if you're sure it was. Is that unusual? Why, I've cleared dozens of guys when it looked like... Janet, what's wrong? Hello. Hello, Mike. I'll talk to you later, Faraday. The girl's just walked in. Janet, are you sick? You're white as a sheet. Here, get her some water, honey, quick. Yeah. (laughs) Mr. Shane. Yes? Jackie. Yeah? Jackie. Oh, here, here, sit down, honey. Let me help you. Oh, the poor kid. She's all unstrung about the verdict. No, it's more than that. Her hands are like ice. He didn't do it. I just discovered what? the grocery. What? Janet, what are you trying to say, honey? My room. Somebody went through. Huh? Oh, oh, Janet. Here, here, Janet. Drink this water. Janet. 12.15. I, I just discovered I went and... Told him, thought he would. Oh, oh. Mike, Mike, she's fainted. I'm going to call a doctor. Phyllis. Yeah. Call Inspector Faraday. She's dead. Okay, Mike, I fixed it. We can go to Jack's cell now. All right, all right. Now, remember, honey, not a word about Janet's death. Jack will go all to pieces and we'll learn nothing. I know, I know, but it seems so hard-hearted. This way, kids. Ah, oh, boy. Sad business, I eh? Guess the girl figured after that jury's verdict she didn't have anything left to live for. Suicide? Uh-uh. No, no. If Janet found something she thought would clear Jack, she certainly wouldn't take poison. Unless she took the poison before she got the information that would clear Jack. Hmm? No, then she would have called a doctor. If we can believe her dying words, she went first to some man, told him her discovery, then came to us. She didn't even know she was poisoned. All right, but who did it? We only knew what she was trying to tell us. Better pipe down. That's Jack's cell with a jailer standing outside. Oh, yes, sir. Now let me do most of the talking. All right, Morrissey. Open it up. Yes, Inspector. Hello, Jack. Hello. How do you feel, Jack? Oh, top of the world. It's so cheering to be condemned to death for a crime you didn't commit. You had a fair trial, my boy. The jury could decide only on the evidence presented. I told them I left the warehouse that night way before it happened. At 12.15, I was at home. But no, they take the word of that cab driver. He did pick you up at the warehouse door, and he said the clock in the drugstore read a quarter past twelve. I checked the clock myself the next day. It was an electric, right on time. So did I, Jack. Unless the cab driver was lying, and he seemed like an honest guy. I see. Even my loyal detective, Mr. Shane, says I'm guilty. Oh, no. No, Jack, you don't understand. Go ahead. Say I killed the watchman. Say I stole the diamonds. You never were working for Janet and me. Yes, we were, Jack, and we still are. That's why we're here. It's about Janet. She's not so good. What? What are you trying to say? She came to the office a little while ago and tried to tell us something, some new evidence she had found, but 
Well, she got sick. What's wrong? Is she all right? Where is she? Now, easy, son, easy. She's still at the office. She said a lot of mixed-up things, Jack. Her room had been ransacked, something about a grocery that you weren't guilty, and she had discovered proof and told him so. Him? Who's him? Oh, that's what we don't know. Did, uh, uh, does Janet have any close men friends she might go to? Not that I know of. We've been engaged for almost a year now. She never mentioned any. Our boss, Mr. Phillips, is a good friend of both of us. Yes, yeah, he's paying the fee on the case. She might have gone to him. Or maybe to his partner. Mr. Russell? Oh, no. Not that old crap. Well, why come to me? Janet's the one to tell you. Well, as we said, Jack, she's all busted up over this thing, and she isn't well. Well, she can talk, can't she? she... Can't she? Jack. I can see it in your faces. Something's happened to her. What is it? Tell me. She's dead, isn't she? We're awfully sorry, son. See, you went out to my home, Mr. Shane. That's right, Mr. Phillips, and your wife told us you were working at the office this evening. Yes, Russell and I spent so many days in court on the trial. We had to work evenings to keep up with business. Well, I wouldn't imagine there'd be such a turnover in the wholesale jewelry line. You'd be surprised. Our firm cuts and mounts gems for at least half the better jewelry stores in the city. Then the robbery and loss of the diamonds didn't hurt your trade. It would have, Inspector, except for the capture and trial of Jack Holmes. Of course, we're covered by insurance. If you'll step into the office. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Yes, Bauer? May I see you a moment, sir? Uh, yes, excuse me, please. Uh, go right into the office. Okay, sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Russell. Miss Russell. Good evening. I uh, believe you and your sister know Inspector Faraday. Of course. Yes. How are you, Inspector? Fair enough, thanks. So the lady executives work nights around this company, too. If she's the treasurer, she does. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And now, Mr. Shane, I suppose you'd like your fee, now that nothing more can be done for poor Jack. Well, I'd hardly bring Inspector Faraday along just to collect a check, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> well, I assume... The case has cracked wide open again. Janet Miley has just died. What? Janet? She was poisoned. She staggered into our office about an hour ago, gasped out a few words, and she died. I was afraid of this. Remember, Anne, I said to you, if the jury brought in a guilty verdict... It wasn't was no... suicide, Mr. Russell. I said she was poisoned. Poisoned? Her dying words were that she'd found new evidence and that she had gone to him, some man, and told him. Well, of course, she came to me, but she didn't say anything about evidence. What time was this, Mr. Phillips? About six o'clock. She was crying and hysterical. Begged me to help Jack to get a retrial or an appeal. I tried to comfort her. Excuse me, Mr. Phillips, but I thought you'd like these invoices. I'm very busy, Mr. Bauer. Oh, yes, sir. I'll leave them here on the desk. If Jim had found any new evidence, it'd hardly be likely to clear Jack Holmes. I'm pretty well convinced that young man is a born criminal. Mr. Russell, that's unfair. Is it? Look at the court testimony. Phillips and I found shortages in Jack's account books. We called him back to the office that night to explain he couldn't. Said he wanted to spend the night checking back through his records. Phillips and I left. Next thing we know, 1,300 carats worth of diamonds are missing... Night watchman's found dead. You never found the diamonds? Of course not. He hid them. I'm afraid it's true. The watchman's clock was smashed. It stopped at 12.10. The cab driver picked up Jack at 12.15. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you mind leaving the room? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. He's new here. Bauer is the nosiest secretary I've ever hired. I'm... Bauer! Now I remember. Remember what? Well, I was in the outer office this evening... When Janet came out of this room, Bauer stopped her. I heard him say something about going out to a bar and having a little chat. I'm going to call him back. A bar, eh? Do you suppose the poison was slipped into a drink? Mr. Bauer! Oh, Mr. Bauer, hold on. Stop! Hey, Inspector, what's wrong? He's Why? running for the front door! He's We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Week in and week out, a lot of motorists go along wondering why their engines lack power without realizing that much of their trouble may be due to dirty or worn-out spark plugs. Yes, that's right. 
Defective or worn spark plugs are to blame for a great deal of poor engine performance. For example, engineering tests show that faulty spark plugs can waste one tankful of gasoline out of every ten, which not only cuts down your mileage, but causes your engine to lose power. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engine has been losing power, it's a pretty safe bet that the Union Oil Minuteman Spark Plug Service can do you some good. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. Or if new plugs are indicated, he can quickly install them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. While Inspector Faraday hurries off in pursuit of the fleeing Secretary Bauer, Mike and Phyllis have set off on an errand of their own. And now in the hallway of a certain apartment house. Oh, here we are. 327. Not much better than here. Mike, that's Secretary Bauer. He's tied into this somehow. Mm -hmm. Snooping around to hear what we said and then running from the inspector. Well, I'll leave that problem to Faraday, you know. Well, the place looks all in order. Hey, wait a minute, honey. Her bed. It's not made up, it's cut to pieces. Yeah, the stuffing pulled out of the mattress. What on earth were they looking for? Let's go here, let me see. Oh, the bathroom. Mike, look at the medicine cabinet. And the floor. Uh-huh. Bottles and jars scattered all over the place. Oh, every one of them with its top or a little cold cream jar. Here, the cream's been scooped out and dropped all over the basin. Huh? Oh, that's an old trick, honey. Hiding gems in a woman's makeup. Mike, you don't think Jack... Gen- that she had the diamonds. Well, somebody thought so. Maybe she did. No. No, that guess that. That's too dizzy. Well, come on, let's check the other room again. Here. Yeah, there's something worth looking into. A desk. Yeah. Somebody else found it, too. Drawers yanked out. Everything's a mess. Well, I doubt if there's anything left for us, but I'll double check. Still searching. No. No, just the usual stuff. Say, how about that wastebasket, honey? How about it? Here. Huh? Put in my thumb and pulled out a plum. What a big girl am I? Yeah. A check shown in half. Mm-hmm. Pay to the order of Janet Miley. Two thousand dollars. And signed by Well, I'll be a Anne Elizabeth Russell. I think this note went with it, Mike. It's the same handwriting. Janet, take this and do as I say. That's all. Take this and do as I say. Which apparently Janet did not. $2,000 is a rather expensive no thanks. Well, stuff this in your purse, Angel. We're about to go places and ask questions. You know, if you ask me, Shh, Miss Russell... Quiet. What? Hmm? Please, the door, quick. Snap off the lights. Yeah. I'll flatten against the wall. I'll jump up when he comes in. No, the light. All right, buddy. Come on, up with your hands. What? Let go of me, you dope. What? Faraday. You? Yeah, me. Oh, I thought you were chasing Bauer. Got away. I phoned Phillips for Bauer's home address. Turned out to be a gas station. Oh, a phony, eh? Well, we've got a lead that may be better. Come on, let's go. Give the doorbell another push, Mike. You know, I wish these people would stay put. First we go to their homes, but they're working at the office. Now they're not at the office, they're home. Somebody's coming now. Yes? Oh, it's you again. Don't strain your enthusiasm, Mr. Russell. May we come in? Uh, yes. Mr. Russell, we would like to talk to your sister. And? Oh, well, she's upstairs. Will you ask her to come down, please? Yes, if you'll go into the living room. And? Oh, Anne, will you come downstairs? May I ask what you people want? Oh, you'll hear it. Oh, by the way, sir, I believe your sister is treasurer of your company? She is. For how long? Six or seven years. How long was Janet Miley with your firm? Mm, Several years. She worked in the same department with Jack Holmes. Look here, I insist on knowing what this is about. Alfred? In here, Anne. Oh, so you're all back. Yes, these people say they want to talk to you, Anne. Phyllis, uh, give me that check and note. Ready and waiting. Miss Russell, would you look at this note and check, please? 
So Janet gave them to you. What did she tell you? Right now, I'm more interested in what you told her. What was Janet to do for your $2,000? Two thousand. And what's the meaning of this? I was merely trying to save you from yourself, brother dear. Save me? I've watched you for a long time, Alfred. What is... I saw the way you were mooning around Janet. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, don't you? I know you proposed marriage to the girl. And now with Jack out of the way, you thought she'd say yes. But I'm not going to have another woman in this organization. I have trouble enough as it is. That doesn't explain the $2,000, Miss Russell. Of course it does. I offered her the money to get out of town and not come back. And what right had you? You're not running my life. Well, this puts a new slant on everything. Could be that Russell wanted Jack out of the way so he could have a clear track with Janet. Mm -hmm. The diamond robbery might have been conveniently arranged. That's a lie. If Miss Russell didn't want her brother to marry Janet and the girl wouldn't buy off, then perhaps Big Sister thought of another way out. You mean the poison route, Phil? Well, how dare you? You, you, uh, 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 you mustn't. I know some naughty names, too. Oh, surely, Mr. Shane, you've got some brains. You don't believe such insane twaddle. Are you referring to my colleagues, Miss Russell, or to your story? No. It could be possible oh. you and your brother Alfred have been uh, putting on a little act for us. I'll answer that remark, Mr. Shane, but right now you're wanted on the phone. What? Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Shane, this is Power. Yeah? I've got to see you at once. What? Where are you? Listen. I have the real dope on the murder. Meet me at the old Dutch windmill in Golden Gate Park. What time? Let's see. It's just about 10 o'clock. Make it 10.30. And come alone. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Bauer. So it's Bauer. Where is he, Mike? Shh, quiet, Inspector. Well, Mr. Russell, I, I think we'll be running along. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. I'm sure you will. No, no, please. Don't bother to see us to the door. Mike, where are we going? Golden Gate Park. Ah, oh, wants to talk to us secretly. A great secret with somebody listening on the line. What? Who's listening? Miss Ann Russell on the extension phone right in the hall here. What time is it, Mike? 10.28. Now keep back in the shadows with Faraday. Oh, this guy in Bauer certainly picked a romantic spot to meet the old Dutch windmill in the loneliest corner of the park. Not to mention spooky. Look at those four huge veins above us like the arms of a giant hovering over our heads. Oh, Angel, your poetry picks the doggondest times to bust loose. Well, I can't help it. I'm nervous. What time is it now? 10.29. I don't know. This may be a trap. Uh, Bauer may be after you, Mike. I don't like anything about that bird. I don't like anything about tonight, period. Shh. I see a light through the bushes. Car's coming around the turn. Got your gun, Mike? I'm all set. Now keep back in the shadows. This sounds like he's driving fast. What was that? Sounded like a gun. Why, Grandma Faraday, your nerves. Here he comes. Mike, he's passing you. Mike? Hey, Bauer! Bauer! He's skidding. Is he hurt? Is he can't, hurt badly? Can't tell yet. Open his shirt, Mike. That's oh, a waste of time, Inspector. Look at the back of his head. Oh, I guess I was right. We did hear a shot. But who would do it? Who knew he was coming here to talk? Oh, that phone call. Yeah, Ann Russell. Well, I guess there's no mystery about this killing. Hey, Faraday, here's his wallet. Maybe it will answer a few things for us. Let's see. Hmm. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm old enough to be told. Mr. Bauer wasn't any ordinary secretary. He was an insurance detective. Planted in that office to find the missing diamonds. Well, then maybe he ransacked Janet's apartment. Yes, he did. It says so here in his pocket notebook. Search girl's room, no evidence, no jewels. Janet went in to see Phillips. Something's up. Took her to bar. Told me to check on mistake. 12.15. 12.15. Mike, remember? Huh? Janet tried to tell us something about that. Twelve fifteen. That was when Jack was picked up by the taxi driver. Yes, according to the clock in the drugstore window. Inspector, let's telephone the coroner and then then what? Go take a good look at that clock. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, this is a waste of time, Mike. I checked that clock the day after the robbery. So did we, Inspector, before the trial began. It's an electric. It keeps perfect time. It couldn't be wrong. Save your breath, pal. Mike's in another stubborn spell. Oh, the drugstore's closed for the night. Yeah, but there's the clock. You can read it a hundred feet away. Neon hands, neon numerals. Uh, it says 11.10. What time have you got, Faraday? 11.10. Now are you satisfied? Jack came out of the jewelry place two doors north of the drugstore. The taxi picked him up. The driver saw the clock in the window. The window! What are you staring at, Mike? The grocery store over there. Inspector, call a cab and get the driver who picked up Jack Holmes. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. As a featured part of this service, the Minutemen also inspect your ignition cables. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Normally, they give little trouble. But if anything happens to them, if they get broken or frayed, or if the insulation is damaged, even brand new spark plugs won't help your driving. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. And by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich, full spark needed for complete combustion. So for a careful check and double check on your car's firepower, have a Union Oil Minuteman service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll get honest, accurate work, and you'll notice the increased power and snap from your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It's a few minutes past midnight. At a lonely street corner in the commercial district, Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are talking to a scared little taxi driver. Look, fellas, it's just like I said in court. I'm cruising along here and I see this guy. The inspector and I know that, Smitty. Now, we just want you to show us. Now, do exactly as you did that night. Yeah, cruise down the street and pretend you're picking up Jack Holmes. And we'll get in the back seat and ride along. Okay, okay, climb in. Here, darling, come in. Thank you. <clears throat> I turns this corner here, see? Mm -hmm. And I'm moseying along when I spot him crossing the street. He waves at me, so I slows down. I stops right about here. Jack was standing in the middle of the street. You opened the door. Which one? The right one. He climbs in and gives me the address. Well, go ahead. Open the door, Smitty. See, ain't you got no imagination? Now, Smitty, when did you see the clock? Right now, when I leans over to close the door. There it is in the window, see? All lit up with neons. Okay, look at it. What time does the clock say? Uh... Gee, it's just like that night. 12.15. Mike, you were right. He made the same mistake all over again. Look at it again, Smitty. Look hard now. Come on, look hard. What do you mean, look hard? The clock says, hey, there's something screwy. The numbers, they're backwards. Right, Smitty, right. You're not looking at the clock. You're looking at the reflection in the grocery store window. The real clock is across the street in the drugstore. The drugstore clock reads a quarter to 12, but the reflection looks like a quarter after 12. Thirty minutes different, Smitty. Gee, I got a sworn. Say, I did swear. You ain't gonna pinch me, are you? No, Smitty. Now, are you willing to do something for us? Me? Yeah, sure. Anything, fellas. All right. We're gonna pick up three passengers. And one of them is the murderer. Here's the office. Right. Mr. Shane, I doubt we'll find anything in here that the police haven't already gone over. Well, they had the wrong slant, Mr. Phillips. You see, someone planned to steal those diamonds, but they needed a fall guy, Jack Holmes. So they faked the shortage in his account books. Then they called him that night, very indignant at discovering his dishonesty. Just a minute. I was the one who found him out. Shut up, Ann. Jack said he wanted to check back through his records. He didn't leave till a quarter to twelve. About midnight, the thief came here and stole the diamonds. The night watchman surprised the thief and was killed. Then the cab driver blundered about the drugstore clock, and Jack was really on the spot. For the killer, it was a beautiful out. Janet discovered the mistake this afternoon. She told it to Bauer. He checked her story. 
When he discovered Janet was dead, he tried to tell me what Janet told him. That's why he was killed. Oh, that's rubbish. Bauer ran away from the inspector. Why? He must have had a reason. He had. He wasn't ready to talk yet. You see, there's one detail we didn't tell you people. Bauer was a detective himself. He was what? Oh, yes, yes. Hired by the insurance company to find those diamonds. You mean that he was... Do you think he found the diamonds? I'm sure he didn't. If we can step inside the office, Mr. Phillips, I'll show you why. Now, Bauer had a suspect, but it was the wrong one. He did know, however, that Jack was innocent. And uh, when he telephoned me, the same call you listened in on, Miss Russell... The killer knew he was trapped, unless... I don't believe it. I didn't hear anything on that phone. Oh, oh, yes, you did, Miss Russell. You ought to have recognized it. Now, perhaps you will now. Mr. Shane, stop this cat and mouse business. Shh, please, please. That clock on the bookcase there, in five seconds, is going to strike the hour. Now, listen. One, two, three... This is fantastic. Four... Well, distinctive chimes, aren't they? This is the same clock I heard strike while I was talking to Bauer on the phone. He called from this very room. There was only one man who knew where I was who could tell Bauer where to phone me. Mr. Phillips. Me? You're insane. Am I? Bauer told you Jack was innocent. You sat there in your chair and heard him say to meet me at the old Dutch windmill at 10.30. So you killed him. He trusted the wrong person, just as Janet did. She came to you, told you about the drugstore clock. You had to stop her tongue. You poured her a drink from this water jug in your desk with poison in the glass. You anything to say to that, Mr. Phillips? No. No, nothing. I thought not. All right, Inspector. Oh, come on in the house, kids. Huh? Mrs. Faraday will be glad to fix us some eggs and coffee. Oh, no, no, no. It's pretty late, Faraday. I think we all better get to bed. Look at Phil here. She's almost asleep. I am not. I was just thinking. How did you know, Mike, that the clock you heard over the phone was in Philip's office? Oh, I heard it the first time we went there, dear. It just took me a little while to get it placed in my memory. Oh. Clocks ran all through this case, didn't they? The watchman's clock stopped at 12.10. The drugstore clock that convicted poor Jack. The office clock that caught the murder. Yeah, sometimes a clock can tell more than the time of day. Oh, oh, Mike, that's corny. But hmm? I knew you'd say it. I was just waiting for it. Well, I guess Michael's entitled to a little corn off the cob tonight. <laughs> that was neat thinking, my boy. A clock reflected in the window and the hands reversed by 30 minutes. Doubt if I'd have thought of it myself. Oh, Faraday, please, Mike's ego. Huh? Besides, I think I know why he's so leery of clocks lately. Hmm? Oh, now listen here, honey, if you mean yes, Go on, please. Phil, let's have it. Well, no, Mike no. had a date with me for six o'clock, and he was an hour late. No, no, Angel, please, and no, no. And guess what his alibi was? What? He thought he saw a clock that said 5 p.m. It was a grocery scale with five pounds of potatoes in it. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. On June 4th, we come on the air one half hour earlier. Remember now, that's not next Monday night, but the Monday for following, June 4th. Four- Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.
Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective, presented by the three great Linux home brighteners, Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax, created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. Today's curious adventure, Death in the Pool. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mink Coat. In just a moment, we'll hear how an expensive mink coat helped Nick Carter solve the mystery of the dead man found floating in the lily pool. But first, here's something you'll want to remember. A home is a place to enjoy. That's why you keep it as lovely as you can. Thousands of American homemakers have discovered that Chemtone, the miracle wall finish, is the way to new wall beauty. Now, renewing the beauty of your floors, Linux self-polishing wax gives a satiny luster without tiresome rubbing. And it resists wear, water, and dirt amazingly, for it contains real Carnaba wax. You can actually clean with a damp cloth or mild suds. What's more, Linux self-polishing wax, the non-skid floor finish, resists slip even when water is spilled on it. Get Linux self-polishing wax at your paint, hardware, or department store. Headquarters for all three great Linux home brighteners and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish. And now for today's mysterious adventure with Nick Carter. As our story opens, Nick and Patsy, his assistant, are driving home a girl who is not feeling well. Where does she live, Patsy? In the Gray Bar apartment, Nick. It's the one with the big lily pool in the court. Oh, that one. She would live in a place like that. All show, nothing else, just like Sally. I wish you wouldn't talk that way about her, Nick. She used to be one of my best friends years ago. Well, she's no friend of mine. I have no use for girls that drink the way she does. She's had a lot of trouble recently, Nick, and she just drinks to make herself forget. Her husband divorced her about a year ago just because she went out on a few parties he didn't approve of. She's been alone ever since. Funny, you standing up for her, Patsy. Usually, you'd be the first to condemn anyone who plays around the way I understand she does. All right, Nick. Think what you like. Just as long as we get her home to her apartment so I can put her to bed. Yep. Who's going to bed? Evelyn's young yet. Let's go somewhere. The only place you're going, young lady, is home to bed. Well, who's that? Well, I don't know him. Oh, yes, you do, Sally. That's Nick Carter, the man I work with. Never heard of him. This the place? Just ahead, Patsy? Yeah, stop at this first entrance. She lives on this side. Okay. Come on now, Sally. This is where you live. I'll get out first and give you a hand. Get out, Miss Selva. Don't need a hand. I can take care of myself. Want me to go up with you? No, Nick, you wait here. She'll be all right. All right. But don't let her keep you up there all night. I won't. Uh Uh-oh, I better go after her. She'll fall in the lily pool if she's not careful. Yeah, she's getting pretty close to the edge of it. You're best... What in heaven's name? You sound terrified. Come on. What's the matter, Sally? What is it? Man in the pool. A man. He's dead. Dead! Yes, Riley, over here, by the edge of the pool. Uh, Patsy phoned me that you found a man's body in the pool. Drowned, was he? Flash your lights this way, Riley. Okay. Holy smokes, Nick. Look in his back. Yes, a knife. Right between the shoulder blades. Did you find the body, Nick? Not exactly. It was Patsy's girlfriend who found it, really. What's her name? Sally Reeves. Oh, that one. Where is she now? Oh, Patsy's putting her to bed. She lives in this house. She's... Well, slightly under the weather. Uh, how'd she happen to find him? Oh, Patsy and I were at a small friendly gathering, having a quiet evening, and then she walked in. Got well lit up and wrecked the party. Patsy wanted to bring her home, so we did. As she went by the pool, she started screaming. I came over here and found this. Well, let's have a look at him. Nick, that's Arthur Reeves. What? That's Sally Reeves, ex-husband. And you say she found him? That's right. Very interesting. Maybe she found him because she knew just where to look for him. The 
Lieutenant Riley seems to think Sally did it herself. He's a dope. Well, you said she's hated her husband ever since he divorced her, Patsy. Maybe she did kill him. Oh, Nick. Well, she certainly acted guilty enough when they questioned her. That doesn't mean anything, and you know it. Well, maybe and maybe not. Well, Riley will find out. Oh, Nick, you can't leave it to Riley. Well, that's certainly what I'm going to do. This is none of my affair. Nick Carter, you've got to make it your affair. Now, Patsy. But I'm not going to see Sally put in jail for something she didn't do. You've got to help her, Nick. And why? Because I asked you to, that's why. Oh, Patsy. Oh, Nick, will you do it? Well, I suppose I'll have to if you put it that way. Oh, Nick, I knew you would. But it's against my better judgment. I don't care why you do it, just as long as you do it. Now, where do we start? Well, I guess the best thing is to go down and see Riley in the morning. And find out just how the case against her stacks up so far. Then we'll see where we go from there. Good morning, Nick. And Patsy. Hi, Riley. Well, Lieutenant, have you let Sally out of jail yet? Let her out? I should say not, Patsy. She's in for good the way it looks now. She did it all right. Riley, do you mind telling us just what the case is against her so far? No, I don't mind at all. Uh, Which side are you on in this, Nick? I'm on the side of the law, just as I always am. You'd know me well enough for that by now. Oh, sure, sure. Well, here it is. Reeves was Sally's ex-husband. He divorced her for seeing too much of other guys, and she hated him for it. In spite of the 500 bucks a month alimony he was paying her, or, or supposed to be paying her. She said he hadn't paid her anything for the last three months. Exactly. Uh, you're proving my case for me, Patsy. Well, now, Reeves' partner tells me that Reeves was having a tough time making both ends meet, let alone paying his alimony. He spent too much on his second wife. And here's another thing. Reeves just took out a $50,000 insurance policy in this Sally's favor. Hmm. Is that so? He had to. That was part of the divorce settlement. You should have done it before then. Yeah, I know. But that insurance policy is another swell motive for Sally to want Reeves dead. She wouldn't kill anybody. Well, here's another point then. She says she got to your party about 9.30 or 10 o'clock. Well, the medical examiner says the guy was killed at least by 9 o'clock. So she could have killed him and gone to your party for an alibi. Where does she say she was from, say, 8 o'clock? Up to the time she got to our party. Uh, She says Reeves called her and asked if he could see her about 8.30. So she said yes and sat in her apartment waiting for him, but he never showed up. So she says. It's a fine alibi, I don't think. It's no alibi at all. Who was the last one to see Reeves alive? Oh, his partner, Workman. He said Reeves was at the shop, but left to go to see Sally about something. Amazing. Now everything points to Sally, isn't it? Oh, it ain't amazing, Nick. It's natural. She did it. She didn't do it, and Nick's going to prove it. Oh, is he now, Patsy? Well, how's he going to get around the facts? Nick's going to dig up some new facts, Lieutenant. Then you'll see how wrong you are. Well, maybe, but I doubt it. Look, Lieutenant, can I see Sally? Oh, sure, sure. I guess it'll be all right. Uh, Would you like to see her now? If I can. Okay, I'll fix it. You go ahead with your investigation, Nick. I'll go back to the office and wait for you when I'm through here. All right. I'll see you then in a little while. I think I'll go down and have a talk with Reeves' partner first. Now, Mr. Workman, you say Reeves was here in the store last night after dinner? Uh, Yes, Mr. Carter. He was checking stock with me. Then he left to see Sally. That was about 8.30. He said he'd be right back to help me finish checking. Did he say why he wanted to see her? He said he was going to ask her to let him out of some of the alimony he owed her. I see. But he didn't come back. No. I stayed here by myself until about one o'clock. Mm-hmm. I should judge by the type of furs you carry here, Mr. Workman, that you must do a pretty good business. That's right, Mr. Carter. Then how do you account for Mr. Reeves having such a hard time keeping up his alimony payments? Well, Mr. Reeves is a heavy spender. He spent money freely himself. And his second wife was extravagant. Mm. Did Reeves have any insurance for the partnership? The kind, I mean, that leaves you any money if he dies. Oh, no, Mr. Carter. We talked about it, but decided it wasn't necessary. Have you and he ever had any trouble? Oh, not the slightest. We've always been the best of friends. Mm hmm. Well, thanks for your trouble, Mr. Workman. I guess that's all for now. Anytime I can help you, you let me know. Oh, uh, by the way, mind if I use your phone? Oh, not at all. It's on the desk over there. Thanks. Just want to call my office. I'll be in the back room if you want me. Thank you. Oh, Patsy, how'd you find Sally? Well, better than I expected, Nick. She's so mad at Riley for thinking she did it that she hasn't had time to be depressed. 
How'd you make out? Nothing new. That is nothing definite. I'm going to see Reeves' wife. Then I have to drop in on the DA, so I may be tied up the rest of the day. Oh, that's good, Nick, because Sally wants me to go and stay in her apartment while she's away. She has a cat and a canary, and she wants me to take care of them. And I think that's a swell idea. What's so swell about it? Well, don't you see? It'll give me a chance to go all through a thing. I'll bet you I find something to help prove she's innocent. Or guilty. Now, Nick, don't be like that. You'll drop over there around 8 o'clock tonight. I'll show you what I found. Okay, see you about 8 then, at Sally's apartment. No wonder Sally couldn't afford to let any of the alimony installments be hit. Cost her plenty to live in this place. Right, stop. Patsy! 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 Patsy, where... Patsy. What happened, Patsy? Patsy, can you hear me? Uh, that you, Nick? Yes, what's the matter? Um, Annie. He tried to... to... Uh... Patsy. What started out to be, for Nick at least, a routine investigation has suddenly taken a strange turn. What's happened to Patsy? And what does this have to do with Nick's attempts to find out who really killed Arthur Reeves? We'll see in just a moment. If you have furniture you treasure, you want to keep it handsome. And Linux Cream Polish will protect its beauty effectively. For Linux Cream Polish is designed to restore your furniture's original beauty in one quick, easy application. Yes, Linex Cream Polish actually cleans as it polishes, removing the cloudy accumulation of dust and polish, banishing messy fingerprints, helping conceal ugly scratches. And it dries to a hard, lustrous finish that leaves no oily film to attract more dust. This makes less work for you. Linex Cream Polish, the creamy white preparation that saves you one whole step in your furniture upkeep, is truly the modern way to protect the things in your home. Depend on it to give you added leisure, to give your furniture added loveliness. Ask for it by name. Linex. L-I-N-X. Linex Cream Polish. One of the three great Linex home brighteners. Get it now at your nearest paint department or hardware store, where you'll find it together with Linex self-polishing wax, Linex clear gloss, and Chemtone, the miracle wall finish that covers in one quick coat and dries in one hour. And now, back to our story. We left Nick trying to revive an unconscious Patsy so he could find out what had happened to her in Sally Reeves' apartment. Feeling better now, Patsy? Yes, Nick. I'm all right. Except for that crack on the head. Well, what happened? Can you tell me? Uh, I don't quite know, Nick. Standing here in front of the bedroom mirror, trying on Sally's new fur coat... Oh, Nick, isn't it heavenly? Yes, yes, it's certainly a valuable piece of fur. But what happened, Patsy? Well, as I was trying on the coat, a man came through the door. He's wearing a mask. He told me to take off the coat and give it to him or he'd kill me. I told him I wouldn't do it. Did he have a gun? Oh, I didn't see one. How'd he talk? Why, sort of funny, as if he were trying to disguise his voice. Sounded as if he might have had something in his mouth. Probably did. It's an old trick. Without your best friend wouldn't recognize you. Then what? He tried to jerk the coat off me, so I scratched his face for him. Good for you. Not so good, Nick. Look at my fingernails. They're all broken. Oh, they'll grow in again. Then what happened? He hit me and knocked me down just as you rang the buzzer. Must have gone out the back door as you came in the front. Then I must have gone out cold. He was certainly completely out when I found you. What does all this mean, Nick? Why did Sally get this coat? You know? Oh, yes, her ex-hubby gave it to her instead of some back alimony that he owed her. He took it out of the stock at the store about two weeks ago and brought it to her. Took it out of the stock at the store, huh? Well, does that mean something to you? I don't know, Patsy. But either this coat is tied up with a murder, or it's an extraordinary coincidence. Well, how can you find out? Get the history of the coat, first of all. Well, how do you do that, for heaven's sake? I know a man who can tell me. Come on. I'm glad you phoned him in advance. I'd hate to have made all this trip for nothing. Hello, Mo. Nick, how are you? Come in, come in. This is Patsy Bowen, my assistant, Mo. How do you do? Hello, glad to see you. And now, what is this puzzle you say you got for me, eh? Here's a fur coat, Mo. Have a look at it. Why, it's beautiful. 
beautiful, Nick. Beautiful. What can you tell me about it? Well, it's worth at least $4,000. No, that isn't what I mean. What can you tell me about the coat itself? Everything I could tell you about it, Nick. But I might have to rip it apart a little here where it's sold. Go ahead. I want to know as much as you can tell me. Sure, Nick, sure. Now, I rip a little of the lining here. And I cut a few of the stitches here. Get the skin are so together. Now, look, Nick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see this little blue mark on the skin here? Yes. That means the coat was sold by Fishbone Brothers. At their mark. The skins were sold together by Herman Schultz, who works for them. Nobody else in the business stitches like Herman. Anything else? When Fishbone Brothers make up the coat, they sell it to a retailer. That's all I could tell. Suppose they could tell me anything else about it? You can ask them. They got a store right on the block from me. I could telephone them that you are coming, and they should take good care of you right away. Thanks, Mo. Oh, by the way, that knife there on the counter, is that any particular kind of knife? All for you, who make garments use them, Nick. That is a good knife for trimming the skins. Why do you ask? Oh, just saw one while ago, and I was curious. Come on, Patsy. Let's go see Fishburne Brothers. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Carter, but I wanted to be sure of the facts. This coat was sold by us to Perry Long. And Perry Long sold the coat to a Mrs. Jackson Moody, who lives in Boston. But three months ago, she reported it stolen and offered $500 reward for its return. $500? Oh, Nick, we can claim that reward. We found the coat. You found it, Patsy. The reward's yours if you want it. Is that what you wanted to know, Mr. Carter? Yes, thanks. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Oh, Patsy, call Riley and tell him to meet us at Reeves and Workman's place. Well, what are we going back there for? I want to see if Workman can add anything to what we already know about this stolen coat. Goodbye. Hmm? Oh, goodbye. Why, Mr. Carter, I didn't expect to see you again tonight. I just want to ask you a few more questions, if you don't mind. Oh, uh... No, uh, not at all. Come in, all of you. Working pretty late, aren't you? Uh, yes, I am. You see, without Mr. Reeves, there's so much more for me to do. Pretty dark in here for you to be working, isn't it? Oh, no, I can see plenty well in this light. Well, uh, Lieutenant Riley has to make some notes, so... Make notes? Uh, on what, Nick? Why, in Mr. Workman's answers to my questions, naturally. Mm. Sure you won't mind if I turn on another light, will you, Mr. Workman? Oh, now, really, Mr. Carter, Nick, I don't think... look. His face is scratched right across the cheek. Uh, yes, uh, there was a cat sleeping on a pile of furs a little while ago. I didn't see him, and when I tried to move the furs, he jumped at me and scratched me. What an alibi. Uh, uh, now, uh, what was it you wanted to ask me? Well, first, Mr. Workman, I'd like your permission to look around your shop a bit. Oh, now, see here, Mr. Carter, I don't see what right you Riley. have to come in here and... Uh... See that Mr. Workman stays where he is while I take a look around the place. Now, look here, you can't come Let's in here and do this. Yes, you are, Workman. Nick knows what he's doing. But I don't understand what... Just sit tight. Nick will tell you when he's ready. Well, this is an interesting package, Workman. Addressed to some firm out in San Francisco. Seems to be full of pieces of fur coats, some odd neck pieces, and other odd pieces of fur. All expensive fur, too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, That's uh, just some pieces I had left over. I don't think so, Workman. What Uh, do you think they are, Nick? I think Workman is a receiver of stolen furs. Ridiculous. He cuts them up and ships them to the West Coast. His accomplice out there ships his stuff east. Then they put them together and mix the furs up so they can't be identified. You're crazy. I I wouldn't get mixed up in anything like that. Riley? Hmm? Ever see a knife like this one before? By golly, Nick, that's the same kind of knife that killed Reeves. You're quite sure? Of course I am. That same dark-colored handle, the same two metal bands around it, I'd know that anywhere. That's the same kind of knife we saw at Moe's a little while ago, Nick. Except that the handle is different. Exactly, Patsy. The knife's a regular furrier's knife. But I imagine that sometime in the past year, Mr. Workman had new handles put on all his old knives. Right, Mr. Workman? Say, now look here. If you're trying to connect me with Reeves' murder, you're all wrong. I didn't kill him. Ever see this fur coat before? Uh, No. And I suppose you weren't the man who tried to take it away from Patsy tonight at Sally's apartment. No, of course not. Uh, What's that about, Nick? You didn't tell me about anybody trying to rob Patsy. Reeves gave Sally a very expensive fur coat out of the stock here at the store instead of paying her some back alimony. 
But Reeves didn't know it was stolen. Then when you arrested Sally, Workman knew he had to get that coat back before you found it, recognize it from the description that's been sent out, and trace it back to him. So he tried to steal it from Patsy tonight in Sally's apartment. Lies, all lies. Hey, Nick, I'm beginning to see what you're leading up to. Do you, Riley? I'll say I do. Reeves finds out that Workman is dealing his stolen furs. They get into a fight about it. Workman tells Reeves the coat he gave to Sally was stolen. Reeves is sore and starts for Sally's house to get it back. That's where he was headed when he was killed last night. I'll bet that's it. Go on, Riley. Doing well so far. But when Reeves leaves, Workman gets scared. He doesn't want Reeves to tell anybody he's selling stolen furs. But the only way he can stop him is to kill him. So he grabs one of his fur knives, beats it up to the apartment house before Reeves gets there, waits for him, and kills him. Why, it's as plain as the nose on your face. You're crazy, all of you. I didn't kill Reeves. Where were you between 8 and 10 last night? I told you I was here in the store, taking stock, alone. That ain't no alibi. Come on, workman, I'm taking you down to headquarters. We got ways of making fellas that have nothing to say talk a lot down there. No, I was right, Nick. Sally didn't do it. Oh, Nick, you're wonderful. Well, thanks for those few kind words, Patsy. Okay, Riley, take him down to headquarters and wait for me there. Well, ain't you coming, Nick? No, there's one last bit of evidence that'll clinch this case, Riley, and I think I know right where to put my hand on it. Meet you in your office in about half an hour. Nick. Well, glad to see the four of you gathered here to welcome me. Riley, Patsy, Sally, and Mr. Workman. Mm -hmm. Now let's sit down and be real cozy. What's all this about, Mr. Carter? They won't tell me anything except that you've got some news for me. Okay, Nick. Okay, Riley, go right ahead. Well, Sally, it's like this. Mr. Workman here is the man who killed your ex-husband, Arthur Reeves. That's a lie, Riley. Oh, no, it ain't. Selling stolen furs, your knife, Sally having a fur coat that was stolen, and you trying to get it back, it all adds up. Just wait till the jury gets it. Then, you know I didn't do it. Of course we know it. And I'm apologizing right here and now to both you and Patsy for being such a dumb idiot as I was. I should have known you wouldn't kill him. Isn't it wonderful, Sally? You're free. And Nick did it. I knew he would. Now, I can collect the $500 reward for recovering the stolen fur coat. Oh, it's just super, super, Patsy. You collect that money, and I'll collect the $100,000 on the insurance that Arthur took out for me. I don't think you will, Sally. But, Mr. Carter, why not? Yes, Nick, why can't she get that money? Sally? Yeah? You told me Reeves never got to your apartment last night. That you didn't see him at all, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I waited and waited, but he didn't come. Riley? Hmm? Got the things you found in Reeves' pocket? Well, sure, Nick. Right here. There you are. Sally, in Reeves' pocket was a bill for women's clothes. Addressed to you, postmarked the morning of the murder. It must have been delivered to you that afternoon. Now, if you didn't see Reeves, how did that bill get in his pocket? Why, You didn't see him, didn't you? Yes, he tried to take my fur coat away from me. But I wouldn't let him. And you got into an argument about money, didn't you? He was broke and couldn't give you any, so you gave him this bill and said he could at least pay that, right? Well, he... And by the time he left you, you were so mad you could have killed him, weren't you? But I didn't kill him. Workman did. Workman didn't kill him, Sally. You did. After he left, you grabbed up that furrier's knife, ran down the stairs, rushed over to where he was still standing beside the pool, and plunged the knife in his back before he knew you were there. No. No, I never owned a knife like that. I couldn't have done it. Ever see this picture, Sally? Huh? I found it in your apartment a few minutes ago. A flashlight shot of a tea party you had in your apartment. Dated three months ago. And on the table is one of workman's fur knives being used as a cheese knife. So you did own a knife like that. All right, I... I did kill Arthur. I had to have money quick. Got a lot of bills that have to be paid. He wouldn't give me any money. Insurance was all I could get. So? So I killed him. Well, Nick, so she did do it. I was right all the time. I told you I didn't do it. I knew you didn't do it all along, workman. But I had to do it this way to break down the case against Sally. Sorry. You say you knew all along, Nick? Certainly. A new workman couldn't have done it because he'd never have chosen such a public place as the court inside a large apartment house at nine o'clock on an early fall evening. (laughs) There's altogether too much chance of his being seen. He'd have picked a much safer spot. Furthermore, he never would have killed him before he got that stolen coat back from Sally. No, Riley, only someone who was so mad they didn't stop to think would kill a man in such a public place. Well, then I, I, I gotta let workman go? He was dealing in stolen furs, wasn't he? Oh, 
By golly, you're right, Nick. I'll see that he gets his for that, I will. Come along, you, and you too, Sally Reeves. I'm going to push her both right where you belong. I knew it was you right from the very first. And you can't be going to show me up. Well, Nick, I was certainly wrong that time. You certainly were, Patsy. Completely wrong. She wasn't like that when I knew her years ago. Well, times change. So do people. You couldn't know what she's like now. I'm sorry, Nick. Gee, I suppose I'll never hear the end of this. You probably won't, Patsy. But don't feel too bad. If it hadn't been for you, we'd never have caught Workman and broken up his racket and stolen furs. And the right person is going to pay for Reeves' murder. Those are the things that really matter. Always. In just a moment, Nick and Patsy will bring you a preview of next week's exciting case. But before they do, a word to the wise. When you use Linux clear gloss on your floors, linoleum, furniture, and woodwork, they look as though you'd spent hours polishing them. And yet Linux clear gloss is so easy to apply, so easy to keep clean. Linux clear gloss is a durable, protective coating which is brushed on easily. Drying without brush marks to a tough, transparent surface that sturdily resists alcohol, perfume, fruit acids, boiling water, and hot grease. The brilliant beauty of Linex Clear Gloss is a constant source of satisfaction to every homemaker. For it wears and wears, keeping its good looks for a long, long time. Linex Clear Gloss keeps dirt on the surface, too, where it's easily wiped away. So protect and beautify every wood and linoleum surface in your home with Linex Clear Gloss. It'll add sparkle to your home and save you hours of housework. Thousands of American homemakers have already learned what a time-saving, labor-saving product Linex Clear Gloss is. Learn for yourself what a household help it can be. Ask for it by name. Famous Linex Clear Gloss. Available at your paint, hardware, or department store. If your dealer hasn't received his supply of the three great Linux home brighteners, he'll have them soon. Ask him to save one or all of them for you. Acme will see that he gets them, and you get them, as quickly as possible. And now let's hear from Nick Carter himself. What exciting story have you got for us next week, Nick? Can you tell us a little about that? Well, Ken, next week I'm going to tell you about a murder in a little country town. Patsy and I had gone there for our vacation. But for that one day, we got very little vacation. A friend of the sheriff's was shot to death in his home in the early morning, and the sheriff made Nick take over. The sheriff found one big clue that satisfied him, but Nick found a number of small clues that really solved the murder. What do you call a story, Nick? I call it Murder in the Night. Or the Mystery of the Milkman's Discovery. So long for now. So long, everybody. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. We'll be looking forward to seeing you again next week. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, entitled Murder in the Night, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Milkman's Discovery. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is a copyright feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. It is presented at this same time and over these same stations by the three great Linux home brighteners. Linux Clear Gloss, Linux Cream Polish, and Linux Self-Polishing Wax. Created by Acme, America's great producer of Acme quality paints. In the Nick Carter Adventures, Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Helen Choate is featured as Patsy. Original music is played by Lou White. The programs are written and directed by Jock McGregor. This is Ken Powell speaking for the thousands of Linux dealers all over America and saying so long until next week. This is Mutual. Seven o'clock by the Longines Presentation Watch. The finest watch ever offered under the Longines banner.
from New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft clothes for men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast, present Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's immortal character, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. This week's adventure, The Case of the Well-Advertised Murder. By Jove, Holmes, there's Park Road and it's blocked. Our carriage can't pass. Quite so, Watson. The road's being repaired. Turn around, driver. You'll have to take the long way around. It'll cost us quite a bit of time, Holmes. Yes, and meanwhile, Christine Blakely is alone with her husband. And he hasn't the remotest notion that she means to kill him at any moment. Do you mind if I take a moment, Mr. Holmes, to tell our listeners that Clipper Craft clothes are priced like sale merchants? Uh, just a second, Mr. Harris. My name is Barron's, and I like sales as well as the next guy. But uh, how about the quality of these Clipper Craft clothes? Well, I'm glad you asked, Mr. Barron's, because Clipper Craft quality is superb, luxuriously tailored, of really fine, long wearing fabrics, and only $40 and $45. Imagine this. A truly expensive-looking Clipper Craft worsted suit costs only $45. Well, how come? That doesn't seem reasonable to me. Well, you see, Mr. Barron's, more than 1,200 of America's fine independent stores combine their purchasing power. That makes for enormous savings in production and distribution. Well, granted, but I want to see before I buy. Uh, where do I see these Clipper Craft clothes? Right in your own community at the friendly independent store that sells Clipper Craft suits and top coats and overcoats, too. Just you compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. Thanks, I will. I like good clothes, but I like to save money, too. Well, Dr. Watson, you've called this adventure with Mr. Holmes the case of the well-advertised murder, but who on earth would want to advertise a murder? Ah, Mr. Harris, the medium of advertising was not quite what one might expect. It was 1902. We medical men were just breaking fresh ground on the problem of mental disorder. It was late afternoon at the office of Dr. John Kemmel. The doctor's nurse, Patricia, was announcing a patient. Uh, Mrs. Richard Blakely to see you, doctor. I filled out a card for her. Oh, do bring her in, Patricia. Yes, doctor. Uh, This way, please, Mrs. Blakely. Thank you. Sit down, Mrs. Blakely. That's it. Now, what seems to be disturbing you? Doctor, I realize that medical ethics require the presence of your nurse, but this is so confidential. Might we be alone? I'm terribly sorry. The nurse must remain. Patricia's a very understanding girl, Mrs. Blakely. Dr. Campbell and I have worked together for many years, ma'am, on every conceivable type of case, so you needn't feel embarrassed. Go on, Mrs. Blakely. Well, I haven't an ordinary illness. I have an illness, I I should say, of the mind. I... Oh, Doctor, I just... I haven't got the courage to speak of this, to face it. Won't you try? I can't help you if you won't try, Mrs. Blakely. Very well, I... I'll try. I'm Mrs. Richard Blakely. Notes, Patricia. Yes, Doctor. My marriage to Richard was a marriage of impulse. I... I became infatuated with him. Richard was handsome and well-bred and gallant. He was my lock in come out of the West. Of course, after a few years of marriage, the first ecstasy died. The inevitable erosion of time began. Our marriage assumed the standard pattern of inertia, and I grew bored. And then I grew to dislike Richard. Doctor, I can't bring myself to say this. Now, please try, Mrs. Blakely. I'm sure you can. I disliked Richard in a petty way. It was a desire to avoid him more than anything else. He traveled because of business. I'd hoped he'd be delayed, giving me more time without him. I began filling the house with guests so that we shouldn't be alone. How did your husband react to this? Oh, he became irritated. Richard is jealous and possessive. He wants to be with me constantly. Then I thought of a divorce. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, what did you decide? Oh, it would be hopeless. He'd never grant one. 
Besides, even if I succeeded, he'd follow me and haunt me and use every device imaginable to bring me back. Now, why have you come to see a physician? Well, I began reading about the new theories of that doctor in Vienna, Sigmund Freud. Ah, yes, an astounding development. Brilliant craftsman of the human psyche. I became obsessed with what sort of demons might be lurking in my own unconscious. <laughs> you shouldn't be alarmed, Mrs. Blakely. Each of us has skeletons in the closet whose rattling is sometimes terrifying. Well, perhaps you can dismiss it, Doctor, but I can't. I've made a horrible discovery about myself. Well, what is it, Mrs. Blakely? I want to kill my husband. Really? That's why I've come to you. I'm afraid of going out of my mind. I've read every word of Freud. I have the symptoms. I have constant headaches and pressure at the back of my head and sudden palpitations of the heart. I, I can't sleep and my hands tremble. They're abnormally cold and I find myself exhausted suddenly for no apparent reason. You haven't been exerting yourself physically? No. Can I prepare for a physical examination, Doctor? In a moment, Patricia. Mrs. Blakely... This desire to murder your husband. Tell me more about it, can you? Well, in the morning, when he's having his breakfast coffee, I, I think how easily I might poison the cup. And when we're in the underground, I think how simple it would be to push him before the train and say it was an accident. I'm on the road to insanity, Doctor. There's no doubt of it. And always, after I think of murdering Richard, I have spells... Breathing is... Breathing is difficult for me. I feel faint. Oh, easy, Mrs. Blakely, easy. Must be something you can do. I, I, I mustn't go through with this awful thing. Bromide, Patricia, in hot water immediately. Yes, Doctor. Mrs. Blakely, have you told your husband of this? Oh, no. He'd ridicule me. I couldn't tolerate that. I'm losing my sanity, Doctor. I shall be a hideous, gibbering creature tied to a bedpost in Coney Hat or Bedlam. Mrs. Blakely... We medical men still have pitiable spears with which to fight the dragon of insanity. But I shall try. I shall do everything possible to help you. I've had even more ghastly thoughts, Dr. Campbell. I've thought killing him just once wouldn't satisfy me. I've had a lust to take a knife and plunge it into his body over and over and over. <laughs> You sent Mrs. Blakely home, Dr. Campbell? Yes, Mr. Holmes. I administered a bromide and told her to go home and rest. I didn't want to strain her any further today. Very advisable indeed. She had no idea you were coming to see me. Oh, no, none whatsoever. I'm shocked you should think I would tell her, Mrs. Hall. The, the, the woman is infinitely ashamed of this fear that possesses her. And immediately after you packed her off, you came here to Baker Street? Well, I made just one stop to see a patient at Upper Gloucester Place. I have a confession, Mr. Holmes. Oh? I've come to tell you about this case as fast as I could because, well, because the great psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud of Vienna, is attracting a great deal of attention. But we doctors are still quite helpless in the face of mental aberration. Do you agree, Dr. Watson? Unquestionably. You see, Freud has opened a door for our profession, but we've years of research ahead. I thought you might advise me, Mr. Holmes. It, it's so dangerous a situation. Yes. Dr. Campbell, are you at all familiar with Mrs. Blakely's home? Her family, her husband, perhaps. Oh, no, no. This afternoon was the first time I'd ever seen or heard of Christine Blakely. Oh, tragic figure, that woman. I wouldn't admit it to her, but I do believe she's on the verge of losing her mind. And of murdering her husband. You've been shockingly careless, Doctor. Set your things, Watson. I've what? Uh, where are we off to her? Mrs. Blakely's house. Immediately. Well, I, I wouldn't disturb her now, Mr. Holmes. She's so distracted. Now, perhaps tomorrow... No, we... we must see her tonight. She must be removed from the house before she has further opportunities for murdering Richard Blakely. As a matter of fact, we've lost precious time already. Where is Mrs. Blakely's residence, Dr. Campbell? Uh, across Regent's Park, St. James Terrace. We'll fetch a carriage and hurry over. Well, the quickest way is by Park Road, past Hanover Gate. Right you are, Dr. Watson. Uh, I'm ready, Holmes. Then quickly, gentlemen, quickly. <laughs> afternoon, Christine. Richard, if you're going to assume that impossible role of prosecuting attorney again, I... Where were you? Shopping. You're lying. I was shopping. Now, will you finish your dinner? The roast will be cold. Tell me the truth. 
If you don't stop persecuting me... Were you me, with the men? Richard. Christine, I know you so well. You're the cool, statuesque mistress of the household. But in your heart of hearts, you're a cheap, scheming little... You foul mouth! Does it please you to slap my face? Does it add to your feeling of superiority? If you tell Christine, I know what you really are. Well, then why don't you do what any man with pride would do and get out? Or let me get out? No. You're going to stay here. You're going to go on living with me. I'd never let you wander off. You're the prisoner of St. James Terrace. It's humiliating and unbearable to you, and that is just what I want. It delights me to have this tigress caged and restless in my home. Richard, this endless battling is so absurd. Can't we stop it? We're so weak. Perhaps we should go away together to some spot we knew when we first met. Do you think so? Now, I'm never sure whether you're being sincere or if you're just play-acting to amuse yourself. No, I'm not play-acting. Oh, let's talk sensibly. Oh, sit back and relax and enjoy your dinner, and then we'll stroll in the park and we'll talk. Good, sensible talk. All right, Christine. I'll try it. That's better. Now, let me cut a fresh piece of that roast for you. A hand of a carving knife, will you? By Jove, Holmes, there's Park Road. And uh, look, it's blocked. I tell Watson, it's being repaired. You see the sign? It's blocked as far as Hanover Gate. We shall have to turn about, Mr. Holmes. We'll have to take Marathon Road to York Gate and cross the park on the other circle. Yes, Dr. Campbell. Turn around, driver. Make for Marathon Road. Hurry. Uh, it'll cost us quite a bit of time, confound it. Yes, and meanwhile, Christine Blakely is alone with her husband. And he has the remotest notion that she means to kill him at any moment. <laughs> There you are, Richard. I've cut a very tempting piece of the roast for you. You can be considerate, Christine. And I do appreciate the rare moments when you are. You put down the carving knife, you'll cut yourself. I've given a great deal of thought to us, Richard. Of course. I've made a decision. You have, Christine? What is it? What is it, Christine? I can only be happy... Yes? I can only be happy if... If what? If you're dead. Chris, if you're dead, if you're dead, if you're dead! I feel much better now, Richard. I feel much better now. Blakely, we... Good Lord! We're too late, Dr. Campbell. Holmes, don't tell me the... Sh- oh, Mrs. Blakely. Who are you? I'm Dr. Campbell. You must recognize me. You visited my office late this afternoon. Apparently, she's lost all sense of orientation. Mrs. Blakely, you do know who I am, do you not? I've never seen you before. I've never seen any of you before. I know who the gentleman is lying on the floor, though. That's my husband. He's dead. I killed him. With this knife. The knife is still in my hand, dripping his blood. That's the way I wanted it. I feel much better now. I'm afraid she's gone mad, Mr. Holmes. I'll fetch her things. I must turn her over to the police immediately. Or her coat. It's in this cupboard. You hope the police won't detain her for long? Miserable creature. She should be turned over to a mental hospital. Now, come, Mrs. Blakely. You must come with us. I must come with you? Yes. uh, You see, we must notify the authorities. Holmes, what are you doing with the body? Examining it, Watson, obviously. Yes, uh, the police will tend to that. They tend to all the details. There's one detail that may escape them, my dear Watson. One amazing, bloody detail.
Look, Mr. Barons, let's hold that detail a minute. I'd like to talk to you some more. About Clippercraft clothes? Why, say, you've already sold me. But did I tell you about the You mean how that... over 1,200 fine independent stores from coast to coast gang up their buying power? Yes, and... and combine on manufacturing and distribution so that they can give values that are simply fabulous. Sure, I know. That's why Clippercraft top coats and overcoats look so expensive. But actually, Clippercraft top coats and overcoats only cost forty to forty-seven fifty. Oh, I was coming to that. They're a terrific buy. Zipper lining top coats and those smart clipper craft overcoats. You've really got to see them to believe they're only forty to forty-seven fifty. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suits, top coats, and overcoats. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Well, Dr. Watson, we're, we're terribly anxious to learn what the astonishing detail was that Mr. Holmes thought might escape the police. Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Harris. Well, sir, Holmes, as usual, refused to elaborate at that point. We notified the police. They removed Richard Blakely's body. Mrs. Blakely, now clearly deranged, was conducted to a prison cell. There was a careful investigation. Finally, she was committed to Bedlam, that awful asylum for the insane in Kent. You know, I regarded the case as a simple tragedy that had moved to its inevitable end. But not Holmes. He paid a visit to Mrs. Blakely in her room at Bedlam. Although we've met Mrs. Blakely, you won't recognize me. I am Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Yes, they mentioned your name to me. I don't seem to recall what your profession was, Mr. Holmes. I frankly don't recall who you are other than the name... Mine is the profession of criminal detection, Mrs. Blakely. You're with the police? Not at all. I function entirely upon my own. I have no official position, no staff. I have no weapons other than my brain. A more than satisfactory arsenal, I find. And is there something I can do for you, Mr. Holmes? I have an insatiate curiosity, Mrs. Blakely. I wanted to inquire further about your husband's death. Well, really... Unless this is absolutely necessary... I merely wanted to ask if you could recall the exact sequence of events, beginning with the moment when you returned to your home after leaving Dr. Campbell's office. Oh, please don't ask me to do that. I'll become ill again. Why do you ask that question? Simply my own desire to understand every crime in which I'm involved. The last minute design of the grotesque pattern. Well, I really don't remember much. When I came home, all sorts of thoughts ran through my mind... My visit to Dr. Campbell that afternoon, the fact that he was on the way with you, but that I could defeat everyone by killing Richard then and there. Oh, please. Unless it's most urgent, I, I can't reenact that awful night. I just can't. Very well, Mrs. Blakely. I regret disturbing you. I thought they were finished with me. I thought they'd allow me to rest. You're like desert birds. Picking ghoulishly at the dead. It's over, and it had best be forgotten. Had it, Mrs. Blakely? Oh, I'm pleased that you dropped by to my office, Mr. Holmes. Are you, Dr. Campbell? Yes, I was afraid that after the Blakely case had ended, our acquaintance might end with it. I hardly thought so, Doctor. Oh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Is there some matter on which I may be of assistance, or is this just a social call? I do not pay social calls, Doctor. My time is much too valuable to be dissipated upon the amenities of more conventional men. Then what is wrong, Mr. Holmes? I've just come from a visit to Mrs. Blakely at the hospital. Oh, how is she? Just as sane as ever. 
I don't quite know what you mean. Mrs. Blakely is just as sane as ever. She never was insane, Doctor. Oh, that's fantastic. I refuse to believe it, sir. Mrs. Blakely has been presenting the world with a melodramatic performance simulating insanity. A performance that proved most convincing to everyone. Except to me. If you're talking nonsense, Mr. Holmes, I'm a physician. Or you must recognize my ability to judge the symptoms of my patients. Christine Blakely intended for a long time to do away with her husband. The sudden popularity of Dr. Freud in Vienna gave her just the situation she desired. Well, what situation? She required a technique for avoiding the penalties of homicide so that she might be rid of her husband. So that she might ultimately join the man with whom she was secretly in love. The man with whom she was secretly in love? Oh, did I neglect to mention that before, Doctor? You're the man, Doctor. You parted with Christine and helped her to commit the murder. I warned Christine time and again that you should be our sole concern, Mr. Holmes. She insisted, though. She wanted her insanity well established with someone of unquestionable repute. So I went to you. I've been prepared for you, though. With that revolver? Oh, the revolver is merely to detain you, Mr. Holmes. I shan't kill you that way. You shall have a most regrettable heart attack while paying me this visit. You came to consult with me about chest pains. Then you died. Hmm. Interesting plan. Of course, consulting you on medical matters would be foolish. I've looked into your background, sir, and it seems you have no legal right to practice. Your title of doctor is pretense. You never earned it. I've been well prepared for your accusations, Mr. Holmes. Look in this drawer. This hypodermic contains a drug, an overdose. I shall inject it into your arm. The needle prick is almost invisible. The injection will strain your heart to the bursting point. Most unfortunate. Now, you were saying about Christine. Oh, yes. She has been conducting a clandestine affair with you. Her late husband traveled on business. You imparted that information to me yourself. While he was away, you visited the Blakely home. You found evidence to that? I never indulge in idle conjecture. Of course I have evidence. You and Christine concocted what you believed to was an ingenious idea. You would establish that she was losing her mind. She would publicize the murder in advance. Your nurse was most important. My nurse? Yes. You insisted she remain and hear every word of Mrs. Blakely's. She was an indispensable witness. Mrs. Blakely would then kill her husband, plead insanity, be committed to a hospital rather than to the gallows, and within a short time she'd be cured, released, and would join you. That was the plan, yes. But you made your first error, Doctor, when you mentioned that you stopped to see a patient at Upper Gloucester Place. That is on Park Road. You couldn't have avoided noticing that the road was blocked. Yet, when Watson suggested we dash to the Blakeley's via Park Road, you accepted the suggestion. Why, Doctor? Because you were afraid Christine wouldn't have time to kill Richard before he arrived. You wanted the delay at the blocked road. Excellent, Mr. Holmes. Surprising powers of observation. When we arrived and found Christine with the body of her husband, you said you'd fetch Mrs. Blakely's things. You knew where they were. You knew the clothes cupboard she used, although you were never supposed to have been to the house before. I was so right in warning, Christine. Now I shall inject this hypodermic. If you resist, I shall be forced to shoot. I'd rather not do that. Naturally. When I examined the body, sir, I mentioned finding an amazing detail. It was the fact that Christine had killed her husband with surgical precision. It's very difficult to plunge a knife into someone's heart directly without the blades being deflected by the ribs or the chest wall. But hers was masterly strokes. It required some knowledge of anatomy to place the knife so neatly into the center of a heart. It confirmed my previous suspicion. Christine had been coached by someone rather learned in such matters. By you, Dr. Campbell, by you. May I ask, Mr. Holmes, why you allowed the investigation to proceed? Because although the evidence was heavily weighted against you, I do not make accusations unless I am upon extremely firm ground. So, I waited to visit Mrs. Blakely, and she provided me with a final bit of information that I needed. Did she? Yes. You told me Mrs. Blakely had no idea that you'd come to see me about her case. You were appalled at my question. But, sir... Just a few minutes ago, Mrs. Blakely inadvertently mentioned that the night she killed her husband, she sat in the dining room thinking of the fact that you were on your way with me. Again, undeniable proof that this homicide was carefully prearranged. She knew exactly what you were doing. A superb series of deductions, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. 
Now we shall have our unavoidable disaster. Your heart attack. Roll up your sleeve, Mr. Holmes. You're forcing me to remind you that at this range, if I pull the trigger of this gun, it'll blow your head off. I have the needle ready. I said roll up your sleeve, Mr. Holmes. I assure you, your death from the drug in this hypodermic will neither be long nor painful. I'm quite familiar with the effects, Doctor. Then you must know you will experience a sudden shooting pain. Very short life. And then oblivion. Rather a pleasant way to die, I should say. Roll up your sleeve. That's it. Now raise your arm. Raise your arm. I'll just take this needle this way. Find a vein. Clench your fist, Mr. Holmes. Good. Good. Now the needle so. Drop that needle, Dr. Campbell. Dr. Watson! Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard is with me, Doctor. I'll take that gun, Dr. Campbell. <sighs> I began to believe you'd never step inside, Watson. Campbell, give your gun to Inspector Lestrade. Come on. Come on. No! No! Oh, ah! oh my hand! I'll ah. take that gun. There we are. I took the precaution, Dr. Campbell, of posting Watson and Lestrade just outside your door. Did you overhear every word, Lestrade? Every word, Holmes. I'll have plenty to tell him in the courtroom. Please should be very grateful to you, Holmes. Very grateful. As always, Lestrade. As always. Uh, the uh, Persian slipper, Watson, my pipe beads tobacco. Oh, here you are, Holmes. <laughs> Nothing quite like the armchair here at Baker Street, eh? You know, I, I've seen in the newspapers that Dr. Campbell, Mrs. Blakely will go on trial next week. Both for premeditated murder. Mm, excellent. A full-blown trial with a noose in the offing. None of your gentle medical inquiries into the dark recesses of Christine Blickley's mind. Amazing, Holmes. Amazing. The facility with which you take a seemingly clear-cut case of insanity and prove that it was a scientifically outlined murder. By George, you know, there may have been countless other cases that passed unnoticed. And the, the killer is now scot-free. Uh, conceivable, don't you think, Holmes? Uh. A uh, murder that defies cold logic? It is beyond understanding? I uh, beg to differ, my dear Watson. Any murder that defies explanation just requires time for me to smoke and think. To me, a case that's supposedly beyond human understanding is simply a three-pipe case. Match, please, Watson. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson, the well-advertised murder deserved the attention it received. It was fascinating. I'm delighted that you enjoyed it, Mr. Harris. And I do believe you'll enjoy the adventure I've planned for next week equally as well. It's an adventure I've called the Island of the Dead. And it concerns the ancestor of one of history's most ruthless pirates. An uncharted, uninhabited island and a ship with a dead pilot at the wheel. Makers of Clippercraft clothes in more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Lockwood. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by George Spelton, Christine was played by Rita Vale. This week's story was written by Howard Merrill with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Island of the Dead. This is Cy Harris speaking for Clippercraft Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Next, it's Behind the Front Page with Gabriel Heater. Send your merchandise and Christmas gifts the fast way. Use Eastern Airlines Air Parcel Post Services.
packages up to 70 pounds. Contact your local post office for details. My name's Regan. I get ten a day on expenses from a detective bureau run by a guy named Anthony J. Lyon. They call me the Lion's Eye. With Jack Webb as Jeff Regan investigators, stand by for hard-boiled action and mystery and thrilling adventure in tonight's story of The Too Many Mrs. Rogers. Seventh Street, near Olive. That's where it stands, downtown L.A. Cosmopolitan building. A big chunk of granite poking its way up through a parking lot. That's where you'll find International Detective Bureau. Suite 308. A good bargain counter if you're shopping around for trouble. Anthony J. Lyon, the guy I work for, pays the rent. Can't be very much because sunlight and those office walls have never said hello. The Cosmopolitan Building. An air shaft runs right up the middle of it. Suite 308 is wrapped around that ventilator like a donut around a hole. Figures that the Weather Bureau ought to run a separate survey on that office. Because we get all the blow-by from the Acme Incense Company, three doors down the hall. Los Angeles smog had come in second best if they knew about it. Well, it was last Tuesday, the day that Cleveland won the pennant that I walked in. The lion was there pecking around in that same old Remington. Somebody had broken the period key, but he didn't seem to mind. He talks in commas anyway. I don't know who he was writing to, but there were a couple of cereal box tops at his elbow and a contest blank. He was writing something about why I feed my children your breakfast food. The lion's a bachelor. Regan, who do you know in Battle Creek, Michigan? Jack Armstrong. I may win this contest. Here's one for you to fill in. No, I don't eat breakfast. This is different. I got us a case. Here's the address. Hinkle and Hinkle. Well, they make pills. It's a funeral parlor, one of the best in town. I'm healthy. I want you to be very careful how you talk to these people. Who, the customers? Hinkle and Hinkle, father and son. They got a fine establishment, and all the best people go to them for the final rites. Well, I'm fresh out of shrouds. They got problems, Hinkle and Hinkle have. What's the trouble? Hop over there, and they'll tell you. I'd rather get it from you. Regan, I can't do that. Why? You've read our business card. Anything told to an international man is in the strictest confidence. I wrote that, and won't double-cross a client. Well, that's a new twist for you. What do you mean? Every day you dump these phony cases in my lap and I go out on them. All I do is play tag with homicide. You won't get caught. A lot of canned tuna felt that way. You know I take care of you. That's what I don't like. Hinkle and Hinkle are expecting you right now. Yeah. Jump in your car and get over there. What do I say to them? Just say hello. They'll pick it up from there. You know, someday I'm going to quit. If you do, you'll starve. So what? <laughs> you'll still wind up at Hinkle and Hinkle. <laughs> The place was on Hope Street near Washington Boulevard. You couldn't miss it. A two-story building painted a battleship gray that sort of crouched at the curb. It had a square pimple for a door and flanked on each side by a brass angel. They were a dirty green color. I figured that one of the hinkles could have been a little more eager with a metal polish. The glass door was draped with white satin and it fluttered as I walked in. The hall was quiet. There was enough marble inside to make the Bank of America jealous. Another angel, this time with the wings folded back, was pointing toward the reception room. I followed directions and moved on. It smelled like the bargain matinee at the Roxy. Over in one corner was a vase of tired-looking flowers, trying real hard not to be cheerful. A little guy in a black serge suit was floating around the room with an atomizer filled with perfume. The whole place was about as inviting as a maiden aunt's kiss. The little man didn't even look at me, he just kept squirting. He couldn't put the perfume people out of business, but I figured he had them working nights. Your name, Hinkle? As soon as I finish. Yeah, well, that might take months. That's a big bottle. Hmm. Don't you just adore this scent? What's the matter? Are the flowers working? They're paper. Now then, sir. I asked first. Yes, I am Jason Hinkle. Aren't there two of you? Gerald? <laughs> Did you call, Pa? Just showing this man the other hinkle. Oh, hi. 
Now then, I believe that you'll find we can make all the necessary arrangements. Save the commercial. Nobody's dead. Oh, that's too bad. This week we're having a special at a greatly reduced rate. Well, I figure I got a few more years. Now, look, didn't you want to see me? Oh, you from Atlas. Who? Atlas Casket Company. We have plenty on hand. Penicillin has practically ruined our business. My name's Regan. I'm with International. Oh, of course. You're the lion's eye. I'm glad you got here. Well, tell me and we'll both be happy. Hey, Pa, he don't look so tough. Well, you do, Buster. You scare me. I'll bet I could break you in the middle. Never mind, Gerald. I'll have to apologize for him. He lifts weight. Uh, he'd have to, to carry that head around. Just, just say the word, Pa. Gerald. Now, Mr. Regan, if you'll step in the back room. All right. I have to be careful about Gerald. He's just a junior partner. He ought to be the silent one. He didn't learn to talk till he was almost nine. I paid him for sex. Drink, Mr. Regan. No, thanks. I stopped drinking that stuff in 32. Oh, you mean the formaldehyde label... Yes, I have to hide it from Gerald. All right, now we've been through the family album. What's the job? Ah, do you know a Mrs. Rogers? The phone book's full of them. Mrs. Rogers has been most unfortunate. Poor dear woman, they were married such a short time and they were ecstatically happy. Her husband died? Mm hmm. She lost him three days ago. Hinkle and Tinkle are handling the last right. Poor Mrs. Rogers, she's so young. You want a shoulder to cry on? Mrs. Rogers wished her husband taken to the family plot in La Jolla. We are furnishing the limousine, and she's requested someone to accompany her. I'll try a Pullman Porter. They like to travel. This whole thing has most unusual aspects. Mrs. Rogers thinks she needs protection. We could send Gerald. She'd still need protection. No, Mr. Regan, she wants you. She paying for this? I believe Mr. Lyon has her check. Okay, is that all you got to tell me? Mr. Regan, we only handle the debt. Well, they don't need protection. That. What they said about King Tut. Hinkle gave me her address. It was over near Westlake Park. It was one of those new modern apartment houses painted in elephant pink. It was around six o'clock when I rang the bell. While I waited, I tried to figure this protection angle. I thought maybe I could talk her out of it and wind up the whole thing right here. I kind of figured that she was just upset and needed a man around. When she opened the door, I knew I was right. You could see she was in mourning. She was wearing black lipstick. She was tall and thin, with long blonde hair. She made Mr. Peabody's mermaid look like a beginner. Right then, I knew that this case was about as much on the level as the city of San Francisco. She needed protection, all right, but so did I. When she said hello, it melted all over you like honey on a hot biscuit. You're standing in a draft. Well, it's a warm night. Well, come in. You were Mrs. Rogers? That's right. My name's Regan. The man from International. You're more than I paid for. Well, prices are coming down. Come over here where we can talk. I got a big voice. Oh. You act like you're afraid of me. Well, I didn't think it showed. Oh, yes. You're just exactly what I wanted. I used to be with an escort bureau. Well, then this should be part of your service. I bet the bureau went broke when you quit. No, but I left them in a hole. Relax, Mr. Regan. It's early. Now look, lady, we can play musical chairs some other time. What do you want? Why worry? You're getting paid. Yeah, but this kind of stuff won't buy food. Oh, I'm lonely. Do your act in the Coliseum. It'll be a sellout. You're practically a crowd. That's what they say about three. No, it's just you and me. With a dead man in between. Never mind Victor. He's my problem. Not anymore. Come on, lady. This is a fat blister. Let's break it. Slow down, Mr. Regan. Maybe that's what happened to Victor. All right. If you don't want to play my game, let's play yours. That's why you hired me. You know about my husband's coffin? Hinkle's having a sale. In the next room now. The limousine will be here in the morning at 8 sharp. We're going to La Jolla. Hinkle knows that much. And that's all you need to know. All I need or all I get. Light up, lady. I don't like the dark. It's a simple job. You go with me on the trip. Not enough. All right, I'll give you a bonus. How much? thousand dollars. Just a whisper. That's ten dollars a mile between here and La Jolla. I get car sick. Now, what has to get there besides Victor? A star sapphire as big as the moon. That good? Huh? Need sunglasses to look at it. Well, why didn't you tell me? I want that ring to get there on his finger. Don't worry, I don't have a fence. Victor's will said he must be buried with it on. Oh, yeah, you've got tears in your eyes. That's what he wanted and that's what he'll get. Other people know about that ring. 
Victor wouldn't want to lose it this late in the game. I'm the nursemaid. That's right. When I said I'd do to Victor in Yuma 1946, I promised him. The trip to La Jolla? I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8. Until then, get out. That bonus still good? If that ring gets to La Jolla? I'll see that it does. Aren't you afraid somebody might steal it? No, lady. You'll ride with me. Well, I began to get an uneasy feeling. Like a steer on the way to Kansas City. I left Helen Rogers and walked outside. There wasn't much traffic. It was a warm night and all the canoes in Westlake Park were full. I headed for an all-night coffee spot on the corner. If I'd have taken one more step, I'd have been in the back seat of a new Nash convertible with a top down. There was a brunette with long black hair in the driver's seat. She was thin and figured to be tall, at least she was wrapped around the wheel. There were two things different. She had bright red lipstick and her hair was black. She was wearing a dress the color of a boulevard stop, and she flipped the right door open. One look at her, and you knew that Dallas was wrong about their women. Want a lift, soldier? No, I only got a weekend pass. Plenty of time. You can go AWOL. No, I'm bucking for sergeant. Get in, and I'll tell you about the atomic bomb. Short ride? No. I think a long one. Okay, I'll buy the gas. Won't have to, Mr. Regan. I've got a credit card. Now, don't tell me you're lonely. You're in trouble. What kind? Bad client. Why? You should be working for Mrs. Rogers. That's who signed the check. I'm Mrs. Rogers. Yeah, blonde's got a license to prove it. Yuma, 1946. I've got priority. Mexico City, 1942. No divorce? I think there was a poor boy scout. He could only tie one knot. He went for the chorus line. And played for Keith. But I loved him. Helen didn't. How do I know? I don't care if you do. All right. What do you want with me? I'm his wife, his first one, his real one. We had some sort of life together before the scenes changed. It's my job to bury him. That all? That's all. It's a corkscrew. Straighten it out, sis. I'm telling you the truth. You left out one item. Tell me that that sapphire's got nothing to do with the affection. It has been. That's what the other Miss Rogers said. She's a liar. A blonde one. She'll run out of bleach. You're trying too hard. I'm telling you, Regan, I'm not going to sit by and do nothing. I believe you. You're letting your fingernails grow. Well, the brunette's name turned out to be Catherine Rogers. She gave me her number, but I wasn't buying. I felt kind of confused, like a polar bear in Palm Springs. Catherine didn't have any more, so she let me off on a corner, and I doubled back to the first Mrs. Rogers' place. It was about 20 minutes later when I rang Helen's bell. No answer. The door was unlocked, so I went in. The room was dark, except for the neon sign outside the bedroom window. I could see Victor Rogers' coffin banked up with flowers. The biggest blossom was already wilted. It was Helen. She was lying on the floor and her fire was out. I went back to the living room to call homicide. Then I smelled taboo perfume. She made a real good reflection in the mirror behind me. This one was a redhead. She had long hair. She was tall and thin enough to slip under the door. She had a little hand, but her finger could reach the trigger of the gun that she had in my back. I couldn't tell too much about it, but if I'd known her in college, my homework would have suffered. Don't make it, Dave. You're not going to make it. She'll wait. It may be forever. Hang it up. Did you do the job on the blonde? Maybe. Too many going for that sapphire. Maybe. Which one are you? Rita. Where'd he find you? South America. Different places, different girls. That's it. He'd make a good advance man for the United Nations. Just the female department. All right. When did you win your letter? Havana, 1944. You're right in the middle. No, you are. Well, the Andrews sisters did all right. I want to do it with you. I'll sing off key. That's all right. It's the style. No music. You're not listening hard enough. Oh. <laughs> Well, South America took it away. When I came out of it, I was all head like tap beer in a cheap saloon. The room was full of homicide. They must have got a hot shot call because they were all there. All I could see was the seats of their pants. I picked out the shiniest pair and I knew it was Sergeant Sanducci. 
He was standing over me with a notebook. The way he was sucking on that pencil, I figured he must have been a lollipop man in his youth. Everybody was there. All the newspapers, the fingerprint men were dusting everything. I had about as much chance as a Christmas tree salesman in July. Sanducci leaned into me. Borderline anemia? Oh. Huh? Kind of tired? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody would get tired lugging a heavy gun. What gun? This thirty-eight. It pushed a hole in that blonde. That's not mine. Who cares? The hand is yours. That's where we found it. Hey, Sanducci, let me shoot a picture of the eye, will you? Yeah, go ahead. Ha. Look happy, Eureka. I got a bad smile. Oh, we'll retouch it. Good. Now, look like a killer. That's enough. Oh, come on. Let's see your teeth. Beat it, punk, or you'll spend the rest of the night picking yours up. How do you like that for gratitude? Okay, Regan. Now, why'd you do it? You tell me. I'm working on it. You're out of your mind. I blow a hole in it and crack myself in the head? I'm working on that, too. We're working a redhead named Rita Rogers. I'm going steady. She wrapped me. It's her gun. Your forehead is wet. Work on a brunette named Catherine Rogers. She's grubbing around, too. I told you I already got a date. You. You couldn't see a frame in a picture gallery. You walk in and find a warm blonde in a deep freeze. You're lying there with the murder gun in your hand and you're yelling Patsy. What were you doing here? I was on a job. Yeah. The lion sent me over to Hinkle and Hinkle, two needle pushers out in Washington. They sent me over here. I was supposed to go to La Jolla with that blonde. On lion's time? I said it was a job. She was taking her dead husband down to the family plot. She was worried about a sapphire ring. Look in the coffin, you'll see. We already did. Well, what'd you find? Air. The coffin was empty. <laughs> You are listening to the story of the too many Mrs. Rogers, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator. (laughs) Commissions are still available in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve. If you are a graduate registered nurse between the ages of 21 and 45, you may be eligible for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps section of the regular officer's reserve. These commissions are still available... And those who meet the high standards and qualify with this fine organization may elect active or inactive status. If you believe you qualify for a commission in the Army Nurse Corps Reserve, apply to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. And now back to the story of the too many Mrs. Rogers and Jeff Regan, investigator. I had about as much chance as a snowball in a Turkish bath. The lion sends me to a funeral parlor run by two guys named Hinkle and Hinkle. They bank me off to a blonde, Mrs. Rogers, who wants protection taking her husband's body to La Jolla. He's being lowered with a star sapphire on his finger. Everybody's scrambling for it. But Victor Rogers was a collector of long-legged ladies, and the blonde turns out to be just a single in the crowd scene. There's two other Mrs. Rogers, a brunette and a redhead. You can't tell one from the other without a program. The next thing I know, the blonde is dead. I'm holding the murder gun in an alibi as full of as many holes as a piece of cheesecloth. There's no star sapphire, no body in the coffin, and Sanducci of homicide is pounding away at me. Well, the police finished in the blonde's apartment. The prints were lifted, and the gun was wrapped. It was Sanducci all the way. Come on, Regan, say why. You're pressing. I just work hard. You got nothing. You'll be saying that in the chamber. They're bluffing. How you figure? The setup's so strong, even you can smell it. I got sinus. Well, you're not taking me in. Well, who said I was? Okay. We'll be around for you when we're ready. Retirement will set in first. I'll sign for another hitch. Look, if you've got to keep beating your head against the wall, come over to my place. What for? It's brick. I left Sanducci still chewing his pencil and headed back to the office. I knew homicide wouldn't let the matter drop, so I wanted to see if maybe the lion could do me any good. I didn't have any supper, but... Somehow I'd lost my appetite. When I walked in, the lion was still working on that contest blank. He was keeping late hours, and the only reason he doesn't go to his hotel room is he gets a reduction in his weekly rate if he doesn't sleep in the bed. Regan, where you been? Beating Sanducci. You're in trouble. Yeah. How many times have I told you to watch your staff? Well, you never check before you send a guy out on a job. What have you got? She's beautiful. What else? She's dead. That's no way to run a business. You got your advance. I was thinking of public relations. Oh, stop it, will you? Somebody mentions dough and you're there with a basket. That's enough. Let's drop this case. Not until the wind dies down. I got another job for you. I'm still with the old one. The case is closed. Oh, I'm opening you it. You do your toe. Now, listen, big shot. You eased me in on that hook. Now, let's see you work backwards. Regan, you're getting out of line. Get a trace on Catherine and Rita Rogers. Who are they? A brunette and a redhead. What else? Victor Rogers' wives. What about Helen? 
His record broke on I do. Now get going and clear this thing up. Would you like to give it a whirl? Regan, don't you like working for me? I'll answer that when we both got more time. Well, I left the line, picked up a cup of coffee and a sandwich and went home. Then I tried to figure the mess. A guy with three wives drops dead and is going to be buried with a fortune on his fingers. All the hens start clawing around. That figures. One of them gets the axe. I happen in. Set up for a patsy. That figures. But what doesn't is why is the coffin empty? Somebody pulls a knockoff to grab a sapphire and takes the stiff with it. God, I was getting nowhere. Like a pickpocket in a nudist colony. The next morning, I was back on Embalmer's Row. Hinkle and Hinkle. I went inside. The little guy in the black suit and his son were standing in the entrance hall. Old Hinkle came toward me kind of slow, like an ant with a super chief in tow. You're back so soon, Regan. Everything all right at Mrs. Rogers? Your business is picking up. I don't understand. Neither do I. You fill it in. Now, there's no use taking that belligerent attitude. Now, listen, you. I played Patsy long enough. Hey, Pa, shall I mash him? You heard Gerald, Regan. Now, get your paws off of me quick. Oh, we're backstage now. Your grease paint's off. I don't know why you came back here. We don't know anything about That's it. That's your version. Look, Regan, I'm going to try to let you down easy, so pay attention. You were called on a routine job. We played our part, now you play yours. Take that trip to La Jolla. We're going to need a bigger car now. I told you all I know. Now beat it. Homicide wants somebody. I'm going to give him you. You're on a treadmill. That's all right. It's slowing down. I'm tired of this small talk, Regan. Now get out of here before I sick Gerald on you. Is that all you've got to offer? That's it. Now blow. Okay. Next time I'll bring homicide. Just won't give up, will you? Gerald. Yeah. How do you want him, Pa? Broken too? You handle it. I'll be in the back room. Fist or gun butt, Pa? Gun Hold butt still. <laughs> you should be glad Pa didn't say fist. It's harder. See? <clears throat> I dreamed about you last night, Regan. Must have been something you ate. I dreamed I broke you in two. You're still walking in your sleep. You say funny things, Regan, but your face don't go with it. Now, get away from me, you big ape. I seen a clown in a circus once. He had a big red nose, like this. And he didn't have no teeth. And he had little teensy eyes, way back in his head. Yeah, you make a swell clown now. I was getting nowhere, like a skywriter in a high wind. Gerald must have got tired. He stood over me, grinning like a Notre Dame gargoyle. I tried to get up a couple of times, but it would have been easier to get to Ohio on a pogo stick. I kept wondering if he'd ever quit when the front door opened and Catherine, the brunette Mrs. Rogers, came in. She had a thirty-two in her hand and she leveled it at Gerald. Stop it! We're going to the circus. Stop it or I'll kill you! All right, you heard her. Uh, what about the circus? Come here, you. <laughs> there ought to be a place for you in the sideshow. I got tired waiting for you to come to me. Yeah, thanks. Shall we go where we can talk? What do you want? You... So did Junior here. My hands are softer. Your gun isn't. You can hold it. It's not good enough. Still don't trust me? No. We'll go in your car. Well, it gets better. We'll go to your place. Okay. You won't be sorry. Why? Because I'm going to help you, Regan. You just did, lady. <laughs> We left Hinkle and Hinkle and drove up Washington to Vermont and then north toward Hollywood. Above Beverly, we had to detour for the freeway coming in. It made me kind of mad. I'd been detouring since the beginning. Well, she didn't say much, and I tried to figure. The last time I saw her, she gave me a choke act about being the only one who ever loved Victor. And the next thing I knew, I was set up like pins in a bowling alley, and Sanducci was going for 300. We pulled to a stop in front of my place and went in. Inside, there was company. She wasn't invited. But the red-headed Rita, the South American bombshell, was lying on my bed. Somebody had set her off. She was dead. This is the kind of help you mean? I... I didn't know she was here. Oh, come off it. You're not Bergman. I didn't. She's past convincing. I'm talking to you. So am I. Rita. No go, lady. You knocked her off, got me over here, worked the gun into my hand. No. You did the first job, too. You let me out of your car, doubled back to Helen's before I got there and fogged her. No, no, you're wrong. Write me. I... I did double back to Helen's apartment and got there before you. Looking for that sapphire. Looking for a showdown on Vic's burial. It was my job. You said that before. We argued. Pulling hair. I didn't touch her. Go on. When I left, Rita was coming up the stairs. She 
She didn't see me. I stepped into the shadows and watched her go into Helen's apartment. They began screaming. I, I looked in and saw Rita kill her. Then I heard someone coming and ran. That'd be me, huh? Yes. Moving in to play Patsy. And I heard the police thought you did it. That's right. So I looked for you. Tell that to homicide. I will. You make it sound good. It is. Cleans up one, but you're not through. Why? It's a double header. Who killed Rita? I don't know. What happened to the sapphire? I don't know. Where's Victor's body? Uh, what do you mean? It's not in the box. I, I... Oh, sure. Wind it up and make it good. I don't know. The wrong pitch. You still don't trust not me. Not until you clean up the rest, no. She can't, oh. Regan. I've got the broom. Victor. Nice of you to remember, Captain. How do you remember? I got a card file. You can throw away some pages. That's what I figured. I've been tagging after the two of you for some time. So you're Victor. Well, it's beginning to clear. You got Hinkle to help you play dead. Tell me why. You tell me. I'm moving up in society. I have to unload. Oh, yeah. It all figures. You're dead. The wives start working for the loot. In the scramble, they take care of each other. The redhead gets the blonde. You get the redhead. And take care of what's left. Now, let's close the book. Victor's aim was good. Catherine went down. Sanducci got Victor from the bedroom window. His sapphire ring caught the light as he sprawled on the floor. And then Sanducci climbed in off the fire escape. Catherine's hair was still long, but she wasn't tall anymore. Regan. Yeah, baby? Victor. He's through. He was no good. Yeah. But I loved him. Uh huh. We should have met sooner. So long, soldier. That's it, Regan. Yeah. <laughs> she seemed like a nice kid. Yeah. It's going to be a long trip, but she'll make it. That was it. Victor was ambitious. He was moving up in society and couldn't stand a bigamy scandal. His brain worked overtime cooking up that dish. He rigged it with the blonde Helen at first. But she got it right off from the redhead. And that didn't make him cry. Took care of one. When the redhead came over to my place, Victor tagged her and put her away there. Two down and I'm the fall guy. And then he waited for the brunette so he could finish the game. Oh, yeah. Vic was a busy fellow, but he ran out of breath. Well, Sanducci put my place back in order, and nothing was left of the girls with the long hair but dandruff. I called the lion. He was mad. A whole day shot without adding a mark to his bank account. Well, Sanducci and I both came up with the same question. All three of those women were beautiful. I wonder if they'd all gone for Victor if they really knew... That star sapphire was a phony. Jack Webb is featured as Jeff Regan with Herb Butterfield as Anthony J. Lyon. Jeff Regan, investigator, written by Larry Roman and D. Jack Newman, produced by Sterling Tracy, is heard each week at this time over CBS. Tonight's cast included Grace Lennard, Gloria Blondell, Lorette Philbrandt, John Hoyt, Jack Petrucci, Paul Fries, and David Ellis. If you're a graduate registered nurse, please listen carefully to this important message. 29,000 nurses are needed to join the new Army Nurse Corps Officers Reserve. For the first time in history, qualified nurses have the opportunity of receiving commissions in the regular Army Reserve. These nurses will remain on inactive status, ready to serve their country in time of emergency. For further information, drop a card to the Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Original music for this program is by Milton Charles. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. There's nothing I like better than a good game of poker. But I get tired of always drawing the straights that never fill. You have to keep throwing your chips on the table. Only the last card pays off if you're lucky enough to get it. 
This time I had to fill my straight. The stakes were too high. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan, and tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> I had spent half the night before in a poker game, and I always kept drawing straights that didn't fill. Finally, I cashed in what chips I had left, wrote out an IOU for plenty, and went home to the tambourine to bed. Even in my sleep, I kept drawing the inside straights and outside straights that never filled. I got up late the next morning, and knowing my gambling friend would soon be around for his dough, I took a bag of money out of the safe in my office. I had just sat down at my desk to count it out when Chris, my bartender, came in. Hey, Rocky. A guy named Jack wants to talk to you on the front payphone. Jack who? I don't know. Just said Jack wants to talk to you. Yeah, you said that. Why'd he call me on the payphone? Hmm, shall I give him your office number? Smart thinking, Chris. Do that. Sure, Rocky. Oh, uh, and there's a man been asking to see you out front. I told him he was busy. What's his name? Mr. Queen. <laughs> Jack and Queen. Not bad with the first two cards. Cards, Rocky? Uh, skip it. I still got poker in the brain. You want me to send him away? No, I'll see what he wants. Might as well take the phone call while I'm out there. I'll watch the money on my desk till I get back, huh? Sure, Rocky. Bring him to me. Bring him to me at once. As I stepped out into the cafe, it sounded like business was starting a little early. The big voice came from the big mouth of a swarthy, well-dressed Egyptian sitting at the rear end of the bar. I sidetracked over his way. I will not be treated this way. I demand respect. Where is the manager? Bring him to me. I don't tap, mister. Who oh, are you? Name's Rocky Jordan. I own the tambourine. What's the trouble? The trouble? Everything, sir. I ask for food, and what do they bring me? Garbage. Oh, especially. Now, listen. The drinks are abominable. And where is your bartender? The service is unspeakable. Then try the hotel shepherd. Why come slumming here? No, you are insulting. Do you know who I am? I am Tom and King. Tom and King. Never heard of you. Take my advice and get some sleep. This is no time. Enough, sir. I will show you what I think of the Café Tambourine. <laughs> okay, Kingpin. Now we go bye-bye. Come on. Stop it, sir. Get your hands off me. I am warning you. I twisted Tom and King's arm behind him, escorted him the full length of the bar out the front door, and discarded him with a shove two doors down. He retreated, still shouting insults. I brushed my hands and strolled back into the cafe. This routine. I was about to take the call on the payphone when a smiling man of uncertain nationality and thick glasses stepped up. Pardon. Are you Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Ah. I am Mr. Queen. Milton Queen. Oh, sure. I forgot about you. I am a visitor in your city, Mr. Jordan. A chance acquaintance, a Mr. Uh, Willoughby. Told me to look you up when I came to Cairo. Willoughby? Oh, well, have a good time. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am to meet my nephew, Junior Queen. He should be here now. We are especially interested in the mosques of Cairo. Could you direct me to the Sultan Hassan? Oh, right down the street. See, I've got a phone call waiting. So... Oh, well, just one more thing. Perhaps you can also tell me how to get to the Mosque El Azhar. Oh, I, sorry, I lost my tourist book. Did you know the Mosque El Azhar is the first known Egyptian use of the pointed arch? <laughs> Interesting. Oh, very, very. <laughs> uh, look, what you need is a guide. You'll find at least three hiding behind every lamp. Oh, yes. Perhaps you are right. But you being a resident here, my friend suggested that you might... If you'll excuse me, that phone call... Oh, oh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. You have been most kind. Most kind. I dragged myself away from Queen and went over to the payphone. Whoever Jack was, he must have gotten tired of waiting and hung up. I didn't blame him. Before the smiling tourist with the thick glasses could buttonhole me again, I headed for my office. I couldn't help thinking how well my poker hand was filling out. A jack, a queen, and now a king. Then I opened the office door. 
Lying face down on the floor, an ugly lump the size of an ostrich egg just behind his left ear, was Chris, my bartender. The money was gone from the desk, and the back door to the alley swung open. I ran out into the alley and up to the narrow side street. There was no one in sight except a native woman. Her somber brown eyes gave me a startled look. She quickly drew a veil over her face and limped away. I've been around Cairo long enough to know not to look at a native woman twice. So I got back to the office, and while the help tried to bring Chris to his senses, I called the police and reported the robbery. It took six pitchers of water and a gin sling, but Chris finally sat up. Hey. Hey, Rocky, you all right? Hey, of course I am, Chris. What happened? I don't know. Well, come on, you got to remember. I left you here to watch the money on my desk. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I heard the yelling out front, so I thought you needed help. So I put the money in the safe. In the safe? Sure. Then I heard somebody come in the door behind me. I stood up and somebody grabbed me. I stepped back on somebody's foot, I think. Hard. Did you see who it was? No, I guess that's when I got slugged. You sure you put the money in the safe? Oh, I ate it there. We'll have a look. What do you know? The money was all there. Every cent of it. We had a look around the office, but so far as we could tell, nothing had been touched. There was a knock at the door, but before I could answer, in walked Sergeant Dreckel, the Cairo police. The usual sour look on his face. What's this all about, Mr. Jordan? Uh, Greco. Where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya's busy. He sent me to get the details of the robbery. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Greco, but it uh, was all a mistake. One moment. I must make a full report. Now. How much money was involved? Oh, a few hundred pounds, more or less. But it's all here. Then what has been going on here? Nothing. Forget it. We do not take slugging so lightly, Mr. Jordan. Chris now... stumbled over his own foot or somebody didn't like his ugly face. Those things happen around here. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to turn around, but if somebody... If you please, I will question you one at a time. Look, Greco, I'll put in a good word for you, Mr. Buyer. Now, if you'll just Now, leave... Mr. Jordan, did you strike No, I told you there's no complaint. Now, for the last touch, that I will take it. Get away from that phone, Greco. It's for me. Sergeant Greco speaking. Oh? Oh, Captain Sabaya. Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, sir. Yes, yes. Jordan is here. Yeah, I'll take it. It is not at all cooperative. What? Uh, so? Yes, 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 sir. I will ask him, of course, of course. You can depend on me completely. Yes, I will handle everything at once. Of course. Don't hang up that phone. Let me talk to him. Well, Jordan. What did Sabaya want? Jordan, uh, when did you last see Ace Warner? Don't tell me I drew an ace. Answer my question. I, I, uh, played poker with him till about three o'clock this morning. Remind me not to send him a greeting card this year. Why not? No, oh, you won a little too easily, I thought. But I asked for it. I'll pay him off. You won't, Jordan. Ace Warner was just found in his casino. Shot to death. Maybe somebody will give me a black tie for Christmas. I believe you own a forty-five caliber automatic, Jordan. Now, look, Greco, you can do better than that. I am instructed to conduct a routine investigation. Let me see the gun. Okay. I keep it in my desk drawer. Haven't touched it in six weeks. Well, Jordan? Here you are, Greco. And you'll find my fingerprints on it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Having fun, Greco? He has not been fired recently. Oh, disappointed? Now, what is in this other drawer? Greco, get out of those drawers or get a search warrant. Hey. Ah, another gun, Jordan. What? How did that get there? Let me see it. Uh, don't touch it. Mm-hmm. A definite smell of cordite. Ah, two shells missing. This automatic has been fired within the last 12 hours. So planned if I ever saw one. I would deliver this gun to Captain Sabaya for his inspection. And under the circumstances, you, Jordan, will accompany me to the Cairo jail. <laughs> Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Remember, over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour each Sunday evening is the time for Rocky Jordan. Now back to tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> my way to an ace high straight. A phone call from a guy named Jack who didn't wait for me to answer. 
A loud Egyptian named King and a smiling tourist named Queen. And finally, a murdered gambler named Ace. I wondered when the ten would show up to fill my street. It was no secret that Ace Warner had my IOU for plenty of money, won in a poker game the night before. But when a forty-five automatic, recently fired, turned up in my desk drawer, I was taken to headquarters. Captain Sam Sabaya sent the gun to ballistics two doors down, kept me in his office. Jordan, I had hoped there would someday be a murder in Cairo in which you were not involved. Just keep trying, Sam. Now, you were about to give me one of your fantastic theories. Nothing fantastic about it. The killer knew I owed Ace Warner too much dough after that poker game last night. So he planted his gun in my desk to throw the blame on me. You seem quite certain that gun killed Ace Warner. What's your idea, Sam? Never mind. Go on. Somebody contrived to get me out of my office while his accomplice entered it from the alley. He didn't count on finding Chris. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. Ballistics must fire the gun to compare bullets. Sure, sure. Uh, Jordan, supposing you are right, can you suggest who contrived to get you out of your office? It could be any one of three. Somebody named Jack called me on the front yes. phone just before this happened. Jack who? I don't know. By the time I answered, he'd hung up. Then a swarthy Egyptian named Tom and King started a phony one-man riot in the cafe. I had to throw him out. Tom and King. And the third? Well, after I get rid of King... <sighs> Sam, how many times do they have to... Go on, Jordan. Well, a tourist with thick glasses named Milton Queen buttonholed me at the door. I had trouble getting rid of him. Any one of those three could have given the accomplice plenty of time to get in the alley door to my office. One moment. Sabaya speaking. You are sure? No, no, not at present. That will be all. Caught him out, Sam? Jordan, Ace Warner was killed with the gun found in your desk drawer. A surprise. Now suppose you continue your story, all of it. I told you everything, Sam. How about talking to Chris? For one thing, he thinks he stepped on somebody's foot. Now, he's a big fan. I have his statement. Jordan, I will release you for the present. In the meantime, let me suggest... Did I give up a weekend of my country estate? Sure, Sam. I'll stay in Cairo. Watch me. I got out quick before Sam had changed his mind and was on my way back to the tambourine. Now all I had to do was find a ten spot to fill my straight. I also wanted a better look at a couple of cards named King and Queen. As I walked into my cafe, Chris nodded his head painfully toward a man sitting at a front table. The man got up and drooped his way toward me, like an underfed dog with its tail between its legs. The Egyptian one-man riot, Tom and King. Mr. Jordan, I've been waiting to see you. Hey, get the glasses off the bar, Chris. No, please, Mr. Jordan, I want to apologize. Why didn't you bring your whole card with you? I don't understand. Your helper who delivered the gun. Mr. Jordan, I am afraid you are confused. I created a disturbance here this morning. My actions were inexcusable. I could phrase it a different way. See, I had been drinking all night. There have been uh, things on my mind. Like murder? Oh, please, worries. Why I came to the tambourine, I do not know. A lot of people wonder that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I am a respectable person. Mm, it's one man's opinion. You can understand why I would not want a disgraceful affair like this to reach the papers. I did considerable damage. I wish to pay for everything. Would, uh... One hundred pounds be sufficient? One hundred. That's your last offer? I realize that I am in no bargaining position. Well, well um, give me your card. I'll send you an itemized bill. Oh, you are very kind, Mr. Jordan. And you will tell no one? Well, that depends. Keep in touch with me, King. He handed me his card and backed out the door, bowing all the way. I asked Chris if the guy named Jack had called again. He hadn't. There was a chance I could learn something about Ace Warner to help me find my ten. So I taxied over to his gambling joint on the other side of town. A lone policeman was on guard out front, but he let me in. One of Ace's boys was in a back room testing a roulette wheel. Hello, Maxie. Uh, oh, hi, Rock. Watch your thirteen coming up. Watch it. See? Thirteen. What'd I tell you? Yeah, I see. Of course, something like that poker game I was in last night. Oh, uh, yeah, Rock. Sorry about that. We had a fix to clean out a couple of the other boys. They had some tricks, too. There was too much dough on the table. Ace couldn't afford it. You know it. Ace is dead? Yeah. Twenty-three this time, watch it. What do you know about the killing? 
I tell you, Rock, uh, uh, watch it now. 23 coming up. 23, just like I said. Come on, what do you know about the killing? Nothing, Rock. Not a thing. Who are his enemies? Who's the angel behind this affair? Angel? It's funny. How do you know? Know what? That was his girlfriend. He met her in France or someplace. Quite a dish, Rocky. He was getting rid of her dough. Why? Ah, he got most of it anyhow. She's too jumpy. Scared her husband to show up. You know what the husband's name was? Let's see, uh... No, I forgot. Four this time. Try to remember, Maxie. Was it King, maybe? King? Yeah, King, that's it. How do you know? I didn't. Where's Angel hiding these days? Got no idea. Hey, wait, Rock. Watch this. Thing. Sorry, Maxie. Time for the next deal. Things were beginning to gel now, but I still needed a ten to fill my straight. I figured I'd find it back to back with a king. Tom and King had given me his address down toward the river on the other side of the bazaar. It takes a taxi all day to get through the bazaar, so I walked. Ordinarily, I like to take in the bazaar, get a kick out of the snake charmers, who always play a little louder when a tourist walks by. I tossed a tattered musician a couple of fiascas, and I saw a familiar-looking veiled native woman coming up from behind. She limped, like the one I saw on the side street off the tambourine that morning. I wasn't sure she saw me, so I dodged into a booth and waited for her to pass. You like my rock? Yeah, sure, but not this time. Only two Egyptian pounds, Effendi, for this thing of it. Ah, not interested, sorry. I see. You bargain well, Effendi. Only for you, one pound. Look, I got a rug. Now, don't bother me. Effendi, you will ruin me. Half a pound and forty piastres. I'm not buying anything. Let it go of me, will you? Very well, but only for you, Effendi. Half a pound. No less, not a million less. Wait. Wait, come back. By the time I got out of the booth and shook the excited peddler off, the veiled native woman was way down the street. I thought I saw her turn in somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Anyhow, I couldn't have followed her. Like I said, a foreigner doesn't look at a veiled woman twice if he values his life. So I hurried on down the street. As I passed an open-air cafe, I changed my course again. Another one of my cards had turned up. He sat at a secluded table sipping tea. Across from him sat a shy, brown-eyed boy of uncertain age. I went up to that table. By, by Mr. Jordan. Mr. Milton Queen, I believe. Uh, this, uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, may I present my nephew, Junior Queen? How do you do, sir? Oh, yes, we've met. We have? Why, oh, no, I was to meet him this morning, but he had not arrived when I talked to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a logical mistake. <laughs> Ever played poker, Mr. Queen? Poker? No, no, I'm so sorry. It's so kind of you to invite me. I just thought you might know Ace Warner. Warner? Ace? No, no, I'm afraid not. But I would enjoy meeting him. There are so many, many friendly people in Cairo. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jordan, I must confess a very foolish mistake. You must? Ah, you will recall I said the Mosque al-Azhar was the first Egyptian example of the pointed arch? Mm hmm I was wrong. It was the Ahmed ibn Tulun. Stupid of me, though. Oh, but think nothing of it. See you later, Mr. Queen. You too, Junior. Goodbye, sir. Oh, won't you have some tea with us, Mr. Jordan? Uh, tea? No, no thanks. It kills the taste of the lemon. As I left the table, I wondered why I said I had met Junior before. I thought I had a good memory for faces. Well, I found Tom and King's address. A large brownstone modern apartment house. But King wasn't in. The clerk said he'd been out most of the day. I waited around the lobby for a while, then stepped into a phone booth and called the tambourine. Cafe Tambourine. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. That fellow named Jack ever called me back? No, never did. But somebody else called. Who? I don't know. Hey, bartender, survey. Ah, just a minute. You said if you wanted to find Angel, try ten dollar beer. Ten dollar beer? What else? That's all. He hung up. Oh, great. Now you can do something. What, Rocky? Hang up. Well, it looked like I finally had that ten to fill my ace high straight. I remembered the paddle streamers along the Nile are known as Dahabias. Then I thought again. The swank little houseboats anchored along the Nile are called the same thing. A five-minute walk from King's Place took me to Dahabi at number ten. I walked up the narrow awning-covered gangplank that led to the little deck and knocked at the door. The name's Jordan. I don't want to see anyone. Wait, I can't. 
Sorry, Blue Eyes, I gotta talk to you. Who did you say you were? Rocky Jordan. I was a friend of Ace Warner's. Oh. Well, uh, how did you find me here? Oh, I just filled a straight, and there you were. I don't understand. Straight? It... Oh. <laughs> well, if you mean you want a drink, it's on the side cabinet. Go ahead. Thanks. I believe I will. I'm, uh, sorry I couldn't get it for you, but <laughs> you see my foot. Yeah, I noticed it. Why, uh, why did you come here, Mr. Jordan? To, uh, to find your husband. My husband? Well, did you know you had one? Well, I, I have not seen him since I left Bordeaux. Uh, you had better go, Mr. Jordan. Oh, sure. But the next time you see Mr. King, tell him I said hello, huh? Mr. King? Who is he? Isn't that his name? I don't know what you are talking about. Now, kindly get out of here. Uh, I'm going. Oh, uh, one more question, Angel. What happened to your foot? Stepped on it. Well, it seemed almost too easy. But just in case Sam Sabaya hadn't already found the answer, I figured I'd throw in my two bits. So at the nearest payphone, I put in a hurry up call to headquarters. Captain Sabaya speaking. Sam is Rocky. Well, Jordan, you did stay in Kyle. I'll make it short and sweet in case you still want to know who killed Ace Warner. You mean you can tell me? All wrapped up neat like a package from Santa Claus. Try a man named Tom and King. At 1114 Fingal Place. Jordan, I have already talked to Mr. King. And next, look up a blue-eyed beauty named Angel. Or didn't you know Tom and King was her husband? Ah, this is news, Jordan. All right, add it up, Sam. While King got me out of my office at the tambourine with his drunk act, Angel put the gun on my desk. She still has a sore foot. That lovely creature knocked Chris out? Well, she had to. Then made her getaway disguised as an Arab woman, maybe. Ridiculous, Jordan. How do you explain that? Sam, if I figure this any farther, you'd have to put me on your payroll. Come on, better be on your way. Well, from there on, it was Sam's baby. Ten Dahabia did it. My first four cards had been people instead of a house address, but I was satisfied. I found myself walking back through the bazaar, and this time I was enjoying it. I slowed down to listen to the tattered beggar musician. I was about to put in a request for the St. Louis Blues when I saw her again. Right behind me this time, still following me. The veiled native woman who limped. But this time I figured I knew who she was. She hesitated. Her somber brown eyes flicked my way. Then she quickened her pace and went on by. I stood there, puzzled. Then it hit me. My house of cars collapsed like a tent in a sandstorm. Rocky Jordan, the prize sucker of Cairo. Sure, I figured it. Just enough to leave a girl named Angel at the mercy of a killer and get another murder rap pinned on me. This time I didn't dare let the veiled woman get out of sight again. I turned and started after her. Three natives eyed me suspiciously and fell in behind. She saw me coming and limped faster. Then she began running. So did I. And with every step, I picked up another native bent on mayhem. There we went. The veiled woman, followed by me, followed by a pack of Muslims, right through the bizarre pirate. Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a note of importance to you listeners who like top-flight adventure mysteries. Rocky Jordan joins Sam Spade and the Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery adventure listening on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and the Whistler, top-notch mystery on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story, Ace High Straight. If you're ever in Cairo and crave excitement, try following a veiled woman. You'll get it. I did better than that. I chased this woman at a dead run, past the beggars and the snake charmers and the street vendors of the crowd of the czar. A pack of natives on my tail were beginning to close in. One big boy tried to block my path. I pulled him over and gathered speed again. I picked up three blocks and 30 more natives when I caught her. She gave me quite a tussle. Let go! Let go of me! Turn around! Turn around and face me! No! No! My veil! Coming off quick and everything with it! Yeah! Look her over, folks. She's not a native, and she's not a woman. He's Uncle's little nephew, Junior Queen. Right then, the cop in the corner came pushing through the crowd. 
I turned Junior Queen over to him for safekeeping and gave him a message for Sabaya. Within two minutes, the pack of natives had faded away like a snowman in the desert. But I kept moving. I backtracked through the bazaar, grabbed a roving taxi, and directed it to Dahabia 10 on the double. We got there in record time. I hit the pier running, crossed it, and went up the canopy gangplank that led to Angel's little houseboat on the Nile. I didn't stop to knock. It seems I was just in time. Oh, Rocky, you ain't here. Close the door, Mr. Jordan, and lock it. This is most convenient. I see you found another gun, Queen. Oh, Rocky, Mason, what's going on? Shut up, Angel. Yes, I know. Maxie's memory was bad. Your husband's name is Queen, not King. Oh, yes. Natural mistake. Now that you know, it makes no difference. Naturally. You killed Ace Warner. And he wants to kill me, Rocky. And I will. Oh, no. The husband doesn't appreciate his wife leaving him. Especially when she takes his last cent and gives to a no-good gambler. So you killed him and planted the gun in my office. Then you sent me here to Angels, planning to kill her after I left. You're a little slow, Queen. Not at all, Jordan. Now that you are here, it will be even more simple. I don't know why you came back. Just to clear up a mistake, Queen. I thought Angel's address filled my straight. I was wrong. I should have known I was holding the Joker all the time. A very wild Joker. Joker? Yeah. Junior Queen. Your shy little nephew. Yes. He is not my nephew. No, no, no. You hired him to disguise himself as a native woman, knowing I wouldn't dare follow him. He planted the gun on my desk. But when Sophia released me, you had Junior keep up the masquerade and tail me just in case. You narrate quite well, Jordan. What comes next? When you introduced me to Junior in the bazaar, I was sure I'd seen that brown-eyed face before. I finally remembered. It was the face on the native woman in the side street off my cafe this morning. Junior was careless with his veil. (laughs) I will reprimand him. The police will enjoy such an incredible story, Jordan. After they find Angel dead and know that you have been here. Oh, Nelson, please, no. Go ahead, Queen. Shoot her. Get it over with. Oh. What? Oh, Rocky, what are you saying? Oh, please don't What do you think Sam Sabai has been doing since he talked to Junior? To Junior? Where is he? Locked up in the Cairo jail. No. The police know everything, Queen. If you doubt me, look out the front window. Oh, I don't do. It's an old trick, but it worked. As Queen turned toward the front, I reached out and knocked off his thick glass. He whirled and started firing blindly. I grabbed him and dragged him to the floor, but the bullets didn't hit anywhere near us. Just then, Sam Sabaya started pounding on the front door. Queen dropped the gun, ran through the back room. The last I saw him, he was disappearing through an open window. Gordon, you here. Where's Milton Queen? Get out your water wings, Sam. Milton went for a swim. Draco! Get after him. But, Captain, I cannot swim. It is an order, Greco. Uh, uh, all right. Don't point. worry, Greco. It's only three feet deep. You'll find Queen among the bulrushes. Now, Jordan, about Angel. Is she... No, she's not dead. She's passed out. I must have stepped on her sore foot when I pulled her down. Yes. Yes. She is suffering only mild shock. You know, that's something I'm still trying to figure out, Sam. How did she hurt that foot? Her foot, Jordan? Why, I received a full report on the accident yesterday. Yeah? What happened? A camel stepped on it. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.